Hi, my name is Tim Ruffgarden. I'm a professor here at Stanford University, and I'd like to welcome you to this first course on the design and analysis of algorithms. Now, I imagine many of you are already clear on your reasons for taking this course, but let me begin by justifying this course's existence and giving you some reasons why you should be highly motivated to learn about algorithms. So, what is an algorithm anyways? Basically, it's a set of well-defined rules, a recipe, in effect, for solving some computational problem. Maybe you have a bunch of numbers and you want to rearrange them so that they're in sorted order. Maybe you have a roadmap and an origin and a destination, and you want to compute a shortest path from that origin to that destination. Maybe you face a number of different tasks that need to be completed by certain deadlines, and you want to know in what order you should accomplish the tasks so that you complete them all by their respective deadlines. So why study algorithms? Well, first of all, understanding the basics of algorithms and the related field of data structures is essential for doing serious work in pretty much any branch of computer science. This is the reason why, here at Stanford, this course is required for every single degree that the department offers, the bachelor's degree, the master's degree, and also the PhD. To give you a few examples, routing and communication networks piggybacks on classical shortest path algorithms, the effectiveness of public key cryptography relies on that of number theoretic algorithms. Computer graphics needs the computational primitives supplied by geometric algorithms. Database indices rely on balanced search tree data structures. Computational biology uses dynamic programming algorithms to measure genome similarity, and the list goes on. Second, Algorithms play a key role in modern technological innovation. To give just one obvious example, search engines use a tapestry of algorithms to efficiently compute the relevance of various web pages to a given search query. The most famous such algorithm is the PageRank algorithm, currently in use by Google. Indeed, in a December 2010 report to the United States White House, the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology argued that, in many areas, performance gains due to improvements in algorithms have vastly exceeded even the dramatic performance gains due to increased processor speeds. Third, although this is outside of the, sco the scope of this course, algorithms are increasingly being used to provide a novel lens on processes outside of computer science and technology. For example, the study of quantum computation has provided a new computational viewpoint on quantum mechanics. Price fluctuations in economic markets can be fruitfully viewed as an algorithmic process, and even evolution can be usefully thought of as a surprisingly effective search algorithm. The last two reasons for studying algorithms might sound flippant, but both have more than a grain of truth to them. I don't know about you, but back when I was a student, my favorite classes were always the challenging ones that, after I struggled through them, left me feeling a few IQ points smarter than when I started. I hope this course provides a similar experience for many of you. Finally, I hope that by the end of the course, I'll have converted some of you to agree with me that the design and analysis of algorithms is simply fun. It's an endeavor that requires a rare blend of precision and creativity. It can certainly be frustrating at times, but it's also highly addictive. So let's now descend from these lofty generalities and get much more concrete. And let's remember that we've all been learning about and using algorithms since we were little kids. Sometime when you were a kid, maybe say third grade or so, you learned an algorithm for multiplying two numbers. Maybe your third grade teacher didn't call it that. Maybe that's not how you thought about it. But you learned a well-defined set of rules for transforming an input, namely two numbers, into an output, namely their product. So that is an algorithm for solving a computational problem. Let's pause and be precise about it. Many of the lectures in this course will follow a pattern 
We'll define a computational problem. We'll say what the input is, and then we'll say what the desired output is. Then we will proceed to giving a solution, to giving an algorithm that transforms the input into the output. When the integer multiplication problem, the input is just two n-digit numbers. So the length n of the two input integers x and y could be anything, but for motivation you might want to think of n as large, in the thousands or even more. Perhaps we're implementing some kind of cryptographic application which has to manipulate very large numbers. We also need to explain what is the desired output. In this simple problem, it's simply the product x times y. So a quick digression. So back in third grade, around the same time I was learning this integer multiplication algorithm, I got a C in penmanship. And I don't think my handwriting has improved much since. Many people tell me, you know, by the end of the course, they think of it fondly as a sort of acquired taste. But if you're feeling impatient, please note there are typed versions of these slides, which I encourage you to use as you go through the lectures, if you don't want to take the time deciphering the handwriting. Returning to the integer multiplication problem, having now specified the problem precisely, the input, the desired output, we'll move on to discussing an algorithm that solves it, namely the same algorithm you learned in third grade. The way we will assess the performance of this algorithm is through the number of basic operations that it performs. And for the moment, let's think of a basic operation as simply adding two single-digit numbers together or multiplying two single-digit numbers. We're going to then move on to counting the number of these basic operations performed by the third grade algorithm as a function of the number n of digits in the input. Here is the integer multiplication algorithm that you learned back in third grade, illustrated on a concrete example. Let's take, say, the numbers 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, 6, 7, 8. As we go through this algorithm quickly, let me remind you that our focus should be on the number of basic operations this algorithm performs as a function of the length of the input numbers, which in this particular example is four digits long. So as you'll recall, we just compute one partial product for each digit of the second number. So we start by just multiplying four times the upper number, five, six, seven, eight. So, you know, 4 times 8 is 32, 2, carry the 3, 4 times 7 is 28, with the 3, that's 31, write down the 1, carry the 3, and so on. When we do the next partial product, we do a shift, effectively we add a 0 at the end, and then we just do exactly the same thing, and so on for the final two partial products. And finally, we just add everything up. What you probably realized back in third grade is that this algorithm is what we would call correct. That is, no matter what integers x and y you start with, if you carry out this procedure, this algorithm, and all of your intermediate computations are done properly, then the algorithm will eventually terminate with the product x times y of the two input numbers. You're never going to get a wrong answer. You're always going to get the actual product. What you probably didn't think about was the amount of time needed to carry this algorithm out to its conclusion, to termination. That is, the number of basic operations, additions or multiplications of single-digit numbers needed before finishing. So let's now quickly give an informal analysis of the number of operations required as a function of the input length n. Let's begin with the first partial product, the top row. How did we compute this number 22,712? Well, we multiplied 4 times each of the numbers 5, 6, 7, and 8. So that was 4 basic operations, one for each digit of the top number, plus we had to do these carries, so those were some extra additions. But in any case, this is at most twice times the number of digits in the first number, at most 2n basic operations, to form this first partial product. 
And if you think about it, there's nothing special about the first partial product. The same argument says that we need at most two n operations to form each of the partial products, of which there are again n, one for each digit of the second number. Well, if we need at most two n operations to compute each partial product, and we have n partial products, that's a total of at most two n squared operations to form all of these blue numbers, all of the partial products. Now, we're not done at that point. We still have to add all of those up to get the final answer, in this case, 7,006,652. And that final addition requires a comparable number of operations, roughly another, say, 2n squared at most operations. So the upshot, the high-level point that I want you to focus on is that as we think about the input numbers getting bigger and bigger, that is, as a function of n, the number of digits in the input numbers, the number of operations that the grade school multiplication algorithm performs grows like some constant, roughly 4, say, times n squared. That is, it's quadratic in the input length n. For example, if you double the size of the input, if you double the number of digits in each of the two integers that you're given, then the number of operations you will have to perform using this algorithm has to go up by a factor of four. Similarly, if you quadruple the input length, the number of operations go is going to go up by a factor of 16 and so on. Now, depending on what type of third grader you were, you might well have accepted this procedure as the unique or at least the optimal way of multiplying two numbers together to form their product. Now, if you want to be a serious algorithm designer, that kind of obedient timidity is a quality you're going to have to grow out of. An early and extremely important textbook on the design and analysis of algorithms was by Aho, Hockcroft, and Ullman. It's about 40 years old now. And there's the following quote, which I absolutely adore. So after iterating through a number of the algorithm design paradigms covered in the textbook, they say the following. Perhaps the most important principle of all for the good algorithm designer is to refuse to be content. And I think this is a spot on comment. I might summarize it a little bit more succinctly as as an algorithm designer, you should adopt as your mantra the question, can we do better? This question is particularly apropos when you're faced with a naive or straightforward solution to a computational problem, like, for example, the third grade algorithm for integer multiplication. A question you perhaps did not ask yourself in third grade was, can we do better than the straightforward multiplication algorithm and now is the time for an answer. If you want to multiply two integers, is there a better method than the one we learned back in third grade? To give you the final answer to this question, you'll have to wait until I provide you with a toolbox for analyzing divide and conquer algorithms a few lectures hence. What I want to do in this lecture is convince you that the algorithm design space is surprisingly rich. There are certainly other interesting methods of multiplying two integers beyond what we learned in third grade. And the highlight of this lecture will be something called Karatsuba multiplication. Let me introduce you to Karatsuba multiplication through a concrete example. I'm going to take the same pair of integers we studied last lecture, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. I'm going to execute a sequence of steps resulting in their product. But that sequence of steps is going to look very different than the one we undertook during the grade school algorithm, yet we'll arrive at exactly the same answer. The sequence of steps will strike you as very mysterious. It'll seem like I'm pulling a rabbit out of a hat. In the rest of this video, we'll develop more systematically what exactly this Karatsuba multiplication method is and why it works. But what I want you to appreciate already on this slide is that the algorithm design space is far richer than you might expect. There's a dazzling array of options for how to actually solve problems like integer multiplication. Let me begin by introducing some notation for the first and second halves of the input numbers x and y. So the first half of x, that is 56, 
we're going to regard as a number in its own right called A. Similarly, B will be 78, C will be 12, and D will be 34. I'm going to do a sequence of operations involving only these double-digit numbers A, B, C, and D. And then after a few such operations, I will collect all of the terms together in a magical way, resulting in the product of X and Y. First, let me compute the product of A times C and also the product of B times D. I'm going to skip the elementary calculations and just tell you the answer. So you can verify that A times C is 672, whereas B times D is 2,652. Next, I'm going to do something uh, even still more inscrutable. I'm going to take the sum of A and B, I'm going to take the sum of C and D, and then I'm going to compute the product of those two sums. That boils down to computing the product of 134 and 46, namely 6,164. Now, I'm going to subtract our first two products from the results of this computation. That is, I'm going to take 6,164, subtract 2,652, and subtract 672. You should check that if you subtract the results of the first two steps from the result of the third step, you get 2,840. Now, I claim that I can take the results of steps 1, 2, and 4 and combine them in a super simple way to produce the product of X and Y. Here's how I do it. I start with the first product, AC, and I pad it with four zeros. I take the result of the second step and I don't pad it with any zeros at all. And I take the result of the fourth step and I pad it with two zeros. If we add up these three quantities from right to left, we get two, five, six, six, zero, zero, seven. If you go back to the previous lecture, you'll note that this is exactly the same output as the grade school algorithm. That is, this is in fact the product of one, two, three, four, and five, six, seven, eight. So let me reiterate that you should not have any intuition for the computations I just did. You should not understand what just went down on this slide. Rather, I hope you feel some mixture of bafflement and intrigue. But more to the point, I hope you appreciate that the third grade algorithm is not the only game in town. There's fundamentally different algorithms for multiplying integers than what you learned as a kid. Once you realize that, once you realize how rich the space of algorithms is, you have to wonder, can we do better than that third grade algorithm? In fact, does this algorithm already do better than the third grade algorithm? Before I explain full-blown Karatsuba multiplication, let me begin by explaining a simpler, more straightforward recursive approach to integer multiplication. Now, I am assuming you have a bit of programming background, in particular that you know what recursive algorithms are. That is, algorithms which invoke themselves as a subroutine with a smaller input. So, how might you approach the integer multiplication problem recursively? Well, the input are two digits, each, uh, two numbers, each has n digits. So, to call the algorithm recursively, we need to form inputs that have smaller size, less digits. Well, we already were doing that in the computations on the previous slide. For example, the number 5678, we treated the first half of the digits 56 as a number in its own right, and similarly 78. In general, given a number x with n digits, it can be expressed decomposed uh, in terms of two and over two digit numbers, namely as a, the first half of the digits shifted appropriately, that is multiplied by 10 raised to the power n over 2, plus the second half of the digits b. In our example, we had a equal to 56, 78 was b, n was 4, so 10 to the n over 2 was 100, and then c and d were 12 and 34. What I want to do next is illuminate the relevant recursive calls. To do that, let's look at the product x times y, express it in terms of these smaller numbers a, b, c, and d, and do an elementary computation. Multiplying the expanded versions of x and y, we get an expression with three terms, one shifted by 10 raised to the power n, and the coefficient there is a times c. We have a term that's shifted by 10 to the n over 2, and that has a coefficient of a, d, and also plus b, c. And bringing up the rear, we have the term b times d. 
We're going to be referring to this expression a number of times, so let me both circle it and just give it a shorthand. We're going to call this expression star. One detail I'm glossing over for simplicity is that I've assumed that n is an even integer. Now, if n is an odd integer, you can apply this exact same recursive approach to integer multiplication in the straightforward way. So if n was 9, then you would decompose one of these input numbers into, say, the first five digits and the latter four digits, and you would proceed in exactly the same way. Now, the point of expression star is if we look at it, despite being the product of just elementary algebra, it suggests a recursive approach to multiplying two numbers. If we care about the product of x and y, why not instead compute this expression star, which involves only the products of smaller numbers, a, b, c, and d. You'll notice, staring at the expression star, there are four relevant products, each involving a pair of these smaller numbers, namely a, c, AD, BC, and BD. So why not compute each of those four products recursively? After all, the inputs will be smaller. And then once our four recursive calls come back to us with the answer, we can formulate the rest of expression star in the obvious way. We just pad A times C with N zeros at the end. We add up A, D, and B, C using the grade school algorithm and pad the result with N over two zeros. And then we just sum up these three terms again using the grade school addition algorithm. So the one detail missing that I've glossed over required to turn this idea into a bona fide recursive algorithm would be to specify a base case. As I hope you all know, recursive algorithms need a base case. If the input is sufficiently small, then you just immediately compute the answer rather than recursing further. Of course, recursive algorithms need a base case, so they don't keep calling themselves till the rest of time. So for integer multiplication, what's the base case? Well, if you're given two numbers that have just one digit each, then you just multiply them in one basic operation and return the result. So what I hope is clear at the moment is that there is indeed a recursive approach to solving the integer multiplication algorithm, resulting in an algorithm which looks quite different than the one you learned in third grade, but which nevertheless you could code up quite easily in your favorite programming language. Now what you shouldn't have any intuition about is whether or not this is a good idea or a completely crackpot idea. Is this algorithm faster or slower than the grade school algorithm? You'll just have to wait to find out the answer to that question. Let's now refine this recursive algorithm, resulting in the full-blown Karatsuba multiplication algorithm. To explain the optimization behind Karatsuba multiplication, let's recall the expression we were calling star on the previous slide. So this just expressed the product of x and y in terms of the smaller numbers a, b, c, and d. In the straightforward recursive algorithm, we made four recursive calls to compute the four products which seemed necessary to, con value, to compute the expression star. But if you think about it, there's really only three quantities in star that we care about, the three relevant coefficients. We care about the numbers AD and BC not per se, but only in as much as we care about their sum, AD plus BC. So this motivates the question, if there's only three quantities that we care about, can we get away with only three rather than four recursive calls? It turns out that we can, and here's how we do it. The first coefficient AC and the third coefficient BD we compute exactly as before, recursively. Next, rather than recursively computing AD or BC, we're going to recursively compute the product of A plus B and C plus D. If we expand this out, this is the same thing as computing AC plus AD plus BC plus BD. Now here is the key observation in Karatsuba multiplication, and it's really a trick that goes back to the early 19th century mathematician Gauss. Let's look at the quantity we computed in step three and subtract from it the two quantities that we already computed in steps one and two. Subtracting out the result of step one cancels the AC term. Subtracting out the result of step two cancels out the BD term, leaving us with exactly what we wanted all along, the middle coefficient AD plus BC. 
And now, in the same way that on the previous slide we had a straightforward recursive algorithm making four recursive calls and then combining them in the obvious way, here we have a straightforward recursive algorithm that makes only three recursive calls and on top of the recursive calls does just grade school addition and subtraction. So you do this particular difference between the three recursive, recursively computed products and then you do the shifts, the padding by zeros, and the final sum as before. So that's pretty cool, and this kind of showcases the ingenuity which bears fruit even in the simplest imaginable computational problems. Now, you should still be asking the question, you know, is this crazy algorithm, is it really faster than the grade school algorithm that we learned in third grade? Totally not obvious. We will answer that question a few lectures hence, and we'll answer it as a special case of an entire toolbox I'll provide you with to analyze the running time of so-called divide-and-conquer algorithms like Karatsuba multiplication. So stay tuned. Okay, so in this video, we'll get our first sense of what it's actually like to analyze an algorithm. And we'll do that by, first of all, reviewing a, a famous sorting algorithm, namely the merge sort algorithm, and then giving a really fairly mathematically precise uh, upper bound on exactly how many operations the merge sort algorithm requires to correctly sort an input array. So I feel like I should begin with a bit of an apology. Here we are in 2012, a very futuristic sounding date, and yet I'm beginning with a really quite ancient algorithm. So for example, merge sort was certainly known uh, to John von Neumann all the way back in 1945. So uh, what justification do I have for beginning you know, a modern class and algorithms with such an old example? Well, there's a bunch of reasons. One I haven't even put down on the slide, which is like a number of the algorithms we'll see, merge sort is an oldie but a goodie. So it's over 60 or maybe even 70 years old, but it's still used all the time in practice. Okay, so this really is one of the methods of choice uh, for sorting. It's the standard sorting algorithm in a number of uh, programming libraries. So that's the first reason. Uh, but there's a number of others as well that I want to be explicit about. Um, so first of all, Throughout these online courses, we'll see a number of general algorithm design paradigms, ways of solving problems that cut across different uh, application domains. And the first one we're going to focus on is called the divide and conquer algorithm design paradigm. So in divide and conquer, the idea is you take a problem, you break it down into smaller subproblems, which you then solve recursively, and then you somehow combine the results of the smaller subproblems to get a solution to the original problem that you actually cared about. And merge sort is some, still, to this day, perhaps the most transparent application of the divide and conquer paradigm. It'll just be very clear what the paradigm is, uh, what analysis challenges it presents, and what kind of benefits you might derive. As far as the benefits, so for example, you're probably all familiar with the sorting problem. Probably you know some number of sorting algorithms, perhaps including merge sort itself. And merge sort is better than a lot of the sort of simpler, I would say more obvious sorting algorithms. So for example, three other sorting algorithms that you might well know about, but that I'm not going to discuss here. If you don't know them, I encourage you to you know, look them up in a textbook or look them up on the web. But so three sorting algorithms, which are perhaps simpler, first of all, is selection sort. So this is where you do a number of passes through your way, repeatedly identifying uh, the minimum of the elements that you haven't looked at yet. So you do basically a linear number of passes each time doing a minimum computation. There's insertion sort, which is still useful in certain cases in practice, as we'll discuss. But again, it's generally not as good as merge sort, where you repeatedly you just maintain the invariant that the prefix of the array is a sorted version of those elements. So after 10 loops of insertion sort, you'll have the invariant that whatever the first 10 elements of the array are, they're going to be in sorted order. And then when insertion sort completes, uh, you have an entire sorted array. Finally, some of you may know about bubble sort. This is where you identify adjacent uh, pairs of elements which are out of order, and you, you do repeated swaps until, in the end, the array is completely sorted. Again, I just say this to jog your memory. These are simpler, so simpler sorts than merge sort, but all of them are worse in the sense that they all have performance in general, which scales uh, with n squared when the input array has n elements. So they all have, in some sense, quadratic running time. But if we use this non-trivial divide and conquer approach, or non-obvious uh, approach, we'll get, a, as we'll see, a much better running time than this quadratic dependence on the input. Okay, so we'll get a win for sorting uh, in divide and conquer, and merge sort is the algorithm that realizes that benefit. 
So a second reason that I want to start out by talking about the merge sort algorithm is to help you calibrate your preparation. I think the discussion we're about to have will give you a good signal for whether your background's at about the right level uh, of the audience that I'm thinking about for this course. So in particular, when I describe the merge sort algorithm, you'll notice that I'm not going to describe it in a level of detail that you could just translate it line by line into a working program in some programming language. My assumption, again, is that you're a solid enough programmer that you can take the high-level idea of the algorithm how it works, and you're perfectly capable about tra of, uh, turning that into a working program in whatever language uh, you see fit. So hopefully, I, I don't, you know, it may not be easy, the analysis of merge sort or the discussion of merge sort, but I hope that you find it at least relatively straightforward, because as the course moves on, we're going to be discussing algorithms and analyses which are a bit more complicated uh, than the one we're about to do with merge sort. So in other words, I think this will be a good warm-up uh, for what's to come. Now, another reason I want to discuss merge sort is that our analysis of it will naturally segue into discussion of how we analyze algorithms in this course and in general. So we're going to expose a couple of assumptions in our analysis. We'll focus on worst case behavior. We'll look for guarantees on performance, on running time that hold for every possible input of a given size. And it will also expose our focus on so-called asymptotic analysis, meaning we'll be much more concerned with the rate of growth of an algorithm's performance than on things like lower order terms uh, or on small changes in the constant factors. Finally, uh, we'll do uh, the analysis of merge sort using what's called a recursion tree method. So this is a way of counting up the total number of operations uh, that are executed by an algorithm. And as we'll see a little bit later, this recursion tree method generalizes greatly and it will allow us to analyze lots of different recursive algorithms, lots of different divide and conquer algorithms, including the integer multiplication algorithm that we discussed uh, in an earlier segment. So those are the reasons to start out with merge sort. So what is the computational problem that merge sort is meant to solve? Well, uh, presumably you all know about the sorting problem, but let me tell you a little bit about it anyways, just so that we're all on the same page. So we're given as input uh, an array of n numbers in arbitrary order. And the goal, of course, is to produce an output array where the numbers are in sorted order. Let's say from smallest to largest. Okay, so for example, we could consider the following input array. And then the goal would be to produce the following output array. Now, one quick comment. Uh, you'll notice that here in the input array, it had eight elements, and all of them were distinct. It was the different integers between one and eight. Now, the sorting problem really isn't any harder uh, if you have duplicates. In fact, it can even be easier. But to keep the discussion as simple as possible, let's just, among friends, go ahead and assume that they're distinct for the purpose of this lecture. And I'll leave it as an exercise, which I encourage you to do, which is to think about how the merge sort algorithm uh, implementation and analysis would be different, if at all, if there were ties. Okay, but we'll go ahead and make the distinctness assumption uh, for simplicity from here on out. Okay, so before I write down any pseudocode for merge sort, let me just uh, show you how the algorithm works using a picture, and I think it'll be pretty clear what the code would be, even just given a single example. So let's go ahead and consider the same unsorted input array that we had on the previous slide. So the merge sort algorithm is a recursive algorithm, and again, that means that it's a program which calls itself, uh, and it calls itself on smaller subproblems of the same form. Okay, so the merge sort is its, its purpose in life is to sort the given input array. So it's going to spawn off calls of itself on smaller arrays, and this is going to be a canonical divide and conquer application where we simply take the input array, we split it in half, we solve the left half recursively, we solve the right half recursively and then we combine the results. So let's look at that in the picture. So the first recursive call gets the first four elements, the left half of the array, namely 5, 4, 1, and 8, and of course the other recursive call is going to get the rest of the elements, 7, 2, 6, and 3. You can imagine these as being copied into new arrays before they are given to the recursive calls. Now by the magic of recursion, or by induction if you like, the recursive calls will do their task. They will correctly sort each of these arrays of four elements, and we'll get back sorted versions of them. So from our first recursive call, we receive the output 1458, and from the second recursive call, we receive the sorted output 2367. So now all that remains to complete merge sort is to take the two results of our recursive calls, these two sorted elements of length 4, and combine them to produce the final output, namely the sorted array of all eight of the input numbers. And this is the step which is called the merge. 
And hopefully you already are thinking about how you might actually implement this merge in a computationally efficient way, but I do owe you some more details, and I will tell you exactly how the merge is done. In effect, you just walk pointers down each of the two sorted subarrays, copying over, populating the output array in sorted order. But I will give you some more details in just a, in just a slide or two. So that's merge short in a picture. Split it in half, solve recursively, and then have some slick merging procedure to combine the two results into a sorted output. Okay, so let's move on and actually discuss the pseudocode for the merge sort algorithm. First, let me just tell you the pseudocode, leaving aside exactly how the merging subroutine is implemented. And thus, high level should be very simple and clear at this point. So there's going to be two recursive calls, and then there's going to be a merging step. Now, I owe you a, a few comments because I'm being a little sloppy. Again, as I promised, this isn't something you would directly translate into code, although it's pretty close. But so what are a couple of the ways that I'm being sloppy? Well, first of all, there's, you know, in any recursive algorithm, you've got to have some base cases. You've got to have this idea that when the input's sufficiently small, you don't do any recursion, you just return some trivial answer. So in the sorting problem, the base case would be if you're handed an array that has either zero or one elements, well, it's already sorted, there's nothing to do, so you just return it without any recursion. Okay, so to be clear, I haven't written down the base cases, although of course you would if you were actually implementing merge sort, so let me make a note of that. A couple other things I'm ignoring, I'm ignoring what, what, uh, what to do if the array has odd length, so if it has, say, nine elements, obviously you have to somehow break that into five and four or four and five, so you would do that just in either way and that would be fine. Uh, and then secondly, I'm ignoring the details of what it really means to sort of recursively sort. So for example, I'm not discussing exactly how you would pass these subarrays onto the recursive calls. That's something that really would depend somewhat on the programming language. So that's exactly what I want to avoid. I really want to talk about the concepts which transcend any particular programming language uh, implementation. So that's why I'm going to describe uh, algorithms at, at this level. Okay. All right, so the hard part, uh, relatively speaking, then, is how do you implement the merge step? The recursive calls have done their work. We have these two sorted subarrays of uh, half the numbers, the left half and the right half. How do we combine them into one? And in English, I already told you on the last slide, the idea is you just populate the output array in sorted order by traversing pointers or just traversing through the two uh, sorted subarrays in parallel. So let's look at that in some more detail. Okay, so here is the pseudocode for the merge step. So let me begin by introducing some names for the characters in uh, what we're about to discuss. Uh, so let's use C to denote the output array. So this is what we're supposed to spit out with the numbers in sorted order. And then I'm going to use A and B to denote the results of the two recursive calls. Okay, so the first recursive call has given us array A, which contains the left half of the input array in sorted order. Similarly, B contains the right half of the input array, again, in sorted order. So as I said, we're going to need to traverse the two uh, sorted subarrays A and B in parallel. So I'm going to introduce a counter, I, to traverse through A, J, to traverse through B. I and J will both be initialized to 1 to be at the beginning of their respective arrays. And now we're going to do we're going to do a single pass through the output array, populating it in increasing order, always taking the smallest from the union of the two sorted subarrays. And if, you, if there's one idea in this merge step, it's just the realization that the minimum element that you haven't yet looked at in A and B has to be at the front of one of the two lists. Right? So, for example, at the very beginning of the algorithm, where is the minimum element overall? Well, whichever of the two arrays it lands in, A or B, it has to be the smallest one there. Okay, so the smallest element overall is either the smallest element in A or it's the smallest element in B. So you just check both places, the smaller one's the smallest, you copy it over, and you repeat, and that's it. So the purpose of K is just to traverse the output array from left to right. That's the order we're going to populate it. We're currently looking at position I in the first array and position J in the second array. So that's how far we've gotten, how deeply we've probed into both of those two arrays. We look at which one has the current smallest and we copy the smallest one over. Okay, so if the, if, uh, the entry in the i-th position of A is smaller, we copy that one over. Of course, we have to increment i, we probe one deeper into the list A, and symmetrically for the case where the current position in B has the smaller element. Now again, I'm being a little bit sloppy so that we can focus on the forest and not sort of uh, and not get bogged down with the trees, I'm ignoring some end cases. So if you really wanted to implement this, you'd have to add a little bit uh, to keep track of when you fall off uh, either A or B. Okay, so you'd have additional checks for when I or J reaches the end of the array, at which point you'd copy over all the remaining elements into C. All right, so I'm going to give you a cleaned up version of uh, that pseudocode so that you don't have to tolerate my questionable handwriting any longer than is absolutely necessary. This, again, is just the same thing that we wrote on the last slide, okay? the pseudocode for the merge step. Now, so that's the merge sort algorithm. 
Now let's get to the meaty part of this lecture, which is, okay, so Merge Short produces a uh, sorted array. What makes it, if anything, better than much simpler non-divide and conquer algorithms like, say, insertion sort? In other words, what is the running time of the Merge Short algorithm? Now, I'm not going to give you a completely precise def definition of what I mean by running time, and there's good reason for that, as we'll discuss shortly. But intuitively, you should think of the running time of an algorithm. You should imagine that you're just running the algorithm in a debugger. Okay? And every time you press enter, you advance one line in the program through the debugger, and then basically the running time is just the number of operations executed, the number of lines of code is executed. So the question is, how many times do you have to hit enter on your debugger before the uh, program finally terminates? So we're interested in how many such uh, lines, of, lines of code get executed for a merge sort when the input array has n numbers. Okay, so that's a fairly complicated question. So let's start with a more modest goal. Rather than thinking about the number of operations executed by merge sort, which is this crazy recursive algorithm which is calling itself over and over and over again, let's just think about how many operations are going to get executed when we do a single merge of two sorted subarrays. That seems like it should be an easier place to start. So let me remind you the pseudocode of the merge subroutine. Here it is. So let's just go and count up how many operations that are, going to, are going to get used. So there's the initialization step. Uh, so let's say that I'm going to charge us um, one operation for each of these two initializations. So let's call this two operations to set i equal one and j equal one. Then we have this for loop. So clearly the for loop executes a total number of n times. So in each of these n iterations of this for loop, how many instructions get executed? Well, we have one here. We have a comparison. So we compare ai to bj. And either way the comparison comes up, we then do two more operations. We do an assignment here or here. And then we do an increment of the relevant variable, either here or here. So that's going to be three operations per iteration. And then maybe I'll also say that uh, in order to increment k, uh, we're going to call it a fourth iteration. Okay, so for each of these n iterations of the for loop, we're going to do four operations. All right. So putting it all together, what do we have is the running time for merge. So let's say the upshot. So the upshot is that the running time of the merge subroutine, given an array of m numbers, is at most 4m plus 2. So a couple of comments. First of all, I've changed a letter on you, so don't get confused. In the previous slide, uh, we were thinking about an input size of uh, n. Here, I've just made it. I've changed the name of the variable to m. That's going to be convenient once we think about merge sort, which is recursing on smaller subproblems. But it's exactly the same thing, m, n, whatever. So an array of m entries that does at most 4m plus 2 lines of code. The second thing is there's some ambiguity in exactly how we counted lines of code on the previous slot. So maybe you might argue that um, you know, really each loop iteration should count as two operations, not just one, because you don't just have to increment k, but you also have to compare it to the uh, upper bound of n. Yeah, maybe. Would have been 5m plus 2 instead of 4m plus 2. So it turns out these small differences in how you count up uh, the number of lines of code executed are not going to matter, and we'll see why shortly. So amongst friends, let's just agree, let's call it 4m plus 2 operations for merge uh, to execute on an array of exactly m entries. So let me abuse our friendship now a little bit further with an inequality which is true but extremely sloppy. But I promise it'll make our lives just easier in some future calculations. So rather than 4m plus 2, this 2 sort of getting on my nerves, let's just call this at most 6m because m is at least 1. Okay. You have to admit, it's true, 6m always is at least 4m plus 2. It's very sloppy. These numbers are not anything close to each other for m large, but let's just go ahead and be sloppy in the interests of future simplicity. Okay. Now, I don't expect anyone to be impressed with this rather crude upper bound and the number of lines of code that the merge subroutine needs to finish, to execute. The key question, you recall, was how many lines of code does merge sort require? to correctly sort the input array, not just this subroutine. And in fact, analyzing merge sort seems a lot more intimidating because it keeps spawning off these recursive versions of itself. So the number of recursive calls, the number of things we have to analyze, is blowing up exponentially as we think about various levels of the recursion. Now, if there's one thing that we have going for us, it's that every time we make a recursive call, it's on a quite a bit smaller input than what we started with. It's on an array of only half the size 
of the input array. So there's some kind of tension between, on the one hand, uh, explosion of subproblems, a proliferation of subproblems, and the fact that successive subproblems only have to solve smaller and smaller subproblems. And res resolving these two forces is what's going to drive our analysis of merge sort. So the good news is, is I'll be able to show you a complete analysis of exactly how many lines of code merge sort takes, and I'll be able to give you, an, in fact, a very precise upper bound. Okay, so here's going to be the claim that we're going to prove in the remainder of this lecture. So the claim is that merge sort never needs more than 6 times n times the logarithm of n, log base 2, if you're keeping track, plus an extra 6n operations to correctly sort an input array of n numbers. Okay, so let's discuss for a second, is this good? Is this a win, knowing that uh, this is an upper bound on the number of lines of code that merge sort takes? Well, yes, it is, and it shows uh, the benefits of the divide and conquer paradigm. Recall, uh, in the simpler sorting methods that we briefly discussed, like insertion sort, selection sort, and bubble sort, I claimed that their performance was governed by a quadratic function of the input size. That is, they need a constant times n squared number of operations to sort an input array of length n. Merge sort, by contrast, needs at most a constant times n times log n. Not n squared, but n times log n lines of code to correctly sort an input array. So to get a feel for what kind of win this is, let me just remind you, for those of you that are rusty or for whatever reason have lived in fear of the logarithm, just exactly what the logarithm is. Okay? So the way to think about the logarithm is as follows. So you have the x-axis, or you have n, which is going from 1 up to infinity. And uh, for comparison, let's think about just the identity function. Okay? So the function which is just f of n equals n. Okay? And let's contrast this with a logarithm. So what is the logarithm? Well, for our purposes, we can just think of the logarithm as follows. Okay? So the log of n, log base 2 of n, is you type the number n into your calculator. Okay? Then you hit divide by 2. And then you keep repeating dividing by 2. And you count how many times you divide by 2 until you get a number that drops below 1. Okay? So if you plug in 32, you've got to divide 5 times by 2 to get down to 1. Log base 2 of 32 is 5. If you put in 1,024, you have to divide by 2 10 times until you get down to 1. So log base 2 of 10,024 is 10, and so on. Okay? So the point is, you can already see this, if log of 1,000, roughly, is something like 10, then the logarithm is much, much smaller than the input. Okay? So graphically, uh, what the logarithm is going to look like is it's going to look like a curve which becomes very flat very quickly as n grows large. Okay, so f of n being log base 2 of n. And I encourage you to do this perhaps a little more precisely on a computer or a graphing calculator uh, at home. But log is growing much, much, much slower than the identity function. And as a result, a uh, sorting algorithm which runs in time proportional to n times log n is much, much faster, especially as n grows large, than a sorting algorithm with a running time that's a constant times n squared. In this video, we'll be giving a running time analysis of the merge sort algorithm. In particular, we'll be substantiating the claim that the recursive divide and conquer merge sort algorithm is better, has better performance than simpler sorting algorithms that you might know, like insertion sort, selection sort, uh, and bubble sort. So in particular, the goal of this lecture will be to ma mathematically argue the following claim from an earlier video, that in order to sort an array of n numbers, the merge sort algorithm needs no more than a constant times n log n operations. That's the maximum number of lines of, ex of code it will ever execute, specifically 6 times n log n plus 6n operations. So, how are we going to prove this claim? We're going to use what is called a recursion tree method. The idea of the recursion tree method is to write out all of the work done by the recursive merge sort algorithm in a tree structure, with the children of a given node corresponding to the recursive calls made by that node. The point of this tree structure is it will facilitate an uh, interesting way to count up the overall work done by the algorithm, and will greatly facilitate uh, the analysis. So specifically, what is this tree? So at level 0, we have a root. And this corresponds to the outer call of merge sort. Okay, So I'm going to call this level 0. Now this tree is going to be binary in recognition of the fact that each invocation of merge sort makes two recursive calls. So the two children will correspond to the two recursive calls 
of Merchor. So at the root, we operate on the entire input array. So let me draw a big array indicating that. And at level one, we have one subproblem for the left half and another subproblem for the right half of the input array. And I'll call these first two recursive calls uh, level one. Now, of course, each of these two level one recursive calls will themselves make two recursive calls, each operating on then a quarter of the original input array. So those are the level two recursive calls, of which there are four, and this process will continue until eventually the recursion bottoms out in base cases when there's only an array of size zero or one. So now I have a question for you, which I'll, I'll give you in the form of a quiz, which is at the bottom of this recursion tree corresponding to the base cases, what is the level number at the bottom? So what, at what level do the leaves in this tree reside? Okay, so hopefully you guess, correctly guess that the uh, answer is the second one. So namely that uh, the number of levels of the recursion tree is essentially logarithmic in the size of the input array. The reason is basically that the input size is being decreased by a factor two with each level of the recursion. If you have an input size of n at the outer level, then each of the first set of recursive calls operates on an array of size n over two. At level two, each array has size n over four and so on. Where does the recursion bottom out? Well, down at the base cases where there's no more recursion, which is where the input array has size one or less. So in other words, the number of levels of recursion is exactly the number of times you need to divide n by two until you get down to a number that's most one. And recall that's exactly the definition of the logarithm base two of n. So since the first level is level zero and the last level is level log base two of n, the total number of levels uh, is actually log base two of n plus one. And when I write down this expression, I'm here assuming that n is a, is a power of 2, which is not a big deal. I mean, the analysis is easily extended to the case where n is not a power of 2. But this way, we don't have to think about fractions. Log base 2 of n, then, is an integer. Okay, so let's return to the recursion tree. Let me just redraw it really quick. So again, down here at the bottom of the tree, we have the leaves i.e. the base cases where there's no more recursion, which when n is a power of 2, correspond exactly uh, to single element arrays. So that's the recursion tree corresponding to an indication of merge sort, and the motivation for writing down, uh, for organizing the work performed by merge sort in this way, is it allows us to count up the work level by level. And we'll see that that's a particularly convenient way to account for all of the different lines of code that get executed. Now, to see that in more detail, I need to ask you to identify a particular pattern. So first of all, the first question is, at a given level j of this recursion, exactly how many distinct subproblems are there as a function of the level j? That's the first question. The second question is, for each of those distinct subproblems at level j, what is the input size? So what is the size of the, of the array which is passed to a subproblem residing at level j of this recursion tree? So the correct answer is the third one. So first of all, at a given level j, there's precisely two to the j distinct subproblems. There's one outermost subproblem at level zero. It has two recursive calls. Those are the two uh, subproblems at level one, and so on. In general, since merge short calls itself twice, the number of subproblems is doubling each level. So that gives us the expression two to the j for the number of subproblems at level j. On the other hand, by a similar argument, the input size is halving each time. With each recursive call, you pass it half of the input that you were given. So at each level of the recursion tree, uh, we're seeing half of the input size of the previous level. So after j levels, since we started with an input size of n, after j levels, each subproblem will be operating on an array of length n over 2 to the j. Okay, so now let's put this pattern to use and actually count up all of the lines of code that merge sort executes. And as I said before, the key, the key idea is to count up the work level by level. Now to be clear, when I talk about the amount of work done at level J, uh, what I'm talking about is the work done by those two to the J invocations of merge sort, not counting their respective recursive calls, not counting work which is gonna get done in the recursion lower in the tree. Now recall, merge sort is a very simple algorithm. It just has three lines of code. First, there's a recursive call, so we're not counting that. Second, there's another recursive call. Again, we're not counting that at level J. And then third, we just invoke the merge subroutine. So really, outside the recursive calls, all that merge sort does is a single indication of merge. Further, recall we already have a good understanding of the number of lines of code that merge needs. On an input of size m, it's going to use at most 6m lines of code. That's an analysis that we did 
in the previous video. So let's fix a level J. We know how many subproblems there are, 2 to the J. We know the size of each subproblem, n over 2 to the j, and we know how much work merge needs on such an input. We just multiply by 6, and then we just multiply it out, and we get the amount of work done at a level j, okay, at all of the level j subproblems. So here it is in more detail. All right, so we start with just the number of different subproblems at level j, and we just noticed that that was at most 2 to the j. We also observed that each level J subproblem is passed an, in, an array as input, which has length n over 2 to the J. And we know that the merge subroutine, when given an input, uh, given an array of size n over 2 to the J, will execute at most six times that many number of lines of code. So to compute the total amount of work done at level J, we just multiply the number of problems times the work done surproblem, per subproblem, and then something sort of remarkable happens. We get this cancellation of the two 2 to the Js, and we get an upper bound, 6n, which is independent of the level j. So we do at most 6n operations at the root. We do at most 6n operations at level 1, at level 2, and so on. Okay, it's independent of the level. Morally, the reason this is happening is because of a perfect equilibrium between two competing forces. First of all, the number of subproblems is doubling with each level of the recursion tree, but secondly, the amount of work that we do per subproblem is halving with each uh, level of the recursion tree. Since those two cancel out, we get an upper bound 6n, which is independent of the level j. Now, here's why that's so cool, right? We don't really care about the amount of work just at a given level. We care about the amount of work that merge sort does ever at any level. But if we have a bound on the amount of work at a level, which is independent of the level, then our overall bound is really easy. What do we do? We just take the number of levels, and we know what that is. It's exactly log base 2 of n plus 1. Remember, the levels are 0 through log base 2 of n inclusive. And then we have an upper bound 6n for each of those log n plus 1 levels. So if we expand out this quantity, we get exactly the upper bound that was claimed earlier, namely that the number of operations merge sort executes is at most 6n times log base 2 of n plus 6n. So that, my friends, is a running time analysis of the merge sort algorithm. That's why its running time is bounded by a constant times n log n, which, especially as n grows large, is far superior to the more simple iterative algorithms like insertion or selection sort. Having completed our first analysis of an algorithm, namely an upper bound on the running time of the merge sort algorithm, what I want to do next is take a step back and be explicit about three assumptions, three biases that we made when we did this analysis of merge sort and interpreted the results. These three assumptions we will adopt as guiding principles for how to reason about algorithms and how to define a so-called fast algorithm for the rest of the course. So the first guiding principle is that we used what's often called worst case analysis. By worst case analysis, I simply mean that our upper bound of 6n log n plus 6n applies to the number of lines of executed for every single input array of length n. We made absolutely no assumptions about the input, where it comes from, what it looks like, beyond what the input length n was. Put differently, if hypothetically we had some adversary whose sole purpose in life was to concoct some malevolent input designed to make our algorithm run as slow as possible, the worst this adversary could do uh, is upper bounded by this same number, 6n log n plus 6n. Now, this so sort of worst case guarantee popped out so naturally from our analysis of merge sort, you might well be wondering, what else could you do? Well, two other methods of analysis, which do have their place, although we won't really discuss them in this course, are quote-unquote average case analysis and also the use of a set of pre-specified benchmarks. By average case analysis, I mean you analyze the average running time of an algorithm under some assumption about the relative frequencies of different inputs. So, for example, in the sorting problem, one thing you could do, although it's not what we did here, you could assume that every possible input array is equally likely and then analyze the average running time of an algorithm. By benchmarks, I just mean that one agrees up front about some set, say 10 or 20, uh, benchmark inputs which are thought to represent practical or typical inputs for the algorithm. Now, both average case analysis and benchmarks are useful in certain settings, but for them to make sense, you really have to have domain knowledge about your problem. You need to have some understanding of what inputs are more common than others, what inputs better represent typical inputs than others. By contrast, in worst case analysis, by definition, you're making absolutely no assumptions about where the input comes from. 
So as a result, worst case analysis is particularly appropriate for general purpose subroutines, subroutines that you design uh, without having any knowledge of how they will be used or what kind of inputs they will be used on. And happily, another bonus of doing worst case analysis, as we will in this course, it's usually mathematically much more tractable than trying to analyze the average performance of an algorithm under some distribution over inputs or to understand the detailed behavior of an algorithm on a particular set of benchmark inputs. This mathematical tractability was reflected in our merge sort analysis where we had no a priori goal of analyzing the worst case per se, but it's naturally what popped out of our reasoning about the algorithm's running time. The second and third guiding principles are closely related. The second one is that in this course, when we analyze algorithms, we won't worry unduly about small constant factors or lower order terms. We saw this philosophy at work very early on in our analysis of merge sort. When we discussed the number of lines of code that the merge subroutine requires, we first upper bounded it by 4m plus 2 for an array of length m, but then we said, ah, eh, let's just think about it as 6m instead. Let's have a simpler, sloppy upper bound and work with that. So that was already an example of not worrying about small changes in the constant factor. Now, the question you should be wondering about is, why do we do this, and can we really get away with it? So let me tell you about the justifications for this guiding principle. So the first motivation is clear, and we used it already in our merge sort analysis, which is it's simply way easier mathematically if we don't have to precisely pin down what the leading constant factors and lower order terms are. The second justification is a little less obvious, but is extremely important. So I claim that given the level at which we're describing and analyzing algorithms in this course, it would be totally inappropriate to obsess unduly about exactly what the constant factors are. Recall our discussion of the merge subroutine. So we wrote that subroutine down in pseudocode, and we gave an analysis of 4m plus 2 on the number of lines of code executed, given an input of length m. We also noted that it was somewhat ambiguous exactly how many lines of code we should count it as, depending on how you count loop increments, and so on. So even there, small constant factors could creep in given the underspecification of the pseudocode. Depending on how that pseudocode gets translated into an actual programming language, like C or Java, you'll see the number of lines of code deviate even further, not by a lot, but again by small constant factors. When such a program is then compiled down into machine code, you'll see even greater variance depending on the exact processor, the compiler, the compiler optimizations, the programming implementation, and so on. So to summarize, because we're going to describe algorithms at a level that transcends any particular programming language, it would be inappropriate to specify precise constants. The precise constants will ultimately be determined by more uh, machine-dependent aspects like who the programmer is, what the compiler is, what the processor is, and so on. And now the third justification is, frankly, we're just going to be able to get away with it. That is, one might be concerned that ignoring things like small constant factors leads us astray, that we wind up deriving results which suggest that an algorithm is fast when it's really slow in practice or vice versa. But for the problems that we discuss in this course, we'll get extremely accurate predictive power even though we won't be keeping track of low order terms and constant factors. When the mathematical analysis we do suggests that an algorithm is fast, indeed it will be. When it suggests that it's not fast, indeed that will be the case. So we lose a little bit of granularity of information, but we don't lose in what we really care about, which is accurate guidance about what algorithms are going to be faster than others. So the first two justifications, I think, are pretty self-evident. This third justification is more of an assertion, but it's one we'll be backing up over and over again as we proceed through this course. Now, don't get me wrong. I'm not saying constant factors aren't important in practice. Obviously, for crucial programs, the constant factors are hugely important. If you're running the sort of crucial loop for, you know, that your startup's survival depends on, by all means, optimize the constant like crazy. The point is just that understanding tiny constant factors in the analysis is an inappropriate level of granularity for the kind of algorithm analysis we're going to be doing in this course. Okay, let's move on to the third and final guiding principle. So the third principle is that we're going to use what's called asymptotic analysis, by which I mean we will focus on the case of large input sizes. The performance of an algorithm as the size n of the input grows large, that is, tends to infinity. Now, this focus on large input sizes was already evident when we interpreted our bound on merge sort. So how did we describe the bound on merge sort? We said, oh, well, it needs a number of operations proportional, a constant factor times, n log n. And we very cavalierly declared that this was better than any algorithm which has quadratic dependence of its running time on the number of operations. 
So for example, we argued that merge sort is a better, a faster algorithm than something like insertion sort without actually discussing the constant factors at all. So mathematically, we were saying the running time of merge sort, which we know we can represent as the function 6n log base 2 of n plus 6n, is better than any function which has a quadratic dependence on n, even one with a small constant, like let's say 1 half n squared, which might be roughly the running time of insertion sort. And this is a mathematical statement that is true if and only if n is sufficiently large. Once n grows large, it's certainly true that the expression on the left is smaller than the expression on the right, but for small n, the expression on the right is actually going to be smaller because of the smaller leading term. So in saying that merge sort is superior to insertion sort, the bias is that we're focusing on problems with large n. So the question you should have is, is that reasonable? Is that a justified assumption to focus on large input sizes? And the answer is certainly yes. So the reason we focus on large input sizes is because, frankly, those are the only problems which are, even, which are at all interesting. If all you need to do is sort 100 numbers, Use whatever method you want, and it's going to happen instantaneously on modern computers. You don't need to know, say, the divide and conquer paradigm if all you need to do is sort 100 numbers. So one thing you might be wondering is if, with computers getting faster all the time, according to Moore's law, if really it doesn't even matter to think about algorithmic analysis, if eventually all problem sizes will just be trivially solvable on super fast computers. But in fact, the opposite is true. Moore's law, with computers getting faster, actually says that our computational ambitions will naturally grow. We naturally focus on ever larger problem sizes, and the gulf between an n-squared algorithm and an n log n algorithm will become ever wider. A different way to think about it is in terms of how much bigger a problem size you can solve as computers get faster. If you're using an algorithm with a running time which is proportional to the input size, then if computers get faster by a factor of four, then you can solve problems which are a factor of four larger. Whereas if you're using an algorithm whose running time is proportional to the square of the input size, then if computers get faster by a factor of four, you can only solve double the problem size. And we'll see even starker examples of this gulf between different algorithmic approaches as time goes on. So to drive this point home, let me show you a couple of graphs. So what we're looking at here is we're looking at a graph of two functions. So the solid function is the upper bound that we proved on merge sort. So this is going to be 6n log base 2 of n plus 6n. And the dotted line is a estimate, a rather generous estimate about the running time of insertion sort, namely 1 half times n squared. And we see here in the graph exactly the behavior we discussed earlier, which is that for small n down here, in fact, because 1 half n squared has a smaller leading constant, it's actually a smaller function. And this is true up to this crossing point of maybe 90 or so. But then beyond n equal 90, the quadratic growth in the n squared term overwhelms the fact that it had a smaller constant and it starts being bigger than this other function, 6n log n plus 6n. So in the regime below 90, it's predicting that insertion sort will be better, and in the regime above 90, it's predicting that merge sort uh, will be faster. Now here's what's interesting. Let's scale the x-axis. Let's look well beyond this crossing point of 90. Let's just increase it in order of magnitude up to a raise of size 1500. And I want to emphasize these are still very small problem sizes. If all you need to do is sort a raise of size 1500, you really don't need to know divide and conquer or anything else I'll talk about. That's a pretty trivial problem on modern computers. So what we're seeing is that even for very modest problem sizes, here an array of, of uh, size, say, 1500, uh, the quadratic dependence in the insertion sort bound is more than dwarfing the fact uh, that it had a lower constant factor. So in this large regime, the gulf between the two algorithms is growing, and of course, if I increased it another 10x or 100x or 1000x to get to genuinely interesting problem sizes, the gap between these two algorithms would be even bigger. It would be huge. That said, I'm not saying you should be completely ignorant of constant factors when you implement algorithms. It's still good to have a general sense of what these constant factors are. So for example, in highly tuned versions of merge sort, which you'll find in many programming li libraries, in fact, because of the difference in constant factors, the algorithm will actually switch from merge sort over to insertion sort once the problem size drops below some particular threshold, say seven elements or something like that. So for small problem sizes, you use the algorithm with smaller constant factors namely the insertion sort. For larger problem si sizes, you use the algorithm with better rate of growth, namely merge sort. 
So to review, our first guiding principle is that we're going to pursue worst case analysis. We're going to look to bounds on the performance, on the running time of an algorithm, which make no domain assumptions, which make no assumptions about uh, which input of a given length the algorithm is provided. The second guiding principle is we're not going to focus on constant factors or lower order terms. That would be inappropriate given the level of granularity at which we're describing algorithms. And third is we're going to focus on the rate of growth of algorithms for large problem sizes. Putting these three principles together, we get a mathematical definition of a fast algorithm. Namely, we're going to pursue algorithms whose worst case running time grows slowly as a function of the input size. So let me tell you how you should interpret what I just wrote down in this box. So on the left hand side is clearly what we want. Okay? We want algorithms which run quickly if we implement them. And on the right hand side is a proposed mathematical surrogate of a fast algorithm. Right? The left hand side is not a mathematical definition. The right hand side is, as will become clear in the next set of lectures. So we're identifying fast algorithms, which those that have good asymptotic runtime, running time which grows slowly with the input size. Now, what would we want from a mathematical definition? We'd want a sweet spot. Okay, on the one hand, we want something we can actually reason about. This is why we zoom out and squint and ignore things like uh, constant factors and lower order terms. We can't keep track of everything, otherwise we'd never be able to analyze stuff. On the other hand, we don't want to throw out the baby with the bathwater. We want to retain predictive power. And this turns out, this definition turns out for the problems we're going to talk about in this course to be the sweet spot for reasoning about algorithms. Okay, worst case analysis using the asymptotic running time. We'll be able to prove lots of theorems. We'll be able to establish a lot of performance guarantees for fundamental algorithms. But at the same time, we'll have good predictive power. What the theory advocates will, in fact, be algorithms that are well known to be fast in practice. So the final explanation I owe you is what do I mean by the running time grows slowly with respect to the input size? Well, the answer depends a little bit on the context, but for almost all of the problems we're going to discuss, the holy grail will be to have what's called a linear time algorithm, an algorithm whose number of instructions grows proportional to the input size. So we won't always be able to achieve linear time, but that's in some sense the best case scenario. Notice linear time is even better than what we achieved with our merge sort algorithm for sorting. Merge sort runs a little bit super linear. It's n times log n, where n is the input size. If possible, we'd love to be linear time. It's not always going to be possible, but that is what we will aspire toward for most of the problems we'll discuss in this course. Looking ahead, the next series of videos is going to have two goals. First of all, on the analysis side, I'll describe formally what I mean by asymptotic running time. I'll introduce big O notation and its variance, explain its mathematical definitions, and give a number of examples. On the design side, we'll get more experience applying the divide and conquer paradigm to further problems. See you then. In the following series of videos, we'll give a formal treatment of asymptotic notation, in particular big O notation, as well as work through a number of examples. Big O notation concerns functions defined on the positive integers. We'll call it T of n. We'll pretty much always have the same semantics for T of n. We're going to be concerned about the worst case running time of an algorithm as a function of the input size n. So the question I want to answer for you in the rest of this video is what does it mean when we say a function T of n is big O of f of n? Where here f of n is some basic function like, for example, n log n. So I'll give you a number of answers, a number of ways of to think about what big O notation really means. But for starters, let's begin with an English definition. What does it mean for a function to be big O of f of n? It means eventually, for all sufficiently large values of n, it's bounded above by a constant multiple of f of n. Let's think about it in a couple other ways. So next I'm going to translate this English definition into a picture, and then I'll translate it into formal mathematics. So pictorially, you could imagine that perhaps we have t of n denoted by this blue function here. And perhaps f of n is denoted by this green function here, which lies below t of n. But when we double f of n, we get a function that eventually crosses t of n and forevermore is larger than it. So in this event, we would say that t of n indeed is big O of f of n. The reason being that for all sufficiently large n, once we go far enough outright on this graph, indeed a constant multiple times f of n, twice f of n, uh, is an upper bound on t of n. So finally, let me give you an uh, actual mathematical definition that you could use to do formal proofs. So how do we say in mathematics that eventually it should be bounded above by a constant multiple of f of n? We say that there exist two constants, which I'll call c and n naught, so that t of n is no more than c times f of n, 
for all n that exceed or equal n naught. So the role of these two constants is to quantify what we mean by a constant multiple and what we mean by sufficiently large in the English definition. C obviously quantifies the constant multiple of f of n, and n naught is quantifying sufficiently large. That's the threshold beyond which we insist that C times f of n is an upper bound on T of n. So going back to the picture, what are C and n naught? Well, C, of course, is just going to be 2 and n naught is the crossing point. So if you look at where 2 f of n and t of n cross, and then we drop the asymptote, this would be the relevant value of n naught in this picture. So that's the formal definition. The way to prove that something's big O of f of n, you exhibit these two constants, c and n naught, and it better be the case that for all n at least n naught, c times f of n upper bounds, t of n. One way to think about it, if you're trying to establish that something is big O of some function, it's like you're playing a game against an opponent. And you want to prove that this inequality here holds, and your opponent wants to show that it doesn't hold for sufficiently large n. You have to go first. Your job is to pick a strategy in the form of a constant c and a constant n naught, and your opponent is then allowed to pick any number n larger than n naught. So the function is big O of f of n if and only if you have a winning strategy in this game. If you can upfront commit to constants c and n naught so that no matter how big an n your opponent picks, this inequality holds. If you have no winning strategy, then it's not big O of f of n. No matter what c and n naught you choose, your opponent can always flip this inequality by choosing a suitable, suitable large uh, value of n. I want to emphasize one last thing, which is that these constants, what do I mean by a constant? I mean they are independent of n. Okay, so when you apply this definition and you choose your constant c and n naught, it better be that n does not appear anywhere. So c should just be something like a thousand or a million, some constant independent of n. So those are a bunch of ways to think about big O notation in English. You want to have a bound above for sufficiently large numbers n. I've shown you how to translate that into mathematics. I've given you a pictorial representation and also a sort of game theoretic way to think about it. Now let's move on to a video that explores a number of examples. Having slogged through the formal definition of big O notation, I want to quickly turn to a couple of examples. Now, I want to warn you up front, these are pretty basic examples. They're not really going to provide us with any insight that we don't already have, but they serve as a sanity check that the big O notation is doing what its intended purpose is, namely to suppress constant factors in lower order terms. Obviously, these simple examples will, will also give us some uh, facility with the definition. So the first example is going to be to prove, formally, the following claim. The claim states that if t of n is some polynomial of degree k, so namely a k n to the k plus all the way up to a 1 n plus a naught for any integer k, positive integer k, and any coefficients a i's, positive or negative, then t of n is big O of n to the k. So this claim is a mathematical statement. It's something we'll be able to prove. As far as you know, what this claim is saying, it's just saying big O notation really does suppress constant factors in lower order terms. If you have a polynomial, then all you have to worry about is what is the highest power in that polynomial. And that dominates its growth as the n goes to infinity. So recall how one goes about showing that one function is big O of another. The whole key is to find this pair of constants, c and n naught, where c quantifies the constant multiple of the function you're trying to prove big O of, and n naught quantifies what you mean by for all sufficiently large n. Now, for this proof, to keep things uh, very simple to follow, but admittedly a little mysterious, I'm just going to pull these constants, c and n naught, out of a hat. So I'm not going to tell you how I derive them, but it'll be easy to check that they work. So let's work with a constant n naught equal to 1. So it's a very simple choice of n naught. And then c, we're going to pick to be the sum of the absolute values of the coefficients. So the absolute value of a k plus the absolute value of a k minus 1, and so on. Remember, I didn't assume that the poly original polynomial had non-negative coefficients. So I claim these constants work in the sense that uh, we'll be able to prove the de assert, you know, establish the definition of big O notation. What does that mean? Well, we need to show that for all n at least 1, because remember we chose n not equal to 1, t of n, this polynomial up here, is bounded above by c times n to the k, where c is uh, the way we chose it here, underlined in red. So let's just check why this is true. So for every positive integer n at least 1, what do we need to prove? We need to prove t of n is upper bounded by something else. So we're going to start on the left-hand side with t of n, and now we need a sequence of upper bounds terminating with c times n to the k for our choice of c, underlined in red. So 
t of n is given is equal to this polynomial underlined in green. So what happens when we replace each of the coefficients with the absolute value of that coefficient? Well, you take the absolute value of a number, either it stays the same as it was before, or it flips from negative to positive. Now, n here we know is at least 1, so if any coefficient flips from negative to positive, then the overall number only goes up. So if we, if we apply the absolute value to each of the coefficients, we get an only bigger number. So t of n is bounded above by the new polynomial, where the coefficients are the absolute values of those that we had before. So why was that a useful step? Well, now what we can do is we can play the same trick, but with n. So it's sort of annoying how right now we have these different powers of n. It would be much nicer if we just had a common power of n. So let's just replace all of these different n's by n to the k, the biggest power of n that shows up anywhere. So if we replace each of these lower powers of n with the higher power n to the k, that number only goes up. Now the coefficients are all non-negative, so the overall number only goes up. So this is bounded above by the absolute value of a k n to the k up to absolute value of a1 n to the k plus a0 n to the k. I'm using here that n is at least 1, so higher powers of n are only bigger. And now you'll notice this, by our choice of c underlined in red, this is exactly equal to c times n to the k. And that's what we had to prove. We had to prove that t of n is a most c times n to the k. In this lecture, we'll continue our formal treatment of asymptotic notation. We've already discussed big O notation, which is by far the most important and ubiquitous concept that's part of asymptotic notation. But for completeness, I do want to tell you about a couple of close relatives of big O, namely omega and theta. If big O is analogous to less than or equal to, then omega and theta are analogous to greater than or equal to and equal to, respectively. But let's treat them a little more precisely. The formal definition of omega notation closely mirrors that of big O notation. We say that one function t of n is big omega of another function f of n if eventually, that is for sufficiently large n, it's lower bounded by a constant multiple of f of n. And we quantify the ideas of a constant multiple and eventually in exactly the same way as before, namely via explicitly giving two constants c and n naught, such that t of n is bounded below by c times f of n for all sufficiently large n, that is for all n at least n naught. There's a picture, just like there was for big O notation. Perhaps we have a function t of n, which looks something like this green curve. And then we have another function, f of n, which is above t of n. But then when we multiply f of n by 1 half, we get something that eventually is always below t of n. So in this picture, this is an example where t of n is indeed big omega of f of n. As far as what the constants are, well, the multiple that we use, c, is obviously just one half. That's what we're multiplying f of n by. And as before, n naught is the crossing point between the two functions. So n naught is the point after which c times f of n always lies below t of n forevermore. So that's big omega. Theta notation is the equivalent of equals, and so it just means that the function is both big O of f of n and omega of f of n. An equivalent way to think about this is that eventually t of n is sandwiched between two different constant multiples of f of n. I'll write that down and I'll leave it to you to verify that the two notions are equivalent. That is, one implies the other and vice versa. So what do I mean by t of n is eventually sandwiched between two multiples of f of n? Well, I just mean we choose two constants, a small one c1 and a big constant c2, and for all n at least n naught, uh, t of n lies between those two constant multiples. One way that algorithm designers can be quite sloppy is by using O notation instead of theta notation. So that's a common convention and I will follow that convention often in this class. Let me give you an example. Suppose we have a subroutine which does a linear scan through an array of length n. It looks at each entry in the array and does a constant amount of work with each entry. So the merge subroutine would be more or less uh, an example of a subroutine of that type. So even though the running time of such an algorithm, a subroutine, is patently theta of n, it does constant work for each of n entries, so it's exactly theta of n, we'll often just say that it has running time O of n. We won't bother to make the stronger statement that it's theta of n. The reason we do that is because, you know, as algorithm designers, what we really care about is upper bounds. We want guarantees on how long our algorithms are going to run, so naturally we focus on the upper bounds and not so much on the lower bound side. So don't get confused. Once in a while, there'll be a quantity which is obviously theta of f of n, and I'll just make the weaker statement that it's O of f of n.
The next quiz is meant to check your understanding of these three concepts, big O, big omega, and big theta notation. So the final three responses are all correct. And I hope the high level intuition for y is fairly clear. T of n is definitely a quadratic function. We know that the linear term doesn't matter much uh, as, it grows, as n grows large. So since it has quadratic growth, then the third response should be correct. It's theta of n squared. And it is omega of n. So omega of n is not a very good lower bound on the asymptotic rate of growth of t of n, but it is legitimate. Indeed, as a quadratic growing function, it grows at least as fast as a linear function. So it's omega of n. For the same reason, big O of n cubed, it's not a very good upper bound, but it is a legitimate one. It is correct. The rate of growth of t of n is at most cubic. In fact, it's at most quadratic, but it is indeed at most cubic. Now, if you wanted to prove these three statements formally, you would just exhibit the appropriate constants. So for proving that it's big omega of n, you could take n not equal to 1 and c equal to 1 half. For the final statement, again, you could take n not equal to 1 and c equal to, say, 4. And to prove that it's theta of n squared, you could do something similar just using the two constants combined. So n not would be 1. You could take c1 to be 1 half and c2 to be 4. And I'll leave it to you to verify that the formal definitions of big omega, big theta, and big O would be satisfied with these choices of constants. One final piece of asymptotic notation, we're not really going to use this much, but you do see it from time to time, so I wanted to mention it briefly. This is called little o notation, in contrast to big O notation. So while big O notation informally is a less than or equal to type relation, little o is a strictly less than relation. So intuitively it means that one function is growing strictly less quickly than another. So formally, we say that a function t of n is little o of f of n if and only if for all constants c there is a constant n naught beyond which t of n is upper bounded by this constant multiple c times f of n. So the difference between this definition and that of big O notation is that to prove that one function is big O of another, we only have to exhibit one measly constant c such that c times f of f, f of n is a upper bound eventually for t of n. By contrast, to prove that something is little o of another function, we have to prove something quite a bit stronger. We have to prove that for every single constant c, no matter how small, for every c there exists some large enough n naught beyond which t of n is bounded above by c times f of n. So for those of you looking for a little more facility with little o notation, I'll leave it as an exercise to prove that, as you'd expect, for all polynomial powers, k, in fact, n to the k minus 1 is little o of n to the k. There is an analogous notion of little omega notation expressing that one function grows strictly quicker than another, but that one you don't see very often, and I'm not going to say anything more about it. So let me conclude this video with a quote from an article back from 1976 by my colleague Don Knuth, widely regarded as the grandfather of the formal analysis of algorithms. And uh, it's rare that you can pinpoint why and where some kind of notation became universally adopted in the field. But in the case of asymptotic notation, indeed, it's very clear where it came from. The notation was not invented by algorithm designers or computer scientists. It's been in use in number theory since the 19th century. But it was Don Knuth in 76 that proposed that this become the standard language for discussing rate of growth and in particular for the running time of algorithms. So in particular, he says in this article, on the basis of the issues discussed here, I propose that members of SIGACT, this is the special interest group of the ACM, which is concerned with uh, theoretical computer science, in particular the analysis of algorithms. So I propose that the members of SIGACT and editors in computer science and mathematics journals adopt the O, omega, and theta notations as defined above, unless a better alternative can be found reasonably soon. So clearly a better alternative was not found, and ever since that time this has been the standard way of discussing the rate of growth of running times of algorithms, and that's what we'll be using here. This video is for those of you who want some additional practice with asymptotic notation, and we're going to go through three additional optional examples. Let's start with the first one. So the point of this first example is to show how to formally prove that one function is big O of another. So the function that I want to work with is 2 raised to the n plus 10. Okay, so it's the 2 to the n function that you're all familiar with. But I'm going to shift it by 10. And the claim is that this function is big O of 2 to the n. So without the 10. So how would one prove such a claim? Well, let's go back to the definition of what it means for one function to be big O of another. What we have to prove is we need to show that there exists two constants such that for all sufficiently large n, meaning n bigger than n naught, 
our left hand side, so the function 2 to the n plus 10, is bounded above by the constant multiple c times the function on the right hand side, 2 to the n. Right, so for all sufficiently large n, the function is bounded above by a constant multiple of 2 to the n. So unlike uh, the first basic example where I just pulled the two constants out of a hat, let's actually start the proof and see how you'd reverse engineer the suitable choice of these two constants. So what a proof would look like, it would start with 2 to the n plus 10 on the left hand side and then there'd be a chain of inequalities terminating in the c times 2 to the n. So let's just go ahead and start such a proof and see what we might do. So if we start with 2 to the n plus 10 on the left hand side, what would our first step look like? Well, this 10 is really annoying, so it makes sense to separate it out. So you could write 2 to the n plus 10 as the product of two terms, 2 to the 10 and then the 2 to the n, also known as just 1024 times 2 to the n. And now we're in, looking in really good shape. So if you look at where we are so far and where we want to get to, uh, it seems like we should be choosing our constant c to be 1024. So if we choose c to be 1024, and we don't have to be clever with n0, we can just set that equal to 1, then, indeed, star holds, so the desired inequality. And remember to prove that one function is big over another, all you got to do is come up with one pair of constants that works. And we've just reverse engineered it, just choosing the constant c to be 1024 and, and not to be 1 works. So this proves that 2 to the n plus 10 is big O of 2 to the n. Next, let's turn to another non-example of a function which is not big O of another. And so this will look superficially similar to the previous one. Instead of taking adding 10 in the exponent of the function 2 to the n, I'm going to multiply by 10 in the exponent. And the claim is if you multiply by 10 in the exponent, then this is not the same asymptotically as 2 to the n. So once again, usually the way you prove that one thing is not big O of another is by contradiction. So we're going to assume the contrary, that 2 to the 10n is in fact big O of 2 to the n. What would it mean if that were true? Well, by the definition of big O notation, that would mean there are constants c and n naught, so that for all large n, c, uh, 2 to the 10n is bounded above by c times 2 to the n. So to complete the proof, what we have to do is go from this assumption and derive something which is obviously false, but that's easy to do just by canceling this 2 to the n term from both sides. So if we divide both sides by 2 to the n, which is a positive number since n is positive, what we find would be a logical consequence of our assumption would be that 2 raised to the 9n is bounded above by some fixed constant c for all n at least n naught. But this inequality, of course, is certainly false. The right-hand side is some fixed constant independent of n. The left-hand side is going to infinity as n grows large, so there's no way that this inequality holds for arbitrarily large n. So that concludes the proof by contradiction. This means our assumption was not the case, and indeed it is not the case that 2 to the 10n is big O of 2 to the n. So our third and final example is a little bit more complicated than the first two. It'll give us some practice using theta notation. Recall that while big O is analogous to saying one function is less than or equal to another, theta notation is in the spirit of saying one function is equal asymptotically to another. So here's going to be the formal claim we're going to prove. For every pair of functions, f and g, both of these functions are defined on the positive integers, the claim is that it doesn't matter, up to a constant factor, is whether we take the pointwise maximum of the two functions or whether we take the pointwise sum of the two functions. So let me make sure it's clear that you know what I mean by the pointwise maximum, by max f and g. So if we look at the two functions, both functions of n, maybe we have f being this green function here, and we have g equal to this red function, then by the pointwise maximum, max fg, I just mean the upper envelope of these two functions. So that's going to be this blue function. So let's now turn to the proof of this claim, that the pointwise maximum of two functions is theta of the sum of the two functions. So let's recall what theta means formally. What it means is that the function on the left can be sandwiched between constant multiples of the function on the right. So we need to exhibit both the usual and not, but also two constants, a small one c1 and a big one c2, so that the pointwise maximum of f and g, whatever they may be, is wedged in between uh, c1 and c2 times f of n plus g of n, respectively. So to see where these constants c1 and cn are going to come from, let's observe the following inequalities. So no matter what n is, any positive integer n, we have the following. Suppose we take the larger of f of n and g of n. And remember now we've fixed a value of n, n is just some integer, you know, like 23. 
And now f of n and g of n are themselves just numbers. You know, maybe they're 57 and 74 or whatever. And if you take the larger of f of n and g of n, that's certainly no more than the sum of f of n plus g of n. Now I'm using in this inequality that f and g are positive, and that's something I've been assuming throughout the course so far. Here I, I want to be explicit about it. We're assuming that f and g cannot output negative numbers. Whatever integer you feed in, you get out something positive. Now the functions we care about are things like the running time of algorithms, so there's really no reason for us to pollute our thinking with negative numbers. So we're just going to always be assuming in this class positive numbers, and I'm actually using it here. The right-hand side is the sum of two things is bigger than just either one of the constituent summands. Secondly, if we double the larger of f of n and g of n, well then that's going to exceed the sum of f of n plus g of n, right? Because on the right-hand side we have a big number plus a small number, and on the left-hand side we have two copies of the big number. So that's going to be something larger. Now it's going to be convenient, it's going to be more obvious what's going on if I divide both of these sides by 2 so that the maximum of f of n and g of n is at least half of f of n plus g of n. That is, it's at least half of the average. And now we're pretty much home free. right? So what does this say? This says that for every possible n the maximum is wedged between suitable multiples of the sum. So 1 half f of n plus g of n is a lower bound on the maximum this is just the second inequality that we derived. And by the first inequality, that's bounded above by once times the sum. And this holds no matter what n is, any n at least 1. And this is exactly what it means to prove that one function is theta of another. We've shown that for all n, not just for n sufficiently large, but in fact for all n, the pointwise maximum of f and g is wedged between suitable constant multiples of their sum. And again, just to be explicit, the certifying choices of constants are n0 equals 1, the smaller constant is 1 half, and the bigger constant equals 1. And that completes the proof. In this next series of videos, we'll get some more practice applying the divide and conquer algorithm design paradigm to various problems. This will also give us a glimpse of the kinds of application domains to which it's been successfully applied. We're going to start by extending the merge sort algorithm to solve a problem involving counting the number of inversions of an array. Before we tackle the specific problem of counting the number of inversions in an array, let me say a few words about the divide and conquer paradigm in general. So again, you've already seen the totally canonical example of divide and conquer, namely merge sort. So the following three conceptual steps will be familiar to you. The first step, no prizes for guessing, uh, is you divide the problem into smaller subproblems. Sometimes this division happens only in your mind. It's really more of a conceptual step than part of your code. Sometimes you really do copy over parts of the input into, uh, say, new arrays to pass on to your recursive calls. The second step, again, no prizes here, is you conquer the subproblems just using recursion. So, for example, in merge sort, you conceptually divide the array into two different pieces, and then you recursively conquer or sort to the first half of the array, and you do, you do the same thing with the second half of the array. Now, of course, it's not quite as easy as just doing these two steps, dividing the problem and then solving the subproblems recursively. Usually, you have some extra cleanup work after the recursive calls end to stitch together the solutions to the subproblems into one for the big problem, the problem that you actually care about. Recall, for example, in merge sort, uh, after our recursive calls, the left half of the array was sorted, the right half of the array was sorted, but we still had to stitch those together uh, and merge into a sorted version of the entire array. So the third step is to combine the solutions to the subproblems into one of the original problems. Generally, the largest amount of ingenuity happens in the third step. How do you actually quickly combine solutions to subproblems into one to the original problem? Sometimes you also get some cleverness in the first step with division. Sometimes it's as simple as just splitting an array in two, but there are cases where the division step also has some ingenuity. Now let's move on to the specific problem of counting inversions and see how to apply this divide and conquer paradigm. So let me begin by defining the problem formally. We're given as input an array A of length n, and you could define the problem so that the array A contains any old distinct numbers, but let's just keep things simple and assume that it contains the numbers 1 through n, the integers in that range, in some order. That captures the essence of the problem. And the goal is to compute the number of inversions of this array. So what's an inversion, you may ask? Well, inversion is just a pair of array indices i and j with i smaller than j, so that the earlier array entry, the ith entry, is bigger than the later one, than the jth one. So one thing that should be evident is that if the array contains these numbers in sorted order, if the array is simply 1, 2, 3, 4, all the way up to n, then the number of inversions is 0. The converse you might also want to think through if the array has any other ordering of 
So far we've developed a divide and conquer approach to counting the number of inversions of an array. So we're going to split the array in two parts, recursively counting inversions on the left, on the right. We've identified the key challenge as counting the number of split inversions quickly, where a split inversion means that the earlier index is on the left half of the array, the second index is on the right half of the array. These are precisely inversions that are going to be missed by both of our recursive calls. And the crux of the problem is that there might be as many as quadratic split inversions, yet somehow to get the runtime we want, we need to do it in linear time. So here's the really nice idea which is going to let us do that. The idea is to piggyback on merge sort. By which I mean we're actually going to demand a bit more of our recursive calls to make the job of counting the number of split recursions easier. This is analogous to when you're doing a proof by induction. Sometimes by making the inductive hypothesis stronger, that's what lets you push through the inductive proof. So we're going to ask our recursive calls to not only count inversions in the array that they're passed, but also along the way to sort the array. And hey, why not? We know sorting is fast. Merge sort will do it at n log n time, which is the runtime we're shooting for. So why not just throw that in? Maybe it'll help us in the combined step. And as we'll see, it will. So what is this bias? Why should we demand more of our recursive calls? Well, as we'll see in a couple slides, the merge subroutine almost seems designed just to count the number of split inversions. As we'll see, as you merge two sorted subarrays, you will naturally uncover all of the split inversions. So let me just be a little bit more clear about how our previous high-level algorithm uh, is going to now be souped up so that the recursive calls sort as well. So here's the high-level algorithm we proposed before, where we just recursively count inversions on the left side, on the right side, and then we have some currently unimplemented subroutine count split if, which is responsible for counting the number of split inversions. So we're just going to augment this as follows. So instead of being called count, now we're going to call it sort and count. So that's going to be the name of our algorithm. The recursive calls, again, just invoke sort and count. And so now we know uh, each of those will not only count the number of inversions in the subarray, but also return a, return a sorted version. So out from the first one, we're going to get uh, array B back, which is the sorted version of the array that we passed it. And we'll get a sorted array C back from the second recursive call, the sorted version of the array that we passed it. And uh, now the count split inversions. Now, in addition to counting split inversions, it's responsible for merging the two sorted subarrays B and C. So count split if will be responsible for outputting. In this video, we'll apply the divide and conquer algorithm design paradigm to the problem of multiplying matrices. This will culminate in the study of Strassen's matrix multiplication algorithm. And this is a super cool algorithm for two reasons. First of all, Strassen's algorithm is completely non-trivial. It's totally non-obvious, very clever, not at all clear how Strassen ever came up with it. The second cool feature is it's for such a fundamental problem. So computers, as long as they've been in use from the time they were invented up till today, a lot of their cycles is spent multiplying matrices because it just comes up all the time in important applications. So let me first just uh, make sure we're all clear on what the, what the problem is of multiplying two matrices. So we're going to be interested in three matrices, X, Y, and Z. They're all going to, I'm going to assume they all have the same dimensions, uh, N by N. The ideas we'll talk about are also relevant for multiplying non-square matrices, but we're not going to discuss it in this video. The entries in these matrices, you know, you can think of it as whatever you want. Maybe they're integers, maybe they're rationals, maybe they're from some finite field. It depends on the application, but the point is they're just entries that we can add and multiply. So how is it that you take two n by n matrices, x and y, and multiply them, producing a new n by n matrix, z? Well, recall that the ij entry of z, that means the entry in the ith row and the jth column, is simply the dot product of the ith row of x with the jth column of y. So if ij was this red square, this red entry over in the z matrix, that would be derived from the corresponding row of the x matrix and the corresponding column of the y matrix. And recall what I mean by dot product, that just means you take the products of the individual components and then add up the results. So ultimately, the zij entry boils down to a sum over n things, where each of the constituent products is just the xik entry, uh, the ik entry of the matrix x with the kj entry uh, of the matrix y, where your k is ranging from 1 to n. So that's how zij is defined for a given uh, pair of indices i and j. One thing to note is that where we often use n to denote the input size, here we're using n to denote the dimension of each of these matrices. The input size is not n. The input size is quite a bit bigger than n. 
Uh, specifically, each of these are n by n matrices and contains n squared entries. So since presumably we have to read the input, which has size n squared, and we have to produce the output, which also has size n squared, the best we could really hope for for a matrix multiplication algorithm would be a running time of n squared. So the question is, how close can we get to it? Before we talk about algorithms for matrix multiplication, let me just make sure we're all crystal clear on exactly what the problem is. So let's just actually spell out what would be the result of multiplying two different two by two matrices. So we can parameterize two generic two by two matrices by just giving the first one entries A, B, C, and D, where these four entries could all be anything. And then we're multiplying by a second two by two uh, matrix. Let's call its entries E, F, G, and H. Now, what's the result of multiplying these? Where again, it's going to be a two by two matrix where each entry is just the corresponding dot product of the relevant row of the first matrix and column of the second matrix. So to get the upper left entry, we take the dot product of the upper row of the first matrix and the first column of uh, the left column of the second matrix. So that results in AE plus BG. To get the upper right entry, we take the dot product of the top row of the left matrix with the right column of the second matrix. So that gives us AF plus BH. And then filling in the other entries in the same way, we get CE plus DG and CF plus DH. Here. So that's the multiplying two matrices, and we've already discussed the definition in general. Now. Suppose you had to write a program to actually compute the results of multiplying two n by n matrices. One natural way to do that would just be to return to the definition, and which defines each of the n squared entries in the z matrix as a suitable sum of products of entries, entries of the x and y matrices. So in the next quiz, I'd like you to uh, figure out exactly what would be the running time of that algorithm as a function of the matrix dimension n, where as usual we count the addition or multiplication of two individual entries as a constant time operation. So the correct response to this quiz is the third answer, that the running time of the straightforward iterative algorithm runs in cubic time relative to the matrix dimension n. To see this, just recall what the definition of the matrix multiplication was. The definition tells us that each entry zij of the output matrix z is defined as the sum from k equal 1 to n of xik times ykj. That is the dot product of the ith row of the x matrix and the jth column of the y matrix. Uh, I'm certainly assuming that we have the matrices represented in a way that we can access a given entry in constant time. And under that assumption, remember each of these, each of these products only takes constant time. And so then to compute zij, we just have to add up these n products. So that's going to be uh, theta of n time to compute a given zij. And then there's an n squared entries that we have to compute. There's n choices for i, n choices for j. So that gives us uh, uh, n squared times n, or cubic running time overall, for the natural algorithm, which is really just a triple for loop, uh, which computes each entry of the output ray separately using the dot product. So the question, as always, for the keen algorithm designer is, can we do better? Can we beat uh, n cubed time for multiplying two matrices? And we might be especially emboldened with the progress that we've already seen in terms of multiplying two integers. We apply the divide and conquer algorithm uh, to the problem of multiplying two n-digit integers, and we had uh, both a naive recursive algorithm and a seemingly better uh, algorithm due to Gauss, which made only three recursive calls. Now, we haven't yet analyzed the running time of that algorithm, but as we'll see later, that does indeed uh, beat the quadratic running time of the grade school algorithm. So it's very natural to ask, can we do exactly the same thing here? There's the obvious n-cubed algorithm, which follows straight from the definition. Perhaps analogous to Gauss, we can have some clever divide-and-conquer method, which beats cubic time. So that's what we're going to explore next. Let's recall the divide and conquer paradigm. What does it mean to use it? Well, we first have to identify smaller subproblems. So if we want to multiply two n by n matrices, we have to identify multiplications of smaller matrices that we can solve recursively. Once we've figured out how we want to divide the given problem into smaller ones, then in the conquer step, we simply invoke our own algorithm recursively. That's going to uh, recursively multiply the smaller matrices together. And then, you know, in general, we'll have to combine the results of the recursive calls to get the solution for the original problem, in our case, to get 
get the product of the original two matrices from the product of whatever submatrices we identify. So how would we apply the divide and conquer paradigm to matrices? So we're given two n by n matrices and we have to somehow identify smaller pairs of square matrices that we can multiply recursively. So the idea I think is fairly natural. So we start with a big n by n matrix X Right, so there's n rows and n columns, and we have to somehow divide it into smaller pieces. Now the first thing you might think about is you put it into its left half and its right half, analogous to what we've been doing with arrays, but then we're going to break x into two matrices which are no longer square, which are n over 2 in one dimension and have length n in the other dimension. And we want to recursively call a subroutine that multiplies square matrices. So what seems like the clear thing to do is to divide x into quadrants. Okay, so we have four pieces of x, each is going to be n over 2 by n over 2, corresponding to the different quarters of this matrix. So let's call these different quadrants or blocks in matrix terminology A, B, C, and D. All of these are n over 2 by n over 2 matrices. As usual, for simplicity, I'm assuming that n is even, and as usual, it doesn't really matter. And we can do the same trick with y. So we'll divide y into quadrants n over 2 by n over 2 matrices, which we'll call E, F, G, and H. So one thing that's cool about matrices is when you split them into blocks and you multiply them, the blocks just behave as if they were atomic elements. So what I mean by that is that the product of X and Y can be expressed in terms of its quadrants. And each of its four quadrants, each of its four corners, uh, can be written as a suitable arithmetic expression of the quadrants of x and y. So here's exactly what those formulas are. They're exactly analogous to when we just multiplied uh, a pair of 2 by 2 matrices. So I'm not going to formally prove this fact. I'm sure many of you uh, have seen it before or are familiar with it. And if you haven't, it's actually quite easy to prove. It's not obvious. It's, you can't see it off the top of your head necessarily. But if you go back to the definition, it's quite easy to verify that indeed when you multiply x and y, you can express its quadrants, its blocks, in terms of the blocks of x and y. So what we just did is completely analogous to when talking about integer multiplication and we wanted to multiply two integers, little x and little y, and we broke them into pairs of n over 2 digits. And then we just took the expansion and we observed how that expansion could be written in terms of uh, products of n over 2 digit numbers. Same thing going on here except with matrices. So now we're in business as far as a recursive approach. We want to multiply x and y, they're n by n matrices. We recognize we can express that product x times y in terms of the products of n over 2 by n over 2 matrices, things we're able to multiply recursively, plus additions. And additions is clearly easy. To multiply uh, two different matrices with, say, n squared entries each, it's going to be linear in the number of entries. So it's going to be uh, n squared time to add two matrices that are n by n. So this immediately leads us to our first recursive algorithm. To describe it, let me quickly rewrite that expression we just saw on the previous slide. And now our first recursive algorithm is simply to evaluate all of these expressions in the obvious way. So specifically in step one, we recursively compute all of the necessary products and observe that there are eight products that we have to compute, eight products of n over 2 by n over 2 matrices. There are four entries in this expansion of x times y. Each of, the, each of the blocks is the sum of two products, and none of the products reoccur. They're all distinct. So naively, if we want to evaluate this, we have to do eight different products of n over 2 by n over 2 matrices. Once those recursive calls complete, then all we do is do the uh, necessary four additions. As we discussed, that takes time proportional to the number of entries in the matrix, so this is going to take a quadratic time overall, quadratic in n, linear in the number of entries. Now, the question you should be asking is, is this a good algorithm? Was this good for anything, this recursive approach, splitting x and y into these blocks, expanding the product in terms of these blocks, then recursively uh, computing each of the blocks? And I want to say it's totally not obvious. It is not clear what the running time of this recursive algorithm is. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and uh, give you a spoiler, which is going to follow from the master method that we'll talk about in the next lecture. But it turns out, with this kind of recursive algorithm, where you do eight recursive calls, each on a problem with dimension half as much as what you started with, and then do quadratic time outside, the running time is going to be cubic. So exactly the same as with the straightforward iterative algorithm that follows from the definition. That was cubic. It turns out, and that was clearly cubic, 
This one, although it's not obvious, is cubic as well. So no better, no worse than the straightforward iterative algorithm. So in case you're feeling disappointed that we went through all this work and this sort of seemingly clever divide and conquer approach for matrix multiplication and, and came out at the end no better than the iterative algorithm, well, there's really no reason to despair. Because remember, back in integer multiplication, we had a straightforward recursive algorithm where we had to do four recursive calls, products of n over two digit numbers. But then we had Gauss's trick, which said, oh, if we only did more clever products and more clever additions and subtractions, then we can get away with only three recursive calls. And we'll see later that that is indeed a significant savings uh, in the time needed for integer multiplication. And we've done nothing analogously clever to Gauss's trick for this matrix multiplication problem. All we did is the naive expansion in terms of submatrices and the naive evaluation of the resulting expressions. So, the $64,000 question is then, can we do something clever to reduce the number of recursive calls from 8 down to something lower? And that is where Strassen's algorithm comes in. So at a high level, Strassen's algorithm has two steps, just like the first recursive algorithm that we discussed. It recursively computes some products of smaller matrices, n over 2, or roughly n over 2 by n over 2 matrices. But there's only going to be seven of them. They will be much less straightforward. They will be much more cleverly chosen than in the first recursive algorithm. And step two, then, is to actually produce the product of x and y, produce each of those four blocks that we saw with suitable uh, additions and subtractions of these seven products. And again, these are much less straightforward than in the first recursive algorithm. And so while the additions and subtractions involved will be a little bit more numerous uh, than they were in the naive recursive algorithm, it's only going to change the work in that part of the algorithm by a constant factor. So we'll still spend only theta of n squared work adding and subtracting things, and we get a huge win in decreasing the number of recursive calls from 8 to 7. Now, just in case you have the intuition that shaving off one of eight recursive calls should only decrease the running time of an algorithm by one eighth, by 12.5%, in fact, it has a tremendously more amplified effect because we do one less recursive call over and over and over again as we keep recursing in the algorithm. So it makes a fundamental difference in the eventual running time of the algorithm, as we'll explore in detail in the next set of lectures when we discuss the master method. So again, a bit of a spoiler alert. What you're going to see in the next set of lectures is that indeed, Strassen's algorithm does beat cubic time. It's better than n cubed time. You'll have to watch the next set of lectures if you want to know just what the running time is. But I'm going to tell you now that savings of the eighth recursive call is what changes the algorithm from cubic to subcubic. Now, 1969 was, obviously, quite a bit before my time. But by all accounts, from people I've talked to who were around then and from you know what the books say, Strassen's algorithm totally blew people's minds at the time. Everybody was assuming that there's no way you could do better than the iterative algorithm, the cubic algorithm. It just seemed that matrix multiplication intuitively fundamentally required all of the calculations that are spelled out in the definition. So Strassen's algorithm is an early glimpse of the magic and of the power of clever algorithm design. That if you really have a serious ingenuity, even for super fundamental problems, you can come up with fundamental savings over the more straightforward solutions. So those are the main points I wanted to talk about Strassen's algorithm, how you can beat cubic time by saving a recursive call with suitably chosen clever products and clever additions and subtractions. Maybe a few of you are wondering, you know, what are these cleverly chosen products? Can you really do this? And I don't blame you. There's no reason to believe me just because I sort of spelled out this high-level idea. It's not obvious this should work. You might want to actually see the products. So for those of you like that, this last slide is for you. So here is Strassen's algorithm in its somewhat gory detail. So let me tell you what the seven products are that we're going to form. I'm going to label them P1 through P7, and they're all going to be defined in terms of the blocks of the input matrices X and Y. So let me just remind you that we think of X in terms of its blocks, A, B, C, D, and we think of Y in terms of its blocks, E, F, G, H. And remember, A through H are all N over 2 by N over 2 submatrices. So here are the seven products, P1 through P7. P1 is A times quantity F minus H. P2 is quantity A plus B times H. P3 is C plus D times E. P4 
is D times G minus E. P5 is quantity A plus D times quantity E plus H. P6 is quantity B minus D times quantity G plus H. And finally, P7 is quantity A minus C, E plus F. So I hope you'll agree that these are indeed only seven products, and we could compute these with seven recursive calls. So we pre-process with a little bit of additions and subtractions. We have to compute F minus H, A plus B, C plus D, and so on. We compute all of these new matrices from the blocks, and we can then recursively, with seven recursive calls, do these seven products that operate on n over 2 by n over 2 matrices. Now, the question is, why is this useful? Why on earth would we want to know the values of these seven products? So the amazing other part of the algorithm is that from just these seven products, we can, using only addition and subtraction, recover all four of the blocks of a x times y. So x times y, you'll recall we expanded in terms of the blocks. So we previously computed this to be AE plus BG in the upper left corner, and then similarly expressions for the upper right, lower left, and lower right blocks. So this we already know. So the content of the claim is that these four blocks also arise from the seven products in the following way. So the claim here is that these two different expressions for x times y are exactly the same, and they're the same block by block. So in other words, what well, the claim is that this crazy expression, p5 plus p4 minus p2 plus p6, where those are four of the products that we've listed above, that is precisely ae plus bg. Similarly, we're, we're claiming that p1 plus p2 is exactly af plus bh. That's actually easy to see. p3 plus p4 is ce plus dg. That's also easy to see. And then the other complicated one is that p1 plus p5 minus p3 minus p7 is exactly the same as cf plus dh. So all four of those hold. So let me just so you believe me, because I don't know why you would believe me unless I actually showed you some of this derivation. Let's just look at the proof of one of the cases of the upper left corner. So that is, let's just expand out this crazy expression, p5 plus p4 minus p2 plus p6. What do we get? Well, from p5, we get ae plus ah plus de plus dh. Then we add p4, so that's going to give us a plus dg minus DE. Then we subtract P2, so that gives us a minus AH minus BH. And then we add in P6. So that gives us a BG plus BH minus DG minus DH. Okay, so what happens next? Well now we look for cancellations. So we cancel the AHs, we cancel the DEs, we cancel the DHs, we cancel the DGs, we cancel the BHs, and holy cow, what do we get? We get AE plus BG, that is, we get exactly what we were supposed to in the upper left block of X times Y. So we just actually verified that this equation holds for the upper left block. It's quite easy to see that it holds for the upper right and lower left blocks, and then a comparable calculation verifies it for the lower right uh, blocks of the two. So summarizing, because this claim holds, because actually we can recover the four blocks of x times y from these seven products, Strassen's algorithm works in the following way. You compute the seven products P1 through P7 using seven recursive calls. Then you just compute the four blocks using some extra additions and subtractions as shown in the claim. So seven recursive calls on n, by, n over 2 by n over 2 matrices plus n squared work to do the necessary additions. And as you'll see in the master method lecture, that is actually sufficient for subcubic time. Now, I sympathize with you if you have the following question which is, how on earth did Strassen come up with this? And indeed, this sort of illustrates uh, the difference between checking somebody's proof and coming up with a proof. Given that I told you the magical seven products, 
and how you, from them, re can recover the four desired blocks of x times y, it's really just mechanical to see that it works. It's a totally different story of how do you come up with p1 through p7 in the first place. So how did Strassen come up with them? Honestly, your guess is as good as mine. So in this video and the next, we're going to study a very cool divide and conquer algorithm for the closest pair problem. Uh, this is a problem where you're given endpoints in the plane and you want to figure out which pair of points are closest to each other. So this will be the first taste we get of an application in computational geometry, which is the part of algorithms which studies how to reason and manipulate geometric objects. So those algorithms are important in, among other areas, uh, robotics, computer vision, uh, and computer graphics. So this is relatively advanced material. It's a bit more difficult than the other applications of divide and conquer that we've seen. The algorithm's a little bit tricky, and it has a quite non-trivial proof of correctness. So just be ready for that, and also be warned that because it's more advanced, I'm going to talk about the material at a slightly uh, faster pace than I do in most of the other videos. So let's begin now by defining the problem formally. So we're given as input endpoints in the plane, so each one just defined by its x-coordinate and its y-coordinate. And when we talk about the distance between two points in this problem, we're going to focus on Euclidean distance. So let me remind you what that is briefly, but we'll introduce some simple notation for that, which we'll use for the rest of the lecture. So we're just going to note the Euclidean distance between two points pi and pj by d of pi pj. So in terms of the x and y coordinates of these two points, we just look at the square differences in each coordinate, sum them up, and take the square root. And now, as the name of the problem would suggest, the goal is to identify among all pairs of points that pair which has the smallest distance between them. Next, let's start getting a feel for the problem by making some preliminary observations. First, I want to make an assumption, purely for convenience, that there's no ties. So that is, I'm going to assume all endpoints have distinct x-coordinates, and also all endpoints have distinct y-coordinates. It's not difficult to extend the algorithm to accommodate ties. I'll leave it to you to think about how to do that. So next, let's draw some parallels with the problem of counting inversions, which was an earlier application of divide and conquer that we saw. The first parallel I want to point out is that if we're comfortable with a quadratic time algorithm, then this is not a hard problem. We can simply solve this by brute force search. And again, by brute force search, I just mean we set up a double for loop, which iterates over all distinct pairs of points. We compute the distance for each such pair, and we remember the smallest. That's clearly a correct algorithm. It has to iterate over a quadratic number of pairs, so its running time is going to be uh, theta of n squared. And as always, the question is, can we apply some algorithmic ingenuity to do better? Can we have a better algorithm than this naive one, which iterates over all pairs of points? You might have a, an initial instinct that because the problem asks about a quadratic number of different objects, perhaps we fundamentally need to do quadratic work. But again, recall back in counting inversions, using divide and conquer, we were able to get an n log n algorithm, despite the fact that there might be as many as a quadratic number of inversions in an array. So the question is, can we do something similar here for the closest pair problem? Now, one of the keys to getting an n log n time algorithm for counting inversions was to leverage a sorting subroutine. Recall that we piggybacked on merge sort to count the number of inversions in n log n time. So the question is, here, with the closest pair problem, perhaps sorting, again, can be useful in some way to beat the quadratic barrier. So to develop some evidence that sorting will indeed help us uh, compute the closest pair of points and better than quadratic time, let's look at a special case of the problem, really an easier version of the problem, which is when the points are just in one dimension, so on the line rather than in two dimensions in the plane. So in the 1D version, all of the points just lie on a line like this one, and we're given the points in some arbitrary order, not necessarily in sorted order. So a way to solve the closest pair problem in one dimension is to simply sort the points. And then, of course, the closest pair better be adjacent in this ordering. So you just iterate through the n minus 1 consecutive pairs and see which one is closest to each other. So more formally, here's how you solve the one-dimensional version of the problem. You sort the points according to their only coordinate, because again, remember, this is one dimension. So as we've seen using merge sort, we can sort the points in n long n time. And then we just do a scan through the points, so this takes linear time, and for each consecutive pair we compute their distance and we remember the smallest of those consecutive pairs and we return that. That's got to be the closest pair. So in this picture on the right, I'm just going to circle here in green uh, the closest pair of points. So this is something we discover by sorting and then doing a linear scan. Now, needless to say, this isn't directly useful. This is not the problem I started out with. We wanted to find the closest pair among points in the plane, not points in the line. But I want to point out that this, even in the line, there are a quadratic number of different pairs. So brute force search is still a quadratic time algorithm, even in the 1D case. So at least with one dimension, we can use sorting, piggyback on it, to beat the naive brute force search bound and solve the problem in n log n time. 
So our goal for this lecture is going to be to devise an equally good algorithm for the two-dimensional case. So we want to solve closest pair of points in the plane, again, in the n log n time. So we will succeed in this goal. I'm going to show you an n log n time algorithm for 2D closest pair. It's going to take us a couple steps. So let me begin with the high-level approach. All right, so the first idea to try is just to copy what worked for us in the one-dimensional case. So in the one-dimensional case, we first sorted the points uh, by their coordinate, and that was really useful. Now, in the 2D case, points have two coordinates, x-coordinates and y-coordinates, so there's two ways to sort them. So let's just sort them both ways. That is, the first step of our algorithm, which is really think of as a pre-processing step, we're going to take the input points, we invoke merge sort once to sort them according to x-coordinate, that's one copy of the points, and then we make a second copy of the points, uh, where they're sorted by y-coordinate. So we're going to call those copies of points px, that's an array of the points sorted by x-coordinate, and py for them sorted by y-coordinate. Now we know merge sort takes n log n time, so this pre-processing step only takes o of n log n time. And again, given that we're shooting for an algorithm with running time big O of n log n, why not sort the points? We don't even know how we're going to use this fact right now, but it's sort of harmless. It's not going to affect our goal of getting a big of o of n log n time algorithm. And indeed, this illustrates a broader point, which is one of the themes of this course. So recall, I hope one of the things you take away from this course is a sense for what are the four free primitives. What are manipulations or operations you can do on data, uh, which basically are costless, meaning that if your data set fits in the main memory of your computer, you can basically invoke the primitive and it's just going to run blazingly fast. And you can just do it even if you don't know why. And again, sorting is the canonical four free primitive, although we'll see some more later in the course. And so here we're using exactly that principle. So we don't even understand why yet we might want the points to be sorted. It just seems like it's probably going to be useful, motivated by the 1D case. So let's go ahead and make uh, sorted copies of the points by x and y coordinate up front. So reasoning by analogy with the 1D case suggests that sorting the points might be useful, but we can't carry this analogy too far. So in particular, we're not going to be able to get away with just a simple linear scan through these arrays to identify the closest pair of points. So to see that, consider the following example. So we're going to look at a point set which has six points. There's going to be two points, which I'll put in blue, which are very close in x-coordinate, but very far away in y-coordinate. And then there's going to be another pair of points, which I'll do in green, which are very close in y-coordinate, but very far away in x-coordinate. And then there's going to be a red pair of points, which are not too far away in either the x-coordinate or the y-coordinate. So in this set of six points, the closest pair is the pair of red points, but they're not even going to show up consecutively in either of the two arrays, right? So in the array that's sorted by x-coordinate, this blue point here is going to be wedged in between the two red points, so they won't be consecutive. And similarly, in, the, in PY, which is sorted by y-coordinate, this green point is going to be wedged between the two red points. So you won't even notice these red points if you just do a linear scan through PX and P or PY and look at the consecutive pairs of points. So following our preprocessing step where we just inver invoke merge sort twice, we're going to do a quite non-trivial divide and conquer algorithm to compute the closest pair. So really in this algorithm, we're applying the divide and conquer algorithm twice. First, internal to the sorting subroutine, assuming that we use the merge sort algorithm to sort, divide and conquer is being used there to get an n log n running time uh, in this preprocessing step. And then we're going to use it again on the sorted arrays in a new way. And that's what I'm going to tell you about next. So let's just briefly review the divide and conquer algorithm design paradigm before we apply it to the closest pair problem. So as usual, the first step is to figure out a way to divide your problem into smaller subproblems. Sometimes this has a reasonable amount of ingenuity, but it's not going to here in the closest pair problem. We're going to proceed exactly as we did in the merge sort and counting inversions problems, where we took the array and broke it into its left and right half. So here we're going to take the input point set, and again, just recurse on the left half of the points and recurse on the right half of the points. We're here by left and right, I mean with respect to the points x-coordinates. There's pretty much never any ingenuity in the conquer step. That just means you take the subproblems you identified in the first step and you solve them recursively. That's what we'll do here. We'll recursively compute the closest pair in the left half of the points and the closest pair in the right half of the points. So where all the creativity in divide and conquer algorithms lie is in the combined step. Given solutions to your subproblems, how do you somehow recover a solution to the original problem, the one that you actually care about? So for closest pair, the question is going to be, given that you've computed the closest pair on the left half of the points, the closest pair on the right half of the points, how do you then quickly recover the closest pair from the whole point set? That's a tricky problem. That's what we're going to spend most of our time on. So let's make this divide and conquer approach for closest pair a little bit more precise. So let's now actually start spelling out our closest pair algorithm. The input we're given, it's this follows the preprocessing step. So recall that we invoke merge sort twice. We get our two sorted copies of the point set px sorted by x coordinate and py sorted by y coordinate. So the first step then is the division step. 
So given that we have a copy of the points px sorted by x coordinate, it's easy to identify the leftmost half of the points, those with the those n over 2 uh, smallest x coordinates, and then the right half, those with the n over 2 largest x coordinates. We're going to call those q and r respectively. One thing I'm skipping over is the base case. I'm not going to bother writing that down. So base case omitted, but it's what you would think it would be. So basically, once you have a small number of points, say two points or three points, then you can just solve the problem in constant time by brute force search. You just look at all the pairs, and you return the closest pair. So think of there being at least four points in the input. Now, in order to recurse, to call close pair again on the left and right halves, we need sorted versions of Q and R, both by x-coordinate and by y-coordinate. So we're just going to form those uh, by doing suitable linear scans through px and py. And so one thing I encourage you to think through carefully, or maybe even code up uh, after the video, is how would you f uh, form QX, QY, RX, and RY, given that you already have PX and PY. And if you think about it, because PX and PY are already sorted, just producing these sorted sublists takes linear time. It's in some sense the opposite of the merge subroutine we used in merge sort. Here we're sort of splitting rather than merging. But again, this can be done in linear time. That's something you should think through carefully later. So that's the division step. Now we just conquer, meaning we recursively call closest pair on each of the two subproblems. So when we invoke closest pair on the left half of the points on Q, uh, we're going to get back what are indeed the closest pair of points amongst those in Q. So we're going to call those P1 and PQ. So among all pairs of points that both lie in Q, P1 and Q1 minimize the distance between them. Similarly, we're going to call P2, Q2 the results of the second recursive call. That is, P2 and Q2 are amongst all pairs of points that both lie in R, the pair that has the minimum Euclidean distance. Now, conceptually, there's two cases. There's a lucky case and there's an unlucky case. In the original point set P, if we're lucky, the closest pair of points in all of P, actually, both of them lie in Q or both of them lie in R. In this lucky case, we'd already be done. If the closest pair in the entire point set they happen to both lie in Q, then this first recursive call is going to recover them, and we just have them uh, in our hands, P1, Q1. Similarly, if both of the closest pair of points in all of P lies on the right side, in R, then they get handed to us on a silver platter by the second recursive call uh, that just operates on R. So in the unlucky case, the closest pair of points in P happens to be split. That is, one of the points lies in the left half in Q, and the other point lies in the right half in R. Notice, if the closest pair of points in all of P is split, is half in Q and half in R, neither recursive call is going to find it. Okay? The pair of points is not passed to either of the two recursive calls, so there's no way it's going to be returned to us. Okay? So we have not identified the closest pair after these two recursive calls if the closest pair happens to be split. This is exactly analogous to what happened when we were counting inversions. The recursive call in the left half of the array counted the left inversions. The recursive call in the right half of the array counted the right inversions, but we still had to count the split inversions. So in this closest pair algorithm, we still need a special purpose subroutine that computes the closest pair for the case in which it is split, in which there's one point in Q and one point in R. So just like in counting inversions, I'm going to write down that subroutine. I'm going to leave it unimplemented for now. We'll figure out how to implement it quickly uh, in the rest of the lecture. Now, if we have a correct implementation of closest split pair, so that takes as uh, input the original point set, sort of by x and y coordinate, and returns the smallest pair that's split, where one point's in q and one point's in r, then we're done. So then the split, then the closest pair has to either be on the left or on the right, or it has to be split. Steps two through four compute the closest pair in each of those categories, so those are the only possible candidates for the closest pair, and we just return the best of them. So that's an argument for why, if we have a correct implementation of the closest split pair subroutine, then that implies a correct implementation of closest pair. Now, what about the running time? So the running time of the closest pair algorithm is going to be, in part, determined by the running time of closest split pair. So in the next quiz, I want you to think about what kind of running time we should be shooting for with the closest split pair subroutine. So the correct response to this quiz is the second one. And uh, the reasoning is just by analogy with our previous algorithms for merge sort and for counting inversions. 
So what is all of the work that we would do in this algorithm? Well, we do have this pre-processing step we call merge sort twice. We know that's n log n, so we're not going to have a running time better than n log n because we sort at the beginning. And then we have a recursive algorithm with the following flavor. It makes two recursive calls. Each recursive call is on a problem of exactly half the size with half the points of the original one. And outside of the recursive calls, by assumption, by in the problem, we do a linear amount of work in the, computing the closest split pair. So we, the exact same recursion tree, which proves an n log n bound for merge short, proves an n log n bound for how much work we do after the pre-processing step. So that gives us an overall running time bound of n log n. And remember, that's what we were shooting for. We were working n log n already to solve the one-dimensional version of closest pair, and the goal of these lectures is to have an n log n algorithm for the 2D version. So this would be great. So in other words, the goal should be to have a correct linear time implementation of the closest split pair subroutine. If we can do that, we're home free. We get the desired n log n algorithm. Now, I'm going to proceed in a little bit to show you how to implement closest split pair. But before I do that, I want to point out one subtle but key idea, which is going to allow us to get this linear time correct implementation. So let me just put that on this slide. So the key idea is that we don't actually need a full-blown correct implementation of the closest split pair subroutine. So I'm not actually going to show you a linear time subroutine that always correctly computes the closest split pair of a point set. The reason I'm not going to do that is that's actually a strictly harder problem than what we need to have a correct recursive algorithm. We do not actually need a subroutine that, for every point set, always correctly computes the closest split pair of points. Remember, there's a lucky case and there's an unlucky case. The lucky case is where the closest pair in the whole point set P happens to lie entirely in the left half of the points Q or in the right half of the points R. In that lucky case, we one of our recursive calls will identify this closest pair and hand it over to us on a silver platter. We could care less about the split pairs in that case. We get the right answer without even looking at the split pairs. Now there's this unlucky case where the split pair happens to be the closest pair of points. That is when we need this linear time subroutine, and only then, only in the unlucky case where the closest pair of points happens to be split. Now that's in some sense a fairly trivial observation, but there's a lot of ingenuity here in figuring out how to use that observation, the fact that we only need to solve a strictly easier problem, and that will enable the linear time implementation that I'm going to show you next. So now let's rewrite the high-level recursive algorithm slightly to make use of this observation that the closest split pair subroutine only has to operate correctly in the regime of the unlucky case, when in fact the closest split pair is closer than the result of either recursive call. So I've erased the previous steps 4 and 5, that, and, but we're going to rewrite them in a second. So before we invoke closest split pair, what we're going to do is we're going to see how well did our recursive calls do. That is, we're going to define a parameter little delta which is going to be the closest pair that we found, or the distance of the closest pair we found by either recursive call. So the minimum of the distance between P1 and Q1, the closest pair that lies entirely on the left, and P2, Q2, the closest pair that lies entirely on the right. Now we're going to pass this delta information as a parameter into our closest split pair subroutine. We're going to have to see why on earth that would be useful. I still owe you that information, but for now we're just going to pass delta as a parameter for use in closest split pair. And then as before, we just do a comparison between the three candidate closest pairs and return the best of the, of the trio. And so just we're all clear on, on where things stand, so what remains is to describe the implementation of closest split pair. And before I describe it, let me just be crystal clear on what it is that we're going to demand of the subroutine. What do we need to have a correct and O of n log n time closest pair algorithm? Well, as you saw on the quiz, we want the running time to be O of n, always. And for correctness, what do we need? Again, we don't need it to always compute the closest split pair, but we need it to compute the closest split pair in the event that there is a split pair of distance strictly less than delta, strictly better than the outcome of either recursive call. So now that we're clear on what we want, let's go ahead and go through the pseudocode for this closest split pair subroutine. And I'm going to tell you up front, it's going to be fairly straightforward to figure out that the subroutine runs in linear time, O of n time. The correctness requirement of closest split pair will be highly non-obvious. In fact, after I show you the pseudocode, you're not going to believe me. You're going to look at the pseudocode and you're going to be like, what are you talking about? But in the second video on the closest pair lecture, we will in fact show that this is uh, a correct subroutine. So how does it work? Well, let's look at a point set. 
So the first thing we're going to do is a filtering step. We're going to prune a bunch of the points away and sort of zoom in on a subset of the points. And the subset of the points we're going to look at is those that lie in a vertical strip, which is roughly centered in the middle of the point set. So here's what I mean. By centered, we're going to look at the middle x-coordinate. So let x bar be the biggest x-coordinate in the left half. So that is, in the sorted version of the points by x-coordinate, we look at the n over tooth smallest x-coordinate. So in this example where we have six points, all this means is we draw, we imagine drawing a line between the third point. So that's going to be x bar, the x-coordinate of the third point from the left. Now since we're passed as input a copy of the point sorted by x-coordinate, we can figure out what x-bar is in constant time, just by accessing the relevant entry of the array px. Now the way we're going to use this parameter delta that we're passed, so remember what delta is. So before we invoke the closest split pair subroutine in the recursive algorithm, we make our two recursive calls. We find the closest pair on the left, the closest pair on the right, and delta is whatever the smaller of those two distances are. So delta is the parameter that controls whether or not we actually care about the closest split pair or not. We care if and only if there is a split pair at distance less than delta. So how do we use delta? Well, that's going to determine the width of our strip. So the strip's going to have width to delta, and it's going to be centered around x. And the first thing we're going to do is we're going to ignore forevermore points which do not lie in this vertical strip. So the rest of the algorithm will operate only on the subset of p, the subset of the points that lie in this strip. And we're going to keep track of them sorted by y-coordinate. So the formal way to say that they lie in this strip is that they have x-coordinate in the interval with lower endpoint x bar minus delta and upper endpoint x bar plus delta. Now how long does it take to construct this set SY sorted by Y coordinate? Well fortunately we've been passed as input a sorted version of the points PY. So to extract SY from PY all we need to do is a simple linear scan through PY uh, checking for each point where its X coordinate is. So this can be done in linear time. Now, I haven't yet shown you why it's useful to have this sorted set SY, but if you take it on faith that it's useful to have the points in this vertical strip sorted by Y coordinate, you now see why it was useful that we did this merge sort all the way at the beginning of the algorithm before we even underwent any recursion. Remember, what is our running time goal for closest split pair? We want this to run in linear time. That means we cannot sort inside the closest split pair subroutine. That would take too long. We want this to be linear time. Fortunately, since we sorted once and for all at the beginning of the closest pair algorithm, extracting sorted sublists from those sorted lists of points can be done in linear time, which is within our goals here. Now, it's the rest of the subroutine where you're never going to believe me that it does anything useful. So I claim that essentially with a linear scan through SY, we're going to be able to identify the closest split pair of points in the interesting unlucky case where there is such a split pair uh, with distance less than delta. So here's what I mean by that linear scan through SY. So as we do the scan, we're, we're going to keep track of the closest pair of points of a particular type that we've seen so far. So let me introduce some variables to keep track of the best candidate we've seen so far. So there's going to be a vari variable best, which will initialize to be delta. Remember, we're uninterested in split pairs unless they have distance strictly less than delta. And then we're going to keep track of the points themselves, so we'll initialize the best pair to be null. Now here's the linear scan. So we go through the points of SY in order of Y coordinate. Okay, well not quite all the points of SY. We stop at the eighth to last point, and you'll see why in a second. And then for each position I of the array SY, we investigate the seven subsequent points of the same array SY. So for J going from one to seven, we look at the ith and I plus Jth entry of SY. So if SY looks something like this array here, at any given point in this double for loop, we're generally looking at an index I, a point in this, in this ith entry of the array, and then some really quite nearby point in the array I plus J, because J here is going to be uh, at most 7. Okay, so we're constantly looking at pairs in this array, but we're not looking at all pairs at all. We're only looking at pairs that are very close to each other within 7 positions of each other. And what do we do for each choice of i and j? Well, we just look at those points, we compute the distance, we see if it's better than all of the pairs of points of this form that we've looked at in the past, and if it is better, then we remember it. So we just remember the best, i.e. closest pair of points of this particular type for choices of i and j uh, of this form. So in more detail, if the distance between the current pair of points p and q is better than the best we've seen so far, we reset the best pair of points to be equal to p and q, and we reset the best distance, the closest distance seen so far to be the distance between p and q. 
and that's it. Then once this double for loop terminates, we just return the best pair. So one possible execution of closest split pair is that it never finds a pair of points P and Q a distance less than delta. In that case, this is going to return null. And then in the outer call, in the closest pair, obviously you interpret a null pair of points to having an infinite distance. So if you call closest split pair and it doesn't return any points, then the interpretation is that there's no interesting split pair of points and you just return the better of the results of the two recursive calls, P1, Q1, or P2, Q2. Now, as far as the running time of this subroutine, what happens here? Well, we do constant work, just initializing the variables. Then uh, notice that the number of points in SY, well, in the worst case, you have all of the points of P. So there's going to be at most N points. And so you do a linear number of iterations in the outer for loop. But here's the key point. In the inner for loop, right, normally double for loops give rise to quadratic running time. But in this inner for loop, we only look at a constant number of other positions. We only look at seven other positions. And for each of those seven positions, we only do a constant number of work. Right, we just uh, compare a distance and make a couple other comparisons and reset some variables. So for each of the linear number of outer iterations, we do a constant amount of work. So that gives us a running time of O of N for this part of the algorithm. So as I promised, analyzing the running time of this closest split pair subroutine was not challenging. We just, in a straightforward way, looked at all the operations. And again, because in the key linear scan, we only do constant work per index, the overall running time is big O of n, just as we want it. So this does mean that our overall recursive algorithm will have running time O of n log n. What is totally not obvious, and perhaps even unbelievable, is that this subroutine satisfies the correctness uh, requirements that we wanted. And remember what we needed, we needed that whenever we're in the unlucky case, whenever in fact the closest pair of points in the whole point set is split, this subroutine better find it. So, but it does, and that's made precise in the following correctness claim. So let me phrase the claim in terms of an arbitrary split pair which has distance less than delta, not necessarily the closest such pair. So suppose there exists a P on the left, a point on the left side, and a point on the right side, so that is a split pair. And suppose the distance uh, of this pair is less than Q. Now there may or may not be such a pair of points PQ. Don't forget what this parameter delta means. What delta is, by definition, is the minimum of D of P1Q1, where P1Q1 is the closest pair of points that lie entirely in the left half of the point set Q, and D of P2Q2 or similarly, P2Q2 is the closest pair of points that lies entirely on the right inside of R. So if there's a split pair with distance less than delta, this is exactly the unlucky case of the algorithm. This is exactly where neither recursive call successfully identifies the closest pair of points. Instead, that closest pair is a split pair. On the other hand, if we are in the lucky case, then there will not be any split pairs with distance less than delta because the closest pair lies either all on the left or all on the right, and it's not split. But remember, so we're interested in the case where there is a split pair uh, that has distance less than delta, where there is a split pair that is the closest pair. So the claim has two parts. The first part, part A, says the following. It says that if there's a split pair P and Q of this type, then P and Q are members of SY. Now let me just sort of redraw the cartoon. So remember what SY is. SY is that vertical strip. And again, the way we got that is we drew a line through a median X coordinate, and then we fattened it by delta on either side and then we focused only on points that lie in the vertical strip. Now notice our counts uh, split pair subroutine, if it ever returns a pair of points, it's going to return a pair of points PQ that belong to SY. First it filters down to SY, then it does a linear search through SY. So if we want to believe that our subroutine identifies best uh, split pairs of points, then in particular such split pairs of points better show up in SY. They better survive the filtering step. So that's precisely what part A of the claim is. Here's part B of the claim, and this is the more remarkable part of the claim, which is that P and Q are almost next to each other in this sorted array SY. So they're not necessarily adjacent, but they're very close. They're within seven positions away from each other. So this is really the remarkable part of the algorithm. This is really uh, what's surprising and what makes the whole algorithm work. So just to make sure that we're all clear on everything, let's show that if we prove this claim, then we're done. Then we have a correct, fast implementation of a closest pair algorithm. I certainly owe you the proof of the claim. That's what the next video is going to be all about. But let's show that if the claim is true, then we're home free. So if this claim is true, then so is the following corollary, which I'll call corollary one. 
So corollary one says, if we're in the unlucky case that we discussed earlier, if we're in the case where the closest point in the whole point set P does not lie both on the left, does not lie both on the right, but rather has one point on the left and one on the right, that is, it's a split pair, then in fact, the count split pair subroutine will correctly identify uh, the closest split pair, and therefore the closest pair overall. Why is this true? Well, what does count split pair do? Okay, so it has this double for loop, and it thereby explicitly examines a bunch of pairs of points, and it remembers the closest pair of all of the pairs of points that it examines. What does this, so what are the criteria that are necessary for a count split pair to examine a pair of points? Well, first of all, the points P and Q both have to survive the filtering step and make it into the array SY. Right, so count split pair only searches over the array SY. Secondly, it only searches over pairs of points that are almost adjacent in SY, that are only seven positions apart. But amongst pairs of points that satisfy those two criteria, count split pair will certainly compute the closest such pair. Right? It just explicitly remembers the best of them. Now, what's the content of the claim? Well, the claim is guaranteeing that every potentially interesting split pair of points, namely every split pair of points with distance less than delta, meets both of the criteria which are necessary to be examined by the count split pair subroutine. So first of all, and this is the content of part A, if you have an interesting split pair of points with distance less than delta, then they'll both survive the filtering step. They'll both make it into the array SY. Part A says that. Part B says they're almost adjacent in SY. So if you have an interesting split pair of points, meaning it has distance less than delta, then they will in fact be at most seven positions apart. Therefore, count split pair will examine all such split pairs, all split pairs with distance less than delta, and just by construction it will compute the closest pair of all of them. So again, in the unlucky case where the best pair of points is a split pair, then this claim guarantees that the count split pair will compute the closest pair of points. Therefore, having handled correctness, we can just combine that with our earlier observations about running time, and corollary two just says, if we can prove the claim, then we have everything we wanted. We have a correct O of n log n implementation for the closest pair points. So with further work and a lot more ingenuity, we've replicated the guarantee that we got just by sorting for the one-dimensional case. Now again, these corollaries hold only if the claim is in fact true. And I've given you no justification for this claim, and indeed even the statement of the claim I think is a little bit shocking. So if I were you, I would demand an explanation for why this claim is true, and that's what I'm going to give you in the next video. All right, so the plan for this video is to prove the correctness of the divide and conquer closest pair algorithm that we discussed in the previous video. So just to refresh your memory, how does the outer algorithm work? Well, we're given endpoints in the plane. We begin by sorting them, first by x-coordinate and then by y-coordinate. That takes n log n time. Then we enter the main recursive divide and conquer powder of the algorithm. So what do we do? We divide the point set into the left half and into the right half, capital Q and capital R. Then we conquer. We recursively compute the closest pair in the left half of the point set Q. We recursively compute the closest pair in the right half of the point set R. There is a lucky case where the closest pair in the entire point set lies either all on the left or all on the right. In that case, the closest pair is handed to us on a silver platter by one of the two recursive calls. But there remains the unlucky case where the closest pair is actually split with one point on the left and one point on the right. So to get our n log n running time bound, analogous to merge sort and our inversion counting, we need to have a linear time implementation of a subroutine which computes the best, the closest pair of points which is split, one on the left or one on the right. Well, actually, we don't need to do quite that. We need to do something only a little bit weaker. We need a linear time algorithm which, whenever the closest pair in the whole point set is, in fact, split, then computes that split pair in linear time. So let me now remind you how that subroutine works. So it has two basic steps. So first there's a filtering step. So it looks at, uh, first of all, a vertical strip roughly down the middle of the point set. And it looks at only at points which fall into that vertical strip. That was a subset of the points that we called S sub Y because we keep track of them sorted by Y coordinate. And then we do essentially a linear scan through S Y. So we go through the points one at a time. And then for each point, we look at only the almost adjacent points. So for each index I, we look only at J's that are between one and seven positions further to the right uh, than I. So among all such points, 
Uh, we compare them, we look at their distances, we remember the best such pair of points, and then that's what we return from the count split pair subroutine. So we've already argued in the previous video that the overall running time of the algorithm is n log n, and what remains is to prove correctness. And we also argued in the previous video that correctness boils down to the following correctness claim, in the sense that if we can prove this claim, then the entire algorithm is correct. So this is what remains. Our residual work is to provide a proof of the correctness claim. What does it say? It says consider any split pair, that is one point P from the left side Q, capital Q, and another point little q, drawn from the right side of the point set capital R, and for, further suppose that it's an interesting split pair, meaning that the distance between them is at most delta. Here delta is, recall, the parameter passed to the count split pair subroutine, which is the smallest distance between a pair of points, which is all on the left or all on the right, and this is the only case we're interested in. There's two claims. First of all, for P and Q, both members of the split pair, survive the filtering step. They uh, make it into the sorted list S sub Y. And second of all, they will be considered by that double for loop in the sense that the positions of P and Q in this array S sub Y differ by at most seven. So that's the story so far. Let's move on to the proof. So let's start with part A, which is the easy part, relatively, of the claim. So remember what we start with, our assumptions. We have a point P. Let's uh, write it out in terms of the x coordinates, x1 and y1, which is from the left half of the point set. And we have a point Q, which we'll call x2, y2, which comes from the right half of the point set. And furthermore, we're assuming that these points are close to each other. And we're going to use that hypothesis over and over again. So the Euclidean distance between P and Q is no more than this parameter delta. So first, something very simple, which is that if you have two points which are close in Euclidean distance, then both of their coordinates have to be close to each other. Right? If you have two points and they differ by a lot in one coordinate, then the Euclidean distance is going to be pretty big as well. So specifically, by our hypothesis that P and Q have Euclidean distance less than delta, it must be that the difference between their coordinates in absolute value is no more than delta, and as well, the difference between their Y coordinates is at most delta. Okay, and this is easy to see if you just return to the definition of Euclidean distance that we reviewed uh, at the beginning of the discussion of closest point. Okay, so if your distance is at most delta, then in each coordinate you differ by at most delta as well. Now, what does A say? So proof of A. So what does part A of the claim assert? It asserts that P and Q are both members of SY, or both members of that vertical strip. So another way of saying that is that the x-coordinates of P and Q, that is the numbers x1 and x2, both are within delta of x-bar. Remember, x-bar was in some sense the median x-coordinate, so the x-coordinate of the n over tooth leftmost point. So we're going to do a proof by picture. So consider, forget about y-coordinates, that's sort of irrelevant right now, and just focus on the x-coordinates of all of these points. So on the one hand, we have x-bar. This is the x-coordinate of the n over tooth point from the left. And then there are the x-coordinates which define the left and the right borders of that vertical strip, namely x-bar minus delta and x-bar plus delta. And then somewhere in here are x1 and y1, the x-coordinates of the points we care about, p and q. So a simple observation. So because p comes from the left half of the point set and x-bar is the rightmost x-coordinate of the left half of the point set, the x-coordinate of p is at most x-bar. Right? So all points of Q have X coordinate at most X bar, in particular P does. Similarly, since X bar is the rightmost edge of the left half of the point set, everything in the right half of the point set has X coordinate at least X bar. So in particular, little Q does as well. So what does this mean? So this means X1, wherever it is, has to be to the left of X bar. X2, wherever it is, has to be to the right of X bar. And what we're trying to prove is that they're wedged in between X bar minus delta and X bar plus delta. And the reason why that's true is because their x-coordinates also differ by at most delta. Okay, so what you should imagine is you, you can imagine x1 and x2 are sort of people tied by a rope at the waist. And this rope has length delta. So wherever x1 and x2 move, they're most delta apart. Furthermore, x1, we just observed, can't move any farther to the right than x-bar. So even if x1 moves as far to the right as it can all the way to x-bar, x2, since it's at most delta away, tied by the waist, can't extend beyond x bar plus delta. By the same reasoning, x2 can't move any further to the left than x bar. x1 being tied to the waist to x2 can never drift further to the left than x bar minus delta. So that's the proof that x1 and x2 both lie within this region that defines the vertical strip. So that's part A. You have any split pair whose distance between them is less than delta, they both have to wind up uh, in this vertical strip. 
and therefore wind up in the filtered set, the prune set, S sub y. So that's part A of the claim. Let's now move to part B. Recall what part B asserts. It says that the points P and Q, the split pair that are distance only delta apart, not only do they wind up in this sort of filtered set SY, but in fact they are almost adjacent in SY, in the sense that the indices in the array differ by at most seven positions. And this is the part of the claim that's a little bit shocking. Really what this says is that we're getting away with more or less a variant of our one-dimensional algorithm. Remember when we wanted to find the closest pair of points on the line, all we had to do was sort them by their single coordinate and then look at consecutive pairs and return the best of those consecutive pairs. Here what we're saying is really once we do a suitable filtering and focus on points in this vertical strip, then we just go through the points according to their y-coordinate. And okay, we don't, we don't just look at adjacent pairs, we look at pairs within seven positions, but still we ba basically do a linear sweep through the points in SY according to their Y coordinate and that's sufficient to identify uh, the closest split pair. So why on earth would this be true? So our workhorse in this argument will be a picture which I'm going to draw next. So I'm going to draw eight boxes which have a uh, height and width delta over two. So here delta is the same parameter that's passed to the closest split pair subroutine and it's also the same delta which we're assuming P and Q are closer to each other then, right? So that's, remember that's one of our hypotheses in this claim, the distance between P and Q is strictly less than delta. So we're gonna draw eight delta over two boxes and they're gonna be centered at X bar, so the same uh, center of the vertical strip that defines SY and the bottom is going to be the smaller of the Y coordinates of the points P and Q. So it might be P, it might be Q, it's, it doesn't really matter. But so just the, let, uh, the bottom is going to be the smaller of the two. So the picture then looks as follows. So the center of these collections of eight boxes is X bar. The bottom is the minimum of Y1, Y2. We're going to have two rows and four columns. And needless to say, we're drawing this picture just for the sake of this correctness proof, right? This picture is just a thought experiment in our head. We're just trying to understand why the algorithm works. The algorithm, of course, does not draw these boxes. The subroutine, the closest split pair subroutine, is just that pseudocode we saw in the previous video. This is just to reason about the, the behavior of that subroutine. Now, looking ahead, I'll make this precise in two lemmas that are about to come up. What's going to be true is the following. So either P or Q is on this bottom line. Right, so we define the bottom to be the lower y-coordinate of the two. So maybe, for example, q is the one that has the smaller y-coordinate, in which case is going to be somewhere, say, down here. p, remember, is from the left half of the point set, so p is maybe going to be here or something. And we're going to argue that both p and q have to be in these boxes. Moreover, we're going to argue that these boxes are sparsely populated. Everyone contains either zero or one point of the array s sub y. So what we're going to see is that there's at most eight points in this picture, two of which are P and Q, and therefore if you look at these points sorted by Y coordinate, it has to be that they're within seven of each other. The difference of indices uh, is no more than seven. So we're going to make those two statements precise uh, one at a time by the following two lemmas. Let's start with lemma one. Lemma one is the easy one, and it states that all of the points of S sub y, which show up in between the y coordinates of the points we care about, P and Q, have to appear in this picture. They have to lie in one of these eight boxes. So we're going to argue this in two steps. First, we're going to argue that all such points have to have y coordinates within the relevant range of this picture between the minimum of y1 and y2 and delta more than that. And secondly, that they have to have x coordinates uh, in the range of this picture, namely between x bar minus delta and x bar plus delta. So let's start with y coordinates. So again, remember this key hypothesis we have. Okay, we're dealing with a split pair PQ that are close to each other. The distance between x and y is strictly less than delta. So the very first thing we did at the beginning of this proof is we said, well, if their Euclidean distance is less than delta, then they have to differ by at most delta in both of their coordinates, and in particular in their y coordinate. Now remember, whichever is the lower of P and Q, whichever one has a smaller Y coordinate is precisely at the bottom of this diagram. So for example, if Q is the one with a smaller Y coordinate, it might be on the black line right here. So that means in particular, X has Y coordinate 
uh, no more than the top part of this diagram, no more than delta bigger than Q, and of course all points with Y coordinates in between them are equally well wedged into this picture. So that's why all points of SY with Y coordinate between those of P and Q have to be in the range of this picture, between the minimum of the two Y coordinates and delta more than that. Now what about horizontally? What about the X coordinates? Well, this just follows from the definition of S sub Y. So remember, S sub Y are the points that fall into this vertical strip. How did we define the vertical strip? Well, it had center X bar, and then we fattened it by delta on both sides. So just by definition, if you're in S Y, you got to have X coordinates in the range of this picture. X delta plus minus, uh, sorry, X bar plus minus delta. So that completes the proof of the lemma. So this is not... This is just a lemma, so I'll use a lowercase qed. Uh, remember, this is just a step toward proving the overall correctness claim. But this is a good step. And again, the way to think about this is it says we draw these boxes. We know either P or Q is at the bottom. The other one is going to be on the other side of the black line x bar, but will be in some other box. So perhaps maybe P is here. And the lemma is saying that all the relevant points of S, Y have to be somewhere in this picture. Now remember, in our double for loop, we only search seven positions away. So the concern is that this is a sort of super highly populated uh, collection of eight boxes. That's the concern, but that's not going to be the case. And that's exactly what lemma two is going to say. Not only do the points between P and Q and Y coordinates show up in this diagram, but there have to be very few. In particular, every box has to be uh, sparse with population either zero or one. So let's move on to lemma two. So for me, the claim is, we have at most one point of the point set in each of these eight boxes. And this is finally where we use, in a real way, the definition of delta. This is where we finally get the payoff from our realization long ago that when defining the closest split pair subroutine, we only really need to be correct in the unlucky case, in the case we're not handed the right answer by one of our recursive calls. We're finally going to use that fact uh, in a fundamental way. So we're going to proceed by contradiction. So we're going to think about what happens if there are two points in a single box. And from that, we'll be able to derive a contradiction. So call the points that wind up in the same box A and B. So to the contrary, suppose A and B lie in the same box. So maybe this is A here, and this is B here at and typical corners of this particular box. So from this supposition, we have two consequences. First of all, I claim that A and B lie on the same side of the point set. They're either both in the left side Q or they're both in the right side R. So why is this true? Well, it's because every box lies either entirely in the left half of the point set or in the right half of the point set. Recall how we define X bar. X bar is the X coordinate of the rightmost point amongst the left half of the point set, capital Q. So therefore, points with X coordinate at most X bar have to lie inside the left half Q. Points with X coordinates at least X bar have to lie inside the right half of the point set, capital R. So that would be like in this example, A and B both lie in a box, which is to the right of X bar, so they both have to come from the right half of the point set, capital R. This is one place we're using that there's no ties in X coordinate, so if there's a point with X, with X coordinate X bar, we can count it as part of the left half. So every box, by virtue of being either to the left of X bar or to the right of X bar, can only contain points from a common half of the point set. So that's the first consequence of assuming that you have two points in the same box. The second consequence is because the boxes are small, the points got to be close. So if A and B cohabitate a box, how far could they be from each other? Well, the farthest they could be is like I've drawn in the picture with the points A and B, where they're at opposite corners of a common box. And then you bust out Pythagorean's theorem, and what do you get? You get that the distance between them is delta over 2, the side of the box, times root 2. And what's relevant for us is this is strictly less than delta, okay? But now, here's where we use, finally, the definition of delta. Consequences 1 and 2, in tandem, contradict how we define delta. Remember what delta is? It's as close as two pair of, a pair of points can get if they both lie on the left side of the point set or if they both lie on the right side of the point set. That is how we defined it. As small as a pair of points on a common half can get to each other, 
But what have we just done? We've exhibited a pair A and B that lie on the same half of the point set and are strictly closer than delta. So that contradicts the definition of delta. So that completes the proof of lemma 2. Let me just make sure we're all clear on why having proved lemma 1 and lemma 2, we're done with the proof of part B of the claim, and therefore the entire claim, because we already proved part 1 now a long time ago. So let's interpret the two lemmas in the context of our picture that we've had all throughout in terms of the eight boxes of side length of delta over 2 by delta over 2. So again, whichever is the lower of P and Q, and again, let's just, uh, for the sake of concreteness, say it's Q, is at the bottom of the picture. The other point is on the other half of the line X bar and is in one of the other boxes. So for example, maybe P is right here. So lemma 1 says that every relevant point, every point that survives the filtering and makes it into SY by virtue of being in the vertical strip has to be in one of these boxes, okay, if it has Y coordinate in between P and Q. Lemma 2 says that you can only have one point in each of these boxes from the point set, so that's going to be at most 8 total. So combining them, lemmas 1 and 2 imply there are at most eight points in this picture, and that includes P and Q, because they also occupy two of the eight boxes. So in the worst case, if this is as densely populated as could possibly be, given lemmas 1 and 2, every other box might have a point, and perhaps every one of those points has Y coordinate between P and Q. But this is as bad as it gets. Any point of the strip with Y coordinate between P and Q occupies a box, so at most there are these six wedged in between them. What does this mean? This means if from Q you look seven positions ahead in the array, you are guaranteed to find this point P. So a split pair with distance less than delta is guaranteed to be identified by our double for loop. Looking seven positions ahead in the sorted array SY is sufficient to identify, to look at, every conceivably interesting split pair. So that completes the assertion B of the uh, correctness claim, and we're done. That establishes that this supremely clever divide and conquer algorithm is indeed a correct O of n log n algorithm that computes the closest pair of a set of n points in the plane. In this series of videos, we'll study the master method, which is a general mathematical tool for analyzing the running time of divide and conquer algorithms. We'll begin in this video motivating the method, then we'll give its formal description. That'll be followed by a video working through six examples. Finally, we'll conclude with three videos that discuss a proof of the master method, with a particular emphasis on the conceptual interpretation of the master method's three cases. So let me say at the outset that this lecture is a little bit more mathematical than the previous two, but it's really not just math for math's sake. We'll be rewarded for our work with this powerful tool, the master method, which has a lot of predictive power. It'll give us good advice about which divide and conquer algorithms are likely to run quickly and which ones are likely to run less quickly. Indeed, it's sort of a general truism that novel algorithmic ideas often require mathematical analysis to properly evaluate. This lecture will be one example of that truism. As a motivating example, consider the computational problem of multiplying two n-digit numbers. Recall from our first set of lectures that we all learned the iterative grade school multiplication algorithm and that that requires a number of basic operations, additions and multiplications between single digits, which grows quadratically with the number of digits n. On the other hand, we also discussed an interesting recursive approach using the divide and conquer paradigm. So recall divide and conquer necessitates identifying smaller subproblems. So for integer multiplication, we need to identify smaller numbers that we want to multiply. So we proceeded in the obvious way, breaking each of the two numbers into its left half of the digits and its right half of the digits. For convenience, I'm assuming that the number of digits n is even, but it really doesn't matter. Having decomposed x and y in this way, we can now expand the product and see what we get. So let's put a box around this expression and call it star. So we begin with the sort of obvious recursive algorithm where we just evaluate the expression star in the straightforward way. That is, star contains four products involving n over two digit numbers, a, c, a, d, b, c, and b, d. So we make four recursive calls to compute them, and then we complete the evaluation in the natural way. Namely, we append zeros as necessary and add up these three terms to get the final result. The way we reason about the running time of recursive algorithms like this one is using what's called a recurrence. So to introduce a recurrence, let me first make some notation, t of n. 
This is going to be the quantity that we really care about, the quantity that we want to upper bound. Namely, this will be the worst case number of operations that this recursive algorithm requires to multiply two n-digit numbers. This is exactly what we want to upper bound. A recurrence, then, is simply a way to express t of n in terms of t of smaller numbers. That is, the running time of an algorithm in terms of the work done by its recursive calls. So every recurrence has two ingredients. First of all, it has a base case describing the running time when there's no further recursion. And in this integer multiplication algorithm, like in most divide and conquer algorithms, the base case is easy. Once you get down to a small input, in this case two one-digit numbers, then the running time is just constant. All you do is multiply the two digits and return the result. So I'm going to express that by just declaring that t of 1, the time needed to multiply one-digit numbers, is bounded above by a constant. I'm not going to bother to specify what this constant is. You can think of it as 1 or 2 if you like. It's not going to matter for what's to follow. The second ingredient in a recurrence is the important one, and it's what happens in the general case when you're not in the base case and you make recursive calls. And all you do is write down the running time in terms of two pieces. First of all, the work done by the recursive calls, and second of all, the work that's done right here now, work done outside of the recursive calls. So on the left-hand side of this general case, we just write t of n, and then we want an upper bound on t of n in terms of the work done by recursive calls and the work done outside of recursive calls. And I hope it's self-evident what the recurrence should be in this recursive algorithm for integer multiplication. As we discussed, there's exactly four recursive calls, and each is invoked on a pair of n over two digit numbers. So that gives us four times the time needed to multiply n over two digit numbers. So what do we do outside of the recursive call? Well, we pad the results of the recursive calls with a bunch of zeros, and we add them up. And I'll leave it to you to verify that grade school addition, in fact, runs in time linear in the number of digits. So putting it all together, the amount of work we do outside of the recursive calls is linear. That is, it's big O of n. Let's move on to the second, more clever, recursive algorithm for integer multiplication, which dates back to Gauss. Gauss's insight was to realize that in the expression star that we're trying to evaluate, there's really only three fundamental quantities that we care about, the coefficients for each of the three terms in the expression. So this leads us to hope that perhaps we can compute these three quantities using only three recursive calls rather than four. And indeed, we can. So what we do is we recursively compute a times c, like before, and b times d, like before. But then we compute the product of a plus b with c plus d. And the very cute fact is if we number these three products, one, two, and three, that the final quantity that we care about, the coefficient of the 10 to the n over 2 term, namely ad plus bc, is nothing more than the third product minus each of the first two. So that's the new algorithm. What's the new recurrence? The base case obviously is exactly the same as before. So the question then is, how does the general case change? And I'll let you answer this in the following quiz. So the correct response for this quiz is the second one, namely the only thing that changes with respect to the first recurrence is that the number of recursive calls drops from 4 down to 3. A couple of quick comments. So first of all, I'm being a little bit sloppy when I say there's three recursive calls each on digits, uh, each on numbers with n over two digits. When you take the sums a plus b and c plus d, those might well have n over two plus one digits. Amongst friends, let's ignore that. Let's just call it n over two digits in each of the recursive calls. As usual, the extra plus one is not going to matter in the final analysis. Secondly, I'm ignoring exactly uh, what the constant factor is in the linear work done outside of the recursive calls. Indeed, it's a little bit bigger in Gauss's algorithm than it is in the naive algorithm uh, with four recursive calls, but it's only by a constant factor, and that's going to be suppressed in the big O notation. So let's look at this recurrence and compare it to two other recurrences, one bigger, one smaller. So first of all, as we noted, it differs from the previous recurrence of the naive recursive algorithm in having one fewer recursive call. So we have no idea what the running time is of either of these two recursive algorithms, but we should be confident that this one certainly can only be better. That's for sure. Another point of contrast is merge sort. So think about what the recurrence would look like for the merge sort algorithm. It would be almost identical to this one, except instead of a 3, we'd have a 2. 
right? Merge sort makes two recursive calls, each on an array of half the size, and outside of the recursive calls it does linear work, namely for the merge subroutine. We know the running time of merge sort, it's n log n. So this algorithm, Gauss's algorithm, is going to be worse, but we don't know by how much. So while we have a couple clues about what the running time of this algorithm might be more or less than, honestly, we have no idea what the running time of Gauss's recursive algorithm for integer multiplication really is. It is not obvious. We currently have no intuition for it. We don't know what the solution to this recurrence is, but it will be one super special case of the general master method, which we'll tackle next. So having motivated and hyped up the generality of the master method and its use for analyzing recursive algorithms, let's move on to its precise mathematical statement. Now the master method is in some sense exactly what you want. It's what I'm going to call a black box for solving recurrences. Basically it takes as input a recurrence in a particular format and it spits out as output a solution to that recurrence, an upper bound on the running time of your recursive algorithm. That is, you just plug in a few parameters of your recursive algorithm and boom, out pops its running time. Now, the master method does require a few assumptions, and let me be explicit about one of them right now. Namely, the master method, at least the one I'm going to give you, is only going to be relevant for problems in which all of the subproblems have exactly the same size. So, for example, in merge sort, there are two recurrences. In this video, we'll put the master method to use by instantiating it for six different examples. But first, let's recall what the master method says. So the master method takes as input recurrences of a particular format, in particular recurrences that are parameterized by three different constants, A, B, and D. A refers to the number of recursive calls, or the number of subproblems that get solved. B is the factor by which the subproblem size is smaller than the original problem size. And D is the exponent in the running time of the work done outside of the recursive calls. So the recurrence has the form T of n, the running time on an input of size n, is no more than A, the number of subproblems, times the time required to solve each subproblem, which is T of n over B, because the input size of a subproblem is n over B, plus O of n to the D, the work outside of the recursive calls. There's also a base case which I haven't written down, so once the problem size do drops below a particular constant, then there should be no more recursion and you can just solve the problem immediately, that is, in constant time. Now, given a recurrence in this permitted format, the running time is given by one of three formulas, depending on the relationship between A, the number of recursive calls, and B raised to the D power. Case one of the master method is when these two quantities are the same, A equals B to the D, then the running time is N to the D log N, no more than that. In case two, the number of recursive calls A is strictly smaller than B to the D, then we get a better running time upper bound of O of N to the D. And when A is bigger than B to the D, we get this somewhat funky looking running time of O of N raised to the log base B of A power. We'll understand what that, where that formula comes from a little later. So that's the master method. It's a little hard to interpret the first time you see it. So let's look at some concrete examples. Let's begin with an algorithm that we already know the answer to. We already know the running time. Namely, let's look at merge sort. So again, what's so great about the master method is all we have to do is identify the values of the three relevant parameters A, B, and D, and we're done. We just plug them in and we get the answer. So A, remember, is the number of recursive calls. So in merge sort, recall, we get two recursive calls. B is the factor by which the subproblem size is smaller than that in the original. Well, we recurse on half the array, so the subproblem so sub size is half that of the original. So B is equal to 2. And recall that outside of the recursive calls, all merge sort does is merge, and that's a linear time subroutine. So the exponent d is 1, in reflection of the fact that it's linear time. So remember, the key trigger which determines which of the three cases is the relationship between a and b to the d. So a obviously is 2, and b to the d is also equal to 2. So this puts us in case 1. And remember, in case 1, we have that the running time is bounded above by O of n to the d log n. In our case, d equals 1, so this is just O of n log n, which, of course, we already knew. Okay? But at least this is a sanity check. The master method is at least reconfirming facts, which we've already proven by direct means. So let's look at a second example. The second example is going to be for the binary search algorithm in a sorted array. Now, we haven't talked explicitly about binary search, and I'm not planning to. So if you don't know what binary search is, please read about it in a textbook 
or just look it up on the web and it'll, it'll be easy to find descriptions. But the upshot is this is basically how you'd look up a phone number in a phone book. Now I realize probably the youngest viewers of this video haven't actually had the experience of using a physical telephone book. But for the rest of you, as you know, you don't actually start with the A's and then go to the B's and then go to the C's if you're looking for a given name. You more sensibly split the telephone book roughly in the middle and then depending on what you, if you're looking for is earlier or later in the alphabet, you effectively recurse on the relevant half of the telephone book. So binary search is just exactly the same algorithm when you're looking for a given element in a particular sorted array. You start in the middle of the array and then you recurse on the left or the right half as appropriate depending on if the element you're looking for is bigger or less than the middle element. Now, the master method applies equally well to binary search, and it tells us what its running time is. So in the next quiz, you'll go through that exercise. So the correct answer is the first one. To see why, let's recall what A, B, and D mean. A is the number of recursive calls. Now, in binary search, you only make one recursive call. This is unlike merge sort. Remember, you just compare the element you're looking for to the middle element. If it's less than the middle element, you recurse on the left half. If it's bigger than the middle element, you recurse on the right half. So in any case, there's only one recursive call. So A is merely one in binary search. Now, in any case, you recurse on half the array. So like in merge sort, the value of B equals two. You recurse on a problem of half the size. And outside of the recursive call, the only thing you do is one comparison. You just determine whether the element you're looking for is bigger than or less than the middle element of the array that you recursed on. So that's constant time outside of the recursive call, giving us a value for D of zero. Just like merge sort, this is again case one of the master method, because we have A equal B to the D. Both in this case are equal to one. So this gives us a recurrence a solution to our recurrence of big O of n to the d log n. Since d equals zero, this is simply log n. And again, many of you probably already know that the running time of binary search is log n, or you can figure that out easily. Again, this is just using the master method as a sanity check to reconfirm that it's giving us the answers that we expect. Let's now move on to some harder examples, beginning with the first recursive algorithm for integer multiplication. Remember, this is where we recurse on four different products of n over two digit numbers, and then recombine them in the obvious way using padding by zero and some linear time additions. So in the, in the first integer multiplication algorithm, which does not make use of Gauss's trick, where we do the four different recursive calls in the naive way, we have A, the number of recursive calls is equal to four. Now, in each case, whenever we take a product of two smaller numbers, the numbers have n over two digits. So that's half as many digits as we started with. So just like in the previous two examples, b is going to be equal to two. The input size drops by a, by a factor two when we recurse. Now, how much work do we do outside of the recursive calls? Well, again, all it is doing is additions and padding by zeros, and that can be done in linear time. Linear time corresponds to a parameter value of d equal to one. So next, we determine which case of the master method we're in. A equals four, B to the D equals two, which in this case is less than A. So this corresponds to case three of the master method. And this is where we get the somewhat strange formula for the running time of the recurrence. T of N is big O of N to the log base B of A, which with our parameter values is N to the log base two of four, also known as O of n squared. So let's compare this to the simple algorithm that we all learned back in grade school. Recall that the iterative algorithm for multiplying two integers also takes an n squared number of operations. So this was a clever idea to attack the problem recursively, but at least in the absence of Gauss's trick, where you just naively compute each of the four uh, necessary uh, products separately, you do not get any improvement over the iterative algorithm that you learned in grade school. Either way, it's an n squared number of operations. But what if we do make use of Gauss's trick, where we do only three recursive calls instead of four? Surely the running time won't be any worse than n squared, and hopefully it's going to be better. So I'll let you work out the details on this next quiz. So the correct answer to this quiz is the fourth option. It's not hard to see what the relevant values of A, B, and D are. Remember, the whole point of Gauss's trick is to reduce the number of recursive calls from four down to three. So the value of A is going to be three. As usual, we're recursing on a problem size, which is half of that of the original, in this case, n over two digit numbers. So B remains two. And just like in the more naive recursive algorithm, we only do linear work outside of the recursive calls. All that's needed to do some additions and paddings by zero. 
So that puts us parameter values A, B, and D. Then we have to figure out which case of the master method that is. So we have A equal 3, B raised to the D equal to 2. So A has dropped by 1 relative to the more naive algorithm, but we're still in case 3 of the master method. A is still bigger than B to the D, so the running time is still governed by that rather exotic looking formula. Namely, T of N is big O of N to the log base B, which in our case is 2, of A, which is now 3 instead of 4. Okay? So the master method just tells us the solution to this recurrence. The running time of this algorithm is big O of N to the log base 2 of 3. So what is log of the uh, what is log base 2 of 3? Well, plug it in your computer or your calculator, and you'll find that it's roughly 1.59. So we get a running time of n to the 1.59, which is certainly better than n squared. It's not as fast as n log n, not as fast as the merge short recurrence, which makes only two recursive calls, but it's quite a bit better than quadratic. So summarizing, you did in fact learn a suboptimal algorithm for integer multiplication way back in grade school. You can beat the iterative algorithm using a combination of recursion plus Gauss's trick to save on the number of recursive calls. Let's quickly move on to our final two examples. Example number five is for those of you that watched the video on Strassen's matrix multiplication algorithm. So recall the salient properties of Strassen's algorithm. The key idea is similar to in Gauss's trick for integer multiplication. First, you set up the problem recursively. One observes that the naive way to solve the problem recursively would lead to eight subproblems. But if you're clever about saving some computations, you can get it down to just seven recursive calls, seven subproblems. So A in Strassen's algorithm is equal to seven. As usual, each uh, subproblem size is half that of the original one. So B is going to be equal to two. And the amount of work done outside of the recursive calls is linear in the matrix size, so quadratic in N, quadratic in the dimension, uh, because there's a quadratic number of entries in terms of the dimension. So n squared work outside of the recursive calls, leading to a value of d equal to 2. So as far as which case of the master method we're in, well, it's the same as in the last couple examples. a equals 7, e to the d equals 4, which is less than a. So once again, we're in case 3. And now the running time of Strassen's algorithm, t of n is big O of n to the log base 2 of 7, which is more or less n to the 2.81. And again, this is a win once we use uh, the, the savings to get down to just seven recursive calls. This beats the naive iterative algorithm, which recall would require cubic time. So that's another win for a clever divide and conquer uh, in matrix multiplication via Strassen's algorithm. And once again, the master's method, just by plugging in parameters, tells us exactly what the right answer to this recurrence is. So for the final example, I feel a little guilty because I've shown you five examples and none of them have triggered case two. Uh, we've had two in case one of the master method and three now in case three. So this will be sort of a fictitious recurrence just to illustrate case two, but you know there are examples of, of recurrences that come up uh, where case two is the relevant one. So let's just look at, uh, at the following recurrence. So this recurrence is just like merge short. We recurse twice. There's two recursive calls, each on half the problem size. The only difference is in this recurrence, we're working a little bit harder in the combined step. Instead of linear time outside of the recursive calls, we're doing a quadratic amount of work. Okay. So A equals 2, B equals 2, and D equals 2. So B to the D was equal to 4, strictly bigger than A, and that's exactly the trigger for case 2. Now recall what the running time is in case two. It's simply n to the d, where d is the exponent in the combined step. In our case, d is two, so we get a running time of n squared. And you might find this a little counterintuitive, right? Given the merge short, all we do with, with merge short is change the combined step from linear to quadratic, and merge short has a running time of n log n. You might have expected the running time here to be n squared log n, but that would be an overestimate. So the master method gives us a tighter upper bound, shows that it's only quadratic work. So put differently, the running time of the entire algorithm is governed by the work outside of the recursive calls just in the outermost call to the algorithm, just at the root of the recursion tree. In this video, we'll begin the proof of the master method. 
The master method, you'll recall, is a generic solution to recurrences of a given form, recurrences in which there's a recursive cause, each on a subproblem of the same size, size n over b, assuming that the original problem had size n, and plus there is big O of n to the d work done by the algorithm outside of these a recursive calls. The solution that the master method provides has three cases depending on how a compares to b to the d. Now, this proof will be the longest one that we've seen so far by a significant margin. Uh, it'll span this video as well as the next two, so let me say a few words up front about what you might want to focus on. Overall, I think the proof is quite conceptual. There's a couple of spots where we're going to have to do some computations, and the computations I think are worth seeing once in your life. I don't know that they're worth really committing to long-term memory. What I do think is worth remembering in the long term, however, is the conceptual meaning of the three cases of the master method. In particular, the proof will follow a recursion tree approach, just like we used in the running time analysis of the merge sort algorithm, and it's worth remembering what three different types of recursion trees the three cases of the master method corresponds to. If you can remember that, there will be absolutely no need to memorize any of these three running times, including the third rather exotic looking one. Rather, you'll be able to reverse engineer those running times just from your conceptual understanding of what the three cases mean and how they correspond to recursion trees of different types. So one final comment before we embark on the proof. So as usual, I'm uninterested in formality in its own sake. The reason we use mathematical analysis in this course is because it provides an explanation of fundamentally why things are the way they are. For example, why the master method has three cases and what those three cases mean. So I'll be giving you an essentially complete proof of the master method in the sense that it has all of the key ingredients. I will cut corners on occasion where I don't think it hinders understanding and where it's easy to fill in the details. So it won't be 100% rigorous, I won't dot every I and cross every T, but it will be a complete proof on the conceptual level. That being said, let me begin with a couple of minor assumptions I'm going to make to make our lives a little easier. So first, we're going to assume that the recurrence has the following form. So here, essentially all I've done is I've taken our previous assumption about the format of a recurrence and I've written out all of the constants. So I'm assuming that the base case kicks in when the input size is 1, and I'm assuming that the number of operations in the base case is at most c, and that that constant c is the same one that was hidden in the big O notation of the general case of the recurrence. The constant c here isn't going to matter in the analysis, it's just all going to be a wash, but to make, keep everything clear I'm going to write out all of the constants that were previously hidden in the big O notation. Another assumption I'm going to make, analogous to our merge sort analysis, is that n is a power of b. The general case would be basically the same, just a little more tedious. At the highest level, the proof of the master method should strike you as very natural. Really, all we're going to do is revisit the way that we analyze merge sort. Recall, our recursion tree method worked great and gave us this n log n bound on the running time of merge sort. So we're just going to mimic that recursion tree and see how far we get. So let me remind you what a recursion tree is. At the root, at level 0, we have the outermost, the initial invocation of the recursive algorithm. At level 1, we have the first batch of recursive calls. At level 2, we have the recursive calls made by that first batch of recursive calls, and so on, all the way down to the leaves of the tree, which correspond to the base cases where there's no further recursion. Now, you might recall from the merge sort analysis that we identified a pattern that was crucial in analyzing the running time. And that pattern that we had to understand was, at a given depth j, at a given level j of this recursion tree, first of all, how many distinct subproblems are there at level j? How many different level j recursive calls are there? And secondly, what is the input size that each of those level j subproblems has to operate on? So think about that a little bit and give your answer in the following quiz. So the correct answer is the second one. At level j of this recursion tree, there are a to the j subproblems, and each has an input of size n over b to the j. So first of all, why are there a to the j subproblems? Well, when j equals 0 at the root, there's just the one problem, the original invocation uh, of the recursive algorithm, and then each call to the algorithm makes a further calls. For that reason, the number of subproblems goes up by a factor of a with each level, leading to a to the j subproblems at level j. Similarly, b is exactly the factor by which the input size shrinks once you make a recursive call. So j levels into the recursion, the input size has been shrunk j times by a factor of b each time. So the input size at level j is n over b to the j. That's also the reason why, if you look at the question statement, we've identified the number of levels as being log base b of n. Back in merge sort, 
B was 2, we recursed on half the array, so the Li's all resided at level log base 2 of n. In general, if we're dividing by a factor B each time, then it takes uh, log base B of n times before we get down to the base cases of size 1. So the number of levels overall is 0 through log base B of n for a total of log base B of n plus 1 levels. Here then is what the recursion tree looks like. At level 0, we have the root corresponding to the outermost call, and the input size here is n, the original problem. The children of a node correspond to the recursive calls. Because there are a recursive calls, by assumption, there are a children or a branches. Level 1 is the first batch of recursive calls, each of which operates on an input of size n over b. At level log base b of n, we've cut the input size by a factor b this many times, so we're down to 1, so that triggers the base case. So now the plan is to simply mimic our previous analysis of merge sort. So let's recall how that worked. What we did is we zoomed in in a given level. And for a given level j, we counted the total amount of work that was done at level j subproblems, not counting work that was going to be done later by recursive calls. Then, given a bound on the amount of work at a given level j, we just summed up over all the levels to capture all of the work done by all of the uh, recursive indications of the algorithm. So inspired by our previous success, let's zoom in on a given level j and see how much work gets done with level j subproblems. We're going to compute this in exactly the way we did in merge sort, namely we're just going to look at the number of problems that are at level j, and we're going to multiply that by a bound on the work done per subproblem. We just identified the number of level j subproblems as a to the j. To understand the amount of work done for each level j subproblem, let's do it in two parts. So first of all, let's focus on the size of the input for each level j subproblem. That's what we just identified in the previous quiz question. Since the input size is being decreased by a factor b each time, the size of each level j subproblem is n over b to the j. Now, we only care about the size of a level j subproblem in as much as it determines the amount of work, the number of operations that we perform per level j subproblem. And to understand the relationship between those two quantities, we just return to the recurrence. The recurrence says how much work gets done in a given subproblem. Well, there's a bunch of work done by recursive calls, the A recursive calls, and we're not counting that. We're just counting up the work done here at level J. And the recurrence also tells us how much work is done outside of the recursive calls. Namely, it's no more than the constant C times the input size raised to the D power. So here the input size is N over B to the J. So that gets multiplied by the constant c, and it gets raised to the d power. Okay, So c times quantity n over b to the j, that's the input size, raised to the d power. Next, I want to simplify this expression a little bit, and I want to separate out the terms which depend on the level number j and the terms which are independent of the level number j. So if you look at it, a and b are both functions of j, where the c and n to the d terms are independent of j. So let's just separate those out. And you will notice that we have now our grand entrance of the ratio between a and b to the d. And foreshadowing a little, recall that the three cases of the master method are governed by the relationship between a and b to the d. And this is the first time in the analysis where we get a clue that the relative magnitude of those two quantities might be important. So now that we've zoomed in on a particular level j and done the necessary computation to figure out how much work is done just at that level, let's sum over all of the levels so that we capture all of the work done by the algorithm. So this is just going to be the sum of the expression we saw on the previous slide. Now since c n to the d doesn't depend on j, I can yank that out in front of the sum, and I'll sum the expression over all j. That results in the following. So believe it or not, we've now reached an important milestone in the proof of the master method. Specifically, this somewhat messy looking formula here, which I'll put a green box around, is going to be crucial. And the rest of the proof will be devoted to interpreting and understanding this expression and understanding how it leads to the three different running time bounds in the three different cases. Now I realize that at the moment this expression star probably just looks like alphabet soup. It probably just looks like a bunch of mathematical gibberish. But actually interpreted correctly, this has a very natural interpretation. So we'll discuss that in the next video. 
This video is the second of three that describes the proof of the master method. In the first of these three videos, we mimicked the analysis of merge short. We used a recursion tree approach, which gave us an upper bound on the running time of an algorithm, uh, which is governed by a recurrence of the specified form. Unfortunately, that video left us with a bit of an alphabet soup, this complicated expression. And so in the second video, we're not going to do any computations. We're just going to look at that expression, attach some semantics to it, and look at how that interpretation naturally leads to three cases and also give intuition for some of the running times that we see in the master method. So recall from the previous video that the way we've bounded the work done by the algorithm is we zoomed in on a particular level j of the recursion tree. We did a computation, which was the number of subproblems at that level, a to the j, times the work done per subproblem, that was the constant c, times quantity n over b to the j raised to the d, and that gave us this expression, c n to the d times the ratio of a over b to the d raised to the j at a given level j. The expression star that we concluded the previous video with was just the sum of these expressions over all of the logarithmic number of levels j. Now, as messy as this expression might seem, perhaps we're on the right track in the following sense. The master method has three different cases, in which case you're in is governed by how a compares to b to the d. And here in this expression, we are seeing precisely that ratio, a divided by b to the d. So let's drill down and understand why this ratio is fundamental to the performance of a divide and conquer recursive algorithm. So really, what's going on in the master method is a tug of war between two opposing forces, one which is forces of good and one which is forces of evil. And those correspond to the quantities b to the d and a, respectively. So let me be more precise. Let's start with the parameter a. So a, you'll recall, is defined as the number of recursive calls made by the algorithm. So it's the number of children that a node in the recursion tree has. So fundamentally, what a is, it's the rate at which subproblems proliferate as you pass deeper in the recursion tree. It's the factor by which there are more subproblems at the next level than the previous one. So let's think of A in this way, as the rate of subproblem proliferation, or RSP. And when I say rate, I mean as a function of the recursion level J. So these are the forces of evil. This is why our algorithm might run slowly, is because as we go down the tree, there are more and more subproblems, and that's a little scary. The forces of good, what we have going for us, is that with each recursion level j, we do less work per subproblem. And the extent to which we do less work is precisely b to the d. So I'll abbreviate this rate of work shrinkage, or this quantity b to the d, by rws. Now perhaps you're wondering, why is it b to the d? Why is it not b? So remember what b denotes. That's the factor by which the input size shrinks with the recursion level j. So for example, if b equals 2, then each subproblem at the next level is only half as big as that at the previous level. But we don't really care about the input size of a subproblem, except in as much as it determines the amount of work that we do solving that subproblem. So that's where this parameter d comes into play. Think, for example, about the cases where you have a linear amount of work outside the recursive calls versus a quadratic amount of work. That is, consider the cases where d equals 1 or 2. If b equals 2 and d equals 1, that is, if you recurse on half the input and do linear work, then not only is the input size dropping by a factor 2, but so is the amount of work that you do per subproblem. And that's exactly the situation we had in merge sort, where we had linear work outside the recursive calls. But think about d equals 2. Suppose you did quadratic work per subproblem as a function of the input size. Then, again, if b equals 2, if you cut the input in half, the recursive call is only going to do 25% as much work as what you did at the current level. The input size goes down by a factor 2, and that gets squared because you do quadratic work as a function of the input size. So that would be b to the d, 2 raised to the 2 or 4. So in general, the input size goes down by a factor b, but what we really care about, how much less work we do per subproblem, goes down by b to the d. That's why b to the d is the fundamental quantity that quant that's, uh, governs the forces of good, the extent to which we work less hard with each recursion level j.
So the question then is just what happens in this tug of war between these two opposing forces? So fundamentally, what the three cases of the master method correspond to is the three possible outcomes in this tug of war between the forces of good, namely the rate of work shrinkage, and the forces of evil, namely the rate of subproblem proliferation. There are three cases, one for the case of a tie, one for the case in which the forces of evil win, that is in which A is bigger than B to the D, and a case in which good wins, that is B to the D is bigger than A. To understand this a little bit better, what I want you to think about is the following. Think about the recursion tree that we drew in the previous slide. And as a function of A versus B to the D, think about the amount of work done per level. When is that going up per level? When is it going down per level? And when is it exactly the same at each level? So the answer is all of these statements are true except for the third one. So let's take them one at a time. So first of all, let's consider the first one. Suppose that the rate of subproblem proliferation, A, is strictly less than the rate of work shrinkage, B to the D. This is where the forces of good, the rate at which we're doing less work per subproblem, is, out, is outpacing the rate at which subproblems are proliferating. Okay, so the number of subproblems goes up, but the savings per subproblem goes up by even more. So in this case, it means we're going to be doing less work with each recursion tree level. The forces of good outweigh the forces of evil. The second one is true for exactly the same reason. If subproblems are proliferating so rapidly that it outpaces the savings that we get per subproblem, then we're going to see an increasing amount of work as we go down the recursion tree. It will increase with the level J. Given that these two are true, the third one is false, we can draw conclusions depending on whether uh, the rate of subproblem proliferation is strictly bigger or strictly less than the rate of work shrinkage. And finally, the fourth statement is also true. This is the perfect equilibrium between the forces of good and the forces of evil. Subproblems are proliferating, but our savings per subproblem is increasing at exactly the same rate. The two forces will then cancel out and we'll get exactly the same amount of work done at each level of the recursion tree. This is precisely what happened when we analyzed the merge sort algorithm. So let's summarize and conclude with the interpretation and even understand how this interpretation lends us to forecast some of the running time bounds that we see in the master method. Summarizing, the three cases of the master method correspond to the three possible outcomes in the battle between subproblems proliferating and the work per subproblem shrinking. One for a tie, one for when subproblems are proliferating faster, and one for when the work shrinkage is happening faster. In the case where the rates are exactly the same and they cancel out, then the amount of work should be the same at every level of the recursion tree. And in this case, we can easily predict what the running time should work out to be. In particular, we know there's a logarithmic number of levels. The amount of work is the same at every level. And we certainly know how much work is getting done at the root, right? Because that's just the original recurrence, which tells us that there's uh, asymptotically n to the d work done at the root. So with n to the d work for each of the log levels, we expect a running time of n to the d times log n. As we just discussed, when the rate of work done per subproblem is shrinking even faster than subproblems proliferate, then we do less and less work with each level of the recursion tree. So in particular, the biggest amount of work, the worst level, is at the root level. Now, the simplest possible thing that might be true would be that actually the root level just dominates the overall running time of the algorithm, and the other levels really don't matter up to a constant factor. So it's not obvious that's true, but if we keep our fingers crossed and hope for the simplest possible outcome, if the root has the most work, we might expect a running time that's just proportional to the work running time at the root. As we just discussed, we already know that that's n to the d, because that's just the outermost call to the algorithm. By the same reasoning, when this inequality is flipped and subproblems proliferate so rapidly that it's outpacing the savings we get per subproblem, the amount of work is increasing the recursion level. And here, the worst case is going to be at the leaves. That's where the, uh, that level is going to have the most work compared to any other level. And again, if you keep your fingers crossed and hope that the simplest possible outcome is actually true, perhaps the leaves just dominate. And up to a constant factor, they govern the running time of the algorithm. In this third case, given that we do a constant amount of work for each of the leaves, since those correspond to base cases, here we'd expect a running time in the simplest scenario proportional to the number of leaves in the recursion tree. So let's summarize what we've learned in this video. 
we now understand that fundamentally there are three different types of recursion trees. Those in which the work done per level is the same at every level, those in which the work is decreasing with the level, in which case the root is the worst level, and those in which the amount of work is increasing in the level, where the leaves are the worst level. Furthermore, it's exactly the ratio between A, the rate of subproblem proliferation, and B to the D, the rate of work shrinkage per subproblem, that governs which of the th these three recursion trees we're dealing with. Furthermore, Intuitively, we have now have predictions about what kind of running time we expect to see in each of the three cases. There are end of the D log N, that we're pretty confident about. There's a hope that in the second case, where the root is the worst level, that maybe the running time is end of the D. And there's a hope in the third case, where the leaves are the worst level, and we do constant time per leaf per base case, that it's going to be proportional to the number of leaves. Let's now sanity check this intuition against the formal statement of the master method, which we'll prove more formally in the next video. So in the three cases, we see they match up at least two out of three with exactly what our intuition lies. So in the first case, we see the expected end of the D times log N. In the second case, where the root is the worst level, indeed, the simplest possible outcome of big O of N to the D is the assertion. Now, the third case, there remains a mystery to be explained. Our intuition said this should hopefully be proportional to the number of leaves. And instead, we've got this funny formula, big O of N to the log base B of A. So in the next video, we'll demystify that connection, as well as supply a formal proof for these assertions. Let's complete the proof of the master method. Let me remind you about the story so far. The first thing we did is we analyzed the work done by a recursive algorithm using a recursion tree. So we zoomed in at a given level j, we identified the total amount of work done at level j, and then we summed up over all of the levels, resulting in this rather intimidating expression, star. C n to the d times a sum over the levels j from 0 to log base b of n of quantity a over b to the d raised to the j. Having derived this expression star, we then spent some time interpreting it, attaching to it some semantics, and we realized that the role of this ratio a over b to the d is to distinguish between three fundamentally different types of recursion trees. Those in which a equals b to the d, and therefore the amount of work is the same at every level. Those in which a is less than b to the d, and therefore the amount of work is going down with the level. And those in which a is bigger than b to the d, in which case the amount of work is growing with the level. This gave us intuition about the three cases of the master method, and even, even gave us predictions for the kind of running times that we might see. So what remains to do is really turn this hopeful intuition into a rigorous proof. So we need to verify that, in fact, the simplest possible scenarios outlined in the previous video actually occur. In addition, we need to demystify the third case and understand what the expression has to do with the number of leaves of the recursion tree. Let's begin with the simplest case, which is case 1. Recall in case 1, we're assuming that A equals B to the D. This is the case where we have a perfect equilibrium between the forces of good and evil, where the rate of subproblem proliferation exactly cancels out with the rate at which we do less work per subproblem. And now examining the expression star, we can see how easy our lives get when A equals B to the D. In that case, this ratio is equal to 1. So naturally, this ratio raised to the J is also equal to 1 for all j. And then, of course, this sum evaluates to something very simple, namely 1 summed with itself log base b of n plus 1 times. So the sum simply equals log base b of n plus 1. And that's going to get multiplied by the c n to the d term, which is independent of the sum. So summarizing, when a equals b to the d, we find that star equals c n to the d times log base b of n plus 1. Writing this in big O notation, we would write big O of n to the d log n. And again, I'm going to suppress the base of the logarithm, since all logarithms differ only by a constant factor. Uh, we don't have to specify the base. That's just suppressed uh, by the constant hidden in the big O notation. So that's it for case 1. Like I said, this is the easy case. So what do we do when a is not equal to b to the d? And remember, a could be either less than or bigger than b to the d. To answer that question, let's take a short detour into geometric series. For this single slide detour, we're going to think about a single constant number, r. Now, what you want to think about is r representing that ratio a over b to the d from the previous slide. But for this slide only, let's just call it r. This is a constant. It's bigger than 0, and it's not equal to 1. Now, suppose we sum up powers of r, stopping, let's say, at the kth power of r. 
I claim that this sum has a nice closed form formula. Specifically, it is exactly r to the k plus 1 minus 1 divided by r minus 1. Now, whenever you see a general formula like this, it's useful to keep in mind a couple of canonical values of the parameters that you can plug in to develop intuition. And for this expression, you might want to think canonically about the cases r equal 2 and r equals 1 half. So when r equals 2, we're summing up powers of 2, 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, and so on. When r is a half, we're summing up 1 plus a half plus a quarter plus an eighth, and so on. Now, I'm not going to prove this for you. I'd like you to prove this yourself if you don't already know this fact. So the way to prove this is simply by induction, and I will leave this as an exercise. What I want to focus on instead is what this fact can do for us. The way we'll use this fact is to formalize the idea that in recursion trees where the amount of work is increasing in the levels, the leaves dominate the overall running time, and where in recursion trees where the amount of work is decreasing in the level, the root dominates the running time, in the sense that we can ignore all of the other levels of the recursion tree. So in the notation in this slide, we have two upshots. First of all, for the case when r is less than 1. And in this case, this expression on the right-hand side, r to the k plus 1 minus 1 over r minus 1, can be upper bounded by 1 over 1 minus r. So again, remember, you might want to have a canonical value of r in mind here, namely 1 half. So what we're claiming here is that the right-hand side is no more than 2 for the case of r equal 1 half. And that's easy to see if you think about 1 plus 1 half plus a quarter plus 1 eighth and so on. That sum is converging to 2 as k grows large. So in general, for r less than 1 and constant, the sum is bounded by 1 minus 1 over r. Now, we're not actually going to care about this formula, 1 minus 1 over r. The point for us is just that this is a constant. And by constant, I mean independent of k, independent of how many terms we sum up. Obviously, it depends on r, the ratio, but it does not depend on how many things we sum up on k. So the way to think about this is when we sum up a bunch of terms where r is less than 1, then the very first term dominates. The first term is equal to 1, and no matter how many terms we sum up, we never get grow bigger than some constant. A similar situation holds for the case where r is a constant bigger than 1. When r is bigger than 1, a tiny bit of algebra shows that we can upper bound the right-hand side by r to the k times something which is constant, independent of k. So again, let's interpret the second upshot in terms of a canonical value of r, namely r equals 2. Then our sum is 1 plus 2 plus 4 plus 8 plus 16, and so on. And what this is saying is that no matter how many terms we sum up, the overall sum is never going to be more than twice the largest and final term. So if we sum up to, say, 128, the sum you'll notice will be 255, which is at most twice that largest term, 128. And that same is true for any k. The entire sum is no more than twice that of the largest term. In this sense, the largest term of the series dominates the whole thing. So to summarize this slide in just one sentence, when we sum up powers of a constant r, when r is bigger than 1, the largest power of that constant dominates the sum. When r is smaller than 1, then the sum is just a constant. Let's now apply this to prove case 2 of the master method. In case 2 of the master method, we assume that a is less than b to the d. That is, the rate at which subproblems are proliferating is drowned out by the rate at which we do less work per subproblem. So this is the case where the amount of work is decreasing with each level of the recursion tree. And our intuition said that, well, in the simplest possible scenario, we might hope that all of the work up to a constant factor is being done at the root. So let's make that intuition precise by using the basic sums fact on the previous slide. So since a is less than b to the d, this ratio is less than 1. So let's call this ratio equal to r. So r, you'll notice, does depend on the three parameters a, b, and d, but r is a constant. It does not depend on n. So what is this sum? This sum is just, we're just summing up powers of this constant r, where r is less than 1. What did we just learn? We just learned that any such sum is bounded above by a constant, independent of the number of terms that you sum up. So therefore, what does this expression star evaluates to? It evaluates to c, which is a constant, times n to the d times another constant. So suppressing the product of these two constants in big O notation, we can say that the expression star is upper bounded by big O of n to the d. And this makes precise our intuition that indeed the overall running time of the algorithm in this type of recursion tree with decreasing work per level is dominated by the root.
the overall amount of work is only a constant factor larger than the work done merely at level zero of the tree. Let's move on to the final and most challenging part of the proof, the final case. In case three, we assume that A is bigger than B to the D. So in conceptual terms, we're assuming the rate at which subproblems proliferate is exceeding the rate at which we do less work per subproblem. So these are recursion trees where the amount of work is increasing with each level, with the most work being done at the leaves. And once again, using the basic sums fact, we can make precise the hope that, in fact, we only have to worry about the leaves. We can throw away the rest of the work, losing only a constant factor. So to see that, we will again denote this ratio between A and B to the D as R. And in this case, R is bigger than 1. So this sum is a sum of a bunch of powers of R where R is bigger than 1. What did we just learn about that two slides ago in the basic sums fact? We learned that such sums are dominated by the largest and last term of the sum. Okay? So they're bounded by a constant factor times the largest term. Therefore, we can, ex we can simplify the expression star to the following. I'm going to write it in terms of big O notation, and like on the last slide, I'll use it to suppress two different constants. On the one hand, I'm going to be suppressing the constant C, which we inherited way back when from the original recurrence. And on the other hand, I'm going to use it to also suppress this constant that comes from the basic sums fact. So ignoring those two constants, what do we have left? We have n to the d times the largest term of the sum. So what is the largest term of the sum? Well, it's the last one. So we plug in the biggest value of j that we're ever going to see. So what's the biggest value of j we're ever going to see? Well, it's just this, log base b of n. So we get the ratio a over b to the d raised to the log base b of n power. Now, don't despair how messy this looks. We can do some remarkable simplifications. So what I want to do next is I want to focus just on this 1 over b to the d raised to the log base b of n term. So that's going to be, we can write that as b to the minus d log base b of n, which if I factor this exponent into two successive parts, I can write this as b raised to the log base b of n power, and only then raised to the minus d. And now, of course, what happens is that taking the logarithm of n base b, followed by taking, uh, raising it to the b power, those are inverse operations that cancel, so that leaves us just with the n. So this results in an n to the minus d, and now, remarkably, this n to the minus d is just going to cancel out with this n to the d, leaving us with merely a raised to the log base b of n. And thus, out of this crazy sea of letters, rises a formula we can actually understand. So a to the log base b of n, if we step back and think for a minute, is actually a supernatural quantity. It describes something about the recursion trees that we already knew was supposed to pop up in the analysis. I'll let you, I'll let you think through exactly what that is in the following quiz. So the correct answer to this quiz is the fourth response a raised to the log base b of n is precisely the number of leaves of the recursion tree. And remember, in our intuition for case three, recursion trees where the amount of work is increasing per level, we thought that perhaps the work would be dominated by the work done at the leaves, which is just proportional to the number of leaves. So why is this the answer? We'll just remember what recursion trees look like. At level zero, we have a single node. And then with each level, we have a times as many nodes as before. That is, with each level of the recursion tree, the number of nodes goes up by a factor of a. How far does this, how long does this process go on? Well, it goes on until we reach down to the leaves. Recall that the input size starts at n up at the root. It gets divided by a factor b each time, and it terminates once we get down to 1. So the leaves reside at precisely level log base b of n. So therefore, the number of leaves is just the branching factor, which is a raised to the number of times that we actually multiply by a, which is just the number of levels, which is log base b of n. So each time we go down a level, we increase the number of nodes by a factor of a, and we go down a level log base b of n times, leaving us with a number of leaves equal to a raised to the log base b of n. So what we've done is we've mathematically confirmed in a very cool way our intuition about what case 3 should look like in the master method. We've proven that in case 3, when a is bigger than b to the d, the running time is 
O of the number of leaves in the recursion tree, just as the intuition predicted. But this leaves us with one final mystery. If you go back to the statement of the master method, we didn't say A to the log base B of N. In case three, it says the running time is N to the log base B of A. And not only that, we've used this case three formula over and over again to evaluate Gauss's recursive algorithm for integer multiplication, to evaluate Strassen's matrix multiplication algorithm, and so on. So what's the story? How come we're not getting the same thing as in the statement of the master method? Well, there's a very simple explanation, which is simply that, believe it or not, A log base B of N and N to the log base B of A are exactly the same thing. This looks like the kind of mistake you'd make in freshman algebra, but actually, if you think about it, these are simply the same quantity. If you don't believe me, just take the logarithm base B of both sides, and you'll get the same thing on both sides. Now, you might well be wondering why I didn't just state in the master method that the running time of case 3 is this very sensible and meaningful expression, A raised to the log base B of N, i.e. the number of leaves in the recursion tree. Well, it turns out that while this expression on the left-hand side is the more meaningful conceptually, the right-hand side, n to the log base b of a, is the easiest one to apply. So recall when we worked through a bunch of examples of the master method, this right-hand side was super convenient when we evaluated the running times of algorithms, when we plugged in the numbers of a and b. In any case, whether or not you want to think about the running time in case 3 as proportional to the number of leaves in the tree, or as proportional to n to the log base b of a, we're done. We've proved it. That's case 3. That was the last one. So we're done with the master method. QED. So that was a lot of hard work, proving the master method, and I would never expect someone to be able to regurgitate all of the details uh, of this proof, you know, it's something like a cocktail party. Well, maybe except at the nerdiest of all cocktail parties. But I do think there's a few high-level conceptual points of this proof that are worth remembering in the long term. So we started by just writing down a recursion tree for the recursive algorithm, and in a generic way, and going level by level, we counted up the work done by the algorithm. And this part of the proof had nothing to do with how A and B to the D related to each other. Then we recognized that there are three fundamentally different types of recursion trees. Those with the same amount of work per level, those where it increases with a level, and those where it decreases with a level. If you can remember that, you can even remember what the running times of the three cases should be. In the case where you do the same amount at every work at each level, we know there's a logarithmic number of levels. We know we do n to the d work at the root, so that gives us the running time in case 1 of n to the d log n. When the amount of work is decreasing with the levels, we now know that the root dominates. Up to a constant factor, we can throw out the rest of the levels, and we know n to the d work gets done at the root, so that's the overall running time. And in the third case, where it's increasing in the levels, the leaves dominate. The number of leaves is a raised to the log base of b of n, and that's the same as n to the log base b of a. And that's the proportion of the running time in case three of the master method. So now we come to one of my favorite sequence of lectures where we get to discuss the famous quicksort algorithm. If you ask professional computer scientists and professional programmers to drop a list of their top five, top ten favorite algorithms, I'll bet you'd see quicksort on many of those, uh, those people's lists. So why is that? After all, we've already discussed sorting. We already have a, a quite good and practical uh, sorting algorithm, namely the merge sort algorithm. Well, quicksort, in addition to being very practical, it's competitive with and often superior to merge sort. Uh, so in addition to being very practical and used all the time in the real world and in programming libraries, uh, it's just an extremely elegant algorithm. When you see the code, it's just so succinct, uh, it's so elegant, you just sort of wish you had come up with it yourself. Moreover, the mathematical analysis, which explains why quicksort runs so fast, and that mathematical analysis we'll cover in detail, uh, it's very slick. So it's something I can cover in just about half an hour or so. So more precisely, what we'll prove about the quicksort algorithm is that a suitable randomized implementation runs in time n log n on average. And I'll tell you exactly what I mean by on average uh, later on in the sequence of lectures. And moreover, the constants hidden in the big O notation are extremely small. And that'll be evident from the analysis that we do. Finally, and this is one thing that differentiates quicksort from the merge sort algorithm, is it operates in place. That is, it needs very little additional storage beyond what's given in the input array in order to accomplish the goal of sorting. Essentially, what quicksort does is just repeated swaps within the space of the input array until it finally concludes with a sorted version of the given array. The final thing I want to mention on this first slide is that, unlike most of the videos, this set of videos will actually have an accompanying set of lecture notes, which I've posted on, in PDF uh, from the course website. Those are largely uh, redundant. They're optional. But if you want another treatment of what I'm going to discuss, a written treatment, I encourage you to look at the lecture notes uh, on the course website. 
So for the rest of this video, I'm going to give you an overview of the ingredients of quicksort and what we have to discuss in more detail. And the rest of the lectures will give details of the implementation uh, as well as the mathematical analysis. So let's begin by recalling the sorting problem. This is exactly the same problem we discussed back when we covered merge sort. So we're given as input an array of n numbers in arbitrary order. So for example, perhaps the input looks like this array here. And then what do we got to do? We just got to output a version of these same numbers, but in increasing order. Like when we discuss merge sort, I'm going to make a simplifying assumption, just to keep the lecture as simple as possible. Namely, I'm going to assume the input array has no duplicates. That is, all of the entries are distinct. And like with merge sort, I encourage you to think about how you would uh, alter the implementation of quick sort so that it deals correctly with ties, with duplicate entries. To discuss how quicksort works at a high level, I need to introduce you to the key subroutine. And this is really the key great idea in quicksort, which is to use a subroutine which partitions an array around a pivot element. So what does this mean? Well, the first thing you got to do is you got to pick one element in your array to act as a pivot element. Now, eventually, we'll worry quite a bit about exactly how we choose this magical pivot element. But for now, you can just think of it that we pluck out the very first element in the array to act as the pivot. So for example, in the input array that I mentioned uh, on the previous slide, we could just use 3 as the pivot element. After you've chosen a pivot element, you then rearrange the array. And you rearrange it so that every, all the elements which come to the left of the pivot element are less than the pivot, and all the elements which come after the pivot element are greater than the pivot. So for example, given this input array, one legitimate way to rearrange it so that this holds is the following. Perhaps in the first two uh, entries, we have the 2 and the 1. Then comes the pivot element. And then comes the elements 4 through 8 in some perhaps jumbled order. So notice that the elements to the left of the pivot, the 2 and the 1, are indeed less than the pivot, which is 3. And the five elements to the right of the pivot, to the right of the three, are indeed all greater than three. Notice in the partitioning subroutine, we do not insist that we get the relative order correct amongst those elements less than the pivot or amongst those elements bigger than the pivot. So in some sense, we're doing some kind of partial sorting. We're just bucketing the elements of the array into one bucket, those less than the pivot, and then a second bucket, those bigger than the pivot. And we don't care about uh, getting right the order amongst each, in, within each of those two buckets. So partitioning is certainly a more modest goal than sorting, but it does make progress towards sorting. In particular, the pivot element itself winds up in its rightful position. That is, the pivot element winds up where it should be in the final sorted version of the array. You'll notice in the example, we chose as the pivot the third largest element, and it does indeed wind up in the third position of the array. So more generally, where should the pivot be in the final sorted version? Well, it should be to the right of everything less than it. It should be to the left of everything bigger than it. And that's exactly what partitioning does by definition. So why is it such a good idea to have a partitioning subroutine? After all, we don't really care about partitioning. What we want to do is sort. Well, the point is that partitioning can be done quickly, it can be done in linear time, and it's a way of making progress toward having a sorted version of an array. And it's going to enable a divide and conquer approach toward sorting the input array. So in a little bit more detail, let me tell you about two cool facts about a partition subroutine. I'm not going to give you the code for partitioning here. I'm going to give it to you on the next video. But here are the two salient properties of the partition subroutine discussed in detail in the next video. So the first cool fact is that it can Im be implemented in linear, that is, big O of n time. 
where n is the size of the input array, and moreover, not just linear time, but linear time with essentially no extra overhead. So we're going to give a linear time implementation where all you do is repeated swaps. You do not allocate any additional memory, and that's key to the uh, practical performance of the quicksort algorithm. Secondly, it cuts down the problem size. So it enables a divide and conquer approach. Namely, after we've partitioned uh, an array around some pivot element, all we have to do is recursively sort the elements that lie on the left of the pivot and recursively sort the elements that lie on the right of the pivot, and then we'll be done. So that leads us to the high-level description of the quicksort algorithm. Before I give the high-level description, I should mention that this uh, algorithm was discovered by uh, Tony Hoare, roughly 1961 or so. This was at the very beginning of Hoare's career. He was just about 26, 27 years old. Uh, he went on to do a lot of other contributions and uh, eventually wound up winning the highest honor in computer science, the ACM Turing Award, uh, in 1980. And when you see this code, uh, I'll bet you feel like you wish you had come up with this yourself. It's hard not to be envious uh, of the inventor of this very elegant quicksort algorithm. So just like in merge sort, this is going to be a divide and conquer algorithm. So it takes an array uh, of some length n. And uh, if it's an array of length n, it's already sorted. And that's the base case. And we can return. Otherwise, we're going to have two recursive calls. The big difference from merge sort is that whereas in merge sort, we first split the array in two pieces, recurse, and then combine the results, here, the recursive calls come last. So the first thing we're going to do is choose a pivot element, then partition the array around that pivot element, and then do two recursive calls. And then we'll be done. There will be no combined step, no merge step. So in the general case, the first thing you do is choose a pivot element. For the moment, I'm going to lose, leave the choose pivot subroutine unimplemented. There's going to be an interesting discussion about exactly how you should do this. For now, you just do it in some way, that for somehow you come up with uh, one pivot element. For example, a naive way would be to just choose the first element. Then you invoke the partition subroutine that we discussed in the last couple slides. So recall that results in a version of the array in which the pivot element P is in its rightful position. Everything to the left of P is less than P. Everything to the right of the pivot is bigger than the pivot. And now all you have to do to finish up is recurse on both sides. So let's call the elements less than P the first part of the partitioned array and the elements greater than P the second part of the recursive array. And now we just call quicksort again to recursively sort the first part and then to recursively sort the second part. And that is it. That is the entire quicksort algorithm at a high level. This is one of the relatively rare uh, recursive or divide and conquer algorithms that you're going to see where you literally do no work after solving the subproblems. There is no combined step, no merge step. Once you've partitioned, you just sort the two sides and you're done. So that's the high-level description of the quicksort algorithm. Let me give you a quick tour of what the rest of the videos are going to be about. Uh, so first of all, I owe you details on this partition subroutine. I promised you it could be implemented in linear time with no additional memory. So I'll show you an implementation of that on the next video. Uh, we'll have a short video that formally proves correctness of the quicksort algorithm. Uh, I think most of you will kind of see intuitively why it's correct, so that's a video you can skip if you want. But if you do want to see what a formal proof of correctness for a divide and conquer algorithm looks like, you might want to check out that video. Then we'll be discussing exactly how the pivot is chosen. It turns out the running time of quicksort depends on what pivot you choose. So we're going to have to think carefully about that. Then we'll introduce randomized quicksort, which is where you choose a pivot element uniformly at random from the given array, hoping that a random pivot is going to be pretty good uh, sufficiently often. Uh, and then we'll give the mathematical analysis in three parts. We'll prove that the quicksort algorithm runs in n log n time with small constants on average for a randomly chosen pivot. Uh, in the first analysis video, I'll introduce a general decomposition principle of how you take a complicated random variable, break it into indicator random variables, and use linearity of expectation to get a relatively simple analysis. That's something we'll use a couple more times in the course, for example, when we study hash 
caution. Uh, then we'll discuss sort of the key insight behind the quicksort analysis, which is about understanding the probability that a given pair of elements gets compared at some point in the algorithm. That'll be the second part. Then there's going to be some mathematical computations just to sort of tie everything together, and that'll give us the bound uh, on the quicksort running time. Another video that's available is a review of some basic probability concepts for those of you that are rusty uh, that we'll be using in the analysis of quicksort. Okay, so that's it for the overview. Let's move on to the details. The goal of this video is to provide more details about the implementation of the quicksort algorithm. And in particular, here we're going to drill down on the key partition subroutine. So let me remind you what the job of the partition subroutine is in the context of sorting an array. So recall the key idea in quicksort is to partition the input array around a pivot element. So this has two steps. First, you somehow choose a pivot element. And in this video, we're not going to worry about how you choose the pivot element. For concreteness, you might just want to think about you keep the first, you pick the first element of the array to serve as your pivot. So in this example array, the first element happens to be three, so we could choose three as the pivot element. Now, there's a key rearrangement step. So you rearrange the array so that it has the following property. Any, el any entries that are to the left of the pivot element should be less than the pivot element, whereas any entries which are to the right of the pivot element should be greater than the pivot element. So for example, in this uh, version of the, the second version of the array, we see to the left of the three is the two and the one. They're in reverse order, but that's okay. Both the two and the one are to the left of the three, and they're both less than three. And the five elements to the right of three are, they're jumbled up, but they're all bigger than the pivot element. So this is a legitimate rearrangement that satisfies the partitioning property. And again, recall this definitely makes partial progress toward having a sorted array. The pivot element winds up in its rightful position. It winds up where it's supposed to be in the final sorted array, to the right of everything less than it, to the left of everything bigger than it. Uh, moreover, we've correctly bucketed the other n minus 1 elements to the left or to the right of the pivot according to where they should wind up in the final sorted array. So that's the uh, job that the partitioning subroutine is responsible for. Now what's cool is we'll be able to implement this partition subroutine in linear time. Even better, we'll be able to implement it so that all it does really is swaps in the array. That is, it works in place. It needs no additional, uh, essentially constant additional memory uh, to rearrange the array according to those properties. And then, as we saw in the high-level description of the quicksort algorithm, what partitioning does is it enables a divide-and-conquer approach. It reduces the problem size. After you've partitioned an array around the pivot, all you got to do is recurse on the left side, recurse on the right side, and you're done. So what I owe you is this implementation. How do we actually satisfy the partitioning property, stuff to the left of the pivot smaller than it, stuff to the right of the pivot bigger than it, in linear time and in place? Well, first let's observe that if we didn't care about the in-place requirement, if we were happy to just allocate a second array and copy stuff over, it would actually be pretty easy to implement a partitioning subroutine in linear time. That is, using O of n extra memory, it's easy to partition around a pivot element in O of n time. And as usual, you know, probably I should be more precise and write theta of n uh, in these two cases. That would be the more accurate, stronger statement. But I'm going to be sloppy, and I'm gonna, just going to write the weaker but still correct statement uh, using big O. Okay, so big O of n time using uh, linear extra memory. So how would you do this? Well, let me just sort of illustrate by example. I think you'll get the idea. So let's go back to our running example of an input array. Well, if we're allowed to use linear extra space, we can just pre-allocate another array of length n. And then we can just do a single scan through the input array, uh, bucketing elements according to whether they're bigger than or less than the pivot. And so, for example, we could fill in the additional array both from the left and the right using elements that are less than or bigger than the pivot. Uh, respectively. So for example, we start with the 8. We note that the 8 is bigger than the pivot, so we put that at the end of the output array. Then we get to the 2. The 2 is less than the pivot, so that should go on the left-hand side of the output array. We get to the 5. It should go on the right-hand side, uh, and the 1 should go on the left-hand side, and so on. When we complete our scan through the input array, there'll be one hole left, and that's exactly where the pivot belongs, to the right of everything less than it, to the uh, left of everything bigger than it. So what's really interesting then is to have an implementation of partition which is not merely linear time but also uses essentially no additional uh, space that doesn't uh, resort to this cop-out of pre-allocating an extra array of length n. So let's turn to how that works, first starting at a high level then filling in the details. So I'm going to describe the partitioning subroutine only for the case 
where the pivot is in fact the first element. But really this is without loss of generality. If instead you want to use some pivot from the middle of the array, you can just have a preprocessing step that swaps the first element of the array with the given pivot and then run the subroutine that I'm about to describe. Okay, so with constant time preprocessing, the case of a general pivot reduces to the case of where the pivot is the first element. So here's the high level idea, and it's very cool. The idea is we're going to be able to get away with just a single linear scan of the input array. So at any given moment in this scan, which is just going to be a single for loop, we'll be keeping track of both the part of the array we've looked at so far and the part that we haven't looked at so far. So there's going to be two groups, what we've seen, what we haven't seen. Then within the group we've seen, we're going to have that be split further according to the elements that are less than the pivot and those that are bigger than the pivot. So we're going to leave the pivot element just hanging out in the first element of the array until the very end of the algorithm when we correct its position with a swap. And at any given snapshot of this algorithm, we will have some stuff that we've already looked at and some stuff that we haven't yet looked at in our linear scan. Of course, we have no idea what's up with the elements that we haven't looked at yet. Who knows what, what they are and whether they're bigger or less than the pivot. But we're going to implement the algorithm, so among the stuff that we've already seen, it will be partitioned in the sense that all elements less than the pivot come first, all elements bigger than the pivot come last. And as usual, we don't care about the relative order amongst elements less than the pivot or amongst elements bigger than the pivot. So summarizing, we do a single scan through the input array. And the trick will be to maintain the following invariant throughout the linear scan. That basically everything we've looked at in the input array is partitioned. Everything less than the pivot comes before everything bigger than the pivot. And we want to maintain that invariant doing only constant work and no additional storage with each step of our key for loop, each step of our linear scan. So here's what I'm going to do next. I'm going to go through an example and execute the partition subroutine on a concrete array, the same input array we've been using as an example thus far. Now maybe it seems weird to give an example before I've actually given you the algorithm, before I've given you the code, but doing it this way, I think you'll see the gist of what's going on in the example, and then when I present the code, it'll be very clear what's going on. Whereas if I presented the code first, it might seem a little opaque when I first show you the algorithm. So let's start with an example. Throughout the example, we want to keep in mind the high-level picture that we discussed in the previous slide. The goal is that at any time in the partition subroutine, we've got the pivot hanging out in the first entry. Then we've got stuff that we haven't looked at. So of course, who knows, uh, the, who knows whether those elements are bigger than or less than the pivot. And then for the stuff we've looked at so far, everything less than the pivot comes before everything bigger than the pivot. This is the picture we want to retain as we go through the linear scan. As this high-level picture would suggest, there's two boundaries that we're going to need to keep track of throughout the algorithm. We're going to need to keep track of the boundary between what we've looked at so far and what we haven't looked at yet. So that's going to be, we're going to use the index j to keep track of that boundary. And then we also need a second boundary for amongst the stuff that we've seen, where is the split between those less than the pivot and those bigger than the pivot. So that's going to be i. So let's use our running example array. So stuff is pretty simple when we're starting out. We haven't looked at anything. So all of this stuff is unpartitioned. And i and j both point to the boundary between the pivot and all the stuff that we haven't seen yet. Now to get a running time which is linear, we want to make sure that at each step we advance j. We look at one new element. That way in a linear number of steps we'll have looked at everything and hopefully we'll be done and we'll have a partitioned array. So in the next step we're going to advance j. So the region of the array which, is, which we haven't looked at, which is unpartitioned, is one smaller than before. We've now looked at the 8, the first element, after the pivot. Now the 8 itself is indeed a partitioned array. Everything less than the pivot comes before everything after the pivot. Turns out there's nothing less than the pivot. So vacuously, this is indeed partitioned. So J, recall, de delineates the boundary between what we looked at and what we haven't looked at. Uh, I delineates 
the, amongst the stuff we've looked at, where is the boundary between what's bigger than and what's less than the pivot? So the 8 is bigger than the pivot, so I should be right here. Okay, because we want I to be just to the left of uh, all the stuff bigger than the pivot. Now, what's going to happen in the next iteration? This is where things get interesting. Suppose we advance J one further. Now the part of the array that we've seen is an 8 followed by a 2. Now, an 8 and a 2 is not a partitioned subarray. Remember what it means to be a partitioned subarray. All the stuff left is less than the pivot, all the stuff less than 3 should come before everything bigger than 3. So a 2 obviously fails that property. 2 is less than the pivot, but it comes after the 8, which is bigger than the pivot. So to correct this, we're going to need to do a swap. We're going to swap the 2 and the 8. That gives us the following version of the original array. So now the stuff that we have not yet looked at is one smaller than before. We've advanced J. So all this stuff is unpartitioned. Who knows what's going on with that stuff? J is one further entry to the right than it was before. And at least after we've done this swap, we do indeed have a partitioned array. So post swap, the 2 and the 8 uh, are indeed partitioned. Now remember, I delineates the boundary between amongst what we've seen so far, the stuff less than the pivot, less than 3 in this case, and that bigger than 3. So I is going to be wedged in between the 2 and the 8. In the next iteration, our life is pretty easy. So in this case, in advancing J, we uncover an element which is bigger than the pivot. So this is what happened in the first iteration when we uncovered the 8. It's different than what happened in the last iteration when we uncovered the 2. Okay, so this case, this third iteration is going to be more similar to the first iteration than the second iteration. In particular, we won't need to swap, we won't need to advance I, we just advance J and we're done. So let's see why that's true. So we've advanced J, we've done one more iteration, so now the stuff that we haven't seen yet is only the last four elements. So who knows what's up with uh, the stuff we haven't seen yet. But if you look at the stuff we have seen, the 2, the 8, and the 5, this is in fact partitioned, right? All the numbers that are bigger than 3 succeed, come after all the numbers bigger than, uh, smaller than 3. So the J, the boundary between what we've seen and what we haven't, is between the 5 and the 1. And the I, the boundary between the stuff less than the pivot and bigger than the pivot, uh, is between the 2 and the 8, just like it was before. Adding a 5 to the end didn't change anything. So let's wrap up this example on the next slide. So first let's just remember where we left off on the previous slide. So I'm just going to redraw that same step after three iterations of the algorithm. And now notice in the next iteration we're going to again have to make some modifications to the array if we want to preserve our invariant. The reason is that when we advance J, when we scan this 1, now again we're scanning in a new element which is less than the pivot. And what that means is that uh, the partitioned region, or the, the region that we've looked at so far, will not be partitioned. We'll have 2, 8, 5, 1. Remember we need everything less than 3 to, be, to precede everything bigger than 3. And this 1 at the end is not going to cut it. So we're going to have to make a swap. Now what are we going to swap? We're going to swap the 1 and the 8. So why do we swap the 1 and the 8? Well, clearly we have to swap the 1 with something. And what makes sense? What makes sense is the leftmost array entry, which is currently bigger than the pivot. And that's exactly the 8. Okay, that's the first leftmost entry bigger than 3. So if we swap the 1 with it, then the 1 will become the rightmost entry smaller than 3. So after the swap, we're going to have the following array. The stuff we haven't seen is the 4, the 7, and the 6. So the J will be between the 8 and the 4. The stuff we have seen is the 2, 1, 5, and 8. And notice that this is indeed partitioned. All the elements which are less than 3, the 2 and the 1, precede all of the entries which are bigger than 3, the 5 and the 8. I, remember, is supposed to split, uh, be the boundary between those less than 3 and those bigger than 3, so that's going to lie between the 1 and the 5. That is one further to the right than it was in the previous iteration. 
Okay, so the, because the rest of the unseen elements, the 4, the 7, and the 6, are all bigger than the pivot, the last three iterations are easy. No further swaps are necessary. No increments to i are necessary. j is just going to get incremented until we fall off the array. And then fast forwarding, the partition subroutine, or this main linear scan, will terminate with the following situation. So at this point, all of the elements have been seen, and all the elements are partitioned. J, in effect, has fallen off the end of the array, and I, the boundary between those less than and bigger than the pivot, still lies between the 1 and the 5. Now, we're not quite done because the pivot element 3 is not in the correct place. Remember, uh, what we're aiming for is an array where everything less than the pivot is to the left of it and everything bigger than the pivot is to the right, but right now the pivot still is hanging out in the first element. So we just have to swap that into the correct place. Where is the correct place? Well, it's going to be the rightmost element, which is smaller than the pivot. So in this case, the 1. So the subroutine will terminate with the following array, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 4, 7, 6. And indeed, as desired, everything to the less left of the pivot is less than the pivot, and everything to the right of the pivot is bigger than the pivot. The 1 and 2 happen to be in sorted order, but that was just sort of an accident, and the 4, 5, 6, and 7, and 8, uh, you'll notice, are jumbled up. They're not in sorted order. So hopefully from this example you have a gist of how the partition subroutine is going to work in general. But just to make sure the details are clear, let me now describe uh, the pseudocode for the partition subroutine. So the way I'm going to denote it is there's going to be an input array A, but rather than being told some explicit link, what's going to be passed to the subroutine are two array indices. The leftmost index, which delineates this part of the subarray you're supposed to work on, and the rightmost index. The reason I'm writing it this way is because partition is going to be called recursively from within uh, a quicksort algorithm. So at any point in quicksort, we're going to be recursing on some subset, contiguous subset of the original input array. L and R are meant to denote what the left boundary and the right boundary of that subarray are. So let's not lose sight of the high-level picture of the invariant that the algorithm is meant to maintain. So, as we discussed, we're assuming the pivot element is the first element, although that's really without loss of generality. And at any given time, there's going to be stuff we haven't seen yet. Who knows what's up with that? And amongst the stuff we've seen, we're going to maintain the invariant that all the stuff less than the pivot comes before, all the stuff bigger than the pivot. And J and I denote the boundaries between the seen and the unseen, and between the small elements and the large elements, respectively. So back to the pseudocode, we initialize the pivot to be the first entry in the array. And again, remember, L denotes the leftmost index that we're responsible for looking at. The initial value of i should be just to the right of the pivot, so that's going to be L plus 1. That's also the initial value of J, which we'll assign in the main for loop. So this for loop with j taking on all uh, values from L plus 1 to the rightmost index r denotes the linear scan through the input array. And what we saw in the example is that there were two cases, depending on for the newly seen element, whether it's bigger than the pivot or less than the pivot. The easy case is when it's bigger than the pivot. Then we essentially don't have to do anything. Remember, we didn't do any swaps. We didn't change i. The boundary didn't change. It was when that the new element was less than the pivot that we had to do some work. So we're going to check that. Is the newly seen element, a j, less than p? And if it's not, we actually don't have to do anything. Let me just put as a comment, if the new element is bigger than the pivot, we do nothing. Of course, at the end of the for loop, the value of j will get incremented. So that's the only thing that changes from iteration to iteration. So let's review the story so far. We've been discussing the quicksort algorithm. Here again is its high-level description. So quicksort, you call two subroutines first, and then you make two uh, recursive calls. So the first subroutine, choose pivot, we haven't discussed yet at all. That'll be 
uh, one of the main topics of this video. Uh, but the job of the choose pivot subroutine is to somehow select one of the n elements in the input array to act as a pivot element. Now what does it mean to be a pivot? Well that comes into play in the second subroutine, the partition subroutine, which we did discuss quite a bit in a previous video. So what partition does is it rearranges the elements in the input array so that it has the following property, so that the pivot p winds up in its rightful position, that is it's to the right of all of the elements less than it, and it's to the left of all of the elements bigger than it. The stuff less than it's to the left in some jumbled order, the stuff bigger than it's to the right in some jumbled order. That's what's listed here as the first part and the second part of the partitioned array. Now, once you've done this partitioning, you're good to go. You just recursively solve, uh, you recursively sort the first part uh, to get them in the right order. You call quick sort again to recursively sort the right part, and bingo, the entire array is sorted. You don't need a combined step. You don't need a merge step. Moreover, recall in a previous video, we saw that the partition array can be implemented in linear time, and moreover, it works in place with essentially no additional storage. We also, in an optional video, uh, formally proved the correctness of quick sort, and remember, quick sort is independent of how you implement the choose pivot subroutine. So what we're going to do now is discuss the running time of the quicksort algorithm, and this is where the choice of the pivot is very important. So what everybody should be wondering about at this point is, is quicksort a good algorithm? Does it run fast? The bar is pretty high. We already have merge sort, which is a very excellent practical n log n algorithm. The key point to realize at this juncture is that we are not currently in a position to discuss the running time of the quicksort algorithm. The reason is we do not have enough information. The running time of quicksort depends crucially on how you choose the pivot. It depends crucially on the quality of the pivot chosen. You'd be right to wonder what I mean by a pivot's quality, and basically what I mean is a pivot is good if it splits the partitioned array into roughly two equal sized subproblems, and it's bad, it's of low quality, if we get very unbalanced subproblems. So to understand both what I mean and the ramifications of having good quality and bad quality pivots, let's walk through a couple of quiz questions. This first quiz question is meant to explore a sort of worst case execution of the quicksort algorithm. What happens when you choose pivots that are very poorly suited for the particular input array? Let me be more specific. Suppose we use the most naive choose pivot implementation, like we were discussing uh, in the partition video. So remember here we just pluck out the first element of the array and we use that as the pivot. So suppose that's how we implement the choose pivot subroutine. And moreover, suppose that the input array to quicksort is an array that's already in sorted order. So for example, if it just had the numbers 1 through 8, it would be 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8 in order. My question for you is, what is the running time of this recursive quicksort algorithm on an already sorted array if we always use the first element of a subarray as the pivot? Okay, so this is a slightly tricky, but actually a very important question. So the answer is the fourth one. So it turns out that quicksort, if you pass it an already sorted array and you're using the first element as pivot elements, it runs in quadratic time. And remember, for a sorting algorithm, quadratic is bad. It's bad in the sense that we can do better. Merge sort runs in time n log n, which is much better than n squared. And if we were happy with an n squared running time, we wouldn't have to resort to uh, these sort of relatively exotic sorting algorithms. We could just use insertion sort, and we'd be fine. We'd get that same quadratic running time. OK, so now I owe you an explanation. Why is it that quicksort can actually run in quadratic time in this unlucky case of being past an uh, already sorted input array? Well, to understand, let's think about what pivot gets chosen and what are the ramifications of that pivot choice for how the array gets partitioned and then what the recursion looks like. So let's just think of the array as being the numbers 1 through n in sorted order. What is going to be our pivot? Well, by definition, we're choosing the first element of the pivot, so the pivot is just going to be 1. Now we're going to invoke the partition subroutine. And if you go back to the pseudocode of the partition subroutine, you'll notice that if we pass it an already sorted array, it's going to do essentially nothing. Okay, so it's just going to advance the index j until it falls off the end of the array, and it's just going to return back to us the same array that it was passed as input. So partition subroutine, if given an already sorted array, returns an already sorted array. Okay, so we have just the pivot 1 in the first position, and then the numbers 2 through n in order in the remainder of the positions. So if we draw our usual picture of what a 
partitioned array looks like with everything less than the pivot to the left, everything bigger than the pivot to the right. Well, since nothing is less than the pivot, this stuff is going to be empty. This will not exist. And to the right of the pivot, this will have length n minus 1. And moreover, it will still be sorted. So once partition completes, we go back to the outer call of quicksort, which then calls itself recursively twice. Now, in this case, one of the recursive calls is just vacuous. There's just an empty array. There's nothing to do. So really, there's only one recursive call, and that happens on a problem of size only one less. So this is about the most unbalanced split we could possibly see, right? where one side has zero elements, one side has n minus one. Splits don't really get any worse than that. And this is going to keep happening over and over and over again. We're going to recurse on the numbers 2 through n. We're going to choose the first element, the 2, as the pivot. Again, we'll feed it to partition. We'll get back the exact same subarray that we handed it in. We get through the numbers 2 through n in sorted order. We exclude the pivot 2. We recurse on the numbers 3 through n, a subarray of length n minus 2. The next recursion level, we recurse on an array of size of length n minus 3, then n minus 4, then n minus 5, and so on, until finally, after added recursion depth of n, roughly, we get down to just the last element, n, the base case kicks in, and we return that, and quicksort completes. So that's how quicksort is going to execute on this particular input with these particular pivot choices. So what running time does that give to us? Well. The first observation is that, you know, in each recursive call, we do have to invoke the partition subroutine. And the partition subroutine does look at every element in the array it is passed as input. So if we pass partition an array of length k, it's going to do at least k operations, because it looks at each element at least once. So the runtime is going to be bounded below by the work we do in the outermost call, which is on an array of length n, plus the amount we do in the second a level of recursion, which is on a subarray of length n minus 1, plus n minus 2, plus blah, 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 all the way down to plus 1 uh, for the very last uh, level of recursion. So this is a lower bound on our running time, and this is already uh, theta of n squared. So one easy way to see why this sum n plus n minus 1 plus et cetera, et cetera, leads to a bound of n squared is to just focus on the first half of the terms. So the first n over 2 terms in the sum are all of magnitude at least n over 2. Uh, so the sum is at least n squared over 4. It's also evident that this sum is at most n squared. So overall, the running time of quicksort on this bad input is going to be quadratic. Now, having understood what the worst case performance of the quicksort algorithm is, let's move on to discuss its best case running time. Now, we don't generally care about the best case performance of algorithms for its own sake. The reason that we want to think about quicksort in the best case, first of all, it'll give us better intuition for how the algorithm works. Second of all, it'll draw a line in the sand. Its average case running time certainly can't be better than the best case, so this will give us a target for what we're shooting for in our subsequent mathematical analysis. So what was the best case? What is the highest quality pivot we could hope for? Well, again, we think of the quality of a pivot as the amount of balance that it provides between the two subproblems. So ideally, we choose a pivot which gave us two subproblems, both of size n over 2 or less. And there's a name for the element that would give us that perfectly balanced split. It's the median element of the array, okay? the element where exactly half of the elements are less than it and half of the elements are bigger than it. That would give us a essentially perfect 50-50 split of the input array. So here's the question. Suppose we had some input and we ran quicksort and everything just worked out in our favor in the magically in the best possible way. That is, in every single recursive invocation of quicksort on any subarray of the original input array, suppose we happen to get as our pivot the median element. That is, suppose in every single recursive call, we wind up getting a perfect 50-50 split of the input array before we recurse. This question asks you to analyze the running time of this algorithm in this magical best case scenario. So the answer to this, third, uh, to this question is the third option. The answer is it runs in n log n time. Why is that? Well, the reason is that then the recurrence which governs the running time of quicksort is exactly matches the recurrence that governs uh, the merge sort running time, which we already know is n log n. That is the so this is the first video of three in which we'll mathematically analyze the running time of the randomized implementation of quicksort. So in particular, we're going to prove that the average running time of quicksort is big O of n log n. 
Now, this is the first randomized algorithm that we've seen in the course, and therefore, in its analysis, will be the first time that we're going to need any kind of probability theory. So let me just uh, explain up front what I might expect you to know uh, in the following analysis. Basically, I need you to know the first few ingredients uh, of discrete probability theory. So I need you to know about sample spaces, that is how to model all of the different things that could happen, all of the ways that random choices could resolve themselves. I need you to know about random variables, functions on sample spaces which take on real values. I need you to know about expectations, that is average values of random variables. And a uh, very simple but very key property we're going to need in the analysis of quicksort is linearity of expectation. So if you haven't seen this before or if you're too rusty, definitely uh, you should review this stuff before you watch this video. Some places you can go to get that necessary review, you can look at the probability review part one video uh, that's up on the course's website. Uh, if you prefer to read something, like I said at the beginning of the course, I recommend the free online lecture notes uh, by Eric Lehman and Tom Layton, uh, Mathematics for Computer Science. That covers everything we'll need to know plus much, much more. Uh, there's also a wiki book on discrete probability, which is a perfectly fine, uh, obviously, free source uh, in which you can learn the necessary material. Okay, so after you've got that uh, sort of fresh in your mind, then you're ready to watch the rest of this video. And in particular, we're ready to prove the following theorem stated in the previous video. So the quicksort algorithm with a randomized implementation, that is where in every single recursive subcall, you pick a pivot uniformly at random, we stated the following assertion that for every single input, so for a worst case input array of length n, the average running time of quicksort with random pivots is O of n log n. And again, to be clear where the randomness is, the randomness is not in the data. We make no assumptions about the data as per our guiding principles. No matter what the input array is, averaging only over the randomness in our own code, the randomness internal to the algorithm, we get a running time of n log n. We saw in the past that the best case behavior of quicksort is n log n. Its worst case behavior is n squared. So this theorem is, is asserting that no matter what the input array is, the typical behavior of quicksort is far closer to the best case behavior than it is to the worst case behavior. Okay, so that's what we're going to prove in the next few videos. So let's go ahead and get started. So first I'm going to set up the necessary notation and be clear about exactly what is the sample space, what is the random variable that we care about, and so on. So we're going to fix an arbitrary array of length n. That's going to be the input uh, to the quicksort algorithm. And we'll be working with this fixed but arbitrary input array for the remainder of the analysis. Okay, so just fix a single input in your mind. Now, what's the relevant sample space? Well, recall what a sample space is. It's just all the possible outcomes of the randomness in the world. So it's all the distinct things that could happen. Now, here, the randomness is of our own devising. It's just the random pivot sequences, the random pivots chosen by quicksort. So omega is just the set of all possible random pivots that quicksort could choose. Now, the whole point of this theorem, proving that the average, average uh, running time of quicksort is small, boils down to computing the expectation of a single random variable. So here's the random variable we're going to care about. For a given pivot sequence, remember that random variables are real valued functions uh, defined on the sample space. So for a given point in the sample space, or pivot sequence sigma, we're going to define capital C of sigma as the number of comparisons that quicksort makes. Where by a comparison, I don't mean something like with an array index in a for loop. That's not what I mean by a comparison. I mean a comparison between two different entries of the input array, like comparing the third entry in the array against the seventh entry in the array to see whether the third entry or the seventh entry is smaller. Notice that this is indeed a random variable. That is, given knowledge of the pivot sequence sigma, the choices of all pivots, uh, you can think of quicksort at that point as just a deterministic algorithm with all of the pivot choices predetermined. And so a deterministic version of quicksort makes some uh, deterministic number of comparisons. So for a given pivot sequence sigma, we're just calling C of sigma to be whatever, however many comparisons it makes, given those choices of pivots. Now, the, well, the theorem I stated is not about the number of comparisons of quicksort, but rather about the running time of quicksort. But really, if you think about it, kind of the only real work that the quicksort algorithm does is make comparisons between two between pairs of elements in the input array. Yes, there's a little bit of other bookkeeping, but that's all noise. That's all second order stuff. All re quicksort really does is comparisons between the uh, pairs of elements in the input array. And if you want to know what I mean by that a little more formally, dominated by comparisons, 
I mean that there exists a constant C so that the total number of operations of any type that quicksort executes is at most a constant factor larger than the number of comparisons. So let's say that by RT, I mean the number of primitive operations of any form that quicksort uses, and for every pivot sequence sigma, the total number of operations is no more than a constant times the total number of comparisons. And if you want a proof of this, it's not that interesting, so I'm not going to talk about it here, but in the notes posted on the website, there is a sketch uh, of why this is true, how you can formally argue that there isn't much work beyond just the comparisons. But I hope most of you find that uh, to be pretty intuitive. So given this, given that the running time of quicksort boils down just to the number of comparisons, we want to prove the average running time is n log n, all we got to do, quote unquote, all we have to do is prove that the average number of comparisons the quicksort makes uh, is O of n log n. And that's what we're going to do. So that's what the, the rest of these lectures are about. So that's what we got to prove. We got to prove that the expectation of this random variable c, which counts up the number of comparisons quicksort makes, uh, is for this arbitrary input array a of length n bounded by big O of n log n. So the high order bit of this lecture is a decomposition principle. We've identified this random variable c, the number of comparisons, and it's exactly what we care about. It governs the average running time of quicksort. The problem is it's quite complicated. It's very hard to understand what this capital C is. It's fluctuating between n log n and n squared, and it's hard to know how to get a handle on it. So how are we going to go about proving this assertion that the expected number of comparisons the quicksort makes uh, is on average just O of n log n? At this point, we actually have a fair amount of experience with divide and conquer algorithms. We've seen a number of examples. And whenever we had to do a running time analysis of such an algorithm, we wrote out our recurrence, we applied the master method, or in the worst case, we wrote out a recursion tree to figure out the solution to that recurrence. So you'd be uh, very right to expect something similar to happen here. But as we probe deeper and we think about quicksort, we quickly realize that the master method just doesn't apply, or at least not in the form that we're used to. Uh, the problem is twofold. So first of all, the size of the two subproblems is random, right? As we discussed in the last video, the quality of the pivot is what determines how balanced a split we get into the two subproblems. It could be as bad as a subproblem of size 0 and one of size n minus 1, or it could be as good as a perfectly balanced split into two subproblems of equal sizes. But we don't know. It's going to depend on our random choice of the pivot. Moreover, the master method, at least as we discussed it, required uh, all subproblems to have the same size. And unless you're extremely lucky, that's not going to happen uh, in the quicksort algorithm. It is possible to develop a theory of recurrence relations for randomized algorithms and to apply that to quicksort in particular, but I'm not going to go that route for two reasons. Uh, the first one is it's really quite messy. It gets pretty technical uh, to talk about solutions to recurrences for randomized algorithms uh, or to think about random recursion trees. Both of those get, get pretty complicated. The second reason is I really want to introduce you to what I call a decomposition principle by which you take a random variable that's complicated but that you care about a lot, you decompose it into simple random variables which you don't really care about in their own right but which are easy to analyze, and then you stitch those two things together using linearity of expectation. So that's going to be the workhorse for our analysis of the, quick, of the quicksort algorithm. And it's going to come up again a couple times in the rest of the course, for example, uh, when we study hashing. So to explain how this decomposition principle applies to quicksort in particular, I'm going to need to introduce you to the building blocks, simple random variables which will make up the complicated random variable that we care about, the number of comparisons. So here's some notation. Recall that we fixed in the background an arbitrary array of length n, and that's denoted by capital A and some notation, which is simple but also quite important, by z sub i, what I mean is the ith smallest element in the input array capital A, also known as the ith order statistic. So let me tell you what z i is not. Okay, What z i is not, in general, is the element in the ith position of the input unsorted array. What z i is, is it's the element which is going to wind up in the ith element of the array once we sort it. Okay, so if you fast forward to the end of a sorting algorithm, in position i, you're going to find zi. So let me give you an example. So suppose we had just a simple array here, unsorted, with the numbers 6, 8, 10, and 2. Then z1, well, that's the first smallest, the one smallest, or just the minimum. So z1 would be the 2. 
Z2 would be the 6, Z3 would be the 8, and Z4 would be the 10 for this particular input array. Okay, so ZI is just the ith smallest number. Wherever it may lie in the original unsorted array, uh, that's what ZI refers to. So we already defined the sample space. Uh, that's just all possible choices of pivots that quicksort might make. I already described one random variable, the number of comparisons that quicksort makes on a particular choice of pivots. Now I'm going to introduce a family of much simpler random variables, which count merely the comparisons involving a given pair of elements in the input array. Not all elements, just a given pair. So for a given choice of pivots, a given sigma, and for a given choices of i and j, both of which are between 1 and n, and so we only count things once, I'm going to insist that i is less than j always. And now here's a definition. By xij, and this is a random variable, so it's a function of the pivots chosen, this is going to be the number of times that zi and zj are compared in the execution of quicksort. Okay, so this is going to be an important definition in our analysis. It's important you understand it. So for something like the third smallest element and the seventh smallest element, xij is asking, that's when i equals 3 and j equals 7, x37 is asking how many times those two elements get compared uh, as quicksort uh, proceeds. And this is a random variable in the sense that if the pivot choices are all predetermined, if we think of those being chosen in advance, then there's just some fixed deterministic number of times uh, that zi and zj get compared. So it's important you understand these random variables xij. Uh, so the next quiz is going to ask a, a basic question about the range of values that a given xij can take on. So for this quiz, we're considering, as usual, some fixed input array. And now, furthermore, fix two specific elements of the input array. For example, the third smallest element, whatever, wherever it may lie, and the seventh smallest element, wherever it may lie. Think about just these pair of two elements. What is the range of values that the corresponding random variable xij can take on? That is, what are the different numbers of times that a given pair of elements might conceivably get compared in the execution of the quicksort algorithm? All right, so the correct answer to this quiz is the second option. Um, this is not a trivial quiz. This is a little tricky to see. So the assertion is that a given pair of elements, uh, they might not be compared at all. They might be compared once, and they're not going to get compared more than once. Okay, so here what I'm going to discuss is why it's not possible for a given pair of elements to be compared twice during the execution of quicksort. It'll be clear later on, if it's not already clear now, that both 0 and 1 are legitimate possibilities. A pair of elements might never get compared, and uh, they might get compared once. And we'll, again, we'll go into more detail on that in the next video. So, but why is it impossible to be compared twice? Well, think about two elements, say the third element and the seventh element. And let's recall how the partition subroutine works. Observe that in quicksort, the only place in the code where comparisons between pairs of input array elements happens, it only happens in the partition subroutine. So that's where we have to drill down. So what are the comparisons that get made in the partition subroutine? Well, go back and look at that code. The pivot element is compared to each other element in the input array exactly once. Okay, so the pivot just hangs out in the first entry of the array. We have this for loop, this index j, which marches over the rest of the array. And for each value of j, the jth element of the input array gets compared to the pivot. Okay, so summarizing, in an invocation of partition, every single comparison involves the pivot element. Okay, so two elements get compared if and only if one is the pivot. All right, so let's go back to the question. Why can't a given pair of elements in the input array get compared two or more times? Well, think about the first time they ever get compared in quicksort. It must be the case that at that moment, we're in a recursive call where either one of those two is the pivot element. So if it's the third smallest element or the seventh smallest element, the first time those two elements get compared to each other, either the third smallest or the seventh smallest is currently the pivot because all comparisons involve a pivot element. Therefore, What's going to happen in the recursion? Well, the pivot is excluded from both recursive calls. So for example, if the seventh smallest element is currently the pivot, that's not going to be uh, passed on to the recursive call, which contains the third smallest element. Therefore, if you're compared once, one of the elements is the pivot, and they'll never be compared again, because the pivot will not even show up in any future recursive calls. So let me just remind you of some terminology. Uh, so a random variable which can only take on the value 0 or 1 is often called an indicator random variable because it's just indicating whether or not a certain thing happens. So in that terminology, each xij 
is indicating whether or not the ith smallest element in the array and the j smallest element in the array ever get compared. It can't happen more than once. It may or may not happen. And xij is one precisely when it happens. So that's the event that it's indicating. Having defined the building blocks I need, these indicator random variables, these xij's, now I can introduce you to the decomposition principle as applied to quicksort. So there's a random variable that we really care about, which is denoted capital C, the number of comparisons the quicksort makes. That's really hard to get a handle on in and of itself. But we can express C as a sum of indicator random variables of these xij's. And those we don't care about in their own right. They're going to be much easier to understand. So let me just rewrite the definitions of C and the XIJ so we're all clear on them. So C, recall, counts all of the comparisons between pairs of input elements that Quicksort ever makes, whereas an XIJ only counts the number, and it's going to be 0 or 1, comparisons that involve the ith smallest and the jth smallest elements in particular. Now, since every comparison involves precisely one pair of elements, some i and some j, with i less than j, we can write c as the sum of the xij's. So don't get intimidated by this fancy double sum. All this is doing is it's iterating over all of the ordered pairs. So all of the pairs ij, where i and j are both between 1 and n, and where i is strictly less than n. This double sum is just a convenient way to do that iteration. And of course, no matter what the pivots chosen are, we have this equality. Okay? The comparisons uh, are somehow split up amongst the various pairs of elements, the various i's and j's. Why is it useful to express a complicated random variable as a sum of simple random variables? Well, because an equation like this is now right in the wheelhouse of linearity of expectation. So let's just go ahead and apply that. Remember, and this is super, super important, linearity of expectation says that the expectation of a sum equals the sum of the expectations. And moreover, this is true whether or not the random variables are independent. Okay, and I'm not going to prove it here, but you might want to think about the fact that the xij's are not, in fact, independent. So we're using the fact that linear expectation works even for non-independent random variables. Again, why is this interesting? Well, the left-hand side, this is complicated. Right? This, is the, this is some crazy number of comparisons by some algorithm on some arbitrarily long array, and it fluctuates between two pretty far apart numbers, n log n and n squared. On the other hand, this does not seem as intimidating, a given xij. It's just 0 or 1, whether or not these two guys get compared or not. So that is the power of this decomposition approach. Okay? So it reduces understanding a complicated random variable to understanding simple random variables. In fact, because these are indicator random variables, we can even clean up this expression some more. So for any given xij being a 0, 1 random variable, if we expand the definition of expectation, just as an average over the various values, uh, it's, what is it? It's just, well, there's some probability it takes on the value 0. That's possible. And there's some possibility it takes on the value 1. And of course, this zero part, we can very satisfyingly delete, cancel. And so the expected value of a given xij is just the probability that xij equals 1. And remember, it's an indicator random variable. It's 1 precisely when the ith smallest and the jth smallest uh, elements get compared. So putting it all together, we find that what we care about, the average value of the number of comparisons made by quicksort on this input array is this double sum, which iterates over all ordered pairs, where each sum and is the probability that the corresponding xij equals 1, that is the probability that zi and zj get compared. And this is essentially the stopping point for this video for the first part of the analysis. So let's call this star and put a nice circle around it. So what's going to happen next is that in the second video for the analysis, we're going to drill down on this probability, probability that a given pair of elements gets compared, and we're going to nail it. We're going to get an exact expression as a function of i and j for exactly what this probability is. Then in the third video, we're going to take that exact expression, plug it into the sum, and then evaluate this sum. And it turns out the sum will evaluate to big O of n log n. So that's the plan. That's how you apply decomposition in terms of 0, 1, or indicator random variables, apply linearity of expectation. In the next video, we'll understand these simple random variables, and then we'll wrap up in the third video. 
Before we move on to the next part of the analysis, I do just want to emphasize that this decomposition principle is relevant not only for quicksort, but it's relevant for the analysis of lots of randomized algorithms. And we will see more applications, at least one more application, later in the course. So just to kind of really hammer the point home, let me spell out the key steps for the general decomposition principle. So first you need to figure out what is it you care about. So in quicksort we cared about the number of comparisons. We had this lemma that said the running time is dominated by comparisons, so we understood what we wanted to know, the average value for the number of comparisons. The second step is to express this random variable y in, as a sum of simpler random variables, ideally indicator or 0, 1 random variables. Now you're in the wheelhouse of linearity of expectation, you just apply it and you find that what it is you care about, the average value of the random, val of the random variable y is just the sum of the probabilities of various events that a uh, given xl random variable is equal to 1. And so the upshot is to understand the seemingly very complicated left hand side all you have to do is understand something which in many cases is much simpler which is understand the probability of these various events. In the next video I'll show you exactly how that's done in the case of quicksort where these where we care about the xijs the probability that two elements gets compared so let's move on and get an exact expression for that probability. This is the second video of three in which we prove that the average running time of randomized quicksort is big O of n log n. So to remind you of the formal statement, so again we're thinking about quicksort where we implement the choose pivot subroutine to always choose a pivot uniformly at random from the subarray that it gets passed. And we're proving that for a worst case input array, for an arbitrary input array of length n, the average running time of quicksort where the average is over the random pivot choices is big O of n log n. So let me remind you of the story so far. This is where uh, we left things at the previous video. We define a few random variables. The sample space, recall, is just the uh, all of the different things that could happen. That is, all of the random coin flip outcomes that uh, Quicksort could produce, which is equivalent to all of the uh, pivot choices made by Quicksort. Now, the random variables we care about, so first of all, there's capital C, which is the number of comparisons between pairs of elements in the input array that Quicksort makes for a given pivot sequence sigma. And then there are the xij's, and so that's just meant to count the number of comparisons involving the i-th smallest and the j-th smallest elements in the input array. Where you'll recall it's zi and zj denote the i-th smallest and j-th smallest entries in the array. Now, because every comparison involves some zi and some zj, we can express capital C as a sum over the xij's. So we did that in the last video. We applied linearity of expectation. We used the fact that xij are 0, 1, that is indicator random variables, to denote the, to, to write the expectation of an xij just as the probability that it's equal to 1. And that gave us the following expression. So the key insight, and really the heart of the quicksort analysis, is to derive an exact expression for this probability as a function of i and j. So for example, if the third smallest element in the array, the seventh smallest element in the array, wherever they may be scattered in the input array, we want to know exactly what's the probability that they get compared at some point in the execution uh, of quicksort. And we're going to get an extremely precise understanding of this probability in the form of this key claim. So for all pairs of elements, and again, ordered pairs, so we're thinking of i being less than j, the probability that zi and zj get compared at some point in the execution of quicksort is exactly 2 divided by j minus i plus 1. So for example, in this example of the third smallest element and the seventh smallest element, it would be exactly 40% of the time, uh, 2 over 5 is how often those two elements would get compared if you ran quicksort with a random choice of pivots. And that's going to be true for every j and i. The proof of this key claim is the purpose of this video. So how do we prove this key claim? How do we prove that the probability that the zi, zj get compared is exactly 2 over quantity j minus i plus 1? Well, fix your favorite ordered pair. So fix elements zi, zj 
with i less than j, for example, the third smallest and the seventh smallest element in the array. Now, what we want to reason about is the set of all elements in the input array between zi and zj inclusive. And I don't mean between in terms of positions in the array. I mean between in terms of their values. So consider the set between zi and zj plus 1 inclusive. So zi, zi plus 1, dot, 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 zj minus 1, zj. So for example, the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh smallest elements in the input array, wherever they may be. Okay? And of course, the initial array is not sorted, so there's no reason to believe that these j minus i plus 1 elements are contiguous. Okay? They're scattered throughout the input array, but we're going to think about them. Okay? Zi through zj inclusive. Now, throughout the execution of quicksort, these j minus i plus 1 elements lead parallel lives, at least for a while, in the following sense. Begin with the outermost call to quicksort, and suppose that none of these j minus i plus, ele plus 1 elements is chosen as a pivot. Where then could the pivot lie? Well, it could only be a pivot that's greater than all of these, or it could be less than all of these. For example, if this is the third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh smallest elements in the array, well, the pivot is either the minimum or the second minimum, in which case it's smaller than all five elements, or it's the eighth or largest or larger elements in the array, in which case it's bigger than all of them. There's no way you can have a pivot that somehow is wedged in between this set, because this is a contiguous set of order statistics. Okay? Now, what do I mean by these elements leading parallel lives? Well, in the case where the pivot is chosen to be smaller than all of these elements, then all of these elements will wind up to the right of the pivot, and they will all be passed to a common recursive call, the second recursive call. If the pivot is chosen to be bigger than all of these elements, then they'll all show up on the left side of the partitioned array, and they'll all be passed to the first recursive call. Iterating this, or proceeding inductively, we see that as long as the pivot does not, is not drawn from the set of j minus i plus 1 elements, this entire set will get passed on to the same recursive call. So these j minus i plus 1 elements are living blissfully together in harmony until the point at which one of them gets chosen as a pivot. And that, of course, has to happen at some point. The recursion only stops when the array length is equal to 0 or 1. So if for no other reason, at some point there will be no other elements in a recursive call other than these j minus i plus 1. Okay, so at some point the reverie is interrupted and one of them is chosen as a pivot. So let's pause the quicksort algorithm and think about what things look like at the time that one of these j minus i plus 1 elements is first chosen as a pivot element. There are two cases worth distinguishing between. In the first case, the pivot happens to be either zi or zj. Now remember what it is we're trying to analyze. We're trying to analyze the frequency, the probability with which zi and zj gets compared. Well, if zi and zj are in the same recursive call, and one of them gets chosen as the pivot, then they're definitely going to get compared. Remember, when you partition an array around its pivot element, the pivot gets compared to everything else. So if zi is chosen as a pivot, it certainly gets compared to zj. If zj gets chosen as a pivot, it gets compared to zi. So either way, if one of these two is chosen, they're definitely compared. If, on the other hand, the first of these j minus i plus 1 elements to be chosen as a pivot is not zi or zj, if instead it comes from the set zi plus 1, so on up to zj minus 1, then the opposite is true. Then zi and zj are not compared now, nor will they ever be compared in the future. So why is that? Well, that requires two observations. First, recall that when you choose a pivot and you partition an array, uh, all of the comparisons involve the pivot. So two elements which are neither of which is the pivot do not get compared in a partition subroutine. So they don't get compared right now. Moreover, since zi is the smallest of these and zj is the biggest of these and the pivot comes from somewhere between them, this choice of pivot will split zi and zj into different recursive calls. zi gets passed to the first recursive call, zj gets passed to the second recursive call, and they will never meet again. So there's no comparisons in the future, either. So these two observations right here, I would say, is the key insight in the quicksort analysis. 
the fact that for a given pair of elements we can very simply characterize exactly when they get compared and when they do not get compared in the quicksort algorithm. That is, they get compared exactly when one of them is chosen as the pivot before any of the other elements with value in between those two has had the opportunity to be a pivot. That's exactly when they get compared. So this will allow us to prove this key claim, this exact expression on the comparison probability. That will plug into the formula we had earlier and will give us the desired bound on the average number of comparisons. So let's fill in those details. So first let me just rewrite the high order bit from the previous slide. So now, at last, we will use the fact that our quicksort implementation always chooses a pivot uniformly at random, that each element of a subarray is equally likely to serve as the pivot element in the corresponding partition call. So what does this bias? This just says all of the elements are symmetric, so each of the elements zi, zi plus 1, all the way up to zj, is equally likely to be the first one asked to serve as a pivot element. Now the probability that zi and zj get compared is simply the probability that we're in case 1 as opposed to in case 2. And since each uh, element is equally likely to be the pivot, that just means there's sort of two bad cases, two cases in which one can occur out of the j minus i plus 1 possible different uh, choices of pivot. Now we're talking about a set of j minus i plus 1 elements, each of whom is equally likely to be asked to be served first as a pivot element. And uh, the bad case, the case that leads to a comparison, uh, there's two different possibilities for that, if zi or zj is first, and the other j minus i minus 1 uh, outcomes lead to the good case where zi and zj never get compared. So overall, because everybody's equally likely to be the first pivot, we have that the probability that zi and zj get compared is exactly the number of pivot choices that lead to a comparison divided by the number of pivot choices overall. And that is exactly the key claim. That is exactly what we asserted was the probability that a given z, i, and z, j get compared for no matter what i and j are. So, wrapping up this video, where does that leave us? We can now plug in this expression for this probability of comparison probabilities into the double sum that we had before. So putting it all together, what we have is that what we really care about, the average number of comparisons that Quicksort makes on this particular input of array n, of length n, is just this double sum which iterates over all possible ordered pairs, ij. And what we had here before was the probability of comparing zi and zj. We now know exactly what that is, so we just substitute. And this is where we're going to stop for this video. So this is going to be our key expression star, which we still need to evaluate, but that's going to be the third video. So essentially we've done all of the conceptual difficulty in understanding where comparisons come from in the quicksort algorithm. All that remains is a little bit of an algebraic manipulation to show that this starred expression really is big O of n log n. And that's coming up next. So we're almost at the finish line of our analysis of quicksort. Let me remind you what we're proving. We're proving that for the randomized implementation of quicksort, where we always choose a pivot element to partition around uniformly at random, we're showing that for every array, every input of length n, the average running time of quicksort over the random choices of pivots is big O of n log n. So we've done a lot of work in the last couple videos. Let me just remind you about the story so far. In the first video, what we did is we identified the relevant random variable that we cared about, capital C, the number of comparisons that quicksort makes among pairs of elements in the input array. Then we applied a decomposition approach. We expressed capital C, the overall number of comparisons, as a sum of indicator or 0, 1 random variables, where each of those variables, x, i, j, just counted the number of comparisons involving the ith smallest and jth smallest entries in the array. And that's going to be either 0 or 1. Then we applied linearity of expectation to realize all we really needed to understand was the comparison probabilities uh, for different pairs of elements. In the second video, we nailed what that comparison probability is, specifically for the i smallest and the j smallest elements in the array. The probability that quicksort compares them when you always make random pivot choices is exactly 2 divided by the quantity j minus i 
plus 1. So putting that all together yields the following expression governing the average number of comparisons made by quicksort. And one thing I want you to appreciate is, is in the last couple of videos we've been sort of amazingly exact as algorithmic analysis goes. Specifically we've done, done nothing sloppy whatsoever, we've done no estimates. The number of comparisons the quicksort makes on average is exactly this double sum. Now shortly we'll do some inequalities to make our lives a little bit easier, but up to this point everything has been completely exact. And this lets you see why there's small constants also in, in, uh, in quicksort. It's basically going to be this factor too. Now the next question to ask is, what are we shooting for? Remember the theorem we want to prove is that the expected number of comparisons, really the expected runtime, is O of n log n. So are we already done? Well, not quite. We're going to have to be a little bit clever. So if we look at this double sum, and we ask how big are the sum ends and how many terms are there? Well, the biggest sum ends we're ever going to see are, are when i and j are right next to each other, where j is one bigger than i. In that case, this fraction is going to be one half. So the terms can be as big as one half. How many terms are there? Well, there's a quadratic number of terms. So it'd be very easy to derive an upper bound that's quadratic in n, but that's not what we want. We want one that's n log n. So to derive that, we're going to have to be a little bit more clever about how we evaluate this sum. So the idea is what we're going to do is we're going to think about a fixed value of i in this outermost sum, and then we're going to ask how big could the inner sum be. So let's fix some value of i, the value of the index in the outer sum. And then let's look at the inner sum where j ranges from i plus 1 up to n, and the value of the sum end is 1 over the quantity j minus i plus 1. So how big can this be? Well, let's first understand what the terms actually are. So j starts at i plus 1 and then it ascends to n. And as j gets bigger, the denominator gets bigger, so the sum ends get smaller. So the biggest sum end is going to be the very first one when j is as small as possible, namely i plus 1. When j is i plus 1, the sum end is 1 half. Then j gets incremented in the sum, and so that's we're going to pick up a 1 third term followed by a 1 fourth term, and so on. So it's going to be, for every inner sum, is going to have a, a, of this form, 1 half plus 1 third plus 1 fourth, and then it's going to sort of run out at some point when j equals n, and the biggest term we're ever going to see uh, is going to be a 1 over n, in the case where i equals 1. So, let's make our lives easier by taking this expression we started with, star, and instead of having a double sum, let's just upper bound this with a single sum. So what are the ingredients of the single sum? Well, there's this 2. Can't forget the 2. Then there's n choices for i. Actually, there's n minus 1 choices for i, but let's just be sloppy and say n choices. So that gives us a factor n. And then how big can an inner sum be? Well, an inner sum is just uh, a bunch of these terms, 1 half plus 1 third and so on. The biggest of those inner sums is the one occurring when i equals 1, at, at which point the last term is 1 over n. So we're going to just do a change of variable and express the inner sum, an upper bound on each inner sum, as the sum from k equal 2 to n of 1 over k. So that's looking more manageable, just having this single sum uh, involving this uh, index k. And life's going to get really good when we prove the next claim, which is that this sum cannot be very big. It's only logarithmic in n. Even though there's a linear number of sum ands, the, the overall value of the sum is only logarithmic. That, of course, is going to complete the proof because that will give us an overall bound of 2 times n times the natural log of n. So that's an n log n bound with really quite reasonable constants. So why is this true? Why is this sum only logarithmically large? Well, let's do a proof by a picture. I'm going to write this sum in a geometric fashion. So on the x-axis, let me mark off points corresponding to the positive integers. And on the y-axis, let me mark off points corresponding to fractions of the form 1 over k. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to draw a bunch of rectangles of decreasing area Specifically, they all have width 1, and the heights are going to be like 1 over k. So the area of this guy is 1, the area of this guy is 1 half, the area of this guy is 1 third, and so on. And now I'm going to overlay on this picture 
the graph of the function, the continuous function, f of x equals 1 over x. So notice that is going to go through these three points. It's going to kiss all of these rectangles on their upper right corners. Now what is it we're trying to prove? The claim we're trying to prove is that this sum of one-half plus one-third and so on is upper bounded uh, by something. So this sum can be just thought of as the areas in these rectangles, the one-half, the one-third, and so on. And we're going to upper bound it by the area under the blue curve. So you notice the area under the blue curve is at least as big as the sum of the areas of the rectangles because the curve hits each of these rectangles in its northeast corner. So putting that into mathematics, the sum from k equal 2 to n of 1 over k is bounded above by the integral and we'll start the area under the curve at 1 and then we need it to go all the way up to n of the function 1 over x dx so that's the area under the curve and if you remember a little bit of calculus the integral of 1 over x is the natural log of x so this equals the natural log of x evaluated uh, at n1 also known as log n minus log 1 and of course log 1 would be 0 so that gives us our log n so that completes the proof of the claim that indeed the sum of these 1 over k's is bounded above by the natural log of n and that in fact completes the proof of the theorem We've got that the expected number of comparisons is at most 2n times this sum, which is at most log n. Putting it all together, we find that the expected number of comparisons that Quicksort makes on an arbitrary input of length n is 2 times n times the natural log of n. So that would be big O of n log n with uh, quite reasonable constants. Uh, now this is just the number of comparisons, but as we observed earlier, the running time of quicksort on average is not much more than that. Uh, the running time is dominated by the number of comparisons that it makes. Moreover, as we discussed when we were talking about the details of the implementation, it works in place. Essentially no extra storage is necessary. So that is a complete and mathematically rigorous explanation of just why quicksort is so quick. I've said pretty much everything I want to say about sorting at this point, but I do want to cover one more related topic, namely the selection problem. This is the problem of computing order statistics of an array, with computing the median of an array being a special case. Analogous to our coverage of quicksort, the goal is going to be the design and analysis of a super practical randomized algorithm that solves the problem, and uh, this time we'll even achieve an expected running time that is linear in the length of the input array, that is big O of n for input arrays of length n, as opposed to the uh, O of n log n time that we had for the expected running time of quicksort. Like quicksort, the mathematical analysis is also going to be quite elegant. So in addition, these two required videos on this very practical algorithm will motivate two optional videos that are on very cool topics but of a somewhat more theoretical nature. Uh, the first optional video is going to be on how you solve the selection problem in deterministic linear time, that is without using randomization. And the second optional video uh, will be a sorting lower bound, that is why no comparison based sort can be better than merge short, can have better running time uh, than big O of n log n. So a few words about what you should have fresh in your mind before you watch this video. Uh, I'm definitely assuming that you've watched the quicksort videos, and not just watched them, but that you have that material pretty fresh in your mind. So in particular, the video of quicksort about the partition subroutine, so this is where you take an input array, you choose a pivot, and you do re by repeated swaps, you rearrange the array so that everything less than the pivot is to the left of it, everything bigger than the pivot is to the right of it. You should remember that subroutine. You should also remember the previous discussion about pivot choices, the idea that the quality of a pivot depends on how balanced a split into two different subproblems it gives you. Those are both going to be important. For the analysis of this randomized linear time selection algorithm, I need you to be, remember the concepts from probability review part one, in particular random variables, their expectation, and linearity of expectation. That said, let's move on and formally define what the selection problem is. The input is the same as for the sorting problem, just you're given an array of n distinct entries. But in addition, you're told what order statistic you're looking for. So that's going to be a number i, which is an integer between 1 and n. And the goal is to output just a single number, namely the ith order statistic, that is the ith smallest entry in this input array. So just to be clear, 
if you had an array entry of let's just say four elements containing the numbers 10, 8, 2, and 4, and you were looking for, say, the third order statistic, that would be this 8. The first order statistic is just the minimum ele element of the array. That's easy to find with a linear scan. The nth order statistic is just the maximum. Again, easier, easy to find with a linear scan. Uh, the middle element is the median, and you should think of that as the canonical version of the selection problem. Now, when n is odd, it's obvious what the median is. That's just the middle element, so the n plus 1 over 2 order statistic. If the array has even length, there's two possible medians, so let's just take the smaller of them. That's the n over 2 order statistic. You might wonder why you'd ever want to compute the median of an array rather than the mean, that is the average. It's easy to see that you can compute the average just with a simple linear scan. And uh, the median, you can one motivation is it's a more robust version of the mean. So if you just have a data entry problem and it corrupts one element of an input array, it can totally screw up the average value of the array, but it has generally very little impact on the median. Final comment about the problem is I am going to assume that the array entries are distinct, that is there's no repeated elements, but just like in our discussions of sorting, this is not a big assumption. Uh, I can encourage you to think about how to adapt these algorithms to work even if the arrays do have duplicates. You can indeed uh, still get the same very practical, very fast algorithms with duplicate elements. Now if you think about it, we already have a pretty darn good algorithm that solves the selection problem. Here's the algorithm. It's two simple steps and it runs in O of n log n time. Step one, sort the input array. We have various subroutines to do that. Let's say we pick merge sort. Now what is it we're trying to do? We're trying to find the ith smallest element of the input array. Well, once we've sorted it, we certainly know where the ith smallest element is. It's in the ith position of the sorted array. So that's pretty cool. We've just done what a computer scientist would call a reduction, and that's a super useful and super fundamental concept. It's when you realize that you can solve one problem by reducing it to another problem that you already know how to solve. So what we just showed is that the selection problem reduces easily to the sorting problem. We already know how to solve the sorting problem in n log n time, so that gives us an n log n time solution to the selection problem. But, again, remember the mantra of any algorithm designer worth their salt is, can we do better? We should avoid contentness. Just because we got n log n doesn't mean we should stop there. Maybe we can be even faster. Now certainly we're going to have to look at all of the elements in the input array in the worst case. We shouldn't expect to do better than linear, but hey, why not linear time? Actually, if you think about it, we probably should have asked that question back when we were studying the sorting problem. Why were we so content with the n log n time bound for merge sort and the O of n log n time on average bound for quick sort? Well, it turns out we have a really good reason to be happy with our n log n upper bounds for the sorting problem. It turns out, and this is not obvious and will be the subject of an uh, optional video, you actually can't sort an input array of length n better than n log n time, either in the worst case or on average. So in other words, if we insist on solving the selection problem via a reduction to the sorting problem, then we're stuck with this n log n time bound. Okay, strictly speaking, that's for something called comparison sorts. See the video for more details. But the upshot is, if we want a general purpose algorithm, and we want to do better than n log n for selection, we have to do it using ingenuity beyond this reduction. We have to prove that selection is a strictly easier problem than sorting. That's the only way we're going to have an algorithm that beats n log n. It's the only way we can conceivably get a linear time algorithm. And that is exactly what is up next on our plate. We're going to show selection is indeed fundamentally easier than sorting. We can have a linear time algorithm for it, even though we can't get a linear time algorithm for sorting. You can think of the algorithm we're going to discuss as a modification of quicksort, and in the same spirit of quicksort, it will be a randomized algorithm, and the running time will be an expected running time that will hold for any input array. Now, for the sorting problem, we know that quicksort that's n log n time on average, where the average is over the coin flips, done by the code, but we also know that if we wanted to, we could get a sorting algorithm in n log n time that doesn't use randomization. The merge sort algorithm is one such solution. So here we're giving a linear time solution for selection, for finding order statistics, that uses randomization, and it would be natural to wonder, is there an analog to merge sort? Is there an algorithm which does not use randomization and gets this exact same linear time bound? 
In fact, there is. The algorithm's uh, a little more complicated and therefore not quite as practical as this randomized algorithm, but it's still very cool. It's a really fun algorithm to learn and to teach. So I will have an optional video about linear time selection without randomization. So for those of you who aren't going to watch that video or want to know what's the key idea, uh, the idea is to choose the pivot deterministically in a very careful way using a trick called the median of medians. That's all I'm going to say about it now. You should watch the optional video if you want more details. I do feel compelled to warn you that if you're going to actually implement a selection algorithm, you should do the one that we discuss in this video, not the linear time one, because the one we'll discuss in this video has both smaller constants and works in place. So what I want to do next is develop the idea that we can modify the quick sort paradigm in order to directly solve the selection problem. So to get an idea of how that works, let me review the partition subroutine. Like in quick sort, this subroutine will be our workhorse for the selection algorithm. So what the partition subroutine does, it takes as input some jumbled up array, and it's going to solve a problem which is much more modest than sorting. So in partitioning, it's going to first choose a pivot element somehow. We'll have to discuss what's a good strategy for choosing a pivot element. But suppose, you know, in this particular input array, it chooses the first element, this three, as the pivot element. The responsibility of the partition subroutine then is to rearrange the elements in this array so that the following properties are satisfied. Anything less than the pivot is to the left of it. It can be in jumbled order, but if you're less than the pivot, you better be to the left, like this 2 and 1 is less than the 3. If you're bigger than the pivot, then again, you can be in jumbled order amongst those elements, but all of them have to be to the right of the pivot. And that's true for the numbers 4 through 8. They all are to the right of the pivot 3 in a jumbled order. So this in particular puts the pivot in its rightful position where it would belong in the final sorted array. And at least for quick sort, it enabled us to recursively sort to smaller subproblems. So this is where I want you to think a little bit about how we should adapt this paradigm. So suppose I told you the first step of our selection algorithm is going to be to choose a pivot and partition the array. Now the question is, how are we going to recurse? We need to understand how to find the ith order statistic of the original input array it suffices to recurse on just one subproblem of smaller size and find a suitable order statistic in it. So how should we do that? Let me ask you that in, with some very concrete examples about what pivot we choose and what order statistic we're looking for and see what you think. So the correct answer to this quiz is the second answer. So we can get away with recursing just once and in this particular example we're going to recurse on the right side of the array. And instead of looking for the fifth order statistic like we were originally, we're going to recursively search for the second order statistic. So why is that? Well, first, why do we recurse on the right side of the array? So by assumption, we have this array with 10 elements. We choose the pivot. We do partitioning. Remember, the pivot winds up in its rightful position. That's what partitioning does. So in, if the pivot winds up in the third position, we know it's the third smallest element in the array. Now, that's not what we were looking for. We were looking for the fifth smallest element in the array. That, of course, is bigger than the third smallest element of the array. So by partitioning, where is the fifth element going to be? It's got to be to the right of this third smallest element, to the right of the pivot. So we know for sure that the fifth order statistic of the original array lies to the right of the pivot. That is guaranteed. So we know where to recurse on the right-hand side. Now, what are we looking for? We are no longer looking for the fifth order statistic, the fifth smallest element. Why? Well, we've thrown out both the pivot and everything smaller than it. Remember, we're only recursing on the right-hand side. So we've thrown out the pivot, the third element, and everything less than it, the minimum and the second minimum. Having deleted the three smallest elements and originally looking for the fifth smallest of what remains of what we're recursing on, we're looking for the second smallest element. So the selection algorithm in general is just the generalization of this idea to arbitrary arrays and arbitrary situations of whether the pivot comes back equal to less than or bigger than the element you're looking for. So let me be more precise. I'm going to call this algorithm rselect for randomized selection. And according to the problem definition, it takes as input as usual an array A of some length n, but then also the order statistic that we're looking for. So we're going to call that i. And of course we assume that i is some integer between 1 and n inclusive. So for the base case, that's going to be if the array has size 1, then the only element we could be looking for is the uh, one order statistic and we just return the sole element of the array. 
Now we have to partition the array around the pivot element. And just like in quicksort, we're not going to be very lazy about choosing the pivot. We're going to choose it uniformly at random from the end possibilities and hope things work out. And that'll be the crux of the analysis, proving that random pivots are good enough sufficiently often. Having chosen the pivot, we now just invoke the standard partitioning subroutine. As usual, that's going to give us the partitioned array. You'll have the pivot element. You'll have everything less than the pivot to the left, everything bigger than the pivot to the right. As usual, I'll call everything to the left the first part of the partitioned array and everything bigger the second part. Now we have a couple of cases depending on whether the pivot is bigger or less than the element we're looking for. So I need a little notation to, to talk about that. So let's let j be uh, the order statistic that p is. So if p winds up being the third smallest element, like in the quiz, then j is going to be equal to 3. Equivalently, we can think of j as defined as the position of the pivot in the partitioned version of the array. Now there's one case which is very unlikely to occur, but we should include it just for completeness. If we're really lucky, then in fact our random pivot just happens to be the order statistic we were looking for. That's when i equals j. We're looking for the i smallest element. If by dumb luck the pivot winds up being the i smallest element, we're done. We can just return it. We don't have to recurse. Now in general, of course, we don't randomly choose the element we're looking for. We choose something that, well, it could be bigger or it could be smaller than it. In the quiz, we chose a pivot that was smaller than what we're looking for. Actually, that's the harder case. So let's first start with a case where the pivot winds up being bigger than the element we're looking for. So that means that j is bigger than i. We're looking for the i smallest. We randomly chose the j smallest for j bigger than i. So this is the opposite case of the quiz. This is where we know what we're looking for has to be to the left of the pivot. The pivot's the j smallest. Everything less than it's to the left. We're looking for the i smallest. i less than j. So that's got to be on the left. That's where we recurse. Moreover, it's clear we're looking for exactly the same order statistic. If we're looking for the third smallest element, we're only throwing out stuff which is bigger than something even bigger than the third smallest element. So we're still looking for the third smallest of what remains. And naturally, the new array size is j minus 1, because that's what uh, is to the left of the pivot. And then it, finally, the final case is when the random element that we choose is less than what we're looking for, and then we're just like the quiz. So namely, what we're looking for is bigger than the pivot. It's got to be on the right-hand side. We know we got to recurse on the right-hand side. We know the right-hand side has n minus j elements. We threw out everything up to the pivot, so we threw out j things. There's n minus j left. And those, all of those j things we threw out are less than what we're looking for. So if we used to be looking for the i smallest element, now we're looking for the i minus j smallest element. So that is the whole algorithm. That is how we adopt the approach we took to the sorting problem in quicksort and adapt it to the problem of selection. So is this algorithm any good? Let's start studying its properties and understand how well it works. So let's begin with correctness. So the claim is that no matter how the algorithm's coin flips come up, no matter what random pivots we choose, the algorithm is correct in the sense that it's guaranteed to output the ith order statistic. The proof is by induction. It proceeds very similarly to quicksort, so I'm not going to give it here. If you're curious about how these proofs go, there's an optional video about the correctness of quicksort. If you watch that and understand it, it should be clear how to adapt that inductive argument uh, to apply to the selection algorithm as well. So as usual for divide and conquer algorithms, the interesting part is not so much knowing, understanding why the algorithm works, but rather understanding how fast it runs. So the big question is, what is the running time of this selection algorithm? Now, to understand this, we have to understand the ramifications of pivot choices on the running time. So you've seen the quicksort videos. They're fresh in your mind. So what should be clear is that just like in quicksort, how fast this algorithm runs is going to depend on how good the pivots are. And what good pivots means is pivots that guarantee a balanced split. So the next quiz will make sure that you understand this point and ask you to think about just how bad the running time of the selection algorithm could be if you get extremely unlucky in your pivot choices. So the correct answer to this question is exactly the same as the answer for quicksort. Uh, the worst case running time, if the pivots are chosen just in a really unlucky way, is actually quadratic in the array length. Remember, we're shooting for linear time, so this quadratic is a total disaster. So how could this happen? Well, suppose you're looking for the median, and suppose you choose the minimum element as the pivot every single time. 
So if this is what happens, if every time you choose the pivot to be the minimum, just like in quicksort, this means every time you recurse, all you succeed in doing is peeling off a single element from the input array. Now, you're not going to find the median element until you've done roughly n over 2 recursive calls, each on an array that has size at least a constant fraction of the original one. So that's a linear number of recursive calls, each on an array of size at least some constant times n. So that gives you a total running time of quadratic overall. Of course, this is an absurdly unlikely event. Frankly, your computer is more likely to be struck by a meteor than it is for the pivot to be chosen as the minimum element in every recursive call. But if you really had an absolutely worst case choice of pivots, it would give this quadratic runtime bound. So the upshot then is that the running time of this randomized selection algorithm depends on how good our pivots are. And for a worst case choice of pivots, the running time could be as large as n squared. Now hopefully most of the time we're going to have much better pivots. And so the analysis proceeds by making that idea precise. So the key to a fast running time is going to be the, the usual property that we want to see in divide and conquer algorithms, namely every time recurse, the every time we recurse, the problem size better not just be smaller, but it better be smaller by a significant factor. How would that happen in this selection approach based on the partition subroutine? Well, if both of the subproblems are not too big, then we're guaranteed that when we recurse, we make a lot of progress. So let's think about what the best possible pivot would be in the sense of giving a balanced split. Right? So of course, in some sense, the best pivot is you just choose the order statistic you're looking for, uh, and that, then you're done in constant time. But that's extremely unlikely, and it's not worth worrying about. So ignore the fact that we might guess the pivot. What's the best pivot if we want to guarantee an aggressive decrease in the input size before the next iteration? Well, the best pivot is the one that gives us as most balanced split as possible. So what's the pivot that gives us the most balanced split, a 50-50 split? Well, if you think about it, it's exactly the median. Of course, this is not super helpful because the median might well be what we're looking for in the first place. So this is sort of a circular idea. But for intuition, it's still worth exploring what kind of running time we would get in the best case, right? If we're not going to get linear time even in this magical best case, we certainly wouldn't expect to get it on average over random choices of the pivots. So what would happen if we actually did luckily choose the median as the pivot every single time? Well, we get the recurrence that the uh, running time that uh, the algorithm requires an array of length n. Well, there's only going to be one recursive call. So this is the big difference from quicksort, where we had to recurse on both sides. And we had two recursive calls. So here we're going to have only one recursive call. In the magical case where our pivots are always equal to the median, both subproblem sizes contain are only half as large as the original one. So when we recurse, it's on a problem size guaranteed to be at most n over 2. And then outside of the recursive call, pretty much all we do is a partitioning invocation, and we know that that's linear time. So the recurrence we get is t of n is the most t of n over 2 plus big O of n. This is totally ready to get plugged into the master method. It winds up being case 2 of the master method. And indeed, we get exactly what we wanted, linear time. To reiterate, this is not interesting in its own right. This is just for intuition. This was a sanity check that at least for a best case choice of pivots, we get what we want, a linear time algorithm, and we do. Now the question is, how well do we do with random pivots? Now the intuition, the hope, is exactly as it was for quicksort, which is the random pivots are a perfectly good surrogate for the median, for the perfect pivot. So having the analysis of quicksort under our belt, where indeed random pivots do approximate very closely the performance you'd get with best case pivots, maybe now we have reason to believe that this is hopefully true. That said, as a mathematical statement, this is totally not obvious, and it's going to take a proof. That's the subject for the next video. But let me just be clear exactly what we're claiming. Here is the running time guarantee that randomized selection provides. For an arbitrary input array of length n, the average running time of this randomized selection algorithm is linear, big O of n. Let me reiterate a couple points I made uh, for the analogous guarantee for the quicksort algorithm. The first is that we're making no assumptions about the data whatsoever. In particular, we're not assuming that the data is random. This guarantee holds no matter what input array you feed into this randomized algorithm. In that sense, this is a totally general purpose subroutine. So where then does this averaging come from? Where does the expectation come from? The randomness is not in the data. Rather, the randomness is in the code. And we put it there ourselves. Now let's proceed to the analysis. 
In this video, I'll explain the mathematical analysis of the randomized linear time selection algorithm that we studied in the previous video. Specifically, I'm going to prove to you the following guarantee for that algorithm. For every single input array of length n, the running time of this randomized selection algorithm, on average, will be linear. Pretty amazing if you think about it, because that's barely more than the time it takes just to read the input. And in particular, this linear time algorithm is even faster than sorting. So this shows that selection is a fundamentally easier problem than sorting. You don't need to reduce to sorting. You can solve it directly in big O of n time. I want to reiterate the same points I made about quicksort. The guarantee is the same. It is a general purpose subroutine. We make no assumptions about data. This theorem holds no matter what the input array is. The expectation, the average, that's in the theorem statement is only over the coin flips made by the algorithm, made inside its code of our own devising. Before we plunge into the analysis, let me just make sure you remember what the algorithm is. So it's like quicksort, we partition around a pivot, except we only recurse once, not twice. So we're given an array with some length n, we're looking for the ith order statistic, the ith smallest element. The base case is obvious. If you're not in the base case, you choose a pivot p uniformly at random from the input array, just like we did in quicksort. We partition around the pivot, just like we did in, pick, in quicksort. That splits the array into a first part, those elements less than the pivot, and the second part, those elements which are bigger than the pivot. Now we have a couple cases. The case which is very unlikely, uh, so we don't really worry about it, is if we're lucky enough to guess the pivot as the ith order statistic, what we're looking for. That's when the new position j of the pivot element happens to equal i, what we're looking for. Then, of course, we just return it. That was exactly what we wanted. In the general case, the pivot is going to be in a position j, which is either bigger than what we're looking for i, that's when the pivot is too big, or j, its position will be less than the order statistic i that we're looking for. That's when the pivot is too small. So if the pivot's too big, if j is bigger than i, then we know that what we're looking for is on the left-hand side amongst the elements less than the pivot, so that's where we recurse. Uh, we've thrown out both the pivot and everything to the right of it. That leaves us with an array of j minus 1 elements, and we're still looking for the ith smallest among these j minus 1 smallest elements. And in the final case, this is what we went through in the quiz in the last video, is if we choose a pivot who's smaller than what we're looking for, that's when j is less than i. Then it means we're safe to throw out the pivot and everything less than it. We're safe recursing on the second part, those elements bigger than the pivot. Having thrown out the j smallest elements, we're recursing on an element of length n minus j, and we're looking for the uh, i minus j smallest element in those that remain, having already thrown out uh, the j smallest from the input array. So that's randomized selection. Let's discuss why it's linear time on average. The first thought that you might have, and this would be a good thought, would be that we should proceed exactly the same way that we did in quicksort. You'll recall that when we analyzed quicksort, we set up these indicator random variables xij, determining whether or not a given uh, pair of elements got compared at any point in the algorithm. And then we just realized the sum of the comparisons, just the sum over all of these xij's. We applied linearity of expectation, and it boiled down to just figuring out the probability that a given pair of elements gets compared. You can analyze this randomized selection algorithm in exactly the same way, and it does give you a linear time bound on average, but it's a little messy. It winds up being not quite as clean in, as in the quicksort analysis. Moreover, because of the special structure of the selection problem, we can proceed in an even more slick way here than uh, the way we did with quicksort. So again, we'll have some uh, constituent random variables. We'll again apply linearity of expectation, but the definition of those random variables is going to be a little bit different than it was in quicksort. So first, a preliminary observation, which is that uh, the workhorse for this randomized selection procedure is exactly the same as it was in quicksort, namely, it's the partition subroutine. Essentially, all of the work that gets done outside of the recursive calls just partitions the input array around some pivot element. As we discussed in detail in a separate video, that takes linear time. So usually when we say something's linear time, we just use big O notation. I'm going to go ahead and explicitly use a constant C here for the operations outside the recursive call. That'll make it clear that I'm not hiding anything up my sleeves when we do the rest of the analysis. Now what I want to do on this slide is introduce some vocabulary, some notation, which will allow us to cleanly track the progress of this recursive selection algorithm. And by progress, I mean the length of the array on which it's currently operating. Remember, we're hoping for a big win over quicksort, because here we do only one recursive call, not two. We don't have to recurse on both sides of the pivot, just on one of them. So it stands to reason that we can think about the algorithm as making more and more progress as its single recursive call is operating on arrays of smaller and smaller length. So the notion that will be important for this proof is that of a phase. This quantifies 
quantifies how much progress we've made so far with higher numbered phases corresponding to more and more progress. We'll say that the R-select algorithm at some midpoint of its execution is in the middle of phase J if the array size that the current recursive call is working on has length between 3 fourths raised to the J times N and the smaller number 3 fourths raised to the J plus 1 times N. For example, think about the case where J equals 0. That says phase 0 recursive calls operate on arrays with size between N, that's the length of the original input array, and 75% of N. So certainly the outermost recursive call is going to be in phase 0 because the input array has size N. And then, depending on the choice of the pivot, you may or may not get out of phase 0 in the next recursive call. If you choose a good pivot and you wind up recursing on something uh, that has at most 75% of the original elements, you will no longer be in phase 0. If you recurse on something that has more than 75% of what you started with of the input array, then you're still going to be in phase 0 even in the second recursive call. So overall, the phase number J quantifies the number of times we've made 75% progress relative to the original input array. And the other piece of notation that's going to be important is going, I'm going to call XJ. So for a phase J, XJ simply counts the number of recursive calls in which a randomized selection algorithm is in phase J. So this is going to be some integer. It could be as small as zero if you think about it for some of the phases, uh, or it could be larger. So why am I doing this? Why am I making these definitions of phases and of these XJs? What's the point? Well, again, remember the point was we want to be able to cleanly talk about the progress that the randomized selection algorithm makes through its recursion. And what I want to now show you is that in terms of these XJs, counting the number of iterations in each phase, we can derive a relatively simple upper bound on the number of operations that our algorithm requires. Specifically, the running time of our algorithm can be bounded above by the running time in a given phase and then summing those quantities over all of the possible phases. So we're going to start with a big sum over all the phases J. We're going to look at the number of recursive calls that we have to endure during phase J. So that's XJ by definition. And then we're going to look at the work that we do outside of the recursive calls in each recursive call during phase J. Now, in a given recursive call, outside of its recursive call, we do C times M operations, where M is the uh, length of the input array. And during phase J, we have an upper bound on the length of the input array. By definition, it's at most 3 quarters raised to the J times N. So that is, we multiply the running time times this constant C. This we inherit from the partition subroutine. And then we can, for the input length, we can put an upper bound of 3 quarters raised to the j times n. So just to review where all of these terms come from, this 3 quarters j times n is an upper bound on the array size during phase j. This is by the definition of a phase. Then if we multiply that times c, that's the amount of work that we do on each phase j subproblem. How much work do we do in phase J overall? Well, we just take the work per subproblem, that's what's circled in yellow, and we multiply it times the number of such subproblems we have. And of course, we don't want to forget any of our subproblems, so we just make sure we sum over all of the phases J to ensure that at every point we count the work done in each of the subproblems. Okay, so that's the upshot of this slide. We can upper bound the running time of our randomized algorithm very simply in terms of phases and the XJs, the number of subproblems that we have to endure during phase J. So this upper bound on our running time is important enough to uh, give some notation. We'll call this star. This will be the starting point of our final derivation when we complete the, the proof of this theorem. Now don't forget, we're analyzing a randomized algorithm. So therefore, the left-hand side of this inequality, the running time of R select, that's a random variable. So that's a different number depending on the outcome of the random coin flips of the algorithm. Depending on the random pivots chosen, you'll get different running times. Similarly, the right-hand side of this inequality is also a random variable. That's because the XJs are random variables. The number of subproblems in phase J depends on which pivots get chosen. So to analyze, what we care about is the expectations of these quantities, their average values. So we're going to start modestly, and as usual, this uh, will extend our modest accomplishments to much 
uh, more impressive ones using linearity of expectation, but our first modest goal is just to be, understand the average value of an xj, the expected value of xj. We're going to do that in two steps. On the next slide, I'm going to argue that to analyze the expectation of xj, it's sufficient to understand the expectation of a very simple coin flipping experiment. Then we'll analyze that coin flipping experiment. Then we'll have the dominoes all set up in a row, and on the final slide, we'll knock them down and finish the proof. So let's try to understand the average number of recursive calls we expect to see in a given phase. So again, just so we don't forget, xj is defined as the number of recursive calls during phase j, where a recursive call is in phase j if and only if the current subarray length lies between 3 quarters raised to the j plus 1 times n and then the larger number of 3 quarters raised to the j times n. So again, for example, phase 0 is just uh, the recursive calls in which the array length is between 75% of the original elements and 100% of the original elements. So what I want to do next is point out that a very simple sufficient condition guarantees that we'll proceed from a given phase on to the next phase. So it's a condition guaranteeing termination of the current phase. And it's an event that we've discussed in previous videos, namely that the pivot that we choose gives a reasonably balanced split, 25, 75, or better. So recall how partitioning works. We choose a pivot P. It winds up wherever it winds up, and the stuff to the left of it is less than P. The stuff to the right of it is bigger than P. So 25, 75 split or better, what I mean is that each of these, each the first part and the second part has at most 75% of the elements in the input array. Uh, both, have both have at least 25% and at most 75%. And the key point is that if we wind up choosing a pivot that gives us a split that's at least this good, the current phase must end. Why must the current phase end? Well, if we get a 25-75 split or better, then no matter which case we wind up in in the algorithm, we're guaranteed to recurse on a subproblem that has at most 75% of what we started with. That guarantees that whatever phase we're in now, we're going to be in an even bigger phase when we recurse. Now I want you to remember something that we talked about before, which is that you've got a decent chance when you pick a random pivot of getting something that gives you a 25-75 split or better. In fact, the probability is 50%. Right? If you have an array that has the integers from 1 to 100 inclusive, anything from 76 to 26 to 75 will do the trick. That'll ensure that at least uh, the first 25 elements are excluded from the rightmost call, and at least the rightmost 25 elements are excluded from the left recursive call. So this is why we can reduce our analysis of the number of recursive calls during Previous videos covered an outstanding algorithm for the selection problem, the problem of computing the ith order statistic of a given array. That algorithm, which we called the rselect algorithm, was excellent in two senses. First, it's super practical, it runs blazingly fast in practice, but also it enjoys a satisfying theoretical guarantee. For every input array of length n, the expected running time of rselect is big O of n, where the expectation is over the random choices of the pivots that rselect makes during its execution. Now, in this optional video, I'm going to teach you yet another algorithm for the selection problem. Well, why bother, given that rselect is so good? Well, frankly, I, I just can't help myself. The ideas of this algorithm are just too cool not to tell you about, at least in an optional video like this one. The selection algorithm we'll cover here is deterministic. That is, it uses no randomization whatsoever, and it's still going to run in linear time, big O of n time, but now in the worst case for every single input array. Thus, the same way merge sort gets the same asymptotic running time, big O of n log n, as quick sort gets on average, this deterministic algorithm will get the same running time, O of n, as the rselect algorithm does on average. That said, the algorithm we're going to cover here, well, it's not slow. It's not as fast as rselect in practice, both because the hidden constants in it are larger, and also because it doesn't operate in place. For those of you who are feeling keen, you might want to try coding up both the randomized and the deterministic selection algorithms and make your own measurements about how much better the randomized one seems to be. But if you have an appreciation for brilliant algorithms, I think you'll enjoy these lectures nonetheless. So let me remind you the problem. This is the ith order statistic problem. So we're given an array. It has n distinct entries. Again, the distinctness is for simplicity. And you're given a number i between 1 and n. You're responsible for finding the ith smallest number, which we call the ith order statistic. For example, if i is something like n over 2, then we're looking for the median. 
So let's briefly review the randomized selection algorithm. We can think of the deterministic algorithm covered here as a modification of the randomized algorithm, the R-select algorithm. So when that algorithm is passed in an array with length n, and when you're looking for the i-th order statistic, as usual, there's a trivial base case. But when you're not in the base case, just like in quicksort, what you do is you're going to partition the array around the pivot element p. Now, how are you going to choose p? Well, just like quicksort, in the randomized algorithm, you choose a uniformly at random. So each of the n elements of the input array are equally likely to be chosen as the pivot. So call that pivot p. Now do the partitioning. Remember, partitioning puts all of the elements less than the pivot to the left of the pivot. We call that the first part of the partitioned array. Anything bi bigger than the pivot gets moved to be right of the pivot. We call that the second part of the array. And let j denote the position of the pivot in this partitioned array. Equivalently, let j be what order statistic the, the pivot winds up happening to be. Right. So if we happen to choose the minimum element, then j is going to be equal to 1. If we happen to choose the maximum element, j is going to be equal to n, and so on. So there's always the lucky case, chance 1 and n, that we happen to choose the i-th order statistic as our pivot. So we're going to find that out when we just notice that j equals i. In that super lucky case, we just return the pivot and we're done. That's what we were looking for in the first place. Of course, that's so rare, it's not worth worrying about. So really, the two main cases depend on whether the pivot that we randomly choose is bigger than what we're looking for or if it's less than what we're looking for. So if it's bigger than what we're looking for, that means j is bigger than i. We're looking for the i-th smallest. We randomly chose the j-th smallest. Then, remember, we know that the i smallest element has to lie to the left of the pivot element in that first part of the partitioned array. So we recurse there. It's an array that has j minus 1 elements in it, everything less than the pivot. And we're still looking for the i smallest among them. In the other case, this was the case covered in a quiz a couple of videos back, if we guess a pivot element that is less than what we're looking for, well, then we should discard everything less than the pivot and the pivot itself. So we should recurse on the second part of A, stuff bigger than the pivot. We know that's where what we're looking for lies. And having thrown away j elements, the smallest ones at that, we're recursing on an array of length n minus j and looking for the i minus j -th smallest element in that second part. So that was the randomized selection algorithm, and you'll recall the intuition for why this works is random pivots should usually give pretty good splits. So the way the analysis went is we showed that each iteration, each recursive call, with 50% probability we get a 25-75 split or better. Therefore, on average, every two recursive calls, we are pretty aggressively shrinking the size of the recursive call, and for that reason we should get uh, something like a linear time bound. We do almost as well as if we pick the median in every single call, just because random pivots are a good enough proxy of best case pivots of uh, the median. So now the big question is, suppose we weren't permitted to make use of randomization. Suppose this choose a random pivot trick was not in our toolbox. What could we do? How are we going to deterministically choose a good pivot? Okay, so let's just remember quickly what it means to be a good pivot. A good pivot is one that gives us a balanced split after we do the partitioning of the array. That is, we want as close to a 50-50 split between the first and the second parts of the partitioned array as possible. Now, what pivot would give us the perfect 50-50 split? Well, in fact, that would be the median. But that seems like a totally ridiculous observation because we canonically are trying to find the median. So previously we were able to be lazy and we just picked a random pivot and used that as a pretty good proxy for the best case pivot. But now we have to have some subroutine that deterministically finds us a pretty good approximation of the median. And the big idea in this linear time selection algorithm is to use what's called the median of medians as a proxy for the true median of the input array. So when I say median of medians, you're not supposed to know what I'm talking about. You're just supposed to be intrigued. Now let me explain a little bit further. Here's the plan. We're going to have our new implementation of choose pivot, and it's going to be deterministic. You will see no randomization on this slide, I promise. So the high-level strategy is going to be we're going to think about the elements of this array like sports teams, and we're going to run a tournament, a two-round knockout tournament, and the winner of this tournament is going to be who we return as the proposed pivot element. Then we'll have to prove that this is a pretty good pivot element. So there's going to be two rounds in this tournament. Each element, each team is going to first participate in a world group, if you will. So there will be uh, small groups of five teams each, five elements each. And to win your first round, you have to be the middle element out of those five. So that will give us n over five first round winners. And then the winner of that second round is going to be the median of those n over five winners from the first round. Here are the details. 
The first step isn't really something you actually do in the program, it's just conceptually. So logically, we're going to take this array capital A, which has n elements, and we're going to think of it as comprising n over 5 groups with 5 elements each. So if n is not a multiple of 5, obviously there'll be one extra group that has size between 1 and 4. Now for each of these groups of 5, we're going to compute the median, so the middle element of those 5. Now for 5 elements, we may as well just invoke our reduction to sorting. We're just going to sort each group separately and then use the middle element, which is the median. It doesn't really matter how you do the sorting because after all there's only 5 elements, but you know, let's use merge sort. What the heck. Now what we're going to do is we're going to take our first round winners and we're going to copy them over into their own private array. Now this next step is the one that's going to seem dangerously like cheating, dangerously like I'm doing something circular and not actually defining a proper algorithm. So C, you'll notice, has length over n over 5. We started with an array of length n. This is a smaller input. So let's recursively compute the median of this array, capital C. That is the second round of our tournament. Amongst the n over 5 first round winners, the n over 5 middle elements of the sorted groups, we recursively compute the median. That's our final winner, and that's what we return as the pivot element from this subroutine. Now, I realize it's very hard to keep track of both what's happening internal to this choose pivot subroutine and what's happening in the calling function of our deterministic selection algorithm. So let me put them both together and show them to you cleaned up on a single slide. So here is the proposed deterministic selection algorithm. So this algorithm uses no randomization. Previously, the only randomization was in choosing the pivot. Now we have a deterministic subroutine for choosing the pivot, and so there's no randomization at all. I've taken the liberty of inlining a choose pivot subroutine. So that is exactly what lines 1, 2, and 3 are. I haven't written down the base case just to save space. I'm sure you can remember it. So if you're not in the base case, what did we do before? The first thing we do is choose a random pivot. What do we do now? Well, we have steps one through three. We do something much more clever to choose a pivot. And this is exactly what we said on the last slide. We break the array into groups of five. We sort each group, for example, using merge sort. We copy over the middle element of each of the n over five groups into their own array, capital C. And then we recursively compute the median of C. So when we recurse on select, we pass it the input C. C has n over five elements, so that's the new link. That's a smaller link than what we start with, so it's a legitimate recursive call. We're finding the median of n over five elements element, so that's going to be uh, the n over 10th order statistic. As usual, to keep things clear, I'm ignoring stuff like fractions. Uh, in your real implementation, you would just round it up or down as appropriate. So steps one through three are the new choose pivot subroutine that replaces the randomized selection that we had before. Steps four through seven are exactly the same as before. We've changed nothing. All we have done is ripped out that one line where we chose the pivot randomly and pasted in these lines one through three. That is the only change to the randomized selection algorithm. So the next quiz is a sanity check that you understand this algorithm, at least not necessarily why it's fast, but at least just how it actually works. And it only asks you to identify how many recursive calls there are each time. So for example, in merge sort, there's two recursive calls. In quick sort, there's two recursive calls. In R select, there's one recursive call. How many recursive calls do you have each time outside of the base case in the deselect algorithm? All right, so the correct answer is two. There are two recursive calls in deselect. And maybe the easiest way to answer this question is not to think too hard about it and literally just inspect the code and count. Right? Namely, there's one recursive call in line three, and there's one recursive call in either six or seven. So quite literally, you know, there's seven lines of code, and two of the ones that get executed have a recursive call. So the answer is two. Now, what's confusing is that in the ran a couple of things. First, in the randomized selection algorithm, we only had one recursive call. We had the recursive call in line six or seven. We didn't have this one in line three. That one in line three is new compared to the randomized uh, procedure. So we're kind of used to thinking of one recursive call using the divide and conquer approach to selection. Here we have two. Moreover, conceptually, the role of these two recursive calls are different. So the one in line six or seven is the one we're used to. That's after you've done the partitioning, so you have a smaller subproblem, and then you just recursively find uh, the residual order statistic in the residual array. That's sort of the standard divide and conquer approach. What's sort of crazy is this second use of a recursive call, which is part of identifying a good pivot element 
for this outer recursive call. And this is so counterintuitive, many students in my experience don't even think that this algorithm will halt. Sort of they sort of expect it to go into an infinite loop. But again, that's sort of overthinking it. Okay, so let's just compare this to an algorithm like merge sort. What does merge sort do? Well, it does two recursive calls and it does some other stuff. Okay, it does linear work. That's uh, what it does to merge. And then there are two recursive calls on smaller subproblems, right? No issue. We definitely feel confident that merge sort is going to terminate because the subproblems keep getting smaller. What does deselect do if you squint? So don't think about the details. Just at a high level, what is the work done in deselect? Well, there are two recursive calls. There's a, the one's in line three, one's in line six or seven. But there's two recursive calls on sm smaller subproblem sizes. And it does some other stuff. Does some stuff in steps one and two and four, but whatever. Those aren't recursive calls. It does some work, two recursive calls and smaller subproblems. It's got to terminate. We don't know what the runtime is, but it's got to terminate. Okay. So if you're worried about this terminating, forget about the fact that the two recursive calls have different semantics, and just remember, if ever you only recurse on smaller subproblems, you're definitely going to terminate. Now, of course. Who knows what the running time is? I owe you an argument about why it would be anything reasonable. That's going to come later. In fact, what I'm going to prove to you is not only does this selection algorithm uh, terminate, run in finite time, it actually runs in linear time, no matter what the input array is. So whereas with our select, we could only discuss its expected running time being linear, we showed that with disastrously bad choices for pivots, our select can actually take quadratic time. Under no circumstances will deselect ever, ever take quadratic time. So for every input array, it's big O of n time. There's no randomization because we don't randomly do anything and choose pivot. So there's no need to talk about average running time. Just the worst case running time over all inputs is O of n. That said, I want to reiterate the warning I gave you at the very beginning of this video, which is if you actually need to implement a selection algorithm, you know, this one wouldn't be a disaster, but it is not the method of choice. So I don't want you to be misled. As I said, there were two reasons for this. The first is that uh, the constants hidden in the big O notation are larger for deselect than for rselect. That will be somewhat evident from the analyses that we give for the two algorithms. The second reason is, recall we made a big deal about how partitioning works in place and therefore quicksort and rselect also both work in place, that is with no uh, real additional memory storage. But in this deselect algorithm, we do need this extra array C to copy over the middle elements, the first round winners, and so that extra memory as usual slows down the practical performance. One final comment. So for many of the algorithms that we cover, I hope I explain them clearly enough that their elegance shines through and that for many of them you feel like you could have come up with it yourself, but if only you'd been in the right place at the right time. I think that's a great way to feel and a great way to appreciate uh, some of these very cool algorithms. That said, linear time selection, I don't blame you if it, you feel like you never might have come up with this algorithm. I think that's a totally reasonable way to feel after you see this code. If it makes you feel better, let me tell you about who came up with this algorithm. It's quite old at this point, about 40 years from 1973. Uh, and the authors, there are five of them. And uh, at the time, this was very unusual. So Manuel Blum, Bob Floyd, Vaughn Pratt, Ron Levest, and Bob Tarjan. And this is a pretty heavyweight lineup. So as we've discussed in the past, the highest award in computer science is the ACM Turing Award, given once each year. And I like to ask my algorithms classes how many of these authors do they think uh, have been awarded a Turing Award. I've asked it many times. The favorite answer anyone's ever given me has been six, which I think is uh, in spirit should be correct. Strictly speaking, the answer is four. So the only one of these five authors that doesn't have a Turing Award is Von Pratt, although he's done remarkable things spanning the gamut from co-founding Sun Systems to uh, having very famous theorems about, uh, for example, testing primality. But the other four have all been awarded the Turing Award at some point. So in chronological order, so the late Bob Floyd, who is a professor here at Stanford, was awarded the 1978 Turing Award. Uh, both for contributions to algorithms, but also to programming languages and compilers. So Bob Tarjan, who, uh, as we speak, is here as a visitor at Stanford and has spent uh, his PhD here and has been here as a faculty at other times, uh, was awarded it for contributions uh, to graph algorithms and data structures. We'll talk some more about some of his other contributions uh, in future courses. Manuel Blum was awarded the Turing Award in 95, largely for contributions in cryptography. 
And many of you probably know Ron Rivest as the R in the RSA crypto system. So he uh, won the uh, Turing Award along with Shamir and Edelman back in 02. So in summary, if this algorithm seems like one that might have eluded you even on your most creative days, uh, I wouldn't feel bad about it. This is, a, this is a quite clever algorithm. So let's now turn to the analysis and explain why it runs in linear time uh, in the worst case. Now let's turn to the analysis of the deterministic selection algorithm that we discussed in the last slide by Blum, Floyd, Pratt, Rivest, and Tarjan. In particular, let's prove that it runs in linear time on every possible input. Let's uh, remind you what the algorithm is. So the idea is we just take the R select algorithm, but instead of choosing a pivot at random, we do quite a bit more work to choose what we hope is going to be a guaranteed pretty good pivot. So again, lines one through three are the new choose pivot subroutine, and it's essentially implementing a two round knockout tournament. So first we do the first round matches. So what does that mean? That means we take A, we think of it as comprising these groups of five elements. So the first five elements, one through five, then the elements six through 10, the elements 11 through 15 in the array and so on. We sort each of those five using, let's say, merge sort, although it doesn't matter much. Uh, then the winner of each of these n over five first round matches is the median of those five. That is the third highest element, third largest element out of the five. So we take those n over five first round winners, the middle element of each of the five in the sorted groups. We copy those over into a new array, capital C, of length n over five. And then we run the second round of our tournament at which we elect the median of these n over five first round winners as our final pivot, as our final winner. So we do that by recursively calling deselect on C. It has length n over five looking for the median, so that's the n over 10th order statistic in that array. So we call the pivot P, and then we just proceed exactly like we did in the randomized case. That is, we partition A around the pivot, we get a first part, a second part, and we recurse on the left side or the right side as appropriate, depending on whether the pivot uh, is uh, less than or bigger than the element that we're looking for. So the claim is, believe it or not, that this algorithm runs in linear time. Now, you'd be right to be a little skeptical of that claim. Certainly, you should be demanding from me some kind of mathematical argument about this linear time claim. It's not at all clear that that's true. One reason for skepticism is that this is an unusually extravagant algorithm in two senses for something that's going to run in linear time. First is, first is its extravagant use of recursion. There are two different recursive calls, as discussed in the previous video, and we have not yet seen any algorithm that makes two recursive calls and runs in linear time. The best case scenario was always n log n time for our two recursive call algorithms like merge sort or quick sort. The second reason is that outside of the recursive calls, it seems like it does kind of a lot of work as well. So to drill down on that point and get a better understanding for how much work this algorithm is doing, the next quiz asks you to focus just on line one. So when we sort groups of five in the input array, how long does that take? So the correct answer to this quiz is the third answer. Maybe you would have guessed that, given that I'm claiming that the whole algorithm takes linear time. You could have guessed that this subroutine wouldn't be worse than linear time. But you should also be wondering, you know, isn't sorting always n log n? So aren't we doing sorting here? Why isn't the n log n thing kicking in? The reason is we're doing something much, much more modest than sorting the length n input array. All we're sorting are these puny little subarrays that have only five elements. And that's just not that hard. That can be done in constant time. So let me be a little more precise about it. The claim is that sorting an element with an array with five elements takes only some constant number of operations. Let's say 120. Where did this number 120 come from? Well, you know, for example, suppose we use merge sort. If you go back to those very early lectures, we actually counted up the number of operations that merge sorts needs to sort an array of length m for some generic m. Here m is 5, so we can just plug 5 into our previous formula that we computed for merge sort. Right? If we plug m equal 5 into this formula, what do we get? We get 6 times 5 times log base 2 of 5 plus 1. Who knows what log base 2 of 5 is? That's some weird number, but it's going to be a most 3, right? So if that's a most 3, 3 plus 1 is 4, multiply that by 5, then again times 6, and boom, you get your 120. So it's constant time to sort just one of these groups of 5. Now, of course, we have to do a bunch of groups of 5, but there's only a linear number of groups, constant per each, so that's going to be linear time overall. 
So to be really pedantic, we do 120 operations at most per group. There's n over five different groups. We multiply those, we get 24 n operations to so do all the sorting, and that's obviously a uh, big O of n. So linear time for step one. So having warmed up with step one, let's look now at the whole seven line algorithm and see what's going on. Now I hope you haven't forgotten the paradigm that we discussed for analyzing the running time of deterministic divide and conquer algorithms, like this one. So namely we're going to develop a recurrence, and remember a recurrence expresses the running time, the number of operations performed in two parts. First of all, there's the work done by the recursive calls on smaller subproblems, and secondly there's the work done locally, not in the recursive calls. So let's just go through these lines one at a time and just do a running tally of how much work is done by this algorithm, both locally and by the recursive calls. So the quiz was about uh, step number one. We just argued that since it's constant time to sort each group and there's a linear number of groups, we're going to do linear work, theta of n, uh, for step one. So copying these first round winners over into their special array C is obviously linear time. Now when we get to the third line, we have a recursive call, but it's a quite easy recursive call to understand. It's just uh, recursing on an array that has size 20% as large as the one we started with, on n over 5 elements. So this, remember the notation we use for recurrences, uh, generally we denote by capital T the running time of an algorithm on arrays of a given length. So this is going to be the running time that our algorithm uh, has in the worst case on inputs of length n over 5 because n over 5 is the length of the array that we're passing to this recursive call. Good. Step 4, partition. Well, we had videos about how to implement partition and why it's linear time. We knew that all the way back in quicksort. So that's definitely theta of n. Step 5 is constant time. I'm not going to worry about it. And finally, we get to lines 6 and 7. So at most, one of these will execute. So in either case, there's one recursive call. So that's fine. We know in recurrences, when there's a recursive call, we just write capital T of whatever the input length is. So we just have to figure out what the input length here is. It was n over 5 in step in line 3. So we just have to figure out what it is in line 6 or 7. Oh, yeah. Now we're remembering why we didn't use recurrences when we discussed randomized quicksort and uh, the randomized selection algorithm. It's because we don't actually know how big the recursive call is, how big the input passed to this recursive call in line 6 or 7 is. Line 3, no problem. It's guaranteed to be 20% of the input array because that's how we define it. But for line 6 or 7, the size of the input array that gets passed to the, to the recursive call depends on how good the pivot is. It depends on the splitting of the array A into the two parts, which depends on the choice of the pivot P. So at the moment, all we can write is T of question mark. We don't know. We don't know how much work gets done in that recursion because we don't know what the input size is. Let me summarize the results of this discussion. So I'm going to write down a recurrence for the deselect algorithm. So let T of n denote the maximum number of operations that deselect ever requires to terminate on an array input of length n. This is just the usual definition of T of n we use in recurrences. What we established in our tally on the last slide is that deselect does linear stuff outside the recursive calls. It does the sorting of groups of five, it does the copying, and it does the partitioning. Each of those is linear, so all of them together is also linear. And then it does two recursive calls. One whose size we understand, one whose size we don't understand. So for once, I'm not going to be sloppy, and I'm going to write out an explicit constant about the work done outside the recursive calls. I'm not going to write big O of n. I'm going to actually write c times n for some constant c. So of course, no one ever cares about base cases, but for completeness, let me write it down anyways. Uh, when deselect gets an input of only one element, it returns it. Let's call that one operation for simplicity. And then in the general case, and this is what's interesting, uh, when you're not in the base case, when you have to recurse, what happens? Well, you do linear work outside of the recursive calls, so that's c times n for some constant c. c is just the linear, the, the expressed constant in all of our big thetas on the previous slide. Plus the recursive call in line 3, and we know that happens on an array of size n over 5. As usual, I'm not going to worry about rounding up or rounding down, it doesn't matter. Plus our mystery recursive call on an array of unknown size. So that's where we stand and we seem stuck because of this pesky question mark. So let's prove a lemma which is going to replace this question mark 
with something we can reason with, with an actual number that we can then analyze. So the upshot of this key lemma is that all of our hard work in our choose pivot subroutine in lines one through three bears fruit in the sense that we're guaranteed to have a pretty good pivot. It may not be the median, it may not give us a 50-50 split, then we could replace the question mark with uh, one half times n, but it's going to let us replace the question mark by a seven tenths times n. Now, I don't want to lie to you. I'm going to be honest, it's not quite 7 tenths n. It's more like 7 tenths n minus 5. There's a little bit of additive error. So taking care of the additive error adds nothing to your conceptual understanding of this algorithm or why it works. Uh, but for those of you who want a truly rigorous proof, uh, there are some posted lecture notes which go through all the gory details. But in lecture, I'm just going to tell you what's sort of morally true and ignore the fact that we're going to be off by you know, 3 here and 4 there. And it will be clear when I show you the proof of this lemma where I'm being a little bit sloppy and why it really shouldn't matter, and it doesn't. So to explain why this key lemma is true, why we get a 30-70 split or better guaranteed, let me set up a little notation. I'm getting sick of writing n over 5 over and over again, so let's just give that a synonym, let's say k. So this is the number of different sort of first round matches that we have, the number of groups. I also want some notation to talk about the first round winners, that is the medians of these groups of five, the k first round winners. So we're going to call xi the ith smallest of those who win their first round match, who make it to the second round. So just to make sure the notation is clear, we can express the pivot element in terms of these x's. Remember, the pivot is the final winner. It wins not only its first round tournament, but also the second round tournament. It's not only the middle element of the first group of five, it's actually the median of the n over five middle elements. It's the median of the medians. That is, of the k middle elements, it's uh, the k over tooth order statistic, the k over tooth smallest. I'm saying this assuming that k is even. If k was odd, it would be some slightly different formula, uh, as you know. So let's remember what we're trying to prove. We're trying to prove that for our proposed pivot, which is exactly this element x sub k over 2, it's exactly the winner of this two-round knockout tournament, we're trying to argue that for this proposed pivot, we definitely get a 30-70 split or better. So what that means is there better be at least 30% of the elements that are bigger than the pivot. That way, if you recurse on the left side in the first part, we don't have to deal with more than 70% of the original elements. Similarly, there better be at least 30% of the elements that are smaller than the pivot. That way, if we recurse on the right-hand side, we know we don't have to deal with more than 70% of the original input elements. So if we achieve this goal, we prove that there's at least 30% on each side of x k over 2, then we're done. That proves the key lemma that we get a 30-70 split or better. So I'm going to show you why this goal is true. I'm going to introduce a thought experiment, and I'm going to lay out it abstractly. Then we'll sort of do an example to make it more clear, and then we'll go back to the general discussion and finish the proof. So what we're going to do is a thought experiment for the purposes of counting how many elements of the input array are bigger than our pivot choice and how many are smaller. So in our minds, we're going to imagine that we take the n elements in A and we arrange them in a 2D grid. So here are the semantics of this grid. Each column will have exactly five elements and it will correspond to one of the groups of five. So we'll have n over five columns corresponding to our n over five groups in our first round of our tournament. If n is not a multiple of five, then one of these groups has size between one and four, but I'm just not gonna worry about it. That's some of the uh, additive loss, which I'm ignoring. Moreover, we're going to arrange each column in a certain way so that going from bottom to top, the entries of that group go from smallest to largest. So this means that in this grid we have five rows, and the middle row, the third row, corresponds exactly to the middle elements, to the winners of the first round matches. So because these middle elements, these first round winners, are treated specially, I'm going to denote them with big squares. The other four elements of the group, two of which are smaller, two of which are bigger, are just going to be little circles. Furthermore, in this thought experiment, in our mind, we're going to arrange the columns from left to right in order of increasing value of the middle element. Now remember I introduced this notation, x sub i is the ith smallest amongst the middle elements. 
So a different way of what I'm trying to say is that the leftmost column is the group that has x1 as its middle element. So among the n over 5 middle elements, one of the groups has the smallest middle element. We put that all the way on the left. So this is going to be x1 in the first column, the smallest of the first round winners. x2 is the second smallest of the first round winners. x3 is the third smallest, and so on. At some point, we get to the median of the first round winners, xk over 2. And then way at the right is the largest of the first round winners. And I'm sure that you remember that the median of medians, which is xk over 2, is exactly our pivot. So this is our lucky winner. I know this is a lot to absorb, so let me go ahead and go through an example. If what I've said so far makes perfect sense, you should feel free to skip the following example. But if there's still some details you're wondering about, I'm hoping this example will make everything crystal clear. So let's suppose we have an input array. I need a slightly big one to make the grid make sense. So let's say there's an input array of 20 elements. So there's going to be the input array, which is in a totally arbitrary order. There's going to be the version of the array after we sort each group of five. And then I'm going to show you the grid. So here's the input array we're going to use. Let's now go ahead and delineate the various groups of five. So after sorting each group, we get the following. From each group, there's a single winner, namely the middle element. So that would be the 12 and the 6 and the 9 and the 14. Those are the four survivors from the first round of the tournament. And the median of these four elements, which at the end of the day is going to be our pivot, is the second smallest of the four. That's how we define the median for an even number of elements. So that's going to be the 9. So this first transformation from the input array to this vaguely mini-sorted version of this input array with the groups of five sorted, this we actually do in the code. This happens in the algorithm. Now this grid we're just doing in our minds. Okay? We're just in the middle of proving why the algorithm is fast why the pivot's guaranteed to give us close to a 30-70 split or better. So let me show you an example of this grid in our mind, what it looks like for this particular input. So the grid always has five rows. The columns always have five elements because the columns correspond to the groups. Here, because n equals 20, n over 5 is 4. So there's going to be four columns and five rows. And moreover, we arrange the columns from left to right so that these middle elements go from smallest to largest. So our middle elements are 6, 9, 12, and 14, and we're going to draw the columns in that order from left to right. So first we'll write down the middle elements, the middle row, from decreasing to increasing, 6, 9, 12, 14. Again, the median of these is our pivot, which is the 9. And then each column is just the other four elements uh, that goes along with this middle element uh, from decreasing to increasing as we go from bottom to top. So this is the grid that we've been talking about on the other slide in this particular example. So I hope that makes what we're talking about clear, what these x's mean and what order we have amongst the rows, amongst the columns, and so on. So let's go back to the general argument. Here is the key point. Here is why we're doing this entire thought experiment. It's going to let us prove our key lemma that we get a 30-70 split or better. 30% of the stuff at least is less than the pivot. 30% of the stuff at least is bigger than the pivot. So why is there at least 30% of the stuff below the pivot? Why is the pivot bigger than at least 30%? Well, it's bigger than everything to the left and everything below the stuff to the left. That is, we know that xk over 2 is bigger than the k over 2 minus 1 elements that are to the left of it, those other middle elements that it's bigger than. That's because it's the median of the medians. So if we just go straight west, from the pivot, we only see stuff which is less. Furthermore, these columns are arranged from decreasing to increasing order as we go from south to north, from bottom to top. So if we travel south from any of these smaller x sub i's, we only see stuff which is still smaller. So all we're using here is transitivity of the less than relation. You go straight west, you see stuff which is only smaller. From any of those points, if you go southward, you'll see stuff which is even smaller than that. So this entire yellow region, everything southwest of the pivot elements is smaller than it. 
and that's a good chunk of the grid, right? So for all of these columns, it's basically three out of the five, or 60% of them, uh, are smaller than the pivot, and half of the columns essentially are in this part of the grid. So if the pivot's bigger than 60% of the stuff in 50% of the groups, that means it's bigger than 30% of the elements overall. And if we reason in an exactly symmetric way, we find that the pivot is also smaller than at least 30% of the array. So to find things bigger than the pivot, what do we do? First, we travel eastward. That gives us middle elements that are only bigger than it. And then we stop wherever we want on our eastward journey, and we head north. And we're going to see stuff which is still bigger. So this entire northeastern corner is bigger than the pivot element. And again, that's 50%. That's at 60% of roughly 50% of the groups. Returning to our example, the southwest region of the nine is this stuff, one, three, four, five, six. Certainly all of that is smaller than the nine. You'll notice there's other things smaller than the nine as well. There's the eight, there's the two, there's the seven, which we're not counting. But it depends on the exact array, whether or not in those positions you're going to have stuff smaller than the pivot or not. So it's this yellow region we're guaranteed to be smaller than the pivot. Similarly, everything northeast of the pivot is bigger than it. Those are all double-digit numbers, and our pivot is 9. Again, there's some other stuff in other regions bigger than the pivot, the 20, the 10, the 11. But again, those are positions where we can't be guaranteed that it will be bigger than the pivot. So it's the yellow regions which are guaranteed to be bigger and smaller than the pivot. And that gives us the guaranteed 30-70 split. Okay, so that proof was hard work, showing that this deterministic choose pivot subroutine guarantees a 30-70 split or better. And you probably feel a little exhausted and like we deserve a QED at this point. But we haven't earned it. We have not at all proved that this deterministic selection algorithm runs in linear time. Why doesn't a guaranteed 30-70 split guarantee us linear time automatically? Well, we had to work pretty hard to figure out this element guaranteeing this 30-70 split. In particular, we had to invoke another recursive call. So maybe this was a Pyrrhic victory. Maybe we had to work so hard to compute the pivot that it outweighs the benefit we get from this guaranteed 30-70 split. So we still have to prove that's not the case. Even in conjunction doing both of these things, we still have our linear time bound. We'll finish the analysis in the next video. This optional video will be more or less the last word that we have on sorting for the purposes of this course, and it'll answer the question, can we do better? Remember, that's the mantra of any good algorithm designer. I've shown you n log n algorithms for sorting, merge sort in the worst case, quick sort on average. Can we do better than n log n? Indeed, for the selection problem, we saw we could do better than n log n. We could do linear time. Maybe we can do linear time for sorting as well. The purpose of this video is to explain to you why we cannot do sorting in linear time. So this is a rare problem where we understand quite precisely uh, how well it can be solved, at least for a particular class of algorithms called comparison-based sorts, which I'll explain in a moment. So here's the formal theorem I want to give you the gist of in this video. So in addition to restricting to comparison-based sorts, which is necessary, as we'll see in a second, I'm going to make a second assumption which is not necessary, but is convenient for the lecture, which is that I'm going to think only about deterministic algorithms for the moment. I encourage you to think about why the same style of argument gives an n log n lower bound on the expected running time of any randomized algorithm. Maybe I'll put that uh, on the course side as an optional theory problem. So in particular, a quick sort is optimal in the randomized sense. It has average n log n time. And again, the claim is that no comparison-based sort can be better than that, even on average. So I need to tell you what I mean by a comparison-based sorting algorithm. What it means, it's a sorting algorithm that accesses the elements of the input array only via comparisons. It does not do any kind of direct manipulation on a single array element. All it does is it picks pairs of elements and asks the question, is the left one bigger or is the right one bigger? I like to think of comparison-based sorts as general purpose sorting routines. They make no assumptions about what the data is other than that it's from some totally ordered set. I like to think of it really as a function that takes as an argument a function pointer that allows it to do comparisons between abstract data types. There's no way to access the guts of the elements. All you can do is go through this API which allows you to make comparisons. And indeed, if you look at the sorting uh, routine in say the Unix operating system, that's exactly how it's set up. You just pass it a function pointer to a comparison uh, operator. 
I know this sounds super abstract, so I think it becomes clear once we talk about some examples. There's famous examples of comparison-based sorts, including everything we've discussed in the class so far. There's also famous examples of non-comparison-based sorts, which we're not going to cover, but perhaps some of you have heard of, or at the very least, they're easy to look up on Wikipedia or wherever. So examples include the two sorting algorithms we've discussed so far, merge sort. The only way that merge sort interacts with the elements in the input array is by comparing them and by copying them. Similarly, the only thing quicksort does with the input array elements is compare them and swap them in place. For those of you that know about the heap data structure, which we'll be reviewing later in the class, uh, heap sort, where you just uh, heapify a bunch of elements and then extract the minimum n times, uh, that also uses only comparisons. So what are some famous non-examples? I think this will make it even more clear what we're talking about. So bucket sort is one very useful one. So bucket sort is used most frequently when you have some kind of distributional assumption on the data that you're sorting. And remember, that's exactly what I'm focusing on avoiding in this class. I'm focusing on general purpose subroutines where you don't know anything about the data. If you do know stuff about the data, bucket sort can sometimes be a really useful method. For example, suppose you can model your data as IID samples from the uniform distribution on 0, 1. So they're all rational numbers, bigger than 0, less than 1, and you expect them to be evenly spread through that interval. Then what you can do in bucket sort is you can just pre-allocate n buckets where you're going to collect these elements. Each one is going to have the same width with 1 over n. The first bucket, you just do a linear pass through the input array. Everything that's between 0 and 1 over n, you stick in the first bucket. Everything between 1 over n and 2 over n, you stick in the second bucket. 2 over n and 3 over n, you uh, stick in the third bucket, and so on. So with a single pass, you've classified the input elements according to which bucket they belong in. Now because the data is assumed to be uniform at random, that means you expect each of the buckets to have a very small population, just a few elements in it. So remember, if it, elements are drawn uniform from the interval 0, 1, then it's equally likely to be in each of the n available buckets. And since there's n elements, that means you only expect one element per bucket. So each one is going to have a very small population. Having bucketed the data, you can now just use, say, insertion sort on each bucket independently. You're going to be doing insertion sort on a tiny number of elements, so that will run in constant time. And then there's going to be a linear number of buckets, so it's linear time overall. So the upshot is, if you're willing to make really strong assumptions about your data, like it's drawn uniformly at random from the interval 0, 1, then there is not an n log n lower bound. In fact, you can elude the lower bound and sort in linear time. So just to be clear, in what sense is bucket sort not comparison based? In what sense does it look at the guts of its elements and do something other than access them by pairs of comparisons? Well, it actually looks at an element in the input array and it says, what is its value? And it checks if its value is 0.17 versus 0.27 versus 0.77. And according to what value it sees inside this element, it makes the decision of which bucket to allocate it to. So it actually stares at the guts of an element to decide how, what to do next. Another non-example, which uh, can be quite useful, is counting sort. So this sorting algorithm is good when your data, again, we're going to make an assumption on the data, when they're integers and they're small integers. So say they're between uh, 0 and k, where k is, say, ideally at most linear in n. So then what you do is you do a single pass through the input array. Again, you just bucket the elements according to what their value is. It's somewhere between 0 and k, and it's an integer by assumption. So you need k buckets, and then you do a pass, and you sort of depopulate the buckets and copy them into an output array, uh, and that gives you a, a sorting algorithm which runs in time O of n plus k, where k is the size of the biggest integer. So the upshot with counting sort is that if you're willing to assume the data are integers, bounded above by some factor linear in n, proportional to n, then you can sort them in linear time. Again, counting sort does not access the array elements merely through comparisons. It actually stares at an element, figures out what its value is, and uses that value to determine what bucket to put the element in. So in that sense, it's not a comparison-based sort, and it can, under various assumptions, beat the n log n lower bound. So a final example is, is the well-known algorithm called radix sort. I think of this as sort of an extension of counting sort, although you don't have to use counting sort as the inner loop. You can use other so-called stable sorts as well. This is stuff you can read about uh, in many programming books or, or on the web. Uh, and the upshot of radix sort is you, pro you, you, again, you assume that the data are integers. You think of them in digit representation, say binary representation, and now you just sort one bit at a time, starting from the least significant bits and going all the way out to the most significant bits. And so the upshot of rating sort, it's extension of counting sort in the sense that if your data is integers that are not too big, polynomially bounded in n, then it lets you sort uh, in linear time. 
So summarizing, a comparison-based sort is one that can only access the input array through this API that lets you do comparisons between two elements. You cannot access the value of an element, so in particular, you cannot do any kind of bucketing technique. Bucket sort, counting sort, and radix sort all fundamentally are doing some kind of bucketing. And that's why when you're willing to make assumptions about what the data is and how you are permitted to access that data, that's what you can bypass in all of those cases, this n log n lower bound. But if you're stuck with a comparison-based sort, if you want to have something general purpose, you're going to be doing n log n comparisons in the worst case. Let's see why. So we have to prove a lower bound for every single comparison-based sorting method, so fix one. And let's focus on a particular input length, call it n. OK, so now let's simplify our lives. Now that we're focused on a comparison-based sorting method, one that doesn't look at the values of the array elements just in the relative order, we may as well think of the array as just containing the elements 1, 2, 3, all the way up to n in some jumbled order. Now, some other algorithm could make use of the fact that everything is small integers, but a comparison-based sorting method cannot. So there's no loss in just thinking about an unsorted array containing the integers 1, at 1 to n inclusive. Now, despite seemingly restricting the space of inputs that we're thinking about, even here, there's kind of a lot of different inputs we've got to worry about, right? So n elements can, sh can show up in n factorial different orderings, right? There's n choices for who the first element is, then n minus 1 choices for the second element, n minus 2 choices for the third element, and so on. So there's n factorial choices for how these elements are, in, are arranged in the input array. So I don't want to prove this super formally, but I want to give you uh, the gist, I think the good intuition. Now we're interested in lower bounding the number of comparisons that uh, this method makes in the worst case. So let's introduce a parameter k, which is its worst case number of comparisons. That is, for every input, each of these n factorial inputs, by assumption, this method makes no more than k comparisons. The idea behind the proof is that because we have n factorial fundamentally different inputs, the sorting method has to execute in a fundamentally different way on each of those inputs. But since the only thing that causes a branch in the execution of the sorting method is the resolution of a comparison, and we have only k comparisons, it can only have 2 to the k different execution paths. So that forces 2 to the k to be at least n factorial, and a calculation then shows that that forces uh, k to be at least omega n log n. So let me just quickly fill in the details. So across all n factorial possible inputs, just as a thought experiment, we can imagine running this method n factorial times and just looking at the pattern of how do the comparisons resolve. Right? For each of these n factorial inputs, we run it through the sorting method. It makes comparison number 1, then comparison number 2, then comparison number 3, then comparison number 4, then comparison number 5. And you know, it gets back a 0, then a 1, then a 1, then a 0. Maybe on some other input, it gets back a 1, then a 1, then a 0, then a 0, and so on. The point is, for each of these n factorial inputs, it makes at most k comparisons. We can associate that with a k-bit string. And because there's, the, there's only k bits, we're only going to see 2 to the k different k bit strings, 2 to the k different ways that a sequence of comparisons resolves. Now to finish the proof, we are going to apply something which I don't get to use as much as I'd like in an algorithm class, but it's always fun when it comes up, which is the pigeonhole principle. The pigeonhole principle, you'll recall, is the essentially obvious fact that if you try to stuff k plus 1 pigeons into just k cubby holes, one of those cubby holes has got to get two of the pigeons. Okay? At least one of the cubby holes gets at least two pigeons. So for us, what are the pigeons and what are the holes? So our pigeons are these n factorial different inputs, the different ways you can scramble the integers 1 through n. What are our holes? Those are the 2 to the k different executions that the sorting method uh, can possibly take on. Now, if the number of comparisons k used is so small that 2 to the k, the number of distinct executions, the number of distinct ways comparisons can resolve themselves, is less than the number of different inputs that have to get correctly sorted, then by the pigeonhole principle, one cubby gets two holes. That is, two different inputs get treated in exactly the same way by the sorting method. They are asked exactly the same k comparisons, and the comparisons resolve identically. Okay, so it's one jumbling of 1 through n, and you get a 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, and it's a totally different jumbling of n, and again, you get a 0, 1, 1, 0, 1. And if this happens, the algorithm is toast, in the sense that it's definitely not correct, right? Because we fed it two different inputs, and it is unable to resolve which of the two it is, right? So it may be one permutation of 1 through n, or this totally different permutation of 1 through n. The algorithm has tried to learn about what the input is through these k comparisons, but it has exactly the same data about the input in, two, in the two cases. So if it outputs the correct 
sorted version in one case, it's going to get the other one wrong. So you can't have a common execution of a sorting algorithm unscramble totally different permutations. It cannot be done. So what have we learned? We've learned that by correctness, 2 to the k is in fact at least n factorial. So how does that help us? Well, we want to lower bound k. k is the number of comparisons this arbitrary sorting method is using. We want to show that's at least n log n. So we, to lower bound k, we better lower bound n factorial. So, you know, you could use Stirling's approximation or something fancy, but we don't need anything fancy here. We'll just do something super crude. We'll just say, well, look, this is the product of n things, right? n times n minus 1 times n minus 2, blah, 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 blah. And the largest of those, the n over 2 largest of those n terms are all at least n over 2. The rest we'll just ignore. Pretty sloppy, but it gives us a lower bound of n divided by 2 raised to the n divided by 2. Now we'll just take log base 2 of both sides, and we get that k is at least n over 2 log base 2 of n over 2, also known as omega of n log n. And that, my friends, is why a correct deterministic sorting algorithm that's comparison-based has got to use n log n comparisons in the worst case. So in this set of lectures, we'll be discussing the minimum cut problem in graphs, and we'll be discussing the randomized contraction algorithm. A randomized algorithm which is so simple and elegant, it's almost impossible to believe that it could possibly work, but that's exactly what we'll be proving. So one way you can think about this set of lectures is as a segue of sorts between our discussion of randomization and our discussion of graphs. So we just finished talking about randomization in the context of sorting and searching. We'll pick it up again toward the end of the class when we discuss hashing. But while we're in the middle of randomization and probability review, I want to give you another application of randomization in a totally different domain, in particular to the domain of graphs rather than to sorting and searching. So that's one high-level goal of these lectures. A second one is we'll get our feet wet talking about graphs. And a lot of the next couple weeks, that's what we're going to be talking about, fundamental graph primitives. So this will give us an excuse to start warming up with the vocabulary, some of the basic concepts of the graph, and what a graph algorithm uh, looks like. Another perk, although it's not one of the main goals, but I, want to do, I do want to point out this fact, uh, is that at least compared to most of the stuff that we're discussing in this class, this is a relatively recent algorithm, the contraction algorithm. By relatively recent, I mean, uh, okay, it's, it's 20 years old. But at least that means most of us, I know not all of us, but most of us at least were born at the time uh, that this algorithm was invented. And so just one quick digression, uh, you know, in an intro course like this, most of what we're going to cover are oldie, oldies but goodies, stuff from as much as 50 years ago. And while it's kind of amazing, given how much the world and how much technology has changed over the past 50 years, that ideas in computer science from that long ago are still useful, they are. Okay, so it's just sort of an amazing thing about uh, the stuff that the first generation of computer scientists figured out. It's still, it's still relevant to this day. That said, algorithms is still a vibrant field with lots of open questions. And when I have an opportunity, I'll try and give you glimpses of that fact. So I do want to point out here that this is somewhat more recent algorithm than most of the other ones we'll see, uh, which dates back to the 90s. So let's talk about graphs. Fundamentally, what a graph does is represent pairwise relationships amongst a set of objects. So as such, a graph is going to have two ingredients. So first of all, there's the objects that you're talking about. And these have two very common names, and you're just going to have to know both of the names, even though they're completely synonymous. The first name is vertices. So vertex is the singular, vertices is the plural. Uh, also known interchangeably as nodes. I'll be using the notation capital V for the set of, of vertices. So those are the objects. Now we want to represent pairwise relationships. So these pairs are going to be called edges. And will be noted by, denoted by capital E. And there's two flavors of graphs. And both are really important. Both come up all the time in applications. So, so you should be aware of both kinds. Uh, so there's undirected graphs and directed graphs. And that just depends on whether the edges themselves are undirected or directed. So edges can be undirected, by which I mean this pair is unordered. There are just two vertices of an edge, the two endpoints, say U and V, and you don't distinguish one as the first and one as the second. Or edges can be directed, in which case you have a directed graph. And here, a pair is ordered. So you do have a notion of a first vertex or a first endpoint and the second vertex or second endpoint of an edge. Those are often called the tail and the head, respectively. 
And once in a while, although I'll, I'll try to I'll not use this terminology, you hear directed edges called arcs. Now I think all of this is much clearer if I just draw some pictures. Indeed, one used to call graphs dots and lines. The dots would refer to the vertices. So here's four dots or four vertices. And uh, the edges would be lines. So the way you denote one of these edges is you just draw a line between the two uh, endpoints of that edge, the two vertices that it corresponds to. So this is an undirected graph with four vertices and five edges. We could equally well have a directed version of this graph, so let's uh, still have four vertices and five edges. But to indicate that this is a directed graph and that each edge has a first vertex and a second vertex, we're going to add arrows to the lines. So the arrow points to the second vertex or to the head of the, of the edge. So the first vertex uh, is often called the tail of the edge. So graphs are completely fundamental. Uh, they show up not just in computer science, but in all kinds of different disciplines, uh, social sciences and, and biology being two prominent ones. So let me just mention a couple of reasons you might use them just off the top of my head, but literally there's hundreds or thousands of others. So a very literal example would be road networks. So imagine you type in asking for driving directions from point A to point B in some uh, web application or software or whatever, it computes a, a, ro a route for you. Uh, what it's doing is it's manipulating some representation of a road network, which inevitably is going to be stored as a graph, where the vertices correspond to intersections and the edges correspond to individual roads. The web is often fruitfully thought of as a graph, a directed graph. So here the vertices are the individual web pages and edges correspond to hyperlinks. So the first vertex in an edge, the tail, is going to be the page that contains the hyperlink. The second vertex, or the head of the edge, is going to be what the hyperlink points to. So that's the web as a directed graph. Social networks are quite naturally represented as graphs. So here the vertices correspond to the individuals in the social network and the edges correspond to relationships, say friendship links. Uh, I encourage you to think about amongst the popular social networks these days which ones are undirected graphs and which ones are directed graphs. We have some interesting examples uh, of each of those. And often graphs are useful even when there isn't such an obvious network structure. So just to mention one example, let me just write down precedence constraints. So to say what I mean, you might think about, uh, you know, say you're a freshman in college and you're looking at your, your major, say the computer science major, and uh, you want to know what courses to take in what order. And uh, you could think about the following graph, where each of the courses in your major corresponds to a vertex, and you draw a directed edge from, one, from course A to course B if course A is a prerequisite for course B. That is, it has to be completed uh, before you begin course B. Okay, so that's a way to represent dependencies, uh, sort of a temporal ordering uh, between pairs of, pairs of objects using a directed graph. So that's the basic language of graphs. Let me now talk about cuts in graphs, because again, this set of lectures is going to be about the so-called minimum cut problem. So the definition of a cut of a graph is very simple. It's just a grouping, a partition of the vertices of the graph into two groups, A and B. And both of those two groups should be non-empty. So to describe this in pictures, let me, let me give you a cartoon of a cut in both the undirected and directed cases. So for an undirected graph, you could imagine drawing your two sets A and B. And once you've defined the two sets A and B, the edges then fall into one of three categories. You've got edges with both of the endpoints in A. You've got edges with both of the endpoints in B. And then you've got edges with one endpoint in A and one endpoint in B. So that's generically what the picture of a graph looks like viewed through the lens of a particular cut AB. The picture for directed graphs is similar. You would again have an A and you'd again have a B. You have directed edges with both endpoints in A, directed edges with both endpoints in B. And now you actually have two further categories. So you have edges who cross the cut from left to right, that is, whose tail vertex is in A and whose head vertex is in B. And you can also have edges which cross the cut in the opposite direction, that is, their tail is in B and their head is in A. Usually when we talk about cuts, we're going to be concerned with how many edges cross a given cut. And by that I mean the following. The crossing edges of a cut AB are those that satisfy the following property. 
So in the undirected case, it's exactly what you think it would be. One of the endpoints is in A, the other endpoint is in B. That's what it means to cross the cut. Now in the directed case, there's a number of reasonable definitions you could propose about which edges cross the cut. Typically, and in this course, we're going to focus on the case where we only think about edges that cross the cut from the left to the right, and we ignore edges which cross from the right to the left. So that is, the edges that cross the cut are those with tail in A and head in B. So referring to our two pictures, our two cartoons of cuts, for the undirected one, all three of these blue edges would be the edges crossing the cut AB, because they're the ones that have one endpoint on the left side and one endpoint on the right side. Now for the directed one, we only have two crossing edges. So the two that cross from left to right, with tail in A and head in B. The one that's crossing backward does not contribute. We don't count it as a crossing edge of the cut. So the next quiz is just a sanity check that you've absorbed the definition of a cut of a graph. All right, so the answer to this quiz is the third option. Recall what is the definition of a cut. It's just a way to group the vertices into two sets, A and B. Uh, both should also be non-empty. So we have n vertices, and essentially we have one binary degree of freedom for each. For each vertex, we can decide whether or not it goes at set A or it goes in set B. So two choices for each of the n vertices. That gives us a two to the n possible choices, two to the n possible cuts overall. Now that's slightly incorrect, because recall that a cut can't have a non-empty set A or a non-empty set B, so those are two of the two to the n options which are disallowed. So strictly speaking, the number is two to the n minus two, but two to the n is certainly the closest answer uh, of the four provided. Now, the minimum cut problem is exactly what you'd think it would be. I give you as input a graph, and amongst these exponentially many cuts, I want you to identify one for me with the fewest number of crossing edges. So a few quick comments. So first of all, the name for this cut is a min cut. A min cut is one with the fewest number of crossing edges. Uh, secondly, to clarify, we, I am going to allow in the input what's called parallel edges. There'll be lots of applications where parallel edges are sort of pointless, but for minimum cut, actually, it's natural to allow parallel edges. And that means you have two edges that correspond to exactly the same pair of vertices. Finally, the more seasoned programmers among you are probably wondering what I mean by you're given a graph as input. You might be wondering about how exactly that's represented. So the next video is going to discuss exactly that, the popular ways of representing graphs and, and how we're going to usually do it in this course, specifically via what's called an adjacency list. Okay, so I want to make sure that everybody understands exactly what the minimum cut problem is asking. So let me draw for you a particular graph with eight vertices and quite a few edges. And what I want you to answer is, what is the min cut value in this graph? That is, how many edges cross the minimum cut, the cut with the fewest number of crossing edges? All right, so the correct answer is the second choice. Uh, the min cut value is two, and the cut which shows that is just to break it basically in half, into the two halves. In this case, there are only two crossing edges, this one and this one. And I'll leave it for you to check that uh, there's no other edge that has as few as two edges. Now, in this case, we got a very balanced split when we took the minimum cut. In general, that need not be true. Sometimes even a single vertex can define uh, the minimum cut of a graph. And I encourage you to think about a concrete example that proves that. So why should you care about uh, computing the minimum cut? Well, this is one problem amongst a genre called graph partitioning, where you're given a graph and you want to break it into two or more pieces. And these kinds of graph partitioning problems come up all the time in a surprisingly diverse array of applications. So let me just mention a couple at a high level. So one very obvious one, when, you have a, when your graph is representing a physical network, what identifying something like a min cut allows you to do is identify weaknesses in your network. Okay, perhaps it's your own network and you want to understand where you want to soup up the infrastructure because it's in some sense a hot spot of your network or a weak point. Or maybe there's someone else's network and you want to know where the weak spot is in their network. 
In fact, there were some declassified documents about mm, 15 years ago or so, which showed that uh, the United States and Soviet Union militaries back during the Cold War were actually quite interested in computing minimum cuts because they were looking for things like, for example, what's the most efficient way to disrupt uh, the other country's uh, transportation network. Another application, which is a big deal in social network analysis these days, is the idea of community detection. So the question is, amongst a huge graph, like say the graph of everybody who's on Facebook or something like that, how can you identify small pockets of people that seem tightly knit, that seem closely related, uh, from which you'd like to infer that they're a community of some sort? You know, maybe they all go to the same school, maybe they all have the same interest, maybe they're part of the same biological family, whatever. Now, it's to some degree still an open question how to best define communities and social networks, but as a quick and dirty sort of first order heuristic, you can imagine looking for small regions, which on the one hand are highly interconnected w amongst themselves, but quite weakly connected to the rest of the graph. So uh, subroutines like the minimum cut problem can be used for identifying these small, densely interconnected, but then weakly connected to everybody else pockets of a graph. Finally, cut problems are also used a lot in, uh, in vision. So for example, one way you can use them is in what's called image segmentation. So here what's going on is you're given as input a uh, 2D array uh, where each entry is a pixel from some image. And there's a graph which is very natural to define given a 2D array of pixels. Namely, you have an edge between two pixels if they're neighboring. So for two pixels that are immediately next to each other, left and right, or top to bottom, you put an edge there. So that gives you what's called a grid graph. And now unlike the basic uh, minimum cut problem that we're talking about here, in image segmentation it's most natural to use edge weights, where the weight of an edge is basically how likely you expect those two pixels to be coming from a common object. Why might you ex expect two neighboring pixels to come from the same object? Well, perhaps their color maps are almost exactly the same, and you just expect that they're part of the same thing. So once you've defined this grid graph with suitable edge weights, now you run a graph partitioning or min cut type subroutine, and the hope is that the cut that it identifies rips off one of the contiguous objects in the picture. And then you do that a few times, and you get the uh, major objects in the given picture. So this list is by no means exhaustive of the applications of min cut and graph partitioning subroutines, but I hope it serves as a sufficient motivation to watch the rest of the lectures in this sequence. Okay, so this video is not about any particular graph problem, not about a, any particular graph algorithm, just sort of the preliminaries we need to discuss algorithms on graphs. How do we measure their size, how do we represent them, and so on. Remember what a graph is, it really has two ingredients. First of all, there's the set of objects we're talking about. Those might be called vertices. Synonymously, we might call them nodes. We represent pairwise relationships using edges. These can be either undirected, in which case they're ordered pairs, or an edge can be directed from one to another. In that case, they're ordered pairs and we have a directed graph. Now, when we talk about, say, the size of a graph or the running time of an algorithm that operates on a graph, we need to think about what we mean by input size. In particular, for a graph, there's really two different parameters that control how big it is, unlike an array. For arrays, we just had a single number, the length. For graphs, we have the number of vertices and we have the number of edges. Usually, we'll use the notation n for the number of vertices, m for the number of edges. So the next quiz asks you to think about how the number of edges m can depend on the number of vertices n. So in particular, I want you to think for this quiz about an undirected graph it has n vertices. There's no parallel edges. Okay, so for a given pair of vertices, there's either zero or one edge between them. Moreover, let's assume that the graph is unconnected. Okay, so I don't want you to think about graphs that have zero edges. Now, I haven't defined what a graph is, what it means for a graph to be connected formally yet, but I hope you get the idea. It means it's in one piece. You can't break it into two parts uh, that have no edges crossing between them. So for such a graph, no parallel edges in one piece, n vertices, Think about what is the minimum number of edges it could possibly have, and what is the maximum number of edges as a function of n that it could possibly have. All right, so the correct option is the first one. The fewest number of edges that a connected undirected graph can have is n minus 1, and the maximum number of edges that an undirected graph with no parallel edges can have is n times n minus 1 over 2, better known as n choose 2. So why does it need at least n minus 1 edges if it's going to be in one piece? Well, think about adding the edges one at a time, okay, each of the edges of the graph. 
Now, initially, you just have a graph with zero edges. The graph has n different pieces, n isolated vertices, and there's no edges at all. Now, each time you add one edge, what you do is you take two of the existing pieces, at best, and fuse them into one. So the maximum decrease you can have in the number of different pieces of a graph is it can decrease by one each time you add an edge. So from a starting point of n different pieces, you've got to get down to one piece. So that requires the addition of n minus 1 edges. You can also convince yourself of this by, by drawing a few pictures and noticing that trees achieve this bound exactly. So for example, here is a four vertex tree that has three edges. So this is a case where m is indeed n minus 1. Now, for the upper bound, why can't you have more than n choose 2? Well, it's clear that the largest number of edges you can have is for the complete graph, where every single pair of edges has one between them. Again, there's no parallel arcs, and ed edges are unordered, so there's at most n choose 2 possibilities of where to put an edge. So again, if n equals 4, here would be an example with a maximum possible number, 6 edges. So now that I've got you thinking about how the number of edges can vary with the number of vertices, let me talk about uh, the distinction between sparse and dense graphs. It's important to distinguish between these two concepts because some data structures and algorithms are better suited for sparse graphs, other data structures and algorithms are better suited for dense graphs. So to make this precise, let me just uh, put down this very common notation. N is the number of vertices of the graph under discussion, M is the number of edges. This is quite standard notation. Please get used to it and use it yourself. If you reverse these, you will confuse a lot of people uh, who have familiarity with graph algorithms and data structures. Now, one thing we learned from the previous quiz is the following. So in most applications, not all applications, but most applications, m is at least linear in n. Remember, in the quiz you saw, it was at least n minus 1 if you wanted the graph to be connected. And it's also big O of n squared. This is under the assumption that there's no parallel arcs. Now, there are cases where we want to allow parallel arcs. In fact, we'll do that in the contraction algorithm for the min cut problem. There are cases where we want to allow the number of edges to drop so low that the graph breaks into multiple pieces. For example, when we talk about connected components. But more often than not, we're thinking about a connected graph with no parallel edges. And then we can pin down the number of edges m to be somewhere between linear in the number of nodes, linear in n, and quadratic in n. Now, I'm not going to give you a super formal definition of what a sparse or a dense graph is, and people are a little loose with this, this terminology uh, in practice. But basically, sparse means you're closer to the lower bound, closer to linear. Dense means you're closer to the upper bound, closer to quadratic. Now, I know this leaves ambiguity when the number of edges is something, you know, like n to the 3 halves. Uh, usually, in that case, you'd think of it as a dense graph. So usually, anything which is more than n times some logarithmic terms, you'd think about as a dense graph. But again, people are a little bit sloppy with this uh, when they talk about graphs. Next, I want to discuss two representations of graphs. And uh, we're mostly going to be using the second one in this course. But this first one, the adjacency matrix, I do want to mention just briefly, just on this slide. This is a supernatural idea where you represent the edges in a graph using a matrix. Let me describe it first for undirected graphs. So the matrix is going to be denoted by a capital A, and it's a square n by n matrix where n is the number of vertices of the graph. And the semantics are the ijth entry of the matrix is 1 if and only if there's an edge between the vertices i and j in the graph. I'm assuming here that the vertices are named 1, 2, 3, 4, etc., all the way up to n. It's easy to add bells and whistles to the adjacency matrix to accommodate parallel edges, to accommodate edge weights, which is accommodate directed arcs, directed edges. If you wanted to have parallel arcs, you could just have aij denote the number of arcs that uh, are between i and j. If edges have different weights, you can just have aij be the weight of the ij edge. And for the directed graph, you can use plus ones and minus ones. So if the arc is directed from i to j, you'd set I, aij to be plus one. If the arc is directed from j to i, you'd set aij to minus one. There are many metrics by which you can evaluate a data structure or a representation. Uh, two important ones I want to discuss here are, first of all, the number of resources it requires. And in this context, that's the amount of space that the data structure needs. The second thing is, what are the operations that the data structure supports? So let's just begin with the space requirements. What are they for the adjacency matrix? 
All right, so the answer, at least with the sort of straightforward way of storing a matrix, is n squared. And this is independent of the number of edges. So you could try to beat this down for sparse graphs using sparse matrix tricks. But for the basic idea of just actually representing an n by n matrix, you got n squared entries. You got to store one bit in each, whether the edge is there or not. So that's going to give you n squared space. The constants are, of course, very small because you're just storing one bit per entry. But nonetheless, this is quadratic in the number of vertices. Now that's going to be fine if you have a dense graph. If the number of edges is as high as n squared, then you're not really wasting anything in this representation. But in a sparse graph, if m is much closer to linear, then this is a super wasteful representation. Let's talk about the adjacency list representation. This is the dominant one we'll be using in this class. This has several ingredients. So first, you keep track of both the vertices and the edges as independent entities. So you're going to have an array or a list of each. And then we want these two arrays to cross-reference each other in the obvious way. So given a vertex, you want to know which edges it's involved in. Given an edge, you want to know what its endpoints are. So let's say first, most simply, each edge is going to have two pointers, one for each of the two endpoints. In a directed graph, of course, it would keep track of which one is the head and which one is the tail. Now each vertex is going to point to all of the edges of which it's a member. Now, in an undirected graph, it's clear what I mean by that. In a directed graph, you could do it in a couple ways. Generally, you'd have a vertex keep track of all of the edges for which it is the tail. That is, all of the edges which you can follow one hop out um, from the edge. If you wanted to, you could also have a second array at a more expensive storage where the vertex also keeps track of the edges pointing to it, the edges for which it's the head. So let me ask you the same question I did with an adjacency matrix. What is the space required of an adjacency list as a function of the number of edges m and the number of vertices n of the graph? So the correct answer to this question is the third option, theta of m plus n, which we're going to think of as linear space in the size of the graph. So this quiz is, is a little tricky, so to explain the answer, let me return to the slide with the ingredients of adjacency lists, and let's compute the space for each of these four ingredients separately. Most of them are straightforward. For example, consider the first ingredient. This is just an array or a list of the n vertices, and we just need constant space per vertex to keep track of its existence. So this is going to be theta of n, linear in the number of vertices. Similarly, for the m edges, we just need linear space in the number of edges to remember their existence. So that's going to be theta of m. Now, each edge has to keep track of both of its endpoints. So that's two pointers, but two is a constant. For each of the m edges, we have a constant space to keep track of endpoints. So that's going to give us another theta of m, constant per edge. Now, this fourth case, you might be feeling kind of nervous because a vertex, in principle, uh, could have edges involving all n minus 1 other vertices. So the number of pointer is that a single vertex could be theta of n. Also, you could have, you know, you do have n vertices, so that could be theta of n squared. And certainly in something like a complete graph, you really would have that much. But the point is, in sparse graphs, n, n squared is way overkill to the space needed by this fourth set of pointers. Actually, if you think about it, for each pointer in the fourth category, a vertex pointing to a given edge, there is a pointer in the third category pointing in the opposite direction from that edge back to that vertex. So there's actually a one-to-one -one correspondence between pointers in the third category and pointers in the fourth category. Since the third category has space theta of m, so does all of the pointers in the fourth category. So adding up over the four ingredients, we have one theta of n and three theta of m's, so that's going to give us overall a theta of m plus n. If you prefer, another way you could think about this would be theta of the max of m and n. These are the same up to a constant factor. Now, as we discussed in a previous slide, often m is going to be bigger than n, but I wanted to do a generic analysis here, which applies even if the graph is not connected, if you know, even if it is in multiple pieces. So the space of the adjacency list is within a constant factor, the same as the number of ingredients in the graph, the number of vertices plus the number of edges. So in that sense, that's exactly what you want. Now, being confronted with these two graph representations that I've shown you, I'm sure you're asking, well, which one should you remember? Which one should you use? And the answer, as it so often is, is it depends. It depends on two things. It depends on the density of your graph. It depends on how n compares to uh, n. And it also depends on what kind of operations that you support.
want to support. Now, given what we're covering in this class and also the motivating applications I have in mind, uh, I can give you basically a clean answer to this question for the purposes of these five weeks, which is we're going to be focusing on adjacency lists. The reason we're going to focus on adjacency lists in this class is both is for both of these reasons, both because of the operations we want and both because of the graph density and motivating applications. So first of all, most of the graph primitives, not all, but most will be dealing with graph search and adjacency lists are perfect for doing graph search. You get to a node, you follow an outgoing arc, you go to another node, you follow an outgoing arc and so on. And so adjacency lists are the perfect thing to do graph search. Adjacency matrices are definitely good for certain kinds of graph operations, but they're not things we're really going to be covering in this class. So that's reason one. Reason two is a lot of the motivations for graph primitives these days comes from massive, massive networks. I mentioned earlier how the web can be fruitfully thought of as a directed graph where the vertices are individual web pages and directed arcs correspond to hyperlinks, going from the page with the hyperlink pointing to the one that the hyperlink goes to. Now, it's hard to get an exact measurement of the web graph, but a conservative lower bound on the number of vertices is something like 10 billion. So that's 10 to the 10. Now, that's pushing the limits of what computers can do, but it's within the limits. So if you work hard, you can actually operate on graphs with 10 to the 10 nodes. Now, suppose we use an adjacency matrix representation. So if n is 10 to the 10, then n squared is going to be like 10 to the 20. And now we're getting close to the estimated number of atoms in the known universe. So that is clearly not feasible now, and it's not going to be feasible ever. So the adjacency matrix representation is totally out for uh, huge sparse graphs like the web graph. Adjacency lists, well, the degree on average in the web is thought to be something like 10. So the number of edges is only going to be something like 10 to the 11. And then the adjacency list representation will be proportional to that. And again, that's really pushing what we can do with current technology, but it is within the limits. So using that representation, we can uh, do non-trivial computations on graphs, even at the scale of the web graph. So now I get to tell you about the very cool randomized contraction algorithm for computing the minimum cut of a graph. Let's just recall what the minimum cut problem is. We're given as input an undirected graph, and uh, parallel edges are allowed. In fact, they will arise naturally throughout the course of the algorithm. That is, for a given pair of vertices, we allow multiple edges to have that pair as endpoints. Now, I do sort of assume you've watched the other video on how graphs are actually represented, although that's not going to play a major role in the description of this particular algorithm. And again, the goal is to compute the cut. So a cut is a partition of the graph vertices into two groups, A and B. The number of edges crossing the cut is simply those that have one endpoint on each side. And amongst all of the exponentially possible cuts, we want to identify one that has the fewest number of crossing edges, or a min cut. So here's the random contraction algorithm. So this algorithm was devised by David Carger back when he was an early PhD student here at Stanford, and this was in the early 90s. So like I said, quote unquote, only about 20 years ago. And the basic idea is to use random sampling. Now, we'd known forever, right, ever, ever since quicksort, that random sampling could be a good idea in certain contexts, in particular when you're doing sorting and searching. And one of the things that was such a breakthrough about Carger's contraction algorithm is it showed that random sampling could be extremely effective for fundamental graph problems. So here's how it works. We're just going to have one main loop. Each iteration of this while loop is going to decrease the number of vertices in the graph by one, and we're going to terminate when we get down to just two vertices remaining. Now, in a given iteration, here's the random sampling. Amongst all of the edges that remain in the graph to this point, we're going to choose one of those edges uniformly at random. Each edge is equally likely. Once you've chosen an edge, that's when we do the contraction. So we take the two endpoints of the edge, call them the vertex U and the vertex V, and we fuse them into a single vertex that represents both of them. This may become more clear when I go through a couple examples on the next couple of slides. This merging may create parallel edges, even if you didn't have them before. That's okay, we're going to leave the parallel edges, and it may create a self-loop. Uh, edge where now both of the endpoints is the same, and self-loops are stupid, so we're just going to delete them as they arise. Each iteration decreases the number of vertices that remain. We start with n vertices, we end up with 2. So after n minus 2 iterations, that's when we stop. And at that point, we return the cut represented by those two final vertices. You might well be wondering what I mean by the cut represented by the final two vertices, but I think that will become clear in the examples, which I'll proceed to now. 
So suppose the input graph is the following four node, five edge graph. There's a square plus one diagonal. So how would the contraction algorithm work on this graph? Well, of course, it's a randomized algorithm, so it could work in different ways. And so we're going to look at two different trajectories. In the first iteration, each of these five edges is equally likely. Each is chosen for contraction with 20% probability. For concreteness, let's say that the algorithm happens to choose this edge to contract, to fuse the two endpoints. After the fusion, these two vertices on the left have become one, whereas the two vertices on the right are still hanging around like they always were. So the edge between the two original vertices is unchanged. The contracted edge between the two vertices on the left has gotten sucked up, so that's gone. And so what remains are these two edges here, the edge on top and the diagonal. And those are now parallel edges between the fused node and the upper right node. And then I also shouldn't forget the bottom edge, which is uh, edge from the lower right node to the super node. So that's what we mean by taking a pair of uh, vertices and contracting them. The edge that was previously connected to them vanishes and then all the other edges just get pulled into the fusion. So that's the first iteration of Carger's algorithm or one possible execution. So now we proceed to the second iteration of the contraction algorithm and the same thing happens all over again. We pick an edge uniformly at random. Now there's only four edges that remain, each of which is equally likely to be chosen, so a 25% probability. Uh, for concreteness, let's say that in the second iteration we wind up choosing uh, one of the two parallel edges, say this one here. So what happens? Well now instead of three vertices we go down to two. We have the original bottom right vertex that hasn't participated in any contractions at all, so that's as it was. Uh, and then we have the second vertex, which actually represents the fusion of all of the other three vertices. So two of them were fused, the leftmost vertices were fused in iteration one, and now the upper right vertex got fused in with them to create this super node representing three original vertices. So what happens to the four edges? Well, the contracted one disappears. That just gets sucked into the super node and we never see it again. And then the other three go in where there's, where, go where they're supposed to go. So there's the edge that used to be the rightmost edge that has no hash mark. There's the edge with two hash marks that goes between uh, the same two nodes that it did before. Just the super node is now an even bigger node representing three nodes. And then the edge which was parallel to the one that we contracted, the other one with a hash mark, becomes a self-loop. And remember what the, what the algorithm does is whenever self-loops like this appear, they get deleted automatically. And now that we've done our n minus two iterations, we're down to just two nodes, we return the corresponding cut. By corresponding cut, what I mean is uh, one group of the cut is the vertices that got fused into each other and wound up corresponding to the super node. In this case, uh, everything but the bottom right node. And then the other group is the original nodes corresponding to the other super node in the contracted graphs, which in this case is just the bottom right node by itself. So the set A is going to be these three nodes here which all got fused into each other, contracted into each other, and B is going to be this node over here, which never participated in any contractions at all. And what's cool is, you'll notice, this does in fact define a min cut. There are two edges crossing this cut. This one, the rightmost one, and the bottommost one. And uh, I'll leave it for you to check that there is no cut in this graph with fewer than two crossing edges. So this is in fact a min cut. Of course, this is a randomized algorithm, and randomized algorithms can behave differently on different executions. So let's look at a second possible execution of the contraction algorithm on this exact same input. Let's even suppose the first iteration goes about in exactly the same way. So in particular, this leftmost edge is going to get chosen in the first iteration. But instead of choosing one of the two parallel edges, let's suppose that we choose the rightmost edge to contract in the second iteration. Totally possible, 25% chance that's going to happen. Now what happens after the contraction? Well again, we're going to be left with two nodes, no surprise there. The contracted node gets sucked into oblivion and vanishes, but the other three edges, the ones with the hash marks, all stick around and become parallel edges between these two final nodes. This again corresponds to a cut, A and B, where A is the left two vertices and B is the right two vertices. Now, this cut, you'll notice, has three crossing edges. And we've already seen that there is a cut with two crossing edges, 
Therefore, this is not a min cut. So what have we learned? We've learned that the contraction algorithm sometimes identifies a min cut and sometimes it does not. It depends on the random choices that it makes. It depends on which edges it chooses to randomly con contract. So the obvious question is, you know, is this a useful algorithm? So in particular, what is the probability that it gets the right answer? And we know it's bigger than zero and we know it's less than one. Is it close to one or is it close to zero? So we find ourselves in a familiar position. We have what seems like a, a quite sweet algorithm, this random contraction algorithm. And uh, we don't really know if it's good or not. We don't really know how often it works. And we're going to need to do a little bit of math to answer that question. So in particular, we'll need some conditional probability. So for those of you who need a refresher, uh, you would go to your favorite source, or you can watch the probability review part two to get a refresher on conditional probability and independence. Once you have that in your mathematical toolbox, we'll be able to totally nail this question, get a very precise answer to exactly how frequently the contraction algorithm successfully computes the minimum cut. So in the last video, I left you with a cliffhanger. I uh, introduced you to the minimum cut problem. I introduced you to a very simple and elegant randomized algorithm in the form of the contraction algorithm. We observed that sometimes it finds a min cut and sometimes it doesn't. And so the $64,000 question is, uh, just how frequently does it succeed and just how frequently does it fail? So now that hopefully you've brushed up on your conditional probability and independence, we're going to give a very precise answer to that question in this lecture. So recall on this problem, we're given as input an undirected graph, possibly with parallel edges. And uh, the goal is to compute among the exponential number of possible different cuts, that's with the fewest number of crossing edges. So for example, uh, in this graph here, which you've seen in a previous video, the goal is to compute the cut AB here, because there are only two crossing edges and that's as small as it gets. That's the minimum cut problem, and uh, Carger proposed the following random contraction algorithm based on random sampling. So we have n minus two iterations, and the number of vertices gets decremented by one in each iteration. So we start with n vertices, we get down to two. And how do we decrease the number of vertices? We do it by contracting or fusing two vertices together. How do we pick which pair of edges, which pair of vertices to fuse? Well, we pick one of the remaining edges uniformly at random. So there's however many edges there are remaining. We pick each one equally likely. What, if the endpoints of that edge are U and V, then we collapse U and V together into a single super node. So that's what we mean by contracting two nodes into a single vertex. And then if that causes any self-loops, and as we saw the examples, we will in general have self-loops, then we delete them before proceeding. After the n minus two iterations, only two vertices remain. You'll recall that those two vertices naturally correspond to a cut. The first group of the cut A corresponds to the vertices that were fused into one of the super vertices remaining at the end. The other super vertex corresponds to the set B, uh, the other original vertices of the graph. So the goal of this, le of this video is to give an answer to the following question. What is the probability of success? Whereas by success, we mean outputs uh, particular min cut a comma b. So let's set up the basic notation. Uh, we're going to fix a, any old input graph, undirected graph. And as usual, we use n to denote the number of vertices and m to denote the number of edges. We're also going to fix a minimum cut a comma b. If a graph has only one minimum cut, then it's clear what I'm talking about here. If a graph has multiple minimum cuts, I'm actually selecting just one of them. Okay, so I'm going to focus on a distinguished minimum cut, a comma b, and we're only going to define the algorithm as successful if it outputs this particular minimum cut, a b. If it outputs some other minimum cut, we don't count it. We don't count it as successful. Okay, so we really want this distinguished minimum cut, a comma b. In addition to n and m, we're going to have a parameter k, which is the size of the minimum cut. That is, it's the number of crossing edges of a minimum cut, for example, that cross a comma b. The k edges that cross the minimum cut a b, we're going to call capital F. So the picture you want to have in mind is there is out there in the world this minimum cut a b. There's lots of edges with both endpoints in a, lots of edges possibly with both endpoints in b, but there's not a whole lot of edges with one endpoint in A and one endpoint in B. So the edges F would be precisely these three crossing edges here. 
So our next step is to get a very clear understanding of exactly when the execution of the contraction algorithm can go wrong and exactly when it's going to work, exactly when we're going to succeed. So let me redraw the same picture from the previous slide. So given that we're hoping that the contraction algorithm outputs this cut AB at the end of the day, what could possibly go wrong? Well, to see what could go wrong, suppose at some iteration, one of the edges in capital F, remember F are the edges crossing the min cut AB, so it's these three magenta edges in the picture. Suppose at some iteration, one of the edges of F gets chosen for contraction. Well, because this edge of F has one endpoint in A, and one endpoint in B, when it gets chosen for contraction, it causes this node from A and this node from B to be fused together. What does that mean? That means in the cut that the contraction algorithm finally outputs, this node from A and this node from B will be in the same side of the output cut. Okay, so the cut output by the contraction algorithm will have on one side both a node from A and a node from B. Therefore, the output of the contraction algorithm, if this happens, will be a different cut than AB. Okay, it will not output AB if some edge of F is contracted. And if you think about it, the converse is also true. So let's assume now that in each of the n minus 2 iterations, the contraction algorithm never contracts an edge from capital F. Remember, capital F are exactly the edges with one endpoint in A and one endpoint in B. So if it never contracts any edge of F, then it only contracts edges where both endpoints lie in capital A or both endpoints lie in capital B. Well, if this is the case, then vertices from A always stick together in fused nodes, and vertices from B always stick together in the fused nodes. There is never an iteration where a node from A and a node from B are fused together. What does that mean? That means that when the algorithm outputs a cut, all of the nodes in A have been grouped together, all of the nodes in B have been grouped together in each of the two super nodes, which means that the output of the algorithm is indeed the desired min cut A comma B. Summarizing, the contraction algorithm will do what we want. It will succeed and output the cut A comma B if and only if it never chooses an edge from capital F for contraction. Therefore, the probability of success that is, the probability that the output is the distinguished min cut A comma B is exactly the probability that it never contracts an edge of capital F. So this is what we're going to be interested in here. This will be the object of our mathematical analysis. The probability that in all of the n minus 2 iterations, we never contract an edge of capital F. So to think about that, let's think about each iteration in isolation and actually define some events describing that. So for an iteration i, let si denote the event that we screw up in iteration i. With this notation, we can succinctly say what our goal is. So to compute the probability of success, what we want to do is we want to compute the probability that none of the events s1, s2 up to n minus sn minus 2 ever occur. So I'm going to use uh, this not symbol to say that S1 does not happen. So we don't screw up in iteration 1, we don't screw up in iteration 2, we don't screw up in iteration 3, and so on, all the way up to we don't screw up, we don't contract anything from capital F in the final iteration either. So summarizing, analyzing the success probability of the contraction algorithm boils down to analyzing the probability of this event, the intersection of all of the not SIs with I ranging from iteration 1 to iteration n minus 2. So we're going to take this in baby steps, and the next quiz will lead you through the first one, which is let's have a more modest goal. Let's just think about iteration number 1. Let's try and understand what's the chance we screw up, what's the chance we don't screw up just in the first iteration. So the answer to this quiz is the second option. The probability is k over m, where k is the number of edges crossing the cut a comma b, and m is the total number of edges. Uh, and that's just because the probability of s1, probability that we screw up, is just the number of crossing edges. That's the number of outcomes, which are bad, which cause, uh, which trigger s1, uh, divided by the number of edges. That's the total number of things that could happen. And since all edges are equally likely, it just boils down to this. And by the definition of our notation, this is exactly k over m. 
So this gives us an exact calculation of the failure probability in the first iteration as a function of the number of crossing edges and the number of overall edges. Now it turns out it's going to be more useful for us to have a bound not quite as exact, an inequality, that's in terms of the number of vertices n rather than the number of edges m. The reason for that is it's a little hard to understand how the number of edges is changing in each iteration. It's certainly going down by one each iteration because we contract an edge each iteration, but it might go down by more than one when we delete self loops. By contrast, the number of vertices is this very steady, obvious process. One less vertex with each successive iteration. So let's rewrite this bound in terms of the number of vertices n. To do that in a useful way, we make the following key observation. I claim that in the original graph G that we were given as input, every vertex has at least k edges incident on it. That is, in graph theoretic terminology, every edge has degree at least k. Where, recall, k is the number of edges crossing our favorite min cut A, comma B. So why is that true? Why must every vertex have a decent number of neighbors, a decent number of edges incident to it? Well, it's because if you think about it, each vertex defines a cut by itself. Remember, a cut is just any grouping into of the vertices into two groups that are non-empty, that don't overlap. So one cut is to take a single vertex and make that the first group A, and take the other n minus 1 vertices and make that the second group capital B. So how many edges cross this cut? Well, it's exactly the edges that are incident on the first node, on the node on the left side. So if every single cut, if all exponentially many cuts, have at least k crossing edges, then certainly the n cuts defined by single vertices have at least k crossing edges, so therefore the degree of every vertex is at least k. So our assumption that every single cut in the graph has at least k crossing edges gives us a lower bound on the number of edges incident on each possible vertex. So why is that useful? Well, let's recall the following general fact about any graph, which is that if you sum up over the degrees, of the nodes. So if you go node by node, look at how many edges are incident on that node, that's the degree of V, and then sum them up over all n vertices, what do you get? You get exactly twice the number of edges. Okay, so this is true for any undirected graph, that the sum of the degrees of the vertices is exactly double the number of edges. To see this, you might think about taking a graph, starting with the empty set of edges, and then adding the edges of the graph one at a time. Each time you add a new edge to a graph, obviously the number of edges goes up by one, and the degree of each of the endpoints of that edge also go up by one. And there are, of course, two endpoints. So every time you add an edge, the number of edges goes up by one, the sum of the degrees goes up by two. Therefore, when you've added all the edges, the sum of the degrees is double the number of edges that you've added. That's why this is true. Now, in this graph that we have at hand here, every degree is at least k, and there's n nodes. So this left-hand side, of course, is at least kn for us. So therefore, if we just divide through by 2 and flip the inequality around, we have the number of edges has to be at least the size of the crossing cut, or the degree of every vertex, times the number of vertices divided by 2. So this is just the re previous inequality uh, rearranging. Putting this together with your answer on the quiz, since the probability of S1 is exactly k over m, and m is at least kn over 2, if we substitute, we get that the probability of S1 is, at worst, 2 over n, 2 over the number of vertices, and the k cancels out. So that's sort of our first milestone. We've figured out the chance that we screw up in the first iteration, that we pick uh, some edge from the, that crosses the cut AB, and things look good. This is, a, this is a small number, right? So in general, the number of vertices might be quite big, and this says that the uh, probability we screw up is only 2 over the number of vertices. So, so far, so good. Of course, this was only the first iteration. Who knows what happens later? So now that we understand the chances of screwing up in the first iteration, let's take our next baby step and understand the probability that we don't screw up in either of the first two iterations. That is, we're going to be interested in the following probability. The probability that we don't screw up in the first iteration nor in the second iteration. Now you should go back to the definition of a conditional probability to realize that we can rewrite an intersection like this in terms of conditional probabilities. 
namely as the probability that we don't screw up in the second iteration, given that we didn't do it already, times the probability that we didn't screw up in the first iteration. Okay, so the probability that we miss all of these k vulnerable edges in the second iteration, given that we didn't contract any of them in the first iteration. Now, notice this we already have a good understanding of. On the previous slide, we gave a nice lower bound of this. We said there's a good chance that we don't screw up, probability at least 1 minus 2 to the n. And in some sense, we also have a very good understanding of this probability. We know this is 1 minus the chance that we do screw up. And what's the chance that we do screw up? Well, these k edges are still hanging out in the graph. Remember, we didn't contract any in the first iteration. That's what's given. So there are k ways to screw up. And we choose an edge to contract uniformly at random. So the total number of choices is the number of remaining edges. Now the problem is, what's nice is we have an exact understanding of this probability. This is an equality. The problem is we don't have a good understanding of this denominator. How many remaining edges are there? We have an upper bound on this. We know this is at most m minus 1. We certainly got rid of one edge in the previous iteration. But actually, what, if you think about it, what we need on this quantity is a lower bound. And that's a little unclear because in addition to contracting the one edge and getting that out of the graph, we might have created a bunch of self loops and deleted all of them. So it's hard to understand exactly what this quantity is. So instead, we're going to rewrite this bounded in terms of the number of remaining vertices. And of course, we know there's exactly n minus 1 vertices re remaining. We took two in the last iteration, we contracted it down to one. So how do we relate the number of edges to the number of vertices? Well, we do it just in exactly the same way as in the first iteration. We make a sort of more general observation. For the first iteration, we observe that every node in the original graph induces a cut. Okay, with that node on one side, the other n minus 1 edges on the other side. But in fact, that's a more general statement. Even after we've done a bunch of contractions, any single node in the contracted graph, even if it represents a union of a bunch of nodes in the original graph, we can still think of that as a cut in the original graph. Right? So if there's some super node in the contracted graph, which is the result of fusing 12 different things together, that corresponds to a cut where those 12 nodes in the original graph are the one side A, and the other n minus 12 vertices are the other side of the cut B. Okay? So even after contractions, as long as we have at least two nodes left in our contracted graph, you can take any node and think of it as half of a cut, one side of a cut in the original graph. Now remember, k is the number of edges crossing our minimum cut, a comma b, so any cut in the original graph g has to have at least k crossing edges. So since every node in the contracted graph naturally maps over to a cut in the original graph with at least k edges crossing it, that means that in the contracted graph all of the degrees have to be at least k. If you ever had a node in the contracted graph that had only, say, k minus 1 incident edges, well, then you'd have a cut in the original graph with only k minus 1 edges, a contradiction. So just like in the first iteration, now that we have a lower bound on the degree of every single vertex, we can derive a lower bound on the number of edges that remain in the graph. The number of remaining edges is at least 1 half, that's because when you sum over the degrees of the vertices, you double count the edges, times the degree of each vertex, and we just argued that that's at least k in this contracted graph, times the number of vertices, and we know there's exactly n minus vertices left in the graph at this point. So now what we do is we plug this inequality, we plug this lower bound on the number of remaining edges on as it, and we substitute that for this denominator. So in lower bounding the denominator, we upper bound this fraction, which gives us a lower bound on 1 minus that fraction, and that's what we want. So what we find is that the probability that we don't screw up in the second iteration, given that we didn't screw up in the first iteration, where again by screwing up means picking one of these k edges crossing AB to contract, is at least 1 minus 2 over n minus 1. So that's pretty cool. We took the first iteration, we analyzed it, we showed the probability that we screw up is pretty low. Uh, we succeed with probability at least 1 minus 2 over n. In the second iteration, our success probability has dropped a little bit, but it's still looking pretty good for reasonable values of n. 1 minus 2 over n minus 1. Now, as I hope you've picked up, we can generalize this pattern to any number of iterations. So the degree of every node in the contracted graph remains at least k. The only thing which is changing is the number of vertices is dropping by 1. 
So extending this pattern to its logical conclusion, we get the following lower bound on the probability that the contraction algorithm succeeds. So the probability that the contraction algorithm outputs the cut AB, you recall we argued, is exactly the same thing as the probability that it doesn't contract anything, any of the K crossing edges, any of the set F in the first iteration, nor in the second iteration, nor in the third iteration, and so on, all the way up to the final N minus tooth iteration. Using the definition of conditional probabilities, this is just the probability that we don't screw up in the first iteration times the probability that we don't screw up in the second iteration, given that we didn't screw up in the first iteration, and so on. In the previous two slides, we showed that uh, we don't screw up in the first iteration with probably at least 1 minus 2 over n, in the second iteration with probably at least 1 minus 2 over n minus 1, and of course you can guess what that pattern looks like, and that results in the following product. Now because we stop when we get down to two nodes remaining, the last iteration in which we actually make a contraction, there are three nodes, and in the second to last iteration in which we make a contraction, there are four nodes, so that's where these last two terms come from. Rewriting, this is just n minus 2 over n times n minus 3 over n minus 1, and so on. And now something very cool happens, which is massive cancellation. And to this day, this is always just incredibly satisfying to be able to cross out so many terms. So you get n minus 2 crossing out here. It's going to be a pair of n minus 3s that get crossed out, n minus 4s, and so on. On the other side, there's going to be a pair of 4s that get crossed out and a pair of threes that get crossed out. And we'll be left with only the two largest terms on the denominator and the two smallest terms in the numerator, which is exactly 2 over n times n minus 1. And to keep things simple, among friends, let's just be sloppy and lower bound this by 1 over n squared. So that's it. That's our analysis of the success probability of uh, Carger's contraction algorithm. Pretty cool, pretty slick, huh? Okay, I'll concede, probably you're thinking, hey, wait a minute. We're analyzing the probability that the algorithm succeeds, and we're thinking of the number of vertices n as being big. So what we see here is a success probability of only 1 over n squared, and that kind of sucks. So that's a good point. Let me address that. Problem. This is a low success probability. So that's disappointing. So why are we talking about this algorithm or this analysis? Well, here's something I want to point out. Maybe this is not so good. 1 and n squared, you're going to succeed. But this is still actually shockingly high for an oblivious algorithm, which honestly seems to be doing almost nothing. This is a non-trivial lower bound, a non-trivial success probability, because, don't forget, there's an exponential number of cuts in the graph. So if you try to just pick a random cut, i.e. you put every vertex 50-50 left or right, you'd be doing way worse than this. You'd have a success probability of like 1 over 2 to the n. So this is way, way better than that. And the fact that it's an inverse polynomial means that using repeated trials, we can turn a success probability that's incredibly small into a failure probability that's incredibly small. So let me show you how to do that next. So we're going to boost the success probability of the contraction algorithm in, if you think about it, a totally obvious way. We're going to run it a bunch of times, each one independently, using a fresh batch of random coins. And we're just going to remember the smallest cut that we ever see. And that's what we're going to return, the best of a bunch of repeated trials. Now the question is, how many trials are we going to need before we're pretty confident that we actually find the min cut we're looking for? To answer this question rigorously, let's define some suitable events. So by TI, I mean the event that the ith trial succeeds. That is, the ith time that we run the contraction algorithm, it does output the desired min cut A comma B. For those of you that watched the part two of the probability review, I said a rule of thumb for dealing with independence is that you should maybe, as a working hypothesis, assume random variables are dependent unless they're explicitly constructed to be independent. So here's a case where we're just going to define 
the random variables to be independent. We're just going to say that we run car the contraction algorithm over and over again with fresh randomness. So they're going to be independent trials. Now we know that the uh, probability that a single trial fails could be pretty big, could be as big as 1 minus 1 over n squared. But here now with repeated trials, we're only in trouble if every single trial fails. If even one succeeds, then we find them in cut. So a different way of saying that is we're interested in the intersection of T1 and T2 and so on. That's the event that every single trial fails. And now we use the fact that the trials are independent. So the probability that all of these things happen is just the product of the relevant probabilities. So the product from i equal 1 to capital N of the probability of not Ti. Recall that we argued that the success probability of a single trial was bounded below by 1 over n squared. So the failure probability is bounded above by 1 minus 1 over n squared. So since that's true for each of the capital N terms, we get an overall failure probability for all capital N trials of 1 minus 1 over little n squared raised to the capital N. All right, so that's a little calculation. Don't lose sight of why we're doing the calculation. We want to answer this question. How many trials do we need? How big does capital N need to be before we are confident that we get the answer that we want? Well, to answer that question, uh, I need a quick calculus fact, which is both very simple and very useful. So for all real numbers x, we have the following inequality. 1 plus x is bounded above by e to the x. So I'll just give you a quick proof by picture. So first, think about the line 1 plus x. What does that cross through? Well, that crosses through the points uh, when x is minus 1, y is 0, and when x is 0, y is 1. And it's a line, so this looks like this blue line here. What does e to the x look like? Well, if you substitute x equals 0, it's going to be 1. So in fact, the two curves kiss each other at x equals 0. But exponentials grow really quickly. So as you jack up x to higher positive numbers, it becomes very, very steep. And uh, for x negative numbers, it stays non-negative the whole way. So this sort of flattens out for the negative numbers. So pictorially, and I encourage you to you know, type this into your own favorite graphing program, uh, you see that e to the x bounds above everywhere the line 1 plus x. For those of you that want something more rigorous, there's a bunch of ways to do it. For example, you can look at the Taylor expansion of e to the x at the point 0. What's the point? The point is this allows us to do some very simple uh, calculations on our previous upper bound on the failure probability by working with exponentials instead of working with these ugly 1 minus whatever is raised to the whatever term. So let's combine our upper bound from the previous slide with the upper bound provided by the calculus fact and to be concrete let's substitute some particular number of capital N. So let's use little n squared trials where little n is the number of vertices of the graph in which case the probability that every single trial fails to recover the cut a comma b is bounded above by e to the minus 1 over n squared. That's using the calculus fact applied with x equal to minus 1 over n squared. And then we inherit the capital N in the exponent, which we just instantiated to little n squared. So of course the n squareds are going to cancel. This is going to give us e to the minus 1, also known as 1 over e. So if we're willing to do little n squared trials, then our, pro our, our failure probability has gone from something very close to 1 uh, to something which is more like, say, 30 some odd percent. Now, once you get to a constant success probability, it's very easy to boost it further by just doing a few more trials. So if we just add a natural log factor, so instead of little n squared trials, we do little n squared times the natural log of little n. Now the probability that everything fails is bounded above by the 1 over e that we had last time, but still with a residual natural log of n up top, and this is now merely 1 over n. So I hope it's clear what happened. We took a very simple, very elegant algorithm that almost always didn't do what we want. It almost always failed to output the cut ab. It did it with only probability 1 over little n squared. but 1 over little n squared is still big enough that we can boost it so that it almost always succeeds just by doing repeated trials. And the number of repeated trials that we need is the reciprocal of its original success probability boosted by a further logarithmic factor. So that transformed this almost always failing algorithm into an almost always succeeding algorithm. And that's a more general, less and more general algorithmic technique, which is certainly worth remembering. Let me conclude with a couple comments about the running time. 
This is probably the first algorithm of, a course, of the course where we haven't obsessed over just what the running time is. Now that said, it's simple enough, it's not hard to figure out what it is, but it's actually not that impressive, and that's why I haven't been obsessing over it. This is not almost linear. This is not a for-free primitive as I've described it here. So it's certainly a polynomial time algorithm. Its running time is bounded above by some polynomial in N and M, so that's way better than the exponential time you get from brute force search through all two of the impossible cuts. But it is certainly the way I've described it. You've got to do N squared trials plus a log factor, which I'm not even going to bother writing down. And also, each trial, well, at the very least, you look at all the edges. So that's going to be another factor of M. So this is a bigger polynomial than in any, almost any of the algorithms that we're going to see. Now, I don't want to undersell this application of random sampling to computing cuts, because I've just shown you the simplest, most elegant, most basic, but therefore also the slowest implementation of using contractions to compute cuts. There's been follow-up work with a lot of extra optimizations, in particular doing stuff much more clever than just repeated trials. So basically using work that you did in previous trials to inform how you look for cuts in subsequent trials, and you can shape large factors off of the running time. So there are much better implementations of this randomized contraction algorithm than the one I'm showing you here. Those are, however, outside the course scope of this course. So in this short optional video, really just for fun, I want to point out an, an interesting consequence that the contraction algorithm has about a problem that's in pure graph theory. So to motivate the question, I want to remind you of something that we discussed in passing, which is that a graph may have more than one minimum cut. So there may be distinct cuts which are tied for the fewest number of crossing edges. For a concrete example, you could think about a tree. So if you just look at a star graph that is hubs and spokes, it's evident that uh, if you isolate any leaf by itself, then you get a minimum cut with exactly one crossing edge. In fact, if you think about it for a little while, you'll see that in any tree, you'll have n minus 1 different minimum cuts, each with exactly one crossing edge. The question concerns counting the number of minimum cuts. Namely, given that a graph might have more than one minimum cut, what is the largest number of minimum cuts that a graph with n vertices can have? We know the answer is at least n minus 1. We already discussed how trees have n minus 1 distinct minimum cuts. We know the answer is at most something like 2 to the n, because a graph only has roughly 2 to the n cuts. In fact, the answer is both very nice and wedged in between. So the answer is exactly n choose 2, where n is the number of vertices. Uh, this is also known as n times n minus 1 divided by 2. So it can be bigger than it is in trees, but not a lot bigger. In particular, graphs have only undirected graphs, have only polynomially many minimum cuts. And that's been a useful fact in a number of different applications. So I'm going to prove this fact to you. All I need is one short slide on the lower bound, and then uh, one slide for the upper bound, which follows from properties of the random contraction algorithm. So for the lower bound, we don't have to look much beyond our trees example. We're just going to look at cycles. So for any value of n, consider the n cycle. So here, for example, is the n cycle with n equal to 8. That would be an octagon. And the key observation is that just like in a tree, how removing each of the n minus 1 edges breaks the tree into two pieces and defines a cut, with a cycle, if you remove just one edge, you don't get a cut. The thing remains connected. But if you remove any pair of edges, then that induces a cut of the graph corresponding to the two pieces that remain. No matter which pair of edges you remove, you get a distinct uh, pair of groups, distinct cuts. So ranging over all n choose two choices of pairs of edges, you generate n choose two different cuts. Each of those cuts has exactly two crossing edges, and it's easy to see that's the fewest possible. So that's the lower bound, which was simple enough. Let's now move on to the upper bound, which a purely combinatorial fact will follow from an algorithm. So consider any graph that has n vertices, and let's think about the different minimum cuts of that graph. What we're going to use is that the analysis of the contraction algorithm proceeded in a fairly curious way. So remember how we defined the success probability of the contraction algorithm. We fixed up front some min cut a comma b. And we defined the contraction algorithm, the basic contraction algorithm, before the repeated trials. We defined the contraction algorithm as successful if and only if it output 
the minimum cut A comma B that we designated up front. If it outputs some other min cut, we didn't count it. We said, nope, that's a failure. So we actually analyzed a stronger property than what we were trying to solve, which is outputting a given min cut A, B, rather than just any old min cut. So how is that useful? Well, let's apply it here. For each of these T minimum cuts of this graph, we could think about the probability that the contraction algorithm outputs that particular min cut. So we can instantiate the analysis with a particular minimum cut, AI, BI. And what we proved in the analysis is that the probability that the algorithm outputs the cut AIBI, not just any old min cut, but in fact this exact cut AI comma BI is bounded below by, we, in the end we made a sloppy inequality, we said it's at least 1 over n squared, but if you go back to the analysis, you'll see that it was in fact 2 over n times n minus 1, also known as 1 over and choose two. So instantiating the contraction algorithm success probability analysis without all of the repeated trials business, we show that for each of these T cuts, for each fixed cut AIBI, the probability that this algorithm outputs that particular cut is at least one over and choose two. Let's introduce a name for this event, the event that the contraction algorithm outputs the ith min cut. Let's call this SI. The key observation is that the SIs are disjoint events. Remember an event is just a subset of stuff that could happen. So one thing that could happen is that the algorithm outputs the ith min cut. And by disjoint we just mean that there's no outcome that's in a given pair of events. And that's because the contraction algorithm at the end of the day, once it makes its coin flips, it outputs a single cut. These are distinct cuts that can only output, at best, one of them. Why is it important that these SIs are disjoint events? Well, with disjoint events, the probabilities add. The probability of the union of a bunch of disjoint events is the sum of the probabilities of the constituent events. If you want to think about this pictorially, you can just draw a big box denoting everything that could happen, omega. And then these SIs are just these blobs that don't overlap. So S1, S2, S3, and so on. Now the sum of probabilities of disjoint events can sum to, at most, 1. Right? The probability of all of omega is 1, and these SIs have no overlap and are packed into omega. So the sum of their probabilities can only be smaller. Writing that formally, we have that the sum of their probabilities which we can lower bound by the number of different events, and remember there are t, different min cuts for some parameter t, for each min cut ai bi, a lower bound on the probability that that gets spit out as output is 1 over n choose 2, so a lower bound on the sum of all of these probabilities is the number of them t times the probability lower bound 1 over n choose 2, and this has got to be at most 1. Rearranging, what do we find? T, the number of different min cuts, is bounded above by n choose 2. Exactly the lower bound provided by the n cycle. The n cycle has n choose 2 distinct minimum cuts. No other graph has more. Every graph has only a polynomial number, indeed at most a quadratic number of minimum cuts. So let's talk about the absolutely fundamental problem of searching a graph and the very related problem of finding paths through graphs. So why would one be interested in searching a graph or figuring out if there's a path from point A to point B? Well, there's many, many reasons. I'm going to give you a highly non-exhaustive list on this slide. So let me begin with a very sort of obvious and literal example, which is if you have a physical network. Then often you want to make sure that the network is fully connected in the sense that you can get from any starting point to any other point. So for example, think back to the phone network. It would have been a disaster if callers from California could only reach callers in Nevada, but not their family members in Utah. So obviously a minimal condition for functionality of something like a phone network is that you can get from any one place to any other place, similarly for road networks within a given country, and so on. 
It can also be fun to think about other non-physical networks and ask if they're connected. So one network that's fun to play around with is the movie network. So this is the graph where the nodes correspond to actors and actresses, and you have an edge between two nodes if they played a role in a common movie. So this is going to be an undirected graph where the edges correspond to not necessarily co-starring, but both the actors appearing at least at some point in the same movie. So versions of this movie network you should be able to find publicly available on the web, and there's lots of fun questions you can ask about the movie network, like for example, what's the minimum number of hops, where a hop here, again, is a movie that two people both played a role in, the minimum number of hops or edges you can get from one actor to another actor. So perhaps the most famous statistic that's been thought about with the movie network is the Bacon number. So this refers to the fairly ubiquitous actor Kevin Bacon, and the question, the Bacon number of an actor is defined as the minimum number of hops you need in this uh, movie graph to get to Kevin Bacon. So for example, you could ask about uh, John Hamm, also known as Don Draper from Mad Men, and you could ask how many edges do you need on a path through the movie graph to get to Kevin Bacon, and it turns out that the answer is one, excuse me, two edges. You need one intermediate point, namely Colin Firth, and that's, became, that's because Colin Firth and uh, Kevin Bacon both starred in the Adam McGoyan movie Where the Truth Lies, and John Hamm uh, and Colin Firth were both in the movie A Single Man. So that would give John Hamm a Bacon number of two. So these are the kind of questions you can ask about connectivity, uh, not just in physical networks like telephone and telecommunication networks, but also uh, logical networks about pairwise relationships between objects more generally. So the Bacon number is fundamentally not just about any pass, but actually shortest pass, the minimum number of edges you need to traverse to get from uh, one actor to Kevin Bacon. And shortest paths are also have a very practical use that uh, you might use yourself in driving directions. So when you use a website or a phone app and you ask for the best way to get from where you are now to, say, some restaurant where you're going to have dinner, obviously you're trying to find some kind of path through a network, through a graph, and indeed often you want the, the shortest path, perhaps in mileage or perhaps in anticipated travel time. Now I realize that when you're thinking about paths and graphs, it's natural to focus on sort of very literal paths and quite literal physical networks. Things like routes through a road network or paths through the internet and so on. But you should really think more abstractly as a path as just a sequence of decisions taking you from some initial state to some final state. And it's this abstract mentality, which is what makes graph search so ubiquitous and feels like artificial intelligence, where you want to formulate a plan of how to get from an initial state to some goal state. So to give a simple recreational example, you could imagine just trying to understand how to compute automatically a way to fill in a Sudoku puzzle so that you get to, so that you solve the puzzle correctly. So you might ask, you know, what is the graph that we're talking about uh, when we want to solve a Sudoku puzzle? Well, this is going to be a directed graph, where here the nodes correspond to partially completed puzzles. So for example, at one node of this extremely large graph, perhaps 40 out of the 81 cells are filled in with some kind of number. And now, again, remember a path is supposed to correspond to a sequence of decisions. So what are the actions that you take in solving Sudoku? Well, you fill in a number into a square. So an edge, which here is going to be directed, is going to move you from one partially completed puzzle to another, where one previously empty square gets filled in with one number. And of course, then the path that you're interested in computing, or what you're searching for when you search this graph, you begin with the initial state uh, of the Sudoku puzzle, and you want to reach some uh, goal state where the Sudoku puzzle is completely filled in without any violations of the rules of Sudoku. And of course, it's easy to imagine millions of other uh, situations where you want to formulate some kind of plan like this. Like, for example, if you have a robotic hand and you just want to grasp some object, you need to think about exactly how to approach the object with this robotic hand so that you can grab it without, for example, first knocking it over. And you can think of millions of other examples. Another thing which turns out to be closely related to graph search, as we'll see, and has many applications in its own right, is that of computing connectivity information about graphs. So in particular, the connected components. So this, especially for undirected graphs, corresponds to the pieces of a graph. We'll talk about these topics in their own right, and I'll give you applications for them later. So for undirected graphs, I'll briefly mention an easy clustering heuristic you can derive out of computing connected components. For directed graphs where the very definition of computing components is a bit more subtle, I'll show you applications to understanding the structure of the web. 
So these are a few of the reasons why it's important for you to understand how to efficiently search graphs. It's a, a fundamental and widely applicable graph primitive. And I'm happy to report that in this section of the course, pretty much anything, any questions we want to answer about graph search, computing connected components, and so on, there's going to be really fast algorithms to do it. So this will be a part of the course where there's lots of what I call for free primitives, uh, processing steps, subroutines you can run without even thinking about it. All of these algorithms we're going to discuss in the next several lectures are going to run in linear time, and they're going to have quite reasonable constants. So they're really barely slower than reading the input. So if you have a graph and you're trying to reason about it, you're trying to make sense about it, you should, in some sense, feel free to apply any of these subroutines we're going to discuss to try and glean some more information about what they look like, how you might use uh, the network data. There's a lot of different approaches to systematically searching a graph. So there's many methods. In this class, we're going to focus on two very important ones, namely breadth-first search and depth-first search. But all of the graph search methods share some things in common. So on this slide, let me just tell you the high-order bits of really any graph search algorithm. So graph search subroutines generally are passed as input a starting vertex from which the search originates. So that's often called a source vertex. And your goal then is to find everything findable from this search vertex. And obviously you're not going to find anything that you can't find, that's not findable. What do I mean by findable? I mean there's a path from the starting point to this other node. So for any other node to which you can get along a path from the starting point, you should discover it. So for example, if you're given an undirected graph that has uh, three different pieces, like this one I'm drawing on the right, and perhaps S is this leftmost node here, then the findable vertices starting from S, i.e. the ones to which you can reach from a path to S, is clearly precisely these four vertices. So you would want graph search to automatically discover and efficiently discover these four vertices if you started at S. You could also think about a directed version of the exact same graph, where I'm going to direct the vertices like so. So now the definition of the findable nodes is a little bit different. We're only expecting to follow arcs forward along the forward direction. So we should only expect at best to find all of the nodes that you can reach by following a succession of forward arcs. That is, any, any node uh, that there's a path to from S. So in this case, these three nodes would be the ones we'd be hoping to find. This blue node to the right, we would no longer expect to find because the only way to get there from S is by going backward along arcs. And that's not what we're going to be thinking about in our graph searches. So we want to find everything findable, i.e. that we can get to along paths, and, uh, but we want to do it efficiently. And efficiently means we don't explore anything twice. Right? So the graph has m arcs, m edges, and n nodes, or n vertices, and really we want to just look at each piece of the graph only once or a small constant number of times. So we're looking for running time, which is linear in the size of the graph, that is big O of m plus n. Now when we were talking about representing graphs, I said that in many applications it's natural to focus on connected graphs, in which case m is going to dominate n. You're going to have at least as many edges as nodes, uh, essentially. But connectivity is the classic case where you might have the number of edges being much smaller than the number of nodes. There might be many pieces and the whole point of what you're trying to do is discover them. So for this sequence of lectures where we talk about graph search and connectivity, we will uh, usually write m plus n. We'll think that either one could be bigger or smaller than the other. So let me now give you a generic approach to graph search. So it's going to be underspecified. There'll be many different ways to instantiate it. Two particular instantiations will get us breadth first search and depth first search. But here's just a general systematic method for finding everything findable without exploring anything more than once. So motivated by the second goal, the fact that we don't want to explore anything twice, with each node, with each vertex, we're going to remember whether or not we've explored it before. So we just need one Boolean uh, per node, and we'll initialize it by having everything unexplored, except S, our starting point, will have it start off as explored. And it's useful to think of the nodes thus far as being, in some sense, territory conquered by the algorithm. And then there's going to be a frontier in between the conquered and unconquered territory. And the goal of the generic algorithm is that each step we supplement the conquered territory by one new node, assuming that there is one adjacent to the territory we've already conquered. So for example, in this top example with the undirected network, initially the only thing we've explored is the starting point S. So that's sort of our home base. It's all that we have conquered so far. And then in our main while loop, which we iterate as many times as we can until we don't have any edges meeting the following criterion, we look for an edge with one endpoint that we've already explored, one endpoint inside the conquered territory, and then the other endpoint outside. So this is how we can, in one hop, 
supplement the number of nodes we've seen by one new one. If we can't find such an edge, then this is where the search stops. If we can find such an edge, well then we suck V into the conquer territory, we think of it being explored, and we return to the main while loop. So for example, in this example on the right, we start with the only explored node being S. Now, there's actually two edges that cross the frontier, in the sense one of the endpoints is explored, namely one of the endpoints is S, and the other one is some other vertex, right? There's this, uh, there's these two, ver two edges to the left, two vertices adjacent to S. So in this algorithm, we pick either one, it's un underspecified which one we pick, but maybe we pick the top one, and so then all of a sudden this second top vertex is now also explored, so the conquered territory is the union of them, and so now we have a new frontier. So now again we have two edges that cross from the explored nodes to the unexplored nodes. These are the edges that are in some sense going uh, from northwest to southeast. Again, we pick one of them. It's not clear how. The algorithm doesn't tell us. We just pick any of them. So maybe, for example, we pick uh, this rightmost edge crossing the frontier. Now the rightmost edge of these four, rightmost vertex of these four is explored. So our conquered territory is the top three vertices. And now again, we have two edges crossing the frontier, the two edges that are incident to the bottom node. We pick one of them, not clear which one, maybe this one. And now the bottom node is also explored, and now there are no edges crossing the frontier. So there are no edges who on the one hand have one endpoint being explored and the other endpoint being unexplored. So these will be the four vertices, as one would hope, that the search will explore started from S. Well, generally, the claim is that this generic graph search algorithm does what we wanted. It finds everything findable from the starting point, and moreover, it doesn't explore anything twice. I think it's fairly clear that it doesn't explore anything twice, right? As soon as you look at a node for the first time, you suck it into the conquered territory, never to look at it again. Similarly, as soon as you look at an edge, you suck them in. Um, but when we explore breadth and depth first search, we'll be more precise about the running time and exactly what I mean by you don't explore something twice. So at this level of generality, I just want to focus on the first point, that any way you instantiate the search algorithm, uh, it's going to find everything findable. So what do I really mean by that? The formal claim is that at the termination of this algorithm, the nodes that we've marked ex explored are precisely the ones that can be reached via a path from S. That's the sense in which the algorithm explores everything that could potentially be findable from the starting point S. And one thing I want to mention is that this claim and the proof I'm going to give of it, it holds whether or not G is an undirected graph or a directed graph. In fact, almost all of the things that I'm going to say about graph search, and in particular about breadth first search and depth first search, work in essentially the same way, either in undirected graphs or directed graphs. The obvious difference being in an undirected graph, you can traverse an edge in either direction. In a directed graph, we're only supposed to traverse it in the forward direction, from the tail to the head. The one big difference uh, between undirected and directed graphs is when we do connectivity computations, and I'll remind you when we get to that point which one we're talking about. Okay? But for the most part, when we just talk about basic graph search, it works essentially the same way, whether it's undirected or directed, so keep that in mind. All right, so why is this true? Why are the nodes that get explored precisely the nodes uh, for which there's a path to them from S? Well, one direction is easy which is you can't find anything which is not findable. That is, if you wind up exploring a node, the only reason that can happen is because you traversed a sequence of edges that got you there. And that sequence of edges obviously defines a path from S to V. If you really want to be pedantic about the forward direction that explored nodes have to have paths from S, uh, then you can just do an easy induction. And I'll leave this for you to check if you want in the privacy of your own home. So the important direction of this claim is really the opposite. Why is it that no matter how we instantiate this generic graph search procedure, it's impossible for us to miss anything? That's the crucial point. We don't miss anything that we could in principle find via a path. But we're going to proceed by contradiction. So what does that mean? We're going to assume that uh, the statement that we want to prove is true is not true, which means that it's possible that G has a path from S to V, and yet somehow our algorithm misses it, doesn't mark it as explored. Right? That's the thing we're really hoping doesn't happen. So let's suppose it does happen and then derive a contradiction. So suppose G does have a path from S to some vertex V, called the path P. I'm going to draw the picture for an undirected graph, but the situation would be the same in the, in the directed case. So there's a bunch of hops, there's a bunch of edges, and then eventually this path ends at V. Now, the bad situation, the situation from which we want to derive a contradiction, is that V is unexplored at the end of this algorithm. 
So let's take stock of what we know. S for sure is explored, right? We initialize the search procedure so that S is marked as explored. V by hypothesis in this proof by contradiction is unexplored. So S is explored, V is unexplored. So now imagine we, just in our heads, as a thought experiment, we traverse this path P. We start at S, and we know it's explored. We go to the next vertex. It may or may not have been explored. We're not sure. We go to the third vertex again. Who knows? Might be explored, might be unexplored, and so on. But by the time we get to V, we know it's unexplored. So we start at S, it's been explored. We get to V, it's been unexplored. So at some point, there's some hop along this path P from which we move from an explored vertex to an unexplored vertex. There has to be a switch at some point, because at the end of the day, at the end of the path, we're at an unexplored node. So consider the first edge, and there must be one, that we switch from being at an explored node to being at an unexplored node. So I'm going to call the endpoints of this purported edge U and W, where U is the explored one and W is the unexplored one. Now, for all we know, U could be exactly the same as S. That's a possibility. Or for all we know, W could be the same as V. That's also a possibility. In the picture, I'll draw it as if this edge UX was somewhere in the middle of this path. But again, it may be at one of the ends. That's totally fine. But now, in this case, there's something I need you to explain to me. How is it possible that, on the one hand, our algorithm terminated, and on the other hand, there's this edge, u, x, where u has been explored and x has not been explored? That, my friends, is impossible. Our generic search algorithm does not give up. It does not terminate unless there are no edges where the one endpoint is explored and the other endpoint is unexplored. As long as there's such an edge, it has it's going to suck in that unexplored vertex into the conquered territory. It's going to keep going. So the, the upshot is there's no way that our algorithm terminated with this picture, with there being an edge ux, u explored, x unexplored. So that's the contradiction. This contradicts the fact that our algorithm uh, terminated with uh, v unexplored. So that is a general approach to graph search. So that, I hope, gives you the flavor of how this is going to work. But now there's two particular instantiations of this generic method that are really important and have their own suites of applications. So we're going to focus on breadth-first search and depth-first search. We'll cover them in detail in the next couple of videos. I want to give you the highlights uh, to conclude this video. Now let me just make sure it's clear where the ambiguity in our generic method is, why we can have different instantiations of it that potentially have different properties and different applications. The question is, at a given iteration of this while loop, what do you got? You got your nodes that you've already explored, so that includes S plus probably some other stuff. And then you've got your nodes that are unexplored. And then you have your crossing edges, right? So they're edges with one point in each side. And for an undirected graph, there's no orientation to worry about. These crossing edges just have uh, one endpoint on the explored side, one endpoint on the unexplored side. In the directed case, you focus on edges where the tail of the edge is on the explored side and the head of the edge is on the unexplored side. So they go from the explored side to the unexplored side. And the question is, in general, in an iteration of this while loop, there's going to be many such crossing edges. There are many different unexplored nodes we could go to next. And different strategies for picking the unexplored node to explore next leads us to different graph search algorithms with different properties. So the first specific search strategy we're going to study is breadth-first search, colloquially known as BFS. So let me tell you sort of the high-level idea and applications of breadth-first search. So the goal is going to be to explore the nodes in what I call layers. So the starting point S will be in its own layer, layer 0. The neighbors of S will constitute layer 1. And then layer 2 will be the nodes that are neighbors of layer 1, but that are not already in layer 0 or layer 1, and so on. So layer i plus 1 is the stuff next to layer i that you haven't already seen yet. You can think of this as a fairly cautious and tentative exploration of the graph. And it's going to turn out that there's a close correspondence between these layers and shortest path distances. So if you want to know the minimum number of hops, the minimum number of edges you need in a path to get from point A to point B in a graph, the way we wanted to know the fewest number of edges in the movie graph necessary to connect John Hamm to Kevin Bacon, that corresponds directly to these layers. So if a node is in layer i, then you need i edges to get from s to i in the graph. 
Once we discuss breadth first search, we'll also discuss how to compute the connected components or the different pieces of an undirected graph. Turns out this isn't that special to breadth first search. You can use any number of graph search strategies to compute connected components in undirected graphs, but I'll show you how to do it using a simple looped version of breadth first search. And we'll be able to do this stuff in the linear time that we want, the very ambitious goal of getting linear time. To get the linear time implementation, you do want to use the right data structure, but it's a super simple data structure, something probably you've seen in the past, namely uh, a queue. So something that's first in, first out. So the second search strategy that's super important to know is depth first search, also known as DFS to its friends. Depth first search has a rather different feel than breadth first search. It's a much more aggressive search where you immediately try and plunge as deeply as you can. It's very much in the spirit of how you might explore a maze where you go as deeply as you can, only backtracking when absolutely necessary. Depth first search will also have its own set of applications. It's not, for example, very useful for computing shortest path information, but especially in directed graphs, it's going to do some remarkable things for us. So in uh, a directed acyclic graph, so a directed graph with no directed cycles, it will give us what's called the topological ordering. So it'll sequence the nodes in a linear ordering from the first to the last so that all of the arcs of the directed graph go forward. So this is useful, for example, if you have a number of tasks that have to get completed with certain precedence constraints. Like, for example, you have to take all of the classes in your undergraduate major and there are certain prerequisites. Uh, topological ordering will give you a way in which to do it, respecting all of the prerequisites. And finally, where for undirected graphs, it doesn't really matter whether you use BFS or DFS to compute connected components. In directed graphs, where even defining connected components is a little tricky, uh, it turns out depth first search is exactly what you want. That's what you're going to get uh, a linear time implementation for computing the right notion of connected components in the directed graph case. Time-wise, both of these are superb strategies for exploring a graph. They're both linear time with very good constants. So depth first search again. We're going to get order O of M plus N time in a graph with M edges and N vertices. Uh, you do want to use a different data structure reflecting the different search strategy. So here, because you're exploring aggressively, as soon as you get to a node, you immediately start exploring its neighbors. You want a last in, first out data structure, also known as a stack. Depth first search also admits a very elegant recursive formulation, and in that formulation, you don't even need to maintain a stack data structure ex explicitly. The stack is implicitly taken care of uh, in the recursion. So that concludes this overview of graph search, both what it is, what our goals are, what kind of applications they have, and two of the most common strategies. The next couple of videos are going to explore these search strategies, as well as a couple of these applications in greater depth. So in this lecture, we're going to drill down into our first specific search strategy for graphs and also explore some applications, namely breadth first search. So let me remind you the intuition and applications of breadth first search. The plan is to systematically explore the nodes of this graph, beginning with the given starting vertex in layers. So let's think about the following example graph, where S is the starting point for our breadth first search. So the star vertex S will constitute uh, the first layer, so we'll call that L0. And then the neighbors of S are going to be the first layer, and so those are the vertices that we explore uh, just after S, so those are L1. Now the second layer is going to be the vertices that are neighboring vertices of L1, but are not themselves in L1, or for that matter, L0. So that's going to be C and D. That's going to be the second layer. Now you'll notice, for example, S is itself a neighbor of these nodes in layer 1, but we've already counted that in a previous layer, so we don't count S toward L2. And then finally, the neighbors of L2, which are not already put in some uh, layer, is E. So that'll be layer 3. Again, notice C and D are neighbors of each other, but they've already been classified in layer 2, so that's where they belong, not in layer 3. So that's the high-level picture of breadth first search you should have. We'll talk about how to actually precisely implement it on the next slide. Again, just a couple of the things that uh, you can do with breadth first search, which we'll explore in this video, is uh, computing shortest paths. So it turns out shortest path distances correspond precisely to these layers. So if, for example, if you had as S, you had that as the Kevin Bacon node in the movie graph, then uh, John Hamm would pop up in the second layer uh, from the breadth first search from Kevin Bacon. I'm also going to show you how to compute the connected components of an undirected graph that is compute its pieces. We'll do that in linear time. 
And for this entire sequence of videos on graph primitives, we will be satisfied with nothing less than the holy grail of linear time. And again, remember, in a graph, you have two different size parameters, the number of edges m and the number of nodes n. For these videos, I'm not going to assume any relationship between m and n. Either one could be bigger. So linear time is going to mean O of m plus n. So let's talk about how you'd actually implement breadth-first search in linear time. So the subroutine is given as input both a graph, G. I'm going to explain this as if it's undirected, but this entire procedure will work in exactly the same way for a directed graph. Again, obviously, in an undirected graph, you can traverse an edge in either direction. For a directed graph, you have to be careful only to traverse arcs in the intended direction from the tail to the head, that is, traverse them forward. So as we discussed when we talked about just generic strategies for graph search, we don't want to explore anything twice. That would certainly be inefficient. So we're going to keep a Boolean at each node, marking whether we've already explored it or not. And by default, I'm just, we're just going to assume that nodes are unexplored. They're only explored if we explicitly mark them as such. So we're going to initialize the search with the starting vertex S. So we mark S as explored, and then we're going to put that in what I was previously calling conquered territory, the nodes we've already started to explore. So to get linear time, we're going to have to manage those in a you know, slightly non-naive, but, but pretty straightforward way, namely via a queue, which is a first-in, first-out data structure that I assume you've seen. If you've never seen a queue before, please look it up in a programming textbook uh, or on the web. But basically, a queue is just something where you can add stuff uh, to the back in constant time, and you can take stuff from the front in constant time. You can implement these, for example, using a doubly linked list. Now recall that in the general systematic approach to graph search, the trick was to, in each iteration of some while loop, to add one new vertex to the conquered territory, to identify one unexplored node that is now going to be explored. So that while loop is going to translate into one in which we just check if the queue is non-empty. So we're assuming that the queue data structure supports that query in constant time, which is easy to implement. And if the queue is not empty, we remove a node from it. And because it's a queue, the removing nodes from the front is what you can do in constant time. So call the node that you get out of the queue V. So now we're going to look at V's neighbors, vertices with which it shares edges, and we're going to see if any of them have not already been explored. So if W is something we haven't seen before, if it's unexplored, that means it's in the unconquered territory, which is great. So we have a new victim. Uh, we can mark W as explored. We can put it in our queue, and we've advanced the frontier. And now we have one more explored node than we did previously. And again, a queue, by construction, it supports adding constant time additions at the end of the queue. So that's where we put W. So let's see how this code actually executes in the same graph that we were looking at uh, in the previous slide. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to number the nodes in the order in which they are explored. So obviously the first node to get explored is S. That's where the queue starts. So now when we follow the code, what happens? Well, in the first iteration of the while loop, we ask, is the queue empty? No, it's not, because S is in it. So we remove, in this case, the only node of Q. It's S. And then we iterate over the edges incident to S. Now, there are two of them. There is the edge between S and A, and there's the edge between S and B. And again, this is still a little underspecified in the sense that the algorithm doesn't tell us which of those two edges we should look at. Turns out it doesn't matter. Either of those is a valid execution of breadth first search. But for concreteness, let's suppose that of the two possible edges, we look at the edge S comma A. So then we ask, has A already been explored? No, it hasn't. This is the first time we've seen it. So we say, oh, goody, this is sort of a new grist for the mill. So we can add A to the, to the queue at the end, and we mark W as, sorry, mark A as explored. So A is going to be the second vertex that we mark. So after marking A as explored and adding it to the queue, so now we go back to the for loop. And so now we move on to the second edge incident to S. That's the edge between S and B. So we ask, have we already explored B? Nope, this is the first time we've seen it. So now we do the same thing with B. So B gets marked as explored. It gets added to the queue at the end. So the queue at this juncture has first a record for A, because that was the first one we put in it after we took Q, uh, S out. And then B follows A in the queue. And again, depending on the execution, this could go either way. But for concreteness, I've done it so that A got added before B. So at this point, this is what the queue looks like. So now we go back up to the while loop. We say, is the queue empty? Certainly not. It actually has two elements. Now we remove the first node from Q. In this case, that's the node A. That was the one we put in before the node B. And so now we say, well, let's look at all of the edges incident to A. 
And in this case, A has two incident edges. It has one that it shares with S, and it has one that it shares with C. And so if we look at the edge between A and S, then we'd be asking in the if statement, has S already been explored? Yes, it has. That's where we started. So there's no reason to do anything with S. That's already been taken out of the queue. So in this for loop for A, there's two iterations. One involves the edge with S, and that one we completely ignore. But then there's the other edge that A shares with C, and C we haven't seen yet. So at that part of the for loop, we say, aha, C is a new thing, new node we can mark as explored and put in the queue. So that's going to be our number four. And so now how has the queue changed? Well, we got rid of A. And so now B is in the front, and we added C at the end. And so now the same thing happens. We go back to the while loop. The queue is not empty. We take off the first vertex. In this case, that's going to be B. B has three incident edges. It has one incident to S, but that's irrelevant. We've already seen S. It has one incident to C. That's also irrelevant. That's also relevant because we've already seen C. True, we just, just saw it very recently, but we've already seen it. But the edge between B and D is new. And so that means we can take the node D, mark it as explored, and add it to the queue. So D is going to be the fifth one that we see. And now the queue has the element C followed by D. So now we go back to the while loop, and we take C off of the queue. It again has four now edges. The one with A is irrelevant. We've already seen A. The one with B is irrelevant. We've already seen B. The one with D is irrelevant. We've already seen D. But we haven't seen E yet. So when we get to the part of the for loop of the edge between C and E, we say, aha, E is new. So E will be the sixth and final vertex to be marked as explored. And that will get added at the end of the queue. So then in the final two iterations of the while loop, the D is going to be removed. We'll iterate through its three edges. None of those will be relevant because we've seen all of the other three endpoints. And then we'll go back to the while loop and we'll get rid of E. E is irrelevant because it has two edges. We've already seen the other endpoints. And now we go back to the while loop. The queue is empty and we stop. And that is breath first search. And to see how this simulates the notion of the layers that we were discussing in the previous slide, notice that the nodes are numbered according to the layer that they're in. So S was layer 0. And then the two nodes that S caused to get added to the queue, the A and the B, are number 2 and 3. And the edges of layer 3 are precisely the ones, sorry, the edges of layer 2 are precisely the ones that got added to the queue while we were processing the nodes from layer 1. That is, C and D are precisely the nodes that got added to the queue while we were processing A and B. So this is level 0, level 1, and level 2. E is the only node that got added to the queue while we were processing level layer 2, the vertices C and D. So E will be the third layer. So in that sense, by using a first-in, first-out data structure, this queue, uh, we do wind up uh, processing the nodes uh, according to the layers that we discussed earlier. So the claim is that breadth-first search is a good way to explore a graph in the sense that it meets the two high-level goals that we delineated in the previous video. Uh, first of all, it finds everything findable and obviously nothing else. And second of all, it does it without redundancy. It does it without exploring anything twice, which is the key to its linear time implementation. So a little bit more formally, claim number one, at the end of the algorithm, the vertices that we've explored are precisely the ones such that there is a path from S to that vertex. And again, this claim is equally valid whether you're running BFS in an undirected graph or a directed graph. Of course, in an undirected graph, we mean an undirected path from S to V, whereas in a directed graph, we mean a directed path from S to V. That means a path where every arc in the path gets traversed in the forward direction. So why is this true? Well, this is true. We basically prove this more generally for any graph search strategy of a certain form of which breadth-first search is one. If it's hard for you to see the right way to interpret breadth-first search as a special case of our generic search algorithm, you can also just look at our proof for the generic search algorithm and copy it down for breadth-first search. So it's clear that you're only going to, again, the forward direction of this claim is clear. If you actually find something, if something's marked as explored, 
it's only because you found a sequence of edges that led you there. So the only way you mark something that is explored is if there's a path from S to V. Conversely, to prove that anything with an S to V, for with a path from V will be found, you can proceed by contradiction. You can look at the part of the path from S to V that, that BFS does successfully explore, and then you get asked, why didn't it go one more hop? It never would have terminated before reaching all the way to V. So you can also just copy that same proof uh, that we had for the generic search strategy in the previous video. Okay, so again, the upshot breadth first search it finds everything you'd want to find. Okay, so it only traverses paths, so you're not going to find anything where there isn't a path to it, but it never misses out. Okay, anything where there's a path, BFS guaranteed to find it, no problem. Claim number two is that the running time is exactly what we want, and I'm going to state it in a form that will be useful later when we talk about connected components. So the running time of the main while loop, ignoring any kind of uh, pre-processing or initialization, is proportional to what I'm going to call ns and ms, which is the number of nodes that can be reached from s and the number of edges that can be reached from s. And the reason for this claim, this just becomes clear if you inspect the code, which we'll do in a second. So let's return to the code and just tally up all the work that gets done. So I'm going to ignore this initialization. I'm just going to focus on the main while loop. So we can summarize the total work done in this while loop as follows. First, we just think about the vertices. So in this search, we're only going to deal ever deal with the vertices that are findable from S. So that's NS. And uh, what do we do for with a given node? Well, we insert it into the queue and we delete it from the queue, right? So we're never going to deal with a single node more than once. So that's constant time overhead per vertex that we ever see. So that's the proportional to the NS part. Now, a given edge, we might look at it twice. So for an edge VW, we might consider it once when we first uh, look at the vertex V, and we might consider it again when we look at the vertex W. Each time we look at an edge, we do constant work, so that means we're only going to do constant work uh, per edge. Okay, so we look at each vertex at most once, we look at each edge findable from S at most twice, we do constant time, constant work when we look at something, so the overall running time is going to be proportional to the number of vertices findable from S plus the number of edges findable from S. So that's really cool. We have a linear time implementation of a really nice graph search strategy. Uh, and moreover, we just need very basic data structures, a uh, queue to make it run fast with small constants. But it gets even better. We can use breadth first search as a workhorse for some interesting applications. So that's what we'll talk about in the rest of this video. And let's begin with the idea of shortest paths. So again, I'll give you the movie graph. I'll give you Kevin Bacon as a starting point. What's the fewest number of hops, the fewest number of edges on a path that leads to, say, John Hamm? So some notation. I'm going to use DIST of V to denote the shortest path distance. So with respect to a starting node S, the fewest number of hops or the fewest number of edges on a path that starts at S and goes to V. And again, you can define this in the same way for undirected graphs or directed graphs. In a directed graph, you always want to traverse arcs in the forward direction, in the correct direction. And to do this, we just have to add a very small amount of extra code to the BFS code that I showed you earlier. It's just going to be a very small constant overhead. And basically, it just keeps track of what layer each node belongs to. And the layers are exactly tracking shortest path distances away from the starting point, S. So what's the extra code? Well, first, in the initialization step, you set your preliminary estimate of the distance, the number, the shortest path distance from S to a vertex V as, well, if V equals S, you know you can get from S to S on a path of length zero, the empty path. And if it's any other vertex, all bets are off. You have no idea if there's a path to V at all. So let's just initially put plus infinity for all vertices other than the starting point. This is something we will, of course, revise once we actually discover a path to a vertex V. And the only other extra code you have to add is when you're considering, so when you take a uh, vertex off of the front of the queue and then you iterate through its edges and you're considering one of those edges VW, so here V would be the vertex that you just removed from the front of the queue. And as usual, if the other end of the edge W has already been dealt with, then you, know, you just throw it out. That would be redundant work to look at it again. But if this is the first time you're seeing the vertex W, then, in addition to what we did previously, in addition to marking it as explored and putting it the queue at the back, we also compute its distance. And its distance is just going to be one more than the distance of the vertex V responsible for W's addition to the queue, responsible for first discovering this vertex W. So returning to our running example of breadth first search, let's see what happens. So again, remember the way this worked is we start out with uh, from the vertex S 
and we set the distance you know, in our initialization equal to zero, we don't know what the distance is of anything else. So then, how did breadth of a search work? So we, in the initial step, we put S in the queue, we go to the main while loop, and then the queue's not empty, we extract S from the queue, we look at its neighbors, those neighbors are A and B, we handle them in some order. Let's again think of that we first handle the edge between S and A. So then what do we do? We say we haven't seen A yet, so we mark A as explored, we put A in the queue at the front, and now we have this extra step. It's the first time we're seeing A, so we want to compute its distance, and we compute its distance as one more than the vertex responsible for discovering A. And so in this case, S was the vertex whose exploration unveiled the existence of the vertex A to us. S's distance is zero, so we set A's distance to one. Okay? And that's tantamount to being a member of the ith layer. So what happens in the next iteration of the while loop? So now the queue contains, uh, sorry, in the next iteration of the for loop, excuse me. So after we've handled the edge S comma A, we're still dealing with S's edges. Now we handle the edge S comma B. We put, this is the first time we've seen B, we put B at the end of the queue, we mark it as explored, and then we also execute this new step. We set B's distance to one more than the vertex responsible for discovering it. That would again be the vertex S, S led to B's discovery, and so we set B's distance to be one more than S's distance, also known as one. And that corresponds to being the other node in layer one. Now, having handled all of S's adjacent arcs, we go back to the while loop. We ask if the queue is empty. Certainly not. It contains two vertices, first A, then B. We extract the first vertex, because it's FIFO. That would be the vertex A. Now we look at A's incident edges. There's S comma A, which we ignore. There's A comma C. This is the first time we've seen C. So as before, we mark C as explored. We add C to the end of the queue, and now again we have this additional line. We set C's distance to be one more than the vertex responsible for its discovery. In this case, it's A that first discovered C. So we're going to set C's distance to be one more than A's distance, also known as 2. So then having handled A, we move on to the next vertex in the queue, which in this case is B. Again, we can forget about the edge between S and B. We've already seen S. We can forget about the edge between B and C. We've already seen C. But D is now discovered for the first time via B. It gets marked as explored. It goes to the end of the queue. And its distance is set equal to one more than B's distance, which is 2. So then we deal with C. Again, it has four arcs, four edges. Three of them are irrelevant. The one to E is not irrelevant, because this is the first time we've seen E. So E's distance is computed as one more than C, because C was the one who first found E. And so E gets a distance of 3. And then the rest of the algorithm proceeds as before. And you will notice that the labelings, the shortest path labels, are exactly the layers as promised. I hope you find it very easy to believe at this point that that claim is true in general. That the distance computed by breadth first search for an arbitrary vertex V that's reachable from S, uh, is, that's going to be equal to I if and only if V is in the ith layer, as we've been defining it previously. And what does it really mean to be in the ith layer? It means that the shortest path distance between V and S has I hops, I edges. So I don't want to spend time giving a super rigorous proof of this claim, but let me just sort of give you, you know, the gist, the basic idea, and I encourage you to, to produce a formal proof at home if that's something that interests you. So one way to do it is you can do it by induction on the layer I. And so what you want to prove is that all of the nodes that belong to a given layer I do indeed, the best for a search does indeed compute uh, the distance of I for them. So what does it mean to be a node in layer I? Well, first of all, you can't have been seen in either of the, any of the previous layers. You weren't a member of layers 0 through I minus 1. And furthermore, you're a neighbor of somebody who's in layer I minus 1. Right? You're seen for the first time once all of the layer I minus 1 nodes are processed. So the inductive hypothesis tells you that distances were correctly computed for everybody from the lower from the lower layers. So in particular, whoever this node V was from layer I minus 1, who is responsible for discovering you in layer I, it has a distance computed as I minus 1. Yours is assigned to be one more than its, namely I. So that pushes through the inductive step. Everything in layer I indeed gets the correct label uh, of a shortest path distance of I away from S. So before we wrap up with this application, I do want to emphasize it is only breadth first search that gives us this guarantee of shortest paths. So we had a wide family of graph search strategies, all of which find everything findable 
Breath First Search is one of those, but this is a special additional property that Breath First Search has. You get shortest path distances from it. So in particular, Depth First Search does not in general compute shortest path distances. This is really a special property of Breath First Search. By contrast, in this next application, which is going to be computing the connected components of an undirected graph, this is not really fundamental to Breath First Search. For example, you could use Depth First Search in here instead, and that would work just as well. So what's the problem? Well, so I did say most of the stuff about graph search, it really doesn't matter, undirected or directed. It's pretty much co cosmetic changes. But the big exception is when you're computing connectivity, when you're computing the pieces of a graph. So right now, I'm only going to talk about undirected graphs. The directed case, we can again get a very efficient algorithms for it, but it's quite a bit harder work. So that's going to be covered in detail in a separate video. So for now, focus just on an undirected graph, G. And we're certainly not going to assume that G is connected. Indeed, part of the point here is to figure out whether or not it's connected, i.e. in one piece. So maybe the graph looks like this. So for example, maybe the graph has 10 vertices and looks like this on the right. And intuitively, especially given that I've drawn it in such a clean way, it's clear that this graph has three pieces. And those are the things that we want to call the connected components. But we do want a somewhat more formal definition, something which is actually, you know, in math that we could say is true or false about a given graph. And roughly, we define the connected components of an undirected graph as the maximal regions f that are connected, in the sense you can get from any vertex in the region from any other vertex in the region using a path. So maximal connected regions in that sense. Now, the slick way to do this is using an equivalence relation. And I'm going to do this here in part because it's really the right way to think about the directed graph case, which we'll talk about in some detail later. So for undirected graphs, so this isn't super important, but let me go ahead and state the, the formal definition just for completeness about what is a, a connected component. What do I mean by a maximal uh, region that's, that's uh, mutually connected? So a good formal definition is as the equivalence classes of the relation on vertices, where which we define by u being related to v, if and only if there's a path between u and v in the graph g. So I'll leave it for you to do the simple check that this squiggle is indeed an equivalence relation. Let me remind you what equivalence relations are. This is something you generally learn in your first class on proofs or your first class in discrete math. Uh, so it's just something which may or may not be true about pairs of objects. And to be an equivalence relation, you have to satisfy three properties. So first, you have to be reflexive, meaning any, everything has to be related to itself. And indeed, in a graph, there is a path from any node to itself, namely the empty path. So also, equivalence relations have to be symmetric, meaning if u and v are related, then v and u are related. Because this is an undirected graph, it's clear that this is symmetric. If there's a path from u to v in the graph, there's also a path from v to u, so no problem there. Finally, equivalence class has got to be transitive. So that means if uh, u and v are related, and so are v and w, then so are u and w. That is, if u and v have a path, v and w have a path, then so does u and w. And you can prove transitivity just by pasting the two paths together. And so the upshot is, when you want to say something like the maximal subset of something where everything is the same, the right way to make that mathematical is using equivalence relations. So over in this blue graph, we want to say 1, 3, 5, 7, and 9 are sort of all the same in the sense that they're mutually connected. And so that's exactly what this relation is making precise. All five of those nodes are related to each other. 2 and 4 are related to each other. 6, 8, and 10, all pairs of them are related to each other. So the equivalence, so equivalence relations always have equivalence classes, the maximal mutually related stuff. And in this graph context, that's exactly these connected components. It's exactly what you want. So what I want to show you is that you can use a breadth first search wrapped in an outer for loop over all of the vertices to compute, to identify all of the connected components of a graph in time linear in the graph, in O of n plus m time. Now, you might be wondering, you know, why do you want to do that? Well, there's a lot of reasons. So an obvious one, which is relevant for physical networks, is to check if a network has uh, broken into two pieces. So certainly, if you're an internet service provider, you want to make sure that uh, from any point in your network, you can reach any other point in the network. And that boils down to just understanding whether the graph that represents your network is a connected graph, that is, if it's in one piece or if it's not in one piece. So obviously, you can ask this same question about recreational examples. So if you return to the movie graph, maybe you're wondering, can you get from every single actor in the IMDb database to Kevin Bacon? Or are there actors for which you cannot reach Kevin Bacon via a sequence of edges, a sequence of movies, uh, 
in which two actors have both played a role. So that's something that boils down to a connectivity computation. If you have network data and you want to display it, you want to visualize it and show it to a group of people so that they can interpret it, obviously one thing you want to do is you want to know if there's multiple pieces and then you want to display the different pieces separately. So let me mention one probably a little less obvious application of undirected connectivity, which is it gives a nice quick and dirty uh, heuristic for doing clustering if you have uh, pairwise information about objects. So let me, be a little, let me be a little more concrete. Suppose you have a set of objects that you really care about. So this could be a set of documents, maybe web pages that you crawled, something like that. It could be a set of images, either your own or drawn from some database. Or it could be, for example, a set of genomes. Suppose further that you have a pairwise function, okay, which for each pair of objects tells you whether they're very much like each other or very much different. And so let's suppose that if two objects are very similar to each other, like they're two web pages that are almost the same, or they're two genomes where you can get from one to the other with a small number of mutations, then they have a low score. Okay, so low numbers close to zero indicates that the objects are very similar to each other. High numbers, let's say, you know, they could go up to even a thousand or something, indicate that they're very different objects. Two web pages that have nothing to do with each other, two genomes for totally unrelated parts, or two images that seem to be of, you know, completely different people or even completely different objects. Now here's a graph you can construct using these objects and the similarity data that you have about them. So you can have a graph where the nodes are the objects. Okay, so for each pix for each image, for each document, whatever, you have a single node. And then for a given pair of nodes, you put in an edge if and only if the two objects are very similar. So for example, you could put in an edge between two objects if and only if the score is at most 10. So remember, the more similar two objects are, the closer their score is to zero. So you're going to get an edge between very similar documents, very similar genomes, very similar images. Now, in this graph you've constructed, you can find the connected components. So each of these connected components will be a group of objects, which more or less are all very similar to each other. So this will be a cluster of closely related objects in your database. And you can imagine a, not, a lot of reasons why, given a large set of unstructured data, just a bunch of pictures, a bunch of documents, or whatever, you might want to find clusters of highly related uh, objects. So we'll probably see more sophisticated heuristics for clustering in some SQL course, but already undirected connectivity gives you a super fast, linear time, uh, quick and dirty heuristic for identifying clusters uh, of similar objects, giving pairwise data about similarity. So that's some reasons you might want to do it. Now let's uh, actually talk about how to compute the connected components in linear time using just a simple for loop and breadth first search as its uh, inner workhorse. Here's the code to compute all the connected components of an undirected graph. So first we initialize all nodes as being unexplored. I'm also going to assume that the nodes have names. Let's say their names are from 1 to n. So these names could just be uh, the position in the node array that these nodes occupy. So there's going to be an outer for loop which walks through the nodes in an arbitrary order, let's say from 1 to n. This outer for loop is to ensure that every single node of the graph will be inspected for sure at some point in the algorithm. Now again, one of our maxims is that we should never do redundant work. So before we start exploring from some node, we check if they've already been there. And if we haven't seen i before, then we invoke the breadth first search subroutine we were talking about previously in the lecture in the graph g starting from the node i. So to make sure this is clear, let's just run this algorithm on this uh, blue graph to the right. So we start in the outer for loop and we set i equal to 1 and we say have we explored node number 1 yet? And of course not, we haven't explored anything yet. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going we're to invoke BFS on node number 1 here. So now we start running the usual breadth first search subroutine starting from this node 1. And so we explore, you know, layer one here is going to be nodes three and five, so we explore them in some order. For example, maybe node number three is what we explore second, then node number five is what we explore third. And then the second layer in this component is going to be the nodes seven and nine. So we'll explore them in some order as well, let's say seven first, followed by nine. So after this BFS initiated from node number one completes, of course it will have found everything that it could possibly find, namely the five nodes in the same connected component as node number one, and of course all of the five of these nodes will be marked as explored. So now we return, once that exits, we return to the outer for loop, we increment i, we go to i equal two, and we say, oh, we already explored node number two. No, we have not. And so now we invoke BFS again from node number two, 
So that'll be the sixth node we explore. There's not much to do from two. All we can do is go to node number four. So that's the seventh node we explore. That BFS terminates, uh, finding the nodes in this connected component. Then we go back to the outer for loop. We increment i to three. We say, ah, oh, have we already seen node number three? Yes, we have. We saw that in the first breadth first search. So we certainly don't bother to BFS from node three. Then we increment i to four. Have we seen four? Yes, we have. In the second call to BFS. Have we seen node five? Yes, we have. In the first call to BFS. Have we seen node six? No, we have not. So the final invocation of breadth first search begins from node number six. That's going to be the eighth node overall that we see. And then we're going to see the nodes eight and ten in some order. So for example, maybe we first explore node number eight. That's, a nut, that's one of the first layer in this component. And then node number ten is the other node of the first layer in this component. So in general, what's going on? Well, what we know about what we know what will happen when we invoke breadth first search from a given node i, we're going to discover exactly the nodes in i's connected component, right? Anything uh, where there's a path from i to that node, we'll find it. That's the BFS guarantee. That's also the definition of a connected component. All the other nodes which have a path uh, to to i. Another thing that I hope was clear from the example, but you know, just to just to reiterate it is. Every birth for search call, when you explore a node, you remember that through the entire for loop, right? So when we invoke breadth for search from node number one, we explore nodes one, three, five, seven, and nine, and we keep those marked as explored for the rest of this uh, for the rest of this algorithm, right? So that's so that we don't do redundant work when we get to l uh, later stages of the for loop. So as far as what does this algorithm accomplish? Well, it certainly finds every connected component. Right? There is absolutely no way it can miss a node because this for loop literally walks through the nodes, all of them, one at a time. Okay? So you're not going to miss a node. Moreover, we know that you know, as soon as you hit a connected component for the first time uh, and you do breadth first search from that node, you're going to find the whole thing. That's the breadth first search guarantee. As far as what's the running time, well, it's going to be exactly what we want. It's going to be linear time, which again means proportional to the number of edges plus the number of vertices. And again, depending on the graph, one of these might be bigger than the other. So why is it O of M plus N? Well, as far as the nodes, we have to do this initialization there where we mark them all as unexplored. So that takes constant time per node. Uh, we have just the basic overhead of a for loop. So that's constant time uh, per node. And then we have this check constant time per node. So that's O of N. And then recall, we proved that within breadth first search, you do a uh, amount of work proportional. You do constant time for each node in that connected component. Now, each of the nodes of the graph is in exactly one of the connected components. So you'll do constant time for each node in the BFS in which you discover that node. So that's, again, O of N over all of the connected components. And as far as the edges, no, we don't even bother to look at edges until we're inside one of these breadth first search calls. They play no role in the outer for loop or in the pre-processing. And remember what we proved about an invocation of breadth first search, the running time, you only do constant amount of work per edge in the connected component that you're exploring. In the worst case, you look at an edge once from either endpoint, and each of that triggers a constant amount of work. So when you discover a given connected component, the edge work is proportional to the number of edges in that connected component. Each edge of the graph is only is in exactly one of the connected components. So over this entire for loop, over all of these BFS calls, for each edge of the graph, you'll only uh, be responsible for a constant amount of work of the algorithm. So summarizing, because breadth first search from a given starting node does works in time proportional to the size of that component, piggybacking on that subroutine and looping over all of the nodes of the graph, we find all of the connected components in time proportional to the number of edges and nodes in the entire graph. Let's explore our second strategy for graph search, namely depth first search. And uh, again, like with breadth first search, I'll open by just reminding you what uh, depth first search is good for. And uh, we'll trace through it in a particular example, and then we'll tell you what the actual code is. So if breadth first search is the cautious and tentative exploration strategy, then depth first search, or DFS for short, is its more aggressive cousin. So the plan is to explore aggressively and only backtrack when necessary. And this is very much the strategy one often uses <coughs> when trying to solve a maze. To explain what I mean, let me show you how this would work in uh, the same running example we used when we discussed breadth first search. So here if we invoke depth first search from the node number s, here's what's going to happen. So obviously we start at s, and obviously there's two places where we can go next. We can go to a or, or to b. And uh, depth first search is underdetermined, like breadth first search, we can pick either one. So like with the breadth first search example, let's go to a first. So A will be the second one that we explore. 
But now, unlike breadth first search, where we automatically went to node B next, since that was the other layer one node, here the only rule is that we have to go next to one of A's immediate neighbors. So we might go to B, but we're not going to B because it's one of the neighbors of S. We go because it's one of the neighbors of A. And actually, to make sure the difference is clear, let's assume that we aggressively pursue deeper and we go from A to C. And now the depth first search strategy is again just to pursue deeper, so you go to one of C's immediate neighbors. So maybe we go to E next. So E is going to be the fourth one visited. Now from E, there's only one neighbor, not counting the one that we came in on. So from E, we go to D, and D is the fifth one we see. Now from D, we have a choice. We could either go to B or we could go to C. So let's suppose we go to C from D. Well, then we get to a node number three where we've been before. Okay, and as usual, we're going to keep track of where we've already been. So at this point, we have to backtrack from C back to D. We retreat to D. Now, there's still another outgoing edge from D to explore, namely the one to B. And so what happens is we actually wind up wrapping all the way around this outer cycle, and we hit B sixth. And now, of course, anywhere we try to explore, we see somewhere we've already been. So from B, we try to go to S, but we've been there, so we retreat to B. We, try, we can try to go to A, but we've been there, so we retreat to B. Now we've explored all of the options out of B. So we have to retreat from B, we have to go back to D. Now from D, we've explored both B and C, so we have to retreat back to E. E, we've explored the only outgoing arc D, so we have to retreat to C. C, we retreat to A. From A, we actually haven't yet looked along this arc, but that just sends us to B, where we've been before. So then we retreat back to A. Finally, we retreat back to S. And S, even at S, there's still an extra edge to explore. At S, we say, oh, we haven't tried this SB edge yet. But of course, when we look across, we get to B where we've been before, and then we backtrack to S. Then we've looked at every edge once, and so we stop. So that's how depth first search works. You just pursue your path. You go to an immediate neighbor as long as you can until you hit somewhere you've been before, and then you retreat. So you might be wondering, you know, why bother with another graph search strategy? After all, we have breadth first search, which seemed pretty awesome, right? It runs in linear time. It's guaranteed to find everything you might want to find. It uh, computes shortest paths. It computes connected components if you embed it in a for loop. Kind of seems like what else would you want? Well, it turns out depth first search is going to have its own impressive catalog of applications, which you can't necessarily replicate with breadth first search. And I'm going to focus on applications in directed graphs. So there's going to be a simple one that we discuss in this video, and then there's going to be a more complicated one that has a separate video devoted to it. So in this video, we're going to be discussing computing topological orderings of directed acyclic graphs, that is, directed graphs that have no directed cycle. The more complicated application is computing strongly connected components in directed graphs. The runtime will be essentially the same as it was for breadth first search, and the best we could hope for, which is linear time. And again, uh, we're not assuming that, the, that there's necessarily that many edges. There may be much fewer edges than vertices. So linear time in these connectivity applications means O of M plus N. So let's now talk about the actual code of depth first search. There's a couple ways to do it. One way to do it is to just make some minor modifications to the code for breadth first search. The primary difference being instead of using a queue and its first in first out behavior, you swap in a stack with its last in first out behavior. Again, if you don't know what a stack is, you should read about that in the programming textbook or, or on the web. It's something that supports constant time insertions to the front and constant time deletions uh, from the front, unlike a queue, which is meant to support constant time deletions to the back. Okay, so stack, it operates just like those cafeteria trays that you know where you put in a tray, and the last one that got pushed in, when you take the first one out, that's the last one that got put in. So these are called push and pop. In a stack context, both are constant time. So if you swap out the queue, you swap in the stack, make a couple other uh, minor modifications, breadth first search turns into depth first search. For the sake of both variety and elegance, I'm instead going to show you a recursive version. So depth first search is very naturally phrased as a recursive algorithm, and that's what we'll discuss here. So depth first search, of course, takes as input a graph G, and again, it could be undirected or directed, it doesn't matter, just with a directed graph, be sure that you only follow arcs in the appropriate direction, which should be automatically handled in the adjacency lists of your graph data structure anyways. So as always, we keep a Boolean local to each vertex of the graph, remembering whether we've start we've been there before or not. And of course, as soon as we start exploring from S, we better make a note that uh, now we have been there. We better plant a flag, as it were. And remember, depth first search is an aggressive search. So we immediately try to recursively search from any of S's neighbors that we haven't already been to. And if we find such a vertex, if we find uh, somewhere we've never been, 
we recursively call depth first search uh, from that node. The basic guarantees of depth first search are exactly the same as they were for breadth first search. We find everything we could possibly hope to find, and we do it in linear time. And once again, the reason is this is simply a special case of the generic search procedure that we started this sequence of videos about. So it just corresponds to a particular way of choosing amongst multiple crossing edges between the region of explored nodes and the region of unexplored nodes, essentially always being biased toward the most recently discovered explored nodes. And just like breadth first search, the running time is going to be proportional to the size of the component that you're discovering. And the basic reason is that each node is looked at only once, right? This uh, Boolean makes sure that we don't ever explore a node more than once. And then for each edge, we look at it at most twice, once from each, each endpoint. And given that these exact same two claims hold for depth first search as for breadth first search, that means if we wanted to compute connected components in an undirected graph, we could equally well use an outer for loop with depth first search as our workhorse in the inner loop. It wouldn't matter. Either of those for undirected graphs, depth first search, breadth first search, is going to find all the connected components in O of m plus n time, in linear time. So instead, I want to focus on an application particular to depth first search, and this is about finding a topological ordering of a directed acyclic graph. So let me begin by telling you what a topological ordering of a directed graph is. Essentially, it's an ordering of the vertices of the graph so that all of the arcs, the directed edges of the graph, only go forward in the ordering. So let me encode an ordering by a labeling of the vertices with the numbers 1 through n. This is just to encode the position of each vertex in this ordering. So formally, there's going to be a function which takes vertices of g and maps them to integers between 1 and n. Each of the numbers 1 through n should be taken on by exactly one vertex. Here n is the number of vertices of g. So that's just a way to encode an ordering. And then here's really the important property, that every directed edge of g goes forward in the ordering. That is, if u v is a directed edge of the directed graph g, then it should be that the f value of the tail is less than the f value of the head. That is, this directed edge has a higher f value as you, as you traverse it in the correct direction. Let me give you an example just to make this more clear. So suppose we have uh, this very simple directed graph with four vertices. Let me show you two different totally legitimate topological orderings of this graph. So the first thing you could do is you could label S1, V2, W3, and T4. Another option would be to label them the same way, except you can swap the labels of V and W. So if you want, you can label V3 and W2. So again, what these labelings are really meant to encode is an ordering of the vertices. So the blue labeling you can think of as encoding the ordering in which we put S first, then V, then W, and then T, whereas the green labeling can be thought of as the same ordering of the nodes except with W coming before V. What's important is that the pattern of the edges is exactly the same in both cases, and in particular all of the edges go forward in this ordering. So in either case, we have S with edges from S to V and S to W. So that looks the same way pictorially, whichever order V and W are in. And then symmetrically, there are edges from V and W to T. So you'll notice that no matter which order we put V and W in, all four of these edges go forward in each of these orderings. Now, if you tried to put V before S, it wouldn't work because the edge from S to V would be going backward if V preceded S. Similarly, if you put T anywhere other than the final position, you would not have a topological ordering. So in fact, these are the only two topological orderings of this directed graph. I encourage you to convince yourself of that. Now, who cares about topological orderings? Well, this is actually a, a very useful subroutine. Uh, this has been come up in all kinds of applications. Really, whenever you want to sequence a bunch of tasks, when there's precedence constraints among them. By precedence constraint, I mean one task has to be finished before another. You can think, for example, about the courses in some kind of undergraduate major, like a computer science major. Here, the vertices are going to correspond to all of the courses, and there's a directed edge from course A to course B if course A is a prerequisite for course B, if you have to take it first. So then, of course, you'd like to know a sequence in which you can take these courses so that you always take a course after you've taken its prerequisites, and that's exactly what a topological ordering will accomplish. So it's reasonable to ask the question, when does a directed graph have a topo topological ordering? 
And when a graph does have such an ordering, how do we get our grubby little hands on it? Well, there's a very clear necessary condition for a graph to have a topological ordering, which is it had better be acyclic. Put differently, if a directed graph has a directed cycle, then there's certainly no way there's going to be a topological ordering. So I hope the reason for this is fairly clear. Consider any directed graph which does have a directed cycle and consider any purported way of ordering the vertices. Well, now just traverse the edges of the cycle one by one. So you start somewhere on the cycle and if the first edge goes backward, well, you're already screwed. You already know that this ordering is not topological. No edges can go backward. So evidently the first edge of this cycle has to go forward. But now you have to traverse the rest of the edges on this cycle and eventually you come back to where you started. So if you started out by going forward, at some point you have to go backward. So that edge goes backward in the ordering, violating the property of a topological ordering. That's true for every ordering, so directed cycles exclude the possibility of topological orderings. Now the question is, well what if you don't have a cycle? Is that a strong enough condition that you're guaranteed to have a topological ordering? Is the only obstruction to sequencing jobs without conflicts the obvious one of having circular precedence constraints? So it turns out not only is the answer yes, if, as long as you don't have any directed cycles, you're guaranteed a topological ordering, but we can even compute one in linear time, no less, via depth-first search. So before I show you the super slick and super efficient reduction of computing topological orderings to depth-first search, let me first go over a pretty good but slightly less slick and slightly less efficient uh, solution to help build up your intuition about directed acyclic graphs and their topological orderings. So for the straightforward solution, we're going to begin with a simple observation. Every directed acyclic graph has what I'm going to call a sync vertex. That is a vertex without any outgoing arcs. So in the four node directed acyclic graph we were exploring on the last slide, there is exactly one source vertex, and that's, excuse me, sync vertex. That's this rightmost vertex here, right? That has no outgoing arcs. The other three vertices all have at least one outgoing arc. Now why is it the case that a directed acyclic graph has to have a sync vertex, well, suppose it didn't. Suppose it had no sync vertex. That would mean every single vertex has at least one outgoing arc. So what could we do if every vertex has one outgoing arc? Well, we could start in an arbitrary node. We know it's not a sync vertex because we're assuming there aren't any. So there's an outgoing arc, so let's follow it. We get to some other node. By assumption, there's no sync vertex, so this isn't a sync vertex. So there's an outgoing arc, so let's follow it. We get to some other node. That also has an outgoing arc. Let's follow that and so on. So we just keep following outgoing arcs. And we do this as long as we want because every vertex has at least one outgoing arc. Well, there's a finite number of vertices, right? This graph has, say, n vertices. So if we follow n arcs, we're going to see n plus 1 vertices. So by the pigeonhole principle, we're going to have to see a repeat, right? So if n plus 1 vertices, there's only n distinct vertices, we're going to see some vertex twice. So for example, maybe after I take the outgoing arc from this vertex, I get back to this one that I saw previously. Well, what have we done? What happens when we get a repeated vertex? By tracing these outgoing arcs and repeating a vertex, we have exhibited a directed cycle. And that's exactly what we're assuming doesn't exist. We're talking about directed acyclic graphs. So put differently, we just proved that a vertex with no sync vertex has to have a directed cycle. So a directed acyclic graph, therefore, has to have at least one sync vertex. So here's how we use this very simple observation now to compute a topological ordering of a directed acyclic graph. Well, let's do a little thought experiment. Suppose, in fact, this graph did have a topological ordering. Let's think about the vertex which goes last in this topological ordering. Remember, any arc which goes backward in the ordering is a violation. So we have to avoid that. We have to make sure every arc goes forward in the ordering. Now, any vertex which has an outgoing arc, we better put somewhere other than in the final position. Right? So if the node that we put in the final position, all of its arcs are going to wind up, all of its outgoing arcs are going to wind up going backward in the topological ordering. There's nowhere else they can go. This vertex is last. So in other words, if we plan to successfully compute a topological ordering, the only candidate vertices for that final position in the ordering are the sync vertices. That's all that's going to work. We put a non-sync vertex there, we're toast. It's not going to happen. 
Fortunately, if it's directed acyclic, we know there is a sync vertex. So let V be a sync vertex of G. If there's many sync vertices, we pick one arbitrarily. We set V's label to be the maximum possible. So if there's n vertices, we're going to put that in the nth position. And now we just recurse on the rest of the graph, which has only n minus 1 vertices. So how would this work in the example on the right? Well, in the first iteration, or the first outermost recursive call, the only, the only sync vertex is this rightmost one circled in green. So there's four vertices, so we're going to give that the label 4. So then having labeled that 4, we delete that vertex and all the edges incident to it, and we recurse on what's left of the graph. So that would be the leftmost three vertices plus the leftmost two edges. Now, this graph has two sync vertices after we've deleted four and everything from it. So both this top vertex and this bottom vertex are sinks in the residual graph. So now in the next uh, recursive call, we can choose either of those as our sync vertex. Uh, because we have two choices, that generates two topological orderings. Those are exactly the ones that we saw in the example. But if, for example, we choose this one to be our sync vertex, then that gets the label 3. Then we recurse just on the northwesternmost two edges. This vertex is the unique sync in that graph. That gets the label 2. And then we recurse on the one-node graph, and that gets the label 1. So why does this algorithm work? Well, there's, there's just two quick observations we need. So first of all, we need to argue that it makes sense that in every iteration or in every recursive call, we can indeed find a sync vertex that we can assign in the final position that's uh, still unfilled. And the reason for that is just if you take a directed acyclic graph and you delete one or more vertices from it, you're still going to have a directed acyclic graph, right? You can't create cycles by just getting rid of stuff. You can only destroy cycles. And we started with no cycles, so through all the intermediate recursive calls, we have no cycles. By our first observation, there's always a sync. So the second thing we have to argue is that we really do produce a topological ordering. So remember what that means. That means for every edge of the graph, it goes forward in the ordering. That is, the head of the arc is given a position later than the tail of the arc. And this simply follows because we always use sync vertices. So consider the vertex V, which is assigned to the position I. This means then that when we're down to a graph that has only I vertices remaining, V is a sync vertex. So if, I is a, if V is a sync vertex for on, when only the first I vertices remain, what property does it have in the original graph? Well, it means all of the outgoing arcs that it has have to go to vertices that were already deleted and assigned higher positions. So for every vertex, by the time it actually gets assigned a position, it's a sync, and it only has incoming arcs from the as yet unsigned vertices. Its outgoing arcs all go forward to vertices that were already assigned higher positions and got deleted previously from the graph. So now we have under our belt a pretty reasonable solution for computing a topological ordering of a directed acyclic graph. In particular, remember we observed that if a graph does have a directed cycle, then of course there's no way there's a topological ordering. However you order the vertices, some edge of the cycle is going to have to go backward. And the solution on the previous slide shows that as long as you don't have a cycle, it guarantees a topological ordering does indeed exist. And in fact, it's a constructive proof, a constructive argument that gives an algorithm. What you do is you just keep plucking off sinks, sink vertices one at a time, and populating the ordering from right to left as you keep uh, peeling off these sinks. So that's a pretty good algorithm. It's not too slow. And actually, if you implement it just so, you can even get it to run in linear time. But I want to conclude this video with an application of depth-first search, which is a very slick, very efficient computation of a topological ordering of a directed acyclic graph. So we're just going to make two really quite minor modifications to our previous depth-first search uh, subroutine. The first thing is we have to embed it in a for loop just like we did with breadth-first search when we were computing the connected components of an undirected graph. That's because in computing a topological ordering, we better give every single vertex a label. We better look at every vertex at least once. So to do that, we'll just make sure there's an outer for loop. And then if we have multiple components, we'll just make sure to invoke DFS as often as we need to. The second thing we'll do is we'll add a little bit of bookkeeping, and this will make sure that every uh, node gets a label. And in fact, these labels will define a topological ordering. So let's not forget the code for depth first search. This is where you're given a graph G. In this case, we're interested in a directed acyclic graph, and you're given a start vertex S. And what you do is you, as soon as you get to S, you very aggressively start trying to explore its neighbors. Of course, you don't visit any vertex you've already been to. You keep track of who you visited. 
And if you find any vertex that you haven't seen before, you immediately start recursing on that node. So I said the first modification we need is to embed this into uh, outer for loop to ensure that every single node gets labeled. So I'm going to call that subroutine DFS dash loop. It does not take a start vertex. Initialization, all nodes start out unexplored, of course. And we're also going to keep track of a global variable, which I'll call current label. This is going to be initialized to n, and we're going to count down each time we finish exploring a new node. And these will be precisely the f values. These will be exactly the positions of the vertices uh, in the topological ordering that we output. In the, main, in the main loop, we're going to iterate over all of the nodes of the graph. So for example, we just do a scan through the node array. As usual, we don't want to do any work twice. So for a ver if a vertex has already been explored in some previous invocation of DFS, we don't, we don't search from it. This should all be familiar from our embedding of breadth-first search in a for loop when we computed the connected components of an undirected graph. And if we get to a vertex V of the graph that we haven't explored yet, then we just invoke DFS in the graph with that vertex as the starting point. So the final thing I need to add is I need to tell you what the F values are, what the actual assignments of vertices to positions are. And as I foreshadowed, we're going to use this global current label variable, and uh, that'll have us assign vertices to positions from right to the left, very much mimicking what was going on in our recursive solution where we plucked off sync vertices one at a time. So when's the right time to assign a vertex its position? Well, it turns out the right time is when we completely finished with that vertex. So we're about to pop the recursive call from the stack corresponding to that vertex. So after we've gone through the for loop of all the edges outgoing from a given vertex, we set f of s equal to whatever the current label is, and then we decrement the current label. And that's it. That is the entire algorithm. So the claim is going to be that the f values produced, which you'll notice are going to be the integers between n through 1, because DFS will be called eventually once on every vertex, and it will get some integer assignment at the end, and everybody's going to get a distinct value, and the largest one is n and the smallest one is 1. The claim is that is a topological ordering. Clearly, this algorithm is just as blazingly fast as DFS itself, with just a trivial amount of extra bookkeeping. Let's see how it works on our running example. So let's just say we have this four-node directed graph that we're getting quite used to. So this has four vertices, so we initialize the current label variable to be equal to four. So let's say that in the outer DFS loop, let's say we start somewhere like the vertex V. So notice in this outer for loop, we wind up considering the vertices in a totally arbitrary order. So let's say we first call DFS from this vertex V. So what happens? Well, the only place you can go from V is to T. And then at T, there's nowhere to go. So we recursively call DFS at T. There's no edges to go through. We finish the for loop. And so T is going to be assigned an F value equal to the current label which is n, and here n is the number of vertices, which is 4. So f of t is going to get, sorry, t is going to get the assignment, the label, 4. So then now we're done with t, we backtrack back to v. We decrement the current label as we finish up with t. We get to v, and now there's no more outgoing arcs to explore, so it four loops finish. So we're done with it with in-depth first search. So it gets what's the new current label, which is now 3. And again, having finished with V, we decrement the current label, which is now down to 2. So now we go back to the outer for loop. Maybe the next vertex we consider is the vertex T, but we've already been there, so we won't, don't bother to DFS on T. And then maybe after that, we try it on S. So maybe S is the third vertex that the for loop considers. We haven't seen S yet, so we invoke DFS starting from the vertex S. From S, there's two arcs to explore, the one with V, V we've already seen, so nothing's going to happen with the arc SV. But on the other hand, the arc SW will cause us to recursively call DFS on W. From W, we try to look at the arc from W to T, but we've already been to T, so we don't do anything. That finishes up with W, so depth first search then finishes up at the vertex W. W gets the assignment of the current label, so F of W equals 2. We decrement current label. Now its value is 1. Now we backtrack to S. We've already considered all of S's outgoing arcs, so we're done with S. It gets the current label, which is 1. And this is indeed one of the two topological orderings of this graph that we exhibited a couple slides ago. So that's the full description of the algorithm and how it works in a concrete example. Let's just discuss what are its uh, key properties, its running time, and its correctness. So as far as the running time, 
of this algorithm, the running time is linear. It's exactly what you'd want it to be. And the reason the running time is linear is for the usual reasons that uh, these graph search algorithms have run in linear time. You're explicitly keeping track of which nodes you've been to so that you don't visit them twice. So you only do a constant amount of work for each of the end nodes. And each edge, in a directed graph, you actually only look at each edge once when you visit the tail of that edge. So you only do a constant amount of work per edge as well. Of course, the other key property is correctness. That is, we need to show that you all are guaranteed to get a topological ordering. So what does that mean? That means every edge, every arc travels forward in the ordering. So if uv is an edge, then f of u, the label assigned to u in this algorithm is less than the label assigned to v. The proof of correctness splits into two cases, depending on which of the vertices u or v is visited first by depth first search. Because of our for loop, which iterates over all of the vertices of the graph g, Depth first search is going to be invoked exactly once from each of the vertices. Either u or v could be first. Uh, both are possible. So first, let's assume that u is visited by DFS before v. So then what happens? Well, remember what depth first search does. When you invoke it from a node, it's going to find everything findable from that node. So if u is visited before v, that means v isn't yet explored. So it's, uh, it's a candidate for being discovered. Moreover, there's an arc straight from u to v. So certainly DFS invoked at u is going to discover v. Furthermore, the recursive call corresponding to the node v is going to finish, is going to get popped off the program stack before that of u. The easiest way to see this is just to think about the recursive structure of depth first search. So when you call depth first search from u, that recursive call, that's going to make further recursive calls to all of the relevant neighbors, including v. And u's call is not going to get popped off the stack until v's does uh, beforehand. That's because of the last in, first out nature uh, of a stack or of a recursive algorithm. So because v's recursive call finishes before that of u, that means it will be assigned a larger label than u. Remember, the labels keep decreasing as more and more recursive calls get popped off the stack. So that's exactly what we wanted. Now, what's up in the second case, case two? So this is where v is visited before u. And here's where we use the fact that the graph has no cycles. So there's a direct arc from u to v. That means there cannot be any directed path from v all the way back to u. That would create a directed cycle. Therefore, DFS invoked from v is not going to discover u. There's no directed path from v to u. Again, if there was, there'd be a directed cycle. So it doesn't find u at all. So the recursive call of v, again, is going to get popped before u is even pushed onto the stack. So we're totally done with v before we even start to consider u. So therefore, for the same reasons, since v's recursive call finishes first, its label is going to be larger, which is exactly what we wanted to prove. So that concludes the first quite interesting application of depth first search. In the next video, we'll look at an even more interesting one, which computes the strongly connected components of a directed graph. This time, we can't do it in one depth first search. We'll need two. So we've now put in a lot of work designing and analyzing super fast algorithms for reasoning about graphs. So in this optional video, what I want to do is show you why you might want such a primitive, especially for computation on extremely large graphs. Specifically, we're going to look at the results of a famous study that computes the strongly connected components of the web graph. So what is the web graph? Well, it's the graph in which the vertices correspond to web pages. So for example, I have my own web page where I you know, list my research papers and also links to courses such as this one. And the edges are going to be directed, and they correspond precisely to hyperlinks. So the links that bring you from one web page to another. Note, of course, these are directed edges, where the tail is the page that contains the hyperlink, and the head is the page that you go to if you click the hyperlink. And so this is a directed graph. So from my home page, you can get to my papers. You can get to my courses. Sometimes I have random links up to things I like, like, say, my favorite record store. And of course, for many of these web pages, there are additional links going out or going in. So for example, from my papers, I might link to some of my co-authors. Some of my co-authors might be linking from their home pages to me. Or of course, there's web pages out there which list the currently available free online courses, and so on. So obviously, this is just part of a massive web graph, just a tiny, tiny piece of it. 
So the origins of the web were probably around 1990 or so, uh, but it started to really explode in the mid-90s. And by the year 2000, it was sort of already beyond comprehension, even though uh, in Internet years, the year 2000 is sort of the Stone Age uh, relative to right now, relative to 2012. But still, even by 2000, people were so overwhelmed with the massive scale of the web graph, they wanted to understand anything about it, even the most basic things. Now, of course, one issue with understanding what the graph looks like is you don't even have it locally, right? It's distributed over all these different servers over the entire world. So the first thing people really focused on when they wanted to answer this question was on techniques for crawling. So having uh, software which just follows lots of hyperlinks, reports back to the home base, from which you can assemble uh, at least some kind of sketch of what this graph actually is. So, but then the question is, even once you have this crawled information, even if once you've accessed a uh, good chunk of the nodes and the edges of this of this network, what does it look like? So what makes this a difficult question, more difficult than, say, for any other directed graph you might encounter? Well, it's simply the massive scale of the web graph. It's just so big. So for the graph used in the particular study I'm going to discuss, you know, like we said, it was in the year 2000, which was sort of the Stone Age uh, compared to 2012. So the graph was small, relatively, but still the graph was really, really big. So it was something like 200 million nodes and 1 billion edges, really 1.5 billion edges. So the reference for the work I'm going to discuss is a paper by a number of authors. The first author is Andre Broder, and then he has many co-authors. And this was a paper that appeared in the WWW conference of the year 2000. That's the World Wide Web Conference. And I encourage you, those of you who are interested to go track down the, the paper online and, and read the original source. Uh, so Andre Broder, the lead author, at this time he was at a company that was called AltaVista. So how many of you remember a company called AltaVista? Well, some of you, especially you know, the youngest ones among you, maybe have never heard of AltaVista, and the youngest ones among you maybe can't even conceive of a world in which we didn't have Google. Uh, but in fact, there was a time when we had web search, uh, that would, but Google did not yet exist. Uh, that was sort of in the, you know, maybe 97 or so. And um, so this was in the very embryonic years of Google, and this, this data set actually came out of, out of AltaVista instead. So Broder et al. wanted to give some answers to this question, what does the web graph look like? And they approached it in a few ways, but the one I'm going to focus on here is they asked, well, you know, what's the most detailed structure we can get about this web graph uh, without doing an infeasible amount of computation, really just sticking to uh, linear time algorithms uh, at, at the worst? And what have we seen? We've seen that in a directed graph, you can get full connectivity information just really using depth-first search. You can compute strongly connected components in linear time with small constants. And that's one of the major things that they did in this study. Now, if you wanted to do the same computation today, you'd have one thing going against you and one thing going for you. The obvious thing that you'd have going against you is that the web is still very much bigger uh, than it was here, certainly by an order of magnitude. The thing that you'd have going for you is now there's specialized systems which are meant to operate on massive data sets. And in particular, they can do things like compute connectivity information on graph data. So what you have to remember, for those of you who are aware of these terms, in 2000, there was no MapReduce, there was no Hadoop, uh, there were no tools for automated processing of large data sets. These guys really had to do it from scratch. So let me tell you about what Broder et al. found when they did strong con connectivity computations on the web graph. They explained their results in what they called the bow tie picture of the web. So let's begin with the center or the knot of the bow tie. So in the middle we have what we're going to call a giant strongly connected component. With the interpretation being this is the core of the web in some sense. All right, so all of you know what a, an SCC is at this point. A strongly connected component is the region from which you can get from any point to any other point along a directed path. So in the context of the web graph with this giant SCC, what this means is that from any web page inside this blob, you can get to any other web page inside this blob just by traversing a sequence of hyperlinks. And hopefully it doesn't strike you as too surprising that a big chunk of the web is strongly connected, is well connected in this sense. Right, so if you think about all the different universities in the world, you know, probably all of the web pages corresponding to all of the different universities, uh, you can get from any one place to any other place. 
For example, from the home page on which I put my papers, I often include links to my co-authors, which uh, very commonly are at other universities. So that already pr provides a web link from some Stanford page to some page at, say, Berkeley or Cornell or whatever. And of course, I'm just one person. I'm just one of many faculty members at Stanford. So you put all of these together, you would expect all of the different uh, SCCs corresponding to different universities to collapse into a single one, and so on for other uh, sectors as well. And then, of course, if you knew that a huge chunk of the web was in the same strongly connected components, so let's say 10% of the web, which would be tens of millions of web pages, uh, you wouldn't expect there to be a second one, right? It would be super weird if there were two different blobs, 10 million web pages each, that somehow were not mutually reachable from each other. That would just, all, all it takes to collapse two SCCs into one is a lone arc going from one to the other, and then a lone arc in the reverse direction. And then those two SCCs collapse into one. So we do expect a giant SCC, just sort of thinking anecdotally about what the web looks like. And then once we realize there's one giant SCC, we don't expect there to be more than one. All right, so is that the whole story? Is the web graph just one big SCC? Well, one of the perhaps interesting findings of this Rotor et al. paper is that, you know, there is a giant SCC, but it doesn't actually take up the whole web or anything really that close to the entire web. So what else would there be in such a picture? Well, there's the other two ends of the bow tie, which are called the in and the out regions. In the out regions, you have a bunch of strongly connected components, not giant SCCs. We've established there shouldn't be other, any other giant SCCs, but small SCCs, which you can reach from the giant strongly connected component, but from which you cannot go back to the giant strongly connected component. I encourage you to think about what types of websites you would expect to see. Uh, in this out part of the bow tie. I'll give you one example. Very often, if you look at a corporate site, uh, including those of well-known corporations, which you would definitely expect to be reachable from the giant SEC, there is actually a corporate policy that no hyperlinks can go from something in the corporate site to something outside the corporate site. So that means the corporate site is going to be a collection of web pages, which are certainly strongly connected. Because it's a major corporation, you can certainly get there from the giant SCC. But because of this corporate policy, you can't get back out. Symmetrically, in the in part of the bow tie, you have strongly connected components, generally small ones, from which you can reach the giant SCC, but you cannot get to them from the giant SCC. Again, I encourage you to think about all the different types of web pages you might expect to see in this in part of the bow tie. Uh, certainly, I think one really obvious example would be new web pages. So if you just create something, and then you know, if I just created a web page and pointed it to Stanford University, that would immediately be in this in component, or this in collection of components. Now, if you think about it, this does not exhaust all of the possibilities of where nodes can lie. There's a few other cases uh, that, frankly, are pretty weird, but they're there. You can have passive hyperlinks which bypass the giant SCC and go straight from the in part of the bow tie to the out part. So Broder et al. suggested calling these tubes. And then there's also kind of very curious outgrowths going out of the in component, but which don't make it all the way to the giant SCC. And similarly, there's stuff which goes into the out component. And Broder et al. recommended calling these strange creatures tendrils. And then, in fact, you can also just have some weird isolated islands of SCCs that are not connected uh, even weakly to the giant SCC. So this is the picture that emerged from Broder et al.'s strong component computation on the web graph. And here's qualitatively some of the main findings that they came up with. So first of all, that picture on the previous slide, I drew roughly to scale in the sense that all four parts, so the giant SCC, the in part, the out part, and then the residual stuff, the tubes and tendrils, have roughly the same size, you know, more or less 25% of the nodes uh, in the graph. I think this surprised some people. I think some people might have thought that the core that the giant SCC might have been a little bit bigger than just 25 or 28%. But it turns out there's a lot of other stuff outside of this strongly connected core. You might wonder if this is just an artifact of the, this data set being from the Stone Age, being from 2000 or so. But uh, people have rerun this experiment on 
the, on the web graph again in later years. And of course, the numbers are changing because the graph is growing rapidly. But these qualitatively findings, qualitative findings have seemed pretty stable uh, throughout subsequent uh, reevaluations of the structure of the web. On the other hand, while the core of the web is not as big as you might have expected, it's extremely well connected, perhaps better connected than you might have expected. Now, you'd be right to ask the question, you know, what could I mean by unusually well connected? We've already established that this uh, giant core of the web is strongly connected. You can get from any one place to any other place via a sequence of hyperlinks. What else could you want? Well, in fact, it has a very richer notion of connectivity called the small world property. So let me tell you about the small world property, or the phenomenon colloquially known as six degrees of separation. So this is an idea that had been in the air at least since the early 20th century, uh, but really kind of was studied uh, in a major way and popularized by Stanley Milgram, who was a social scientist uh, back in 1967. So Milgram was interested in, in understanding, you know, are people at great distance, in fact, connected by short change of intermediaries. So the way he evaluated this, uh, he ran the following experiment. He gave, uh, he identified a friend in Boston, Massachusetts, a doctor, I believe, and uh, so this was going to be the target. And then he identified a bunch of people uh, who were thought to be far away, both culturally uh, and geographically, uh, specifically Omaha. So for those of you who don't live in the U.S., just take it on faith that many people in the U.S. would regard Boston and, and Omaha as being fairly far apart geographically and otherwise. And uh, what he did is he wrote each of these uh, residents of Omaha the following letter. He said, look, here's the name and address of this doctor who lives in Boston. Okay? Your job is to get this letter to this doctor in Boston. Now, you're not allowed to mail the letter directly to the doctor. Instead, you need to mail it to an intermediary, someone who you know on a first name basis. So, of course, if you knew the doctor on a first name basis, you could mail it straight to them, but that was very unlikely. So, you know, what people would do in Omaha is they'd say, well, you know, I don't know any doctors, or I don't know anyone in Boston, but at least I know somebody in Pittsburgh, and at least that's closer to Boston than Omaha, that's further eastward. Or maybe someone would say, well, I don't really know anyone on the east coast, but at least I do know some doctors here in Omaha, and so they'd give the letter to somebody that they knew on a first name basis in Omaha. And then the situation would repeat. Whoever got the letter, again, they'd be given the same instructions. If you know this doctor in Boston on a first name basis, send them the letter, otherwise pass the letter on to somebody who seems more likely closer to them uh, than you are. Now, of course, many of these letters never reach their destination, but shocking, at least to me, is that a lot of them did. So something like 25% uh, at least of the letters that they started with made it all the way to Boston, which I think says something about people in the late 60s just having more free time on their hands uh, than they do in the early 21st century. I, I find this hard to imagine. But it's a fact. So you had dozens and dozens of letters uh, reaching this doctor in Boston, and they were able to trace exactly which path of individuals the letter went along before it eventually reached this doctor in Boston. And so then what they did is they looked at the distribution of chain lengths. So how many intermediaries were required to get from some random person in Omaha to this doctor in Boston? Some were as few as two, some were as big as nine, but the average number of hops, the average number of intermediaries was in the range of five and a half or six. And so this is what has given rise to the colloquialism, uh, even the name of a popular play, the six degrees of separation. So that's the origin myth. That's where this phrase comes from. Uh, these sort of experiments with physical letters. But now in network science, the small world property is meant to be a network which on the one hand is richly connected, but also in some sense there are enough cues about which links are likely to get closer to some target. So that if you need to route information from point A to point B, not only is there a short path, but if you in some sense follow your nose, then you'll actually exhibit a short path. So in some sense, routing information is easy in small world networks. And this is exactly the, the property that uh, Broder et al. identified within this giant SCC. Very rich with short paths, and if you want to get from point A to point B, just follow your nose and you'll do great. You don't need a very sophisticated shortest path algorithm to find a short path. Some of you may have heard of Stanley Milgram not for this small world experiment, but for another famous or, or maybe infamous experiment he did earlier in the 60s, uh, which consisted into tricking volunteers into thinking they were subjecting other human beings to massive doses of electric shocks. So that wound up you know, causing a rewrite to certain standards of ethics uh, in experimental psychology. You don't hear about that so much when people are talking about networks, but that's another reason uh, why Milgram's work is well known. 
And just as a point of contrast, outside of this giant strongly connected component, which has this rich small world structure, uh, very poor connectivity in the other parts of the web graph. So there's lots of cool research going on these days about the study of information networks like, like the web graph. So I don't want you to get the impression that the in entire interaction between algorithms and thinking about information networks has just been this one strongly connected component, computation in 2000. Of course, there's all kinds of interactions. I just singled one out that was easy to explain and also highly influential and interesting back in the day. But, you know, these days, lots of stuff's going on. People are thinking about uh, information networks in all kinds of different ways, and of course algorithms, like in almost everything, is playing a very fundamental role. So let me just dash off sort of a few examples, uh, maybe to whet your appetite, maybe you want to go explore uh, this topic in greater depth uh, outside of this course. So one super interesting question is, rather than looking at a static snapshot of the web, like we were doing so far in this video, right, the web's changing all the time. New pages are getting created, new links are getting created and destroyed, and so on, and how does this evolution proceed? Can we have a mathematical model which faithfully reproduces uh, the most important first-order properties of this evolutionary process? So a second issue is to think not just about the dynamics of the graph itself, but the dynamics of information that gets carried by the graph. And you could ask this both about the web graph and about other social networks like, say, Facebook or Twitter. Another really important topic, which there's been a lot of work on, but we still don't fully understand by any means, is getting at the finer grain structure in networks, including the web graph. In particular, what we'd really like to do is have foolproof methods for identifying communities. So groups of nodes, these could either be web pages in the web graph or individuals in a social network, which we should think of as grouped together. We discussed this a little bit when we talked about applications of cuts. One motivation for cuts is to identify communities. If you think of communities as being relatively densely connected inside and sparsely connected outside, and that's just a, but that's just a baby step. Really, we need much better techniques for both defining and computing communities in these kinds of networks. So I think these questions are super interesting, both from a mathematical slash technical level, but also they're very timely. Answering them really uh, helps us understand our world better. Uh, unfortunately, these are going to be well outside the course of just the bread and butter design and analysis of algorithms, which is what uh, I'm tasked with covering here. But I will leave you with a reference a book that I recommend if you want to read more about these topics. Namely, the quite recent book by David Easley and John Kleinberg called Networks, Crowds, and Markets. We've arrived at another one of computer science's greatest hits, namely Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. So let me tell you about the problem. It's a problem called single source shortest paths. Basically, what we want to do is compute something like driving directions. So we're given as input a graph. In this lecture, I'm going to work with directed graphs, although the same algorithm would work for undirected graphs with cosmetic changes. As usual, we'll use M to denote the number of edges and N to denote the number of vertices. The input also includes two extra ingredients. First of all, for each edge E, we're given as input a non-negative length, which I'll denote by L sub E. In the context of a driving directions application, L sub E could denote the, the mileage, how long uh, this particular road is, or it could also denote uh, the expected travel time along the edge. The second ingredient is a vertex from which we are looking for paths. This is exactly the same as we had in breadth first search and depth first search. We have an originating vertex, which we'll call here the source. Our responsibility then is to, given this input, compute for every other vertex V in this network the length of a shortest path from the source vertex S to that destination vertex V. And so just to be clear, what is the length of a path that has, say, three edges in it? Well, it's just the sum of the length of the first edge in the path, plus the length of the second edge in the path, plus the length of the third edge in the path. So if you had a path like this with three edges and length one, two, and three, then the length of the path would just be six. And then we define the shortest SV path in the natural way. So amongst all of the paths directed from S to V, each one has its own respective path length. And then the minimum over all SV paths is the shortest path distance uh, in the graph G. So I'm going to make two assumptions for these lectures. Uh, one is really just for convenience. Uh, the other is really important. The other assumption without which Dijkstra's algorithm is not correct, as we'll see. So for convenience, we'll assume that there is a directed path from S to every other vertex V in the graph. 
Otherwise, the shortest path distance is something we define to be plus infinity. And the reason this is not a big assumption is if you think about it, you could detect which vertices are not reachable from S just in a pre-processing step using, say, breadth-first or depth-first search. And then you could delete the irrelevant part of the graph and run Dijkstra's algorithm as we'll describe it on what remains. Alternatively, Dijkstra's algorithm will quite naturally figure out which vertices there are paths to from S and which ones there are not. So this won't really come up. So to keep it simple, just think about we have an input graph where you can get from S to V for every different vertex V. And the challenge then is amongst all the ways to get from S to V, what is the shortest way to do it? So the second assumption already appears in the problem statement, but I want to reiterate it just so it's really clear. When we analyze Dijkstra's algorithm, we always focus on graphs where every length is non-negative. No negative edge lengths are allowed. And we'll see why a little bit later in the, in the video. Now, in the context of a driving directions application, it's natural to ask the question, why would you ever care about negative edge lengths? Until we invent a time machine, it doesn't seem like negative edge lengths are going to be relevant when you're computing literal paths through literal networks. But again, remember that paths can be thought of as more abstractly as a just sequence of decisions. And some of the most powerful applications of shortest paths are coming up with optimal way such sequences. So, for example, maybe you're engaging in financial transactions and you have the option of both buying and selling assets at different times. If you sell, then you get some kind of profit and that would correspond to a negative edge length. So there are quite interesting applications in which negative edge lengths are relevant. If you are dealing with such an application, Dijkstra's algorithm is not the algorithm to use. There's a different shortest path algorithm, a couple other ones, but the most well-known one is called Bellman-Ford. That's something based on dynamic programming, which we may well cover in a SQL course. Okay, so for Dijkstra's algorithm, we always focus on graphs that have only non-negative edge lengths. So with the next quiz, I just want to make sure that you understand the single source shortest path problem. Okay, let me draw for you here a simple Ford node network and ask you for what are the four shortest path lengths. So from the source vertex S to each of the four vertices in the network. All right, so the answer to this quiz is the final option, 0, 1, 3, 6. Uh, to see why that's true, well, uh, all of the options had 0 as the shortest path distance from S to itself, so that just uh, seemed kind of obvious. So the empty path will get you from S to itself uh, and have 0 length. Now suppose you wanted to get from S to V. Well, there's actually only one way to do that. You have to go along this one hop path. So the only path has length one. So the shortest path distance from S to V is one. Now W is more interesting. There's a direct one hop path, SW, that has length four, but that is not the shortest path from S to W. In fact, the two hop path that goes through V as an intermediary has total path length three, which is less than the length of the direct arc from S to W. So therefore, the shortest path distance from S to W is going to be three. And finally, for the vertex T, there's three different paths going from S to T. There's the two-hop path that goes through V. There's the two-hop path which goes through W. Both of those have path length seven. And then there's the three-hop path which goes through both V and W. And that actually has a path length of one plus two plus three equal to six. So despite having the largest number of edges, the zigzag path is in fact the shortest path from S to T, and it has length six. All right, so before I tell you how Dijkstra's algorithm works, I feel like I should justify the existence of this video a little bit, right? Because this is not the first time we've seen shortest paths. You might be thinking, rightfully so, we already know how to compute shortest paths. That was one of the applications of breadth-first search. So the answer to this question is both yes and no. Breadth-first search does indeed compute shortest paths. We had an entire video about that. But it works only in the special case where the length of every edge of the graph is one. At the moment, we're trying to solve a more general problem. We're trying to solve shortest paths when edges can have arbitrary non-negative edge lengths. So for example, in the graph that we'd explored in the previous quiz, if we ran breadth first search starting from the vertex S, it would say that the shortest path distance from S to T is two. And that's because there's a path with two hops going from S to T. Put differently, T is in the second layer emanating from S. But as we saw in the quiz, there is not in fact a shortest two hop path from S to T if you care about the edge lengths. Rather, the, the minimum length path, the shortest path with respect to the edge weights is this three hop path, which has a total length of six. 
So breadth first search is not going to give us what we want when the edge lengths are not all the same. And if you think about an application like driving directions, then needless to say, it's not the case that every edge in the network is the same. Some roads are much longer than others. Some roads will have much larger travel times than others. So we really do need to solve this more general shortest path problem. Similarly, if you're thinking more abstractly about a sequence of decisions like financial transactions, uh, in general, different transactions will have different values. So you really want to solve general shortest paths. You're not in the special case that breadth first search solves. Now, if you're feeling particularly sharp today, you might uh, have the following objection to what I just said. You might say, eh, big deal. General edge weights, unit edge weights, it's basically the same. Say you have an edge that has link three. How is that fundamentally different than having a path with three edges, each of which has length one? So why not just replace all the edges with a path of edges of the appropriate length? Now we have a network in which every edge has unit length, and now we can just run breadth first search. So, put succinctly, isn't it the case that computing shortest paths with general edge weights reduces to computing shortest paths with unit edge weights? Well, the first comment I want to make is I think this would be an excellent objection to raise. And indeed, as programmers, as computer scientists, this is the way you should be thinking. If you see a problem that seems superficially harder than another one, you always want to ask, well, maybe just with a with a clever trick, I can reduce it to a problem I already know how to solve. That's a great attitude in general for problem solving. And indeed, you know, if all of the edge lengths were just small numbers like one, two, and three, and so on, this trick would work fine. The issue is when you have a network where the different edges can have very different lengths. And that's certainly the case in many applications. Uh, definitely road networks would be one where you have both sort of long highways and you have neighborhood streets and potentially in financial transaction based networks you would also have a wide variance between the value of different transactions. And the problem then is some of these edge links might be really big. They might be a hundred, they might be a thousand. It's very hard to put a priori bounds on how large these edge weights could be. So if you start wantonly replacing single edges with these really long paths of like a thousand, you've blown up the size of your graph way too much. So you do have a faithful representation of your old network, but it's too wasteful. So even though breadth first search runs in linear time, it's now on this much larger graph, and we'd much prefer something which is linear time or almost linear time that works directly on the original graph. And that is exactly what Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm is going to accomplish. Let's now move on to the pseudocode for Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. So this is another one of those algorithms where no matter how many times I explain it, it's always just uh, super fun to teach. And the main reason is because it exposes the beauty that pops up uh, in good algorithm design. So the pseudocode, as you'll see in a second, is itself very elegant. We're just going to have one loop, and in each iteration of the loop, we will compute the shortest path distance to one additional vertex. And by the end of the loop, we'll have computed shortest path distances to everybody. The proof of correctness, which we'll do in the next video, uh, is a little bit subtle, but also quite natural, quite pretty. And then finally, Dijkstra's algorithm will give us our first opportunity to see the interplay between good algorithm design and good data structure design. So with a suitable application of the heap data structure, we'll be able to implement Dijkstra's algorithm so it runs blazingly fast, almost linear time, namely m times log n. But I'm getting a little ahead of myself. Let me actually show you this pseudocode. At a high level, you really should think of Dijkstra's algorithm as being a close cousin of breadth first search. And indeed, if all of the edge lengths are equal to one, Dijkstra's algorithm becomes breadth first search. So this is sort of the slick generalization of breadth first search when edges can have different lengths. So like our generic graph search procedures, we're going to start at the source vertex S, and in each iteration, we're going to conquer one new vertex, and we'll do that once each iteration after n minus one iterations will be done. And in each iteration, we'll correctly compute the shortest path distance to one new possible destination vertex V. So let me just start by initializing some notation. So capital X is going to denote the vertices that we've dealt with so far. And by dealt with, I mean we've correctly computed shortest path distance from the source vertex to every vertex in X. We're going to augment X by one new vertex in each iteration of the main loop. Remember that we're responsible for outputting n numbers, one for each vertex. We're not just computing one thing, we're computing the shortest path distance from the source vertex S to every other vertex. So I'm going to frame the output in terms of this array capital A. So for each vertex, we're going to have an entry in the array A, and the goal is at the end of the algorithm, A will be populated with the correct shortest path distances. 
Now to help you understand Dijkstra's algorithm, I'm going to do some additional bookkeeping, which you would not do in a real implementation of Dijkstra's algorithm. Specifically, in addition to this array capital A, in which we compute shortest path distances from the source vertex to every other destination, there's going to be an array capital B, in which we'll keep track of the actual shortest path itself from the source vertex S to each destination V. So the arrays A and B will be indexed in the same way. There'll be one entry for each possible destination vertex V. Capital A will store just a number for each destination, shortest path distance. The array B in each position will store an actual path, the path, the shortest path from S to V. But again, you would not include this in an actual implementation. I just find, in my experience, it's easier for students to understand this algorithm if we think of the paths being carried along as well. So now that I've told you the semantics of these two arrays, I hope it's no surprise how we initialize them for the source vertex itself, S. Right, the shortest path distance from S to itself is zero. The empty path gets you from S to S with link zero. There's no negative edges by assumption, so there's no way you can get from S back to S uh, with uh, non-positive length. So this is definitely the shortest path distance for S. By the same reasoning, the shortest path from S to S is just the empty path, the path with no edges in it. So now let's proceed to the main while loop. So the plan is we want to grow this set capital X like a mold until it covers the entire graph. So in each iteration it's going to grow and cover up one new vertex and that vertex will then be processed and at the time of processing we're responsible for computing the shortest path distance from S to this vertex and also figuring out what the actual shortest path from S to this vertex is. So in each iteration, we need to grow x by one node to ensure that we make progress. So the obvious question is, which node should we pick? Which one do we add to x next? So there's going to be two ideas here. The first one we've already seen in terms of all of these generic graph search procedures, which is we're going to look at the edges and the vertices which are on the frontier. So we're going to look at the vertices that are just one hop away from vertices we've already put into x. So that motivates, at a given iteration of the while loop, to look at the stuff we've already processed, that's x, and the stuff we haven't already processed, that's v minus x. s, of course, starts in x, and we never take anything out of x, so s is still there. You know, in some generic iteration of the while loop, we might have some other vertices that are in x, and in a generic iteration of this while loop, there might be multiple vertices uh, which are not in x. And now, as we've seen in our graph search procedures, there are general our edges crossing this cut. So there are edges which have one endpoint in each side, one endpoint in X and one endpoint outside of X. This is a directed graph so they can cross in two directions. They can cross from left to right or they can cross from right to left. So you might have some edges internal to X. Those are things we don't care about at this point. You might have edges which are internal to V minus X. We also don't care about those, at least not quite yet. And then you have edges which can cross from x to v minus x, as well as edges that can cross in the reverse direction, from v minus x back to x. And the ones we're going to be interested in, just like when we did graph search and directed graphs, are the edges crossing from left to right, the edges whose tail is amongst the vertices we've already seen and whose head is some not yet explored vertex. So the first idea is that at each iteration of the while loop, we scan or we examine all of the edges with tail and x and head outside of x. One of those is going to lead us to the vertex that we pick next. So that's the first idea, but now we need a second idea because this is again quite underdetermined. There could be multiple such vertices which meet this criterion. So for example, in the cartoon in the bottom left part of this slide, you'll notice that there's one vertex here which is the head of an arc that crosses from left to right, and there's yet another vertex down here in V minus X, which again is the head of an arc which crosses from left to right. So there are two options of which of those two to suck into our set X, and we might want some guidance about which one to pick next. So the key idea in Dijkstra is to give each vertex a score corresponding to how close that vertex seems to the source vertex S, and then to pick among all candidate vertices the one that has the minimum score. Let me be more precise. So among all crossing edges with tail on the left side and head on the right side, we pick the edge that minimizes the following criterion. The shortest path distance that we previously computed from S to the vertex V plus the length of the edge that connects V to W. So this is quite an important expression, so I will call this Dijkstra's greedy criterion, 
This is a very good idea to use this method to choose which vertex to add to the set X, as we'll see. I need to give a name to this edge, which minimizes this quantity over all crossing edges. So let's call it V star W star. So for example, in the cartoon in the bottom left, maybe of the two edges crossing from left to right, maybe the top one is the one that has a smaller value of Dijkstra's greedy criterion. So in that case, this would be the vertex V star, and the other end of the edge would be the vertex W star. So this edge V star W star is going to do wonders for us. It will both guide us to the vertex that we should add to X next. That's going to be W star. It's going to tell us how we should compute the shortest path distance to W star, as well as what the actual shortest path from S to W star is. So specifically, in this iteration of the while loop, after we've chosen this edge V star W star, we add W star to X. Remember, by definition, W star was previously not in capital X, so we're making progress by adding it to X. That's one more vertex in X. Now, X is supposed to represent all of the nodes that we've already processed. So an invariant of this algorithm is that we've computed shortest path distances for everybody in X as well as the actual shortest paths. So now that we're putting W star in X, we're responsible for all of this information, shortest path information. So what we're going to do is we're going to set the R estimate of W star's shortest path distance from S to be equal to the value of this Dijkstra greedy criterion for this edge. That is, whatever our previously computed shortest path distance from S to V star was, plus the length of the direct edge from V star to W star. Now, a key point is to realize that this code does make sense, by which I mean, if you think about this quantity AV, this has been previously computed. And that's because an invariant of this algorithm is we've always computed shortest path distances to everything that's in capital X. And of course, the same thing holds when we need to assign W star shortest path distance because V star was a member of capital X. We had already computed its shortest path distance. So we can just look up uh, the V star entry position in the array A. So over in our picture on our left, we would just say, well, what did we compute the shortest path distance to V star previously? Maybe it's something like 17. And then we'd say, you know, what is the length of this direct edge from V star to W star? Maybe that's 6. Then we would just add 17 and 6, and we would put 23 as our estimate of the shortest path distance from S to W star. So we do something analogous with the shortest paths itself and the array B. That is... Again, we're responsible, since we just added W star to capital X, we're responsible for suggesting a path from S to W star in the B array. So what we're going to do is we're just going to inherit the previously computed path to V star, and we're just going to tack on the end one extra hop, namely the direct edge from V star to W star. That'll give us a path from S all the way to W star via V star as an intermediate pit stop. And that is the entirety of Dijkstra's algorithm. I've explained all of the ingredients about how it works at a conceptual level. So the two things I owe you is, you know, why is it correct? Why does it actually compute shortest path correctly to all of the different vertices? And then secondly, how fast can we implement it? So the next two videos are going to answer both of those questions. But before we do that, let's go through an example to get a better feel for how this algorithm actually works. And I also want to go through a non-example so that you can appreciate how it breaks down when there are negative edges. And that'll make it clear why we do need a proof of correctness, because it's not correct without any assumptions about the edge lengths. So let's just see how it works on the same example we traced through earlier. So we start out just by initializing uh, things in the obvious way. So the shortest path distance from S to itself we say is zero, and the shortest path from S to itself is just the empty path. And initially our X is going to be just the source vertex itself. So now we enter the main while loop, and so remember in the while loop we say, well, let's scan all of the edges whose tail is in the vertices we've already looked at, whose tail is in X, and whose head is outside of X. Now in this first iteration, there are two such edges. There's the edge S comma V and the edge S comma W. So how do we know which of these two to choose? Well, we evaluate Dijkstra's greedy criterion. And so remember what that is. Dijkstra's greedy score for a given edge VW that's crossing the frontier is just the previously computed shortest path distance for the tail of the arc plus the length of the arc itself. So at this point, SV has a greedy score of 0 plus 1, which is 1, and 
the arc S, W has a Greedy score of 0 plus 4, which is 4. So obviously SV is going to be the shorter of those two. So we use the edge SV. This is playing the role of V star W star on the previous slide. And the algorithm then suggests that we should add V to our set X. So we suck in V. And our new X consists of S and V. And it also tells us how to compute the shortest path distance and the shortest path from S to V. Namely, in the A array, we just write down what was the greedy, the Dijkstra's greedy score for this particular edge, and that was 0 plus 1 or, or 1. It also tells us how to compute the shortest path for V. Namely, we just inherit the shortest path to the tail of the arc, which in this case is the empty path from S to itself. And then we tack on the end, we append the arc we used to get here, the arc S of V. So now we go to the next iteration of the while loop. So with our new set capital X consisting of S and V. And now again, we want to look at all edges which are crossing the frontier, edges that have tail uh, in X and head outside X. And now we see there's three such crossing edges. There's S comma W, there's V comma W, and there's V comma T. All of those have the tail in X and the head outside of X. So we need to compute Dijkstra's greedy score for each of those three and then pick the minimum. So let's go from bottom to top. So first of all, we can look at the arc S comma V, S comma W, excuse me. And the greedy score here is the shortest path distance for the tail, so that's zero, plus the length of the arc, which is four. So here we get a four in this iteration. Then if we do this crossbar edge, this VW edge, the Dijkstra greedy score is the A value, or the shortest path distance value of the tail. And we computed that last iteration the A of V value is 1. We add to that the length of the arc, which in this case is 2. So this edge 3, this edge V comma W has a score of 3. Finally, there's the arc V comma T, and here we're going to add 1, which is the shortest path distance of the tail of the arc, plus the edge length, which is 6. So that has the worst score. So since the edge V comma W has the smallest score, that's the one that guides how we supplement X and how we compute the shortest path distances and the shortest path for the newly acquired vertex W. So the changes are, first of all, we enlarge X. So X is now everything but T. And then how do we compute things for W? Well, the shortest path, so the, our entry in the A array, is just going to be Dijkstra's greedy score in the previous iteration. So that was 1 plus 2, so that's going to be equal to 3. And then what is the shortest path? How do we fill up the array B? Well, we inherit the shortest path to the tail of the arc, which in this case is the arc S comma V. And then we append the arc that we used uh, to choose this new vertex W, so that's the arc VW. So the new path is just the S V W path. Okay, so that's what we compute as the shortest path from S to W in this graph. So now we proceed to the final iteration of Dijkstra's algorithm. We know what vertex we're going to bring into X. It's going to be the vertex T. That's the only one left. But we still have to compute by which edge we discover T and bring it into the set X. So we have to compute the greedy score for each of the two crossing arcs, V comma T and W comma T. And in this final iteration, the score for the arc VT is unchanged. So this is still going to be the A value of its tail 1 plus the length of the arc 6. So the score here is still 7. And now, for the first time, W comma T is a crossing edge of the frontier. And when we compute its score, it's the A value of its tail W, which is 3, plus the length of this arc, which is 3. So we get a greedy score of 6. So by Dijkstra's greedy criterion, we pick the edge WT instead of the edge VT. And of course, that doesn't matter who gets brought into X, but it does matter how we compute the A and B values for T. So in the final iteration, we compute AT to be the Dijkstra greedy score of the edge that we picked, which is the edge WT, and the score was 6. So we compute the shortest path distance from S to T to be 6. And then what is the path itself? Well, we inherit the shortest path to the tail of the arc that we used to discover T. So that's the shortest path to W, which we previously computed as being the path through V. And then we append the edge we used to discover T. So we append the edge WT. So the shortest path from S to T, we're going to compute as the zigzag path. S goes to V, goes to T, sorry, goes to W, goes to T. 
And then now, uh, indeed, x is all of the vertices. We've computed it for everything. This is our final output. The contents of the, especially the A array, is the final output. Shortest path distances from S to all of the four possible destinations. And if you go back and compare this to the example you went through to the quiz, you will see, at least on this example, indeed, Dijkstra's algorithm corrects the, the shortest path distances. Now, I've said it before, I'm going to say it again. If someone shows you their algorithm works just on some example, especially a pretty simple four-node example, you should not jump to the conclusion that this algorithm always works. Sometimes algorithms work fine on small examples, but break down once you go to more interesting, complicated examples. So I definitely owe you a proof that Dijkstra's algorithm works not only in this network, but in any network. And actually, it doesn't work in any network. It's only going to work in any network with non-negative edge lengths. So to help you appreciate that, let's conclude this video with a non-example showing what goes wrong in Dijkstra's algorithm when you have networks with negative edge lengths. So before I actually give you a, a real non-example, let me just answer a preliminary question, which you might have. And this would be a very good question if it's something that's occurred to you. The question would be, well, you know, why, is it, why are these negative edge lengths such a big deal? Why can't we just reduce shortest path computation with negative edge lengths to the problem of computing shortest paths with non-negative edge lengths? Right? So why don't we just sort of clear things out? We just add a big number to all the edges. That makes them all non-negative, and now we just run Dijkstra's algorithm, and we're good to go. So this is exactly the sort of question you should be looking to ask if, as a computer scientist, as a serious programmer. When confronted with a problem, you always want to look for ways to reduce it to simpler problems that you already know how to solve. And this is a very natural idea of how to reduce a seemingly harder shortest path problem to one we already know how to solve using Dijkstra's algorithm. The only problem is uh, it doesn't quite work. Why doesn't it work? Well, if you let's say you have a graph and the most negative edge is minus 10. So all the edge lengths are minus 10 and above. So then what you'd want to do is add 10 to every single edge in the network. And that ensures that all the edge uh, lengths are non-negative. Run Dijkstra's algorithm, get your shortest path. The issue is that different paths between a common origin and destination have differing numbers of edges. So some might have five edges, some might have two edges. Now, if you add 10 to every single edge in the graph, you're going to change path lengths by different amounts. If a path has five edges, it's going to go up by 50 when you add 10 to every edge. If a path has only two edges, it's only going to go up by 20 when you add 10 to every edge. So as soon as you start changing the path lengths of different paths by different amounts, you might actually screw up which path is the shortest. The path which is shortest under the new edge lengths need not be the one which is shortest under the old edge lengths. So that's why this reduction doesn't work. To be concrete, let's look at this very simple three vertex graph with vertices S, V, and T, and edge lengths as shown, 1, minus 5, and minus 2. Now, what I hope is clear is that in this graph, the shortest path, the one with the minimum length, is the two-hop path, S, V, T. That has length minus 4. The direct S, T arc has length minus 2, which is bigger than minus 4. So the upper path is the shortest path. Now suppose we tried to massage this by adding a constant to every edge so that all, edges, all edge lengths were non-negative. We'd have to add 5 to every edge because that's the biggest negative number, the VT edge. So that would give us new edge lengths of 6 and 0 and 3. And now the problem is we've changed which path is the shortest one. We added 10 to the top path and only 5 to the bottom path, and as a result, they've reversed. So now the bottom path, ST, is actually the shorter one. So if you run Dijkstra on this graph, it's going to come back with the path ST, even though that's not, in fact, the shortest path in the original network, the one that we actually care about. Okay, So that's why you can't just naively reduce shortest paths with negative edge lengths to shortest paths with non-negative edge lengths. Moreover, on this very same super simple three-node graph, you know, we can try run, running Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm. It's perfectly well defined. It'll produce some output, but it's actually going to be wrong. It is not going to compute shortest path distances uh, correctly in this graph. So let me show you why. Well, so of course, the initialization will work as it always does. So it's going to start by saying the shortest path distance uh, from S to itself is zero via the empty path. And then what's it going to do next? It's going to say, OK, well, we need to enlarge the set capital X by one vertex. And there are two crossing edges. There's the XV edge and the ST edge. And uh, what's it going to do? It's going to use the Dijkstra greedy score. So the score of this upper edge is going to be 1. And the score of this bottom edge is going to be minus 2. 
because remember you take the previously computed shortest path value of the tail, that's zero in both cases, and then you add the edge length. So the edge lengths are one and minus two, so the scores are one and minus two. Which of these is smaller? Well, evidently, the ST arc has the smaller score, minus two. So what is Dijk's desire going to do? It's going to say, yes, let's go for this edge ST. Let's bring T into the set capital X. T is now part of the conquered territory. And of course, as soon as you bring a node into the set X, into the conquered territory, you have to commit, or Dijkstra's algorithm chooses to commit to its shortest path distance and its shortest path. What is the definition of its shortest path distance as computed by Dijkstra? Well, it's just its greedy score. So it's going to assign the vertex T the shortest path distance of minus two, and the path is going to be just the arc ST. But notice that this is in fact wrong. The shortest path distance from S to T is not minus two in this graph. There is another path, namely the one that goes through V, that has length minus four, less than minus two. So Dijkstra computes incorrect shortest path distances on this trivial three node graph. So to summarize the story so far, we've described Dijkstra's algorithm. I've showed you that it works in a very simple example that doesn't have negative edge lengths. And I've showed you that it doesn't work in an even simpler example that does have negative edge lengths. So I've both given you some plausibility that it might work generally, at least for uh, non-negative edge lengths, but I've also tried to sow some seeds of doubt that it's not at all clear at this point if Dijkstra's algorithm is always correct or not, even if you have non-negative edge lengths. And certainly, if it is always correct, there better be a, a foolproof argument for why. You should be demanding an explanation of a claim that Dijkstra's is correct in any kind of generality that's the subject of the next video. In this video, I'll prove to you that Dijkstra's algorithm does indeed compute correct shortest paths in any directed graph where all edge lengths are non-negative. Let me remind you about what is Dijkstra's algorithm. It's very much in the spirit of our graph search primitives, in particular breadth-first search. So there's going to be a subset X of vertices, which are the ones that have been processed so far. Initially, X contains only the source vertex. Of course, the distance from the source vertex to itself is zero, and the shortest path from S to itself is the empty path. So then we'll have a main while loop. There's going to be n minus one iterations, and each iteration will bring one vertex, which is not currently an X, into capital X. An invariant that we're going to maintain is that all the vertices in X, we will have computed estimates of the shortest path distance from S to that vertex, and also we'll have computed the shortest path itself from S to that vertex. Remember our standing assumptions stated in the previous video, we're always going to assume there's at least one path from the source vertex S to every other destination V. Our job is just to compute the shortest one, and also we have to assume that the edge lengths are non-negative, as we've seen otherwise Dijkstra's algorithm might fail. Now, the key idea in Dijkstra's algorithm is a very careful choice of which vertex to bring from outside of X into capital X. So what we do is we scan the edges crossing the frontier, meaning given the current edges vertices that we've already processed, we look at all of the edges whose tail has been processed and whose head has not been processed. So the tail is in capital X, the head is outside of X. That is, they cross the cut from left to right in the diagrams that we usually draw. Now, there may be many such edges. How do we decide amongst them? Well, we compute the Dijkstra Greedy score for each. The Dijkstra Greedy score is defined as the shortest path distance we computed for the tail, and that's been previously computed because the tail's in capital X, and then we add to that the length contributed by this edge itself, by the edge VW, which is crossing the cut from left to right. So amongst all edges crossing the cut from left to right, we compute all those greedy, Dijkstra greedy scores. We pick the, sm the edge with the smallest greedy score, calling that edge just V star, W star for the purposes of notation. W star is the one that gets added to X, so it's the head of the arc with the smallest greedy score. And then we compute the shortest path distance of that new vertex W star to be the shortest path distance to V star plus the length contributed by this edge V star W star. And then what is the shortest path? It's just the shortest path previously computed to V star plus this extra edge V star W star tacked onto the end. Here's the formal statement we're going to prove. For this video, we're not going to worry at all about running time. That'll be the discussion of the next video. We'll discuss both the running time of the basic algorithm and a super fast implementation that uses the heap data structure. For now, we're going to just focus on correctness. 
So the claim is that for every directed graph, not just the four node five arc example we studied, as long as there's no negative edge links, Dexter's algorithm works perfectly. It computes all of the correct shortest path distances. So just to remind you about the notation, what does it mean to correct all shortest path distances correctly? It means that uh, what the algorithm actually computes, which is A of V. In this video, I'm gonna tell you a little bit about my approach toward teaching data structures in this course. So knowing when and how to use basic data structures is an essential skill for the serious programmer. Data structures are used in pretty much every major piece of software. So let me remind you what's the point, the raison d'etre of a data structure. Uh, its job is to organize data in a way that you can access it quickly and usefully. There's many, many examples of data structures and uh, hopefully you've seen a few of them and perhaps even used a few of them in your own programs. And they range from very simple examples like lists, stacks, and queues Two more intricate but still very useful ones like heaps, search trees, hash tables, relatives thereof like bloom filters, union find structures, and so on. So why do we have such a laundry list of data structures? Why is there such a bewildering assortment? It's because different data structures support different sets of operations and are therefore well suited for different types of tasks. Let me remind you of a concrete example that we saw back when we were discussing graph search, and in particular breadth first search and depth first search. So we discussed how implementing breadth first search, the right data structure to use is a queue. This is something that supports fast, meaning constant time insertion to the back and constant time deletion from the front. Depth first search, by contrast, is a different algorithm with different needs. And because of its recursive nature, a stack is much more appropriate for depth first search. That's because it supports constant time deletion from the front, but constant time insertion to the front. So the last in first out uh, support of a stack is good for depth first search. The first in first out operations of a queue work for breadth first search. Now, because different data structures are suitable for different types of tasks, you should learn the pros and cons of the basic ones. Generally speaking, the fewer operations that a data structure supports, the faster the operations will be and the smaller the space overhead required by the data structure. Thus, as a programmer, it's important that you think carefully about the needs of your application. What are the operations that you need a data structure to export? And then you should choose the right data structure, meaning the one that supports all of the operations you need, but ideally no superfluous ones. Let me suggest four levels of data structure knowledge that someone might have. So level zero is the level of ignorance for someone who's never heard of a data structure and is unaware of the fact that organizing your data can produce fundamentally better software, for example, fundamentally faster algorithms. Level one I think of as being cocktail party level awareness. Now obviously here I'm talking only about the nerdiest of cocktail parties, but nonetheless, this would be someone who could at least hold a conversation about basic data structures. They've heard of things like heaps and binary search trees. They're perhaps aware of some of the basic operations, but this person would be shaky using them in their own program or say in a technical interview context. Now with level two, we're starting to get somewhere. So here I would put someone who has solid literacy about data structures. They're comfortable using them as a client in their own programs, and they have a good sense of which data structures are appropriate for which types of tasks. Now level three, the final level, is the hardcore programmers and computer scientists. And these are people who are not content to just be a client of data structures and use them in their own programs, but they actually have an understanding of the guts of these data structures, how they are coded up, how they're implemented, not merely how they are used. Now, my guess is that really a large number of you will wind up using data structures in your own programs and therefore learning about what are the operations of different data structures and what are they good for will be a quite empowering skill for you as a programmer. On the other hand, I'll bet that very few of you will wind up having to implement your own data structures from scratch as opposed to just using as a client the data structures that already come with the various standard programming libraries. So with this in mind, I'm going to focus my teaching on taking you up to level two. My discussion is going to focus on the operations supported by various data structures and some of the canonical applications. So through this, I hope I'll develop your intuition for what kinds of data structures are suitable for what kinds of tasks. Time permitting, however, I'll also include some optional material for those of you wanting to take it to the next level and learn some about the guts of these data structures, the canonical implementations of how you code them up. 
So in this video, we'll start talking about the heap data structure. So in this video, I want to be very clear on what are the operations supported by a heap, what running time guarantees you can expect from canonical implementations, and I want you to get a feel for what kinds of problems they are useful for. In a separate video, we'll take a peek under the hood and talk a little bit about how heaps actually get implemented. But for now, let's just focus on how to use them as a client. So the number one thing you should remember about a given data structure is what operations it supports and what is the running time you can expect from those operations. So basically a heap supports two operations. There's some bells and whistles you can throw on, but the two things you got to know is insertion and extract min. All right, so the first thing I have to say about a heap is that it's a container for a bunch of objects, and each of these objects should have a key, like a number, so that for any given object you can compare their keys and say one key is bigger than the other key. So for example, maybe the objects are employee records and the key is social security numbers. Maybe the objects are the edges of a network and the keys are something like the length or the weight of an edge. Maybe each object indicates an event and the key is the time at which that event is meant to occur. Now the number one thing you should remember about a given data structure is first of all, what are the operations that it supports? And second of all, what is the running time you can expect from those operations. For a heap, essentially, there's two basic operations. Insert and extract the object that has the minimum key value. So in our discussion of heaps, we're going to allow ties. They're pretty much equally easy with or without ties. So when you extract min from a heap that may have duplicate key values, then there's no specification about which one you get. You just get one of the objects that has uh, a tied for the minimum key value. Now, of course, there's no special reason that I chose to extract the minimum rather than the maximum. Uh, either you can have a second notion of a heap, which is a max heap, which always returns the object with the maximum key value. Or if all you have at your disposal is one of these extract min type heaps, you can just uh, negate the sign of all of the key values before you insert them. And then extract min will actually extract uh, the max key value. So just to be clear, I'm not proposing here a data structure that supports simultaneously an extract min operation and an extract max operation. If you wanted both of those operations, there'd be data structures that would give it to you. Probably a binary search tree is the first thing you'd want to consider. So I'm just saying you can have a heap of one of two flavors. Either the heap supports extract min and not extract max, or the heap will support extract max and not extract min. So I mentioned that you should remember not just the supported operations of a data structure, but what is the running time of those operations. Now for the heap, the way it's canonically implemented, the running time you should expect is logarithmic in the number of items in the heap. And it's log base 2 with quite good constants. So when you think about heaps, you should absolutely remember these two operations. Optionally, there's a couple other things about heaps that are, might be worth remembering some additional operations that they can support. So the first is an operation called heapify, like a lot of the other stuff about heaps, it has a few other names as well, but I'm gonna call it heapify, one standard name. And the point of heapify is to initialize a heap in linear time. Now, if you have n things and you wanna put them all on a heap, obviously you could just invoke insert once per each object. If you have n objects, it seems like that would take n times log n time log n for each of the n inserts, but there's a slick way to do them in a batch which takes only linear time. So that's the heapify operation. And another operation which can be implemented, although there are some subtleties, uh, is you can delete not just the minimum, but you can delete an arbitrary element from the middle of a heap, again in logarithmic time. I mention this here primarily because we're going to use this operation when we use heaps to speed up Dijkstra's algorithm. So that's the gist of a heap. You maintain objects that have keys, you can insert in logarithmic time, and you can find the one with the minimum key in logarithmic time. So let's turn to applications. I'll give you several. Uh, but before I dive into any one application, let me just say, what's the general principle? What should trigger you to think that maybe you want to use a heap data structure in some task? So the most common reason to use a heap is if you notice that your program is doing repeated minimum computations, especially via exhaustive search. And most of the applications that we go through will have this flavor. It'll be, there'll be a naive program which does a bunch of repeated minimums using just brute force search, and we'll see that a very simple application of a heap will allow us to speed it up tremendously. 
So let's start by returning to the mother of all computational problems, sorting an unsorted array. Now a sorting algorithm which is sort of so obvious and suboptimal that I didn't even really bother to talk about it in any other point in the course is selection sort. What do you do in selection sort? You do a scan through the unsorted array, you find the minimum element, you put that in the first position, you scan through the other n minus 1 elements, you find the minimum among them, you put that in the second position, you scan through the remaining n minus 2 unsorted elements, you find the minimum, you put that in the third position, and so on. So evidently, this set sorting algorithm does a linear number of linear scans through this array. So this is definitely a quadratic time algorithm, that's why I didn't bother to tell you about it earlier. So this certainly fits the bill as being a bunch of repeated minimum computations, or for each computation, we're doing exhaustive search. So this, we should just, a light bulb should go off and say, aha, can we do better using a heap data structure? And we can, and the sorting algorithm that we get is called heap sort. And given a heap data structure, the sorting algorithm is totally trivial. We just insert all of the elements from the array into the heap, then we extract the minimum one by one. From the first extraction, we get the minimum of all n elements. The second extraction gives us the minimum of the remaining n minus 1 elements, and so on. So when we extract min one by one, we can just populate a sorted array from left to right. Boom, we're done. What is the running time of heap sort? Well, we insert each element once, and we extract each element once. So that's 2n heap operations. And what I promised you is that you can count on heaps being implemented so that every operation takes logarithmic time. So we have a linear number of logarithmic time operations for a running time of n log n. So let's take a step back and appreciate what just happened. We took the least imaginative sorting algorithm possible, selection sort, which is evidently quadratic time. We recognized the pattern of repeated minimum computations. We swapped in the heap data structure, and boom, we get an n log n sorting algorithm, which is just two trivial lines. And remember, n log n is a pretty good running time for a sorting algorithm. This is exactly the running time we had from merge sort. This was exactly the average running time we got from randomized quick sort. Moreover, heap sort is a comparison-based sorting algorithm. We don't use any data about the key elements. We just use it as a totally ordered set. And as some of you may have seen in an optional video, there does not exist a comparison-based sorting algorithm with running time better than n log n. So for the question, can we do better, the answer is no if we use a comparison-based sorting algorithm like heap sort. So that's pretty amazing. All we do is swap in a heap and the running time drops from the really quite unsatisfactory quadratic to the optimal n log n. Moreover, heap sort's a pretty practical sorting algorithm. You run this, it's going to go really fast. Is it as good as quick sort? Eh, maybe not quite, but it's close. It's getting into the same ballpark. So let's look at another application, which, which frankly in some sense is almost trivial, uh, but this is also a canonical way in which heaps are used. And in this application, it will be natural to call a heap by a synonymous name, a priority queue. So what I want you to think about for this example is that you've been tasked with writing software that performs a simulation of the physical world. So you might pretend, for example, that you're helping write a video game, uh, which is for basketball. Now, why would a heap come up in a simulation context? Well, the objects in this application are going to be uh, events records. So an event might be, for example, that the ball will reach the hoop at a particular time. And that would be because a player shot it a couple seconds ago. When, uh, if, for example, the ball hits the rim, that could trigger another event to be scheduled for the near future, which is that a couple players are going to vie for the rebound. That event, in turn, could trigger the scheduling of another event, which is one of these players commits an over-the-back foul on the other one and knocks him to the ground. That, in turn, could trigger another event, which is the player that got knocked on the ground gets up and argues the foul call, and so on. So when you have event records like this, there's a very natural key, which is just the timestamp, the time at which this event in the future is scheduled to occur. Now clearly a problem which has to get solved over and over and over again in this kind of simulation is you have to figure out what's the next event that's going to occur. You have to know what other events to schedule, you have to know how to update the screen, and so on. So that's a minimum computation. So a very silly thing you could do is just maintain an unordered list of all of the events that have ever been scheduled and do a linear pass through them and compute the minimum. But you're going to be computing minimums over and over and over again. So again, that light bulb should go on and you could say, ah, maybe a heap is just what I need for this problem. And indeed it is. 
So if you're storing these event records in a heap, with the key being the timestamps, then when you extract min, the heap hands for you on a silver platter using only logarithmic time exactly which event is going to occur next. So let's move on to a less obvious application of heaps, which is a problem I'm going to call median maintenance. The way that this is going to work is you and I are going to play a little game. So on my side, what I'm going to do is I'm going to pass you index cards one at a time when there's a number written on each index card. Your responsibility is to tell me at each time step the median of the numbers that I've passed you so far. So after I've given you the first 11 numbers, you should tell me as quickly as possible the sixth smallest. After I've given you 13 numbers, you should tell me the seventh smallest, and so on. Moreover, we know how to compute the median in linear time, but the last thing I want is for you to be doing a linear time computation every single time step. Right? I only give you one new number. Do you really have to do linear time just to recompute the median if I just gave you one new number? So to make sure that you don't run a linear time selection algorithm every time I give you one new number, I'm going to put a budget on the amount of time that you can use at each time step to tell me the median. And it's going to be logarithmic in the number of numbers I've passed you so far. So I encourage you to pause the video at this point and spend some time thinking about how you would solve this problem. Alright, so hopefully you've thought about this problem a little bit. So let me give you a hint. What if you use two heaps? Do you see a good way to solve this problem then? Alright, so let me show you a solution to this problem that makes use of two heaps. So the first heap we'll call H low. This heap will support extract max. Remember we discussed that a heap you could pick whether it supports extract min or extract max. You don't get both, but you can get either one. It doesn't matter. And then we'll have another heap H high, which supports extract min. And the key idea is to maintain the invariant that the smallest half of the numbers that you've seen so far are all in the low heap, and the largest half of the numbers that you've seen so far are all in the high heap. So, for example, after you've seen the first 10 elements, the smallest five of them should reside in H low, and the biggest five of them should reside in H high. After you've seen 20 elements, then the bottom 10, the smallest 10, should, should reside in H low, and the largest 10 should reside in H high. If you've seen an odd number, uh, either one can be bigger. It doesn't matter. So, if you have 21, you have the smallest 10 in the one and the biggest 11 in the other, or vice versa. It's not, not important. Now, given this key idea of splitting the elements in half according to the two heaps, you need two realizations, which I'll leave for you to check. So, first of all, you have to prove you can actually maintain this invariant with only O of log i work in step i. Second of all, you have to realize this invariant allows you to solve the desired problem. So, let me just quickly talk through both of these points, and then you can think about it in more detail uh, on your own time. So, let's start with the first one. How can we maintain this invariant uh, using only log i work at time step i? And this is a little tricky. So, let's suppose we've already processed the first 20 numbers, and the smallest 10 of them we've all worked hard to, to put only in h low, and the biggest 10 of them we've worked hard to put only in h high. Now, here's a preliminary observation. What's true? So, what do we know about the maximum element in h low? Well, these are the tenth smallest overall, and the maximum then is the biggest of the tenth smallest. So, that would be the tenth order statistic, so the tenth smallest overall. Now, what about in the high heap? What is its minimum value? Well, those are the biggest ten values, so the minimum of the ten biggest values would be the eleventh order statistic. Okay? So, the maximum of h low is the tenth order statistic, the minimum of h high is the 11th order statistic. They're right next to each other. These are, in fact, the two medians right now. So, when this new element comes in, this 21st element comes in, we need to know which heap to insert it into. And, well, it just if it's smaller than the 10th order statistic, then it's still going to be in the bottom, then it's in the bottom half of the elements. It needs to go in the low heap. If it's bigger than the 11th order statistic, if it's bigger than the uh, minimum value of the high heap, then that's where it belongs, in the high heap. If it's wedged in between the 10th and 11th order statistics, it doesn't matter. We can put it in either one. This is the new median anyways. Now, we're not done yet with this first point because there's a problem with potential imbalance. So, imagine that the 21st element comes up and it's less than the maximum of the low heap. So, we stick it in the low heap and now that has a population of 11. And now imagine the 22nd number comes up and that again is less than the maximum element in the low heap. So, again we have to insert it in the low heap. Now we have 12 elements in the low heap, but we only have 10 in the right heap. 
So we don't have a 50-50 split of the numbers. But we can easily rebalance. We just extract the max from the low heap and we insert it into the high heap. And boom, now they both have 11 and the low heap has the smallest 11 and the high heap has the biggest 11. So that's how you maintain uh, the invariant that you have this 50-50 split in terms of the small and the high between the two heaps. You check where it lies with respect to the max of the low heap and the min and the, of the high heap. You put it in the appropriate place and whenever you need to do some rebalancing, you do some rebalancing. And this uses only a constant number of heap operations when a new number shows up, so that's log i work. So now given this discussion, it's easy to see the second point, given that this invariant is true at each time step, how do we compute the median? Well, it's going to be either the maximum of the low heap and or the minimum of the high heap, depending on uh, whether i is even or odd. If it's even, both of those are medians. If i is odd, then it's just whichever heap has one more element than the other one. So the final application we'll talk about in detail in a different video, a video concerned with the running time of Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, but I do want to mention it here as well, just to reiterate the point of how careful use of data structures can speed up algorithms, uh, especially when you're doing things like minimum computations in an inner loop. So Dijkstra's shortest path algorithm, uh, hopefully many of you have watched that video at this point, but basically what it does is it has a central while loop and so it operates once per vertex of the graph. And at least naively, it seems like what each iteration of the while loop does is an exhaustive search through the edges of the graph, computing a minimum. So if we think about the work performed in this naive implementation, it's exactly uh, in the wheelhouse of a heap, right? So uh, what we do in each of these loop iterations is do an exhaustive search computing a minimum. You see repeated, repeated minimum computations, a light bulb should go off and you should think, ah, maybe a heap can help. And heap can help in Dijkstra's algorithm. The details are a bit subtle and they're discussed in the separate video, but the upshot is we get a tremendous improvement in the running time. So recalling that M denotes the number of edges and N denotes the number of vertices of a graph, with the careful deployment of heaps in Dijkstra's algorithm, the runtime drops from this really rather large polynomial, the product of the number of vertices and the number of edges, down to something which is almost linear time, namely O of M log N, where M is the number of edges and N is the number of vertices. So the linear time here would be O of M, linear the number of edges, we're picking up an extra log factor, but still this is basically as good as sorting. So this is a fantastically fast uh, shortest path algorithm, certainly way, way better than what you get if you don't use heaps and just do repeated exhaustive searches for the minimum. So that wraps up our discussion of uh, what I think you really want to know about heaps, namely what are the key operations that it supports, what is the running time you can expect from those operations, what are the types of problems that the data structure will yield speedups for, and a suite of applications. For those of you that want to take it to the next level and see a little bit about the guts of the implementation, there is a separate optional video uh, that talks a bit about that. In this sequence of videos, we'll discuss our last but not least data structure, namely the balanced binary search tree. Like our discussion of other data structures, we'll begin with the what, that is we'll take the client's perspective and we'll ask what operations are exported by this data structure, what can you actually use it for. Then we'll move on to the how and the why. We'll peer under the hood of the data structure and look at how it's actually implemented. And in understanding the implement implementation, we'll understand why the operations have the running times that they do. So what is a balanced binary search tree good for? Well, I recommend thinking about it as a dynamic version of a sorted array. That is, if you have data stored in a balanced binary search tree, you can do pretty much anything on the data that you could if it was just a static sorted array. But in addition, the data structure can accommodate insertions and deletions. You can accommodate a dynamic set of data that you're storing over time. So to motivate the operations that a balanced binary search tree supports, let's just start with a sorted array and look at some of the things you can easily do with data that happens to be stored in such a way. So let's think about an array that has numerical data, although generally, as we've said, in data structures, there's usually associated other data that's what you actually care about, and the numbers are just some unique identifier for each of the records. So these might be an employee ID number, social security numbers, uh, packet ID numbers in a network context, uh, etc. So what are some things that are easy to do given that your data is stored as a sorted array? Well, there's a bunch of things. First of all, you can search. And recall that searching in a sorted array is generally done using binary search. So this is 
how we used to look up phone numbers when we had physical phone books. You'd start at the middle of the phone book. If the name you were looking for was less than the midpoint, you'd recurse on the left-hand side. Otherwise, you'd recurse on the right-hand side. As we discussed back in the master method lectures long ago, this is going to run in logarithmic time. Roughly speaking, every time you recurse, you've thrown out half of the array, so you're guaranteed to terminate within a logarithmic number of iterations. So binary search gives us logarithmic search time. Something else we discussed in previous lectures is the selection problem. So previously we discussed this in the much harder context of unsorted arrays. Remember, in the selection problem, in addition to an array, you're given an order statistic. So if your order statistic that your target is 17, that means you're looking for the 17th smallest number that's stored in the array. So in previous lectures, we worked very hard to give a linear time algorithm for this problem in unsorted arrays. Now, in a sorted array, if you want to know the 17th smallest element in the array, pretty easy problem. Just return whatever element happens to be in the 17th position of the array. Since the array is sorted, that's where it is. So no problem. If it's already sorted, constant time, you can solve the selection problem. Of course, two special cases of the selection problem are finding the minimum element of the array. That's just uh, the order statistic problem with i equal 1. And the maximum element, that's just when i equals n. So this just corresponds to uh, returning the element that's in the first position and the last position of the array, respectively. Well, let's do some more brainstorming. What other operations could we implement on a sorted array? Well, here's a couple more. So there are operations called the predecessor and successor operations. And so the way these work is you start with one element. So say you start with a pointer to the 23. And you want to know where in this array is the next smallest element. That's the predecessor query. And the successor operation returns the next largest element in the array. So the predecessor of the 23 is the 17. The successor of the 23 would be the 30. And again, in a sorted array, these are trivial. right? You just know the predecessor is just one position back in the array. The successor is one position forward. So given a pointer to the 23, you can return the 17 or the 30 in constant time. What else? Well, how about the rank operation? So we haven't discussed this operation in the past. So what rank is, this asks for how many keys stored in the data structure are less than or equal to a given key. So for example, the rank of 23 would be equal to 6, because 6 of the 8 elements in the array are less than or equal to 23. And if you think about it, implementing the rank operation is really no harder than implementing search. All you do is search for the given key, and wherever the search terminates in the array, you just look at the position of the array, and boom, that's the rank of that element. So for example, if you do a binary search for 23, and then when it terminates, you discover it is there in position number 6, then you know the rank is 6. If you do an unsuccessful search, say you search for 21, well then you get stuck in between the 17 and the 23, and at that point you can conclude that the rank of 21 in this array is 5. Let me just wrap up the list with a final operation, which is trivial to implement in a sorted array. Namely, you can output or print, say, the stored keys in sorted order, let's say from smallest to largest. And naturally, all you do here is a single scan from left to right through the array, outputting whatever element you see next. The time required is constant per element or a linear overall. So that's a quite impressive list of supported operations. Could we really be so greedy as to want still more from our data structure? Well, yeah, certainly. We definitely want more than just what we have on this slide. The reason being, these are operations that operate on a static data set, which is not changing over time. But the world, in general, is dynamic. For example, if you're running a company and keeping track of the employees, sometimes you get new employees, sometimes employees leave. That is, we want a data structure that not only supports these kinds of operations, but also insertions and deletions. Now, of course, it's not that it's impossible to implement insert or delete in a sorted array. It's just that they're going to run way too slow. In general, you have to copy over a linear amount of stuff on an insertion or deletion if you want to maintain the sorted array property. So this linear time performance for insertion and deletion is unacceptable unless you barely ever do those operations. So the raison d'etre of a balanced binary search tree is to implement this exact same set of operations, just as rich as that supported by a sorted array, but in addition, 
insertions and deletions. Now a few of these operations won't be quite as fast. We're going to have to give up a little bit. Instead of constant time, they'll run in logarithmic time, but we'll still get logarithmic time for all of these operations, linear time for outputting the elements in sorted order, plus we'll be able to insert and delete in logarithmic time. So let me just spell that out in a little more detail. So a balanced binary search tree will act like a sorted array, plus it will have fast, meaning logarithmic time, inserts and deletes. So let's go ahead and spell out all of those operations. So search is going to run in log in time, just like before. Select runs in constant time in a sorted array, and here it's going to take logarithmic, so we'll give up a little bit on the selection problem, but we'll still be able to do it quite quickly. Even on the special cases of finding the minimum or finding the maximum, uh, in, our, in our data structure, we're going to need logarithmic time in general. Same thing for finding predecessors and successors. They're, not, they're no longer constant time. They go up to logarithmic. Rank took us logarithmic time in the, even in the sorted array version, and that will remain logarithmic here. As we'll see, we lose essentially nothing over the sorted array if we want to output the key values in sorted order, say from smallest to largest. And crucially, we have two more fast operations compared to the sorted array data structure. We can insert stuff. So if you hire a new employee, you can insert them into your data structure. If an employee decides to leave, you can remove them from the data structure. You do not have to spend linear time like you do for a sorted array. You only have to spend logarithmic time, where as always, n is the number of keys being stored in the data structure. So the key takeaway here is that if you have data and it has keys which come from a totally ordered set, like say numeric keys, then a balanced binary search tree supports a very rich collection of operations. So if you anticipate doing a lot of different processing using the ordering information of all of these keys, then you really might want to consider a balanced binary search tree to maintain them. One thing to keep in mind though is we have seen a couple other data structures which don't do quite as much as balanced binary search trees, but what they do, they do better. We already, we just discussed in the last slide the sorted array, so if you have a static data set, you don't need inserts and deletes, well then by all means don't bother with balanced binary search trees, just use a sorted array because it'll do everything super fast. But we also saw two dynamic data structures, which don't do as much, but do it, but what they do, they do very well. So we saw a heap. So what a heap is good for is it's just as dynamic as a search tree. It allows insertions and deletions, both in logarithmic time. And in addition, it keeps track of the minimum element or the maximum element. Remember, in a heap, you can choose whether you want to keep track of the minimum or keep track of the maximum. But unlike in a search tree, a heap does not simultaneously keep track of the minimum and the maximum. So if you just need those three operations, insertions, deletions, and remembering the smallest, and this would be the case, for example, in a priority queue or a scheduling application, as discussed in the heap videos, then a binary search tree is overkill. You might want to consider a heap instead. In fact, the benefits of a heap don't show up in the big O notation here. Both have logarithmic operation time, but the constant factors both in space and time are going to be faster with a heap than with a balanced binary search tree. The other dynamic data structure that we discussed is a hash table. And what hash tables are really, really good at is handling insertions and searches, that is lookups. Some, sometimes, depending on the implementation, they'll also handle deletions really well also. So if you don't actually need to remember things like minima, maxima, or remember ordering information on the keys, you just have to remember what's there and what's not, then the data structure of choice is definitely the hash table, not the balanced binary search tree. Again, a balanced binary search tree would do fine. It would give you logarithmic lookup time, but it's kind of overkill for the problem. If all you need are fast lookups, a hash table, recall, will give you constant time lookups. So that'll be a noticeable win over the balanced binary search tree. But if you want a very rich set of operations for processing your data, then the balanced binary search tree could be the optimal data structure for your needs. So in this video, we'll go over the basics behind implementing binary search trees. We're not going to focus on the balance aspect in this video. That'll be discussed in later videos. We're going to talk about things which are true for binary search trees in general, balanced or otherwise. But let's just recall, you know, why it is are we doing this? You know, what is the raison d'etre of this data structure, the balanced version of a binary search tree? And basically, it's a dynamic version of a sorted array. So it does pretty much everything you can do on a sorted array, maybe in slightly more, more expensive time, but still really fast. 
Uh, but in addition, it's dynamic. It accommodates insertions and deletions. So remember, if you want to keep a sorted array data structure, every time you insert, every time you delete, you're probably going to wind up paying a linear factor, which is way too expensive in most applications. By contrast, with a search tree, a balanced version, you can insert and delete in logarithmic time in the number of keys in the tree. And moreover, you can do stuff like search in logarithmic time, no more expensive than binary search on a sorted array. And also, you can solve, say, the selection problem and the special case is the minimum and maximum. Okay, it's not constant time like in a sorted array, but still logarithmic, pretty good. And in addition, you can print out all of the keys from smallest to largest in linear time, constant time per element, just like you could with a linear scan through a sorted array. So that's what they're good for. Everything a sorted array can do more or less, plus insertions and deletions, everything in logarithmic time. So how are search trees organized? And again, what I'm going to say in the rest of this video is true both for balanced and unbalanced search trees. We're going to worry about the balancing aspect uh, in the later videos. All right, so let me tell you the key ingredients in a binary search tree. Let me also just draw a simple cartoon example up in the upper right part of the slide. So there's a one-to-one -one correspondence between nodes of the tree and keys that are being stored. And as usual in our data structure discussions, uh, we're going to act as if the only thing that we care about, the only thing that exists at each node is this key, when generally there's associated data that you really care about. So each node in the tree uh, will generally contain both a key plus a pointer to some data structure that has more information. Maybe the key is the employee ID number, and then there's a pointer to lots of other information about that employee. Now, in addition to the nodes, you have to have links amongst the nodes. And there's a lot of different ways to do the exact implementation of the pointers that connect the nodes of a tree together. For the video, I'm just going to keep it as straightforward as possible. And we're just going to assume that at each node, there's three pointers, one to a left child, another one to a right child, and then a third pointer, which points to the parent. Now, of course, some of these pointers can be null. And in fact, in the five node, uh, binary search tree I've drawn on the right, uh, for each of the five nodes, at least one of these three pointers is null. So for example, for the node with key one, uh, it has a null left child pointer. There's no left child. Its right child pointer is going to point to the node with key two. Its parent pointer is going to point to the node that has key three. Similarly, uh, three is going to have a null parent pointer, and the root node, in this case three, is the unique node that has a null parent pointer. Uh, here the node with key value three, of course, has a left child pointer, it points to one, it has a right child pointer, it points to five. Now here is the most fundamental property of search trees. Let's just go ahead and call it the search tree property. So the search tree property asserts the following condition at every single node of a search tree. If the node has some key value, then all of the keys stored in the left subtree should be less than that key. And similarly, all of the keys stored in the right subtree should be bigger than that key. So if we have some node whose stored key value is x, and this is somewhere, you know, say, deep in the middle of the tree, so upward we think of as being toward the root, and then if we think about all the nodes that are reachable after following the left child pointer from x, that's the left subtree, and similarly the right subtree being everything reachable via the right child pointer from x, it should be the case that all keys in the left subtree are less than x, and all keys in the right subtree are bigger than x. And again, I want to emphasize this property holds not just at the root, but at every single node in the tree. I've defined the search tree property assuming that all of the keys are distinct. That's why I wrote strictly less than in the left subtree and strictly bigger than in the right subtree. But search trees can easily accommodate duplicate keys as well. You just have to have some convention about how you handle ties. So for example, you could say that everything in the left subtree is less than or equal to uh, the key at that node, and then everything in the right subtree should be strictly bigger than that node. That works fine as well. So if this is the first time you've ever heard of the search tree property, maybe at first blush it seems a little arbitrary. It seems like I pulled it out of thin air. But actually, this, you would reverse engineer this property if you sat down and thought about what property would make search really easy in a data structure. The point is the search tree property tells you exactly where to look for some given key. So looking ahead a little bit, stealing my fire from a slide to come, suppose you were looking for, say, a key 23. And you start at the root and the root is 17. 
The point of the search tree property is you know where 23 has to be. If the root is 17 and you're looking for 23, if it's in the tree, no way is it in the left subtree. It's got to be in the right subtree. So you can just follow the right child pointer and forget about the left subtree for the rest of the search. This is very much in the spirit of binary search where you start in the middle of the array. And again, you compare what you're looking for to what's in the middle. And either way, you can recurse on one of the two sides, forgetting forever more about the other half of the array. And that's exactly the point of the search tree property. We're going to search from root on down. The search tree property guarantees we have a unique direction to go next and we never have to worry about any of this stuff that we don't see. We could also draw a very loose analogy with our discussion of heaps. You might recall heaps were also logically, we thought of them as a tree, even though they're implemented as an array. And heaps had some heap property. And if you go back and review the heap property, you'll find that it is not the same thing as the search tree property. Those are two different properties, and that's because they're trying to make different things easy. Back when we talked about heaps, the property was that, this was for the extract min version, Parents always have to be smaller than their children. That's different than the search tree property, which says stuff to the left is smaller than you, stuff to the right is bigger than you. In heaps, we had the heap property so that identifying the minimum value was trivial. It was guaranteed to be at the root. Heaps are designed so that you can find the minimum easily. Search trees are, def are defined so that you can search easily. That's why we have this different search tree property. If you want to get smaller, you go left. If you want to get bigger, you go right. One point that's important to understand early, and this will be particularly relevant once we, do, once we try to enforce balancing in our subsequent videos, is that for a given set of keys, you could have a lot of different search trees. On the previous slide, I drew one search tree containing the key values 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Let me redraw that exact same search tree here. If you stare at this tree a little while, you'll agree that, in fact, at every single node of this, of this tree, all of the things in the left subtree are smaller, all of the things in the right subtree are bigger. However, let me show you another valid binary search tree with this exact same set of keys. So in this second search tree, the root is 5, the maximum value, and everybody has null right children. Only the left children are populated, and it goes 5, 4, 3, 2, 1 in descending order. If you check here again, it has the property that at every node, everything in the left subtree is smaller, everything in the right subtree, in this case empty, is bigger. So extrapolating from these two cartoon examples, we surmise that for a given set of n keys, search trees that contain these keys could vary in height anywhere from the best case scenario of a perfectly balanced binary tree, which is going to have like logarithmic height, to the worst case of one of these linked list-like chains, which is going to be linear in the number of keys n. And so just to remind you, uh, the height of a search tree, which is also sometimes called the depth, is just the longest number of hops it ever takes to get from a root to a leaf. So in the first search tree here, the height is 2, and in the second search tree, the height is 4. If the search tree is perfectly arranged with the number of nodes essentially doubling at every level, then the depth is you're going to run out of nodes around the depth of log base 2 of n. And in general, if you have a chain of n keys, the depth is going to be n minus 1. But let's just call it n amongst friends. So now that we understand the basic structure of binary search trees, we can actually talk about how to implement all of the operations that they support. So as we go through most of the supported operations one at a time, I'm just going to give you a really high-level description. It should be enough for you to code up your own implementation if you want, or as usual, if you want more details or actual uh, working code, you can check on the web or in uh, one of a number of good programming or algorithms textbooks. So let's start with really the primary operation, which is search. Searching, we've really already discussed how it's done when we discussed the search tree property. Again, the search tree property makes it obvious how to look for something in a search tree. Pretty much, you just follow your nose. You have no other choice. So you start at the root. It's the obvious place to start. If you're lucky, the root is what you're looking for. And then you stop and you return the root. More likely, the root is either bigger than or less than the key that you're looking for. Now, if the key is smaller, if the key you're looking for is smaller than the key at the root, where are you going to look? Well, the search tree property says if it's in the tree, it's got to be in the left subtree. So you follow the left subchild pointer. 
if the key you're looking for is bigger than the key at the root, where's it got to be? Got to be in the right subtree. So you're just going to recurse on the right subtree. So in this example, if you're searching for, say, the key 2, obviously you're going to go left from the root. If you're searching for the key 4, obviously you're going to go right from the root. So how can the search terminate? Well, it can terminate in one of two ways. First of all, you might find what you're looking for. So in this example, if you search for four, you're going to traverse a right child pointer, then a left child pointer, and then boom, you're at the four, and you return successfully. The other way the search could terminate is with a null pointer. So in this example, suppose you were looking for a node with key six. What would happen? Well, you start at the root. Three is too small, so you go to the right. You get to five. Five is still too small because you're looking for six. So you try to go right, but the right child pointer is null. And that means six is not in the tree. If it was anywhere in the tree, it had to be to the right of the three. It had to be to the right of the five. But you tried it, and you ran out of pointers, so the six isn't there. And you return correctly with an unsuccessful search. Next, let's discuss the insert operation, which really is just a simple piggybacking on the search that we just described. So for simplicity, let's first think about the case where there are no duplicate keys. The first thing to do on this insertion is search for the key K. Now, because there are no duplicates, this search will not succeed. This key K is not yet in the tree. So for example, in the picture on the right, we might think about trying to insert the key six. What's going to happen when we search for six, we follow a right child pointer, we go from three to five, and then we try to follow another one and we get stuck. There's a null pointer going to the right of five. Then when this unsuccessful search terminates at a null pointer, we just rewire that pointer to point to a node with this new key K. So if you want to permit duplicates in your data structure, you got to tweak the code of insert a little bit, but really barely at all. You just need some convention for handling the case when you do encounter the key that you're about to insert. So for example, if the current node has a key equal to the one you're inserting, you could have the convention that you always continue on the left subtree. And then you continue the search as usual, again, eventually terminating in a null pointer, and you stick the new inserted node, uh, you rewire the null pointer to point to it. One good exercise for you to think through, which I'm not going to say more about here, is that when you insert a new node, you retain the search tree property. That is, if you start with a search tree, you start with a tree where at every node, stuff to the left is smaller, stuff to the right is bigger. You insert something and you follow this procedure, you will still have the search tree property after this new node has been inserted. That's something for you to think through. So what I want to do next is test your understanding of both the search and insertion procedures by asking you about their running time. So of the following four parameters, of a search tree that contains n different keys, which one governs the worst case time of a search or of an insertion? So the correct answer is the third one. So the height of a search tree governs the worst case time of a search or of an insertion. Notice that means merely knowing the number of keys n is not enough to deduce what the worst case search time is. You also have to know something about the structure of the tree. So to see that, just let's think about the two examples that we've been running so far, one of which is nice and balanced, and the other of which, which contains exactly the same five keys, is super unbalanced. It's this crazy linked list in effect. So in any search tree, the worst case time to do a search or an insertion is proportional to the largest number of pointers, left or right child pointers, that you might have to follow to get from the root all the way to a null pointer. Of course, in a successful search, you're going to terminate before you encounter a null pointer. But in the worst case, or an insertion, you go all the way to a null, null pointer. Now in the tree on the left, you're going to follow at most three such pointers. So if, for example, if you're searching for 2.5, you're going to follow a left pointer, followed by a right pointer, followed by another right pointer, and then that one's going to be null. So you're only going to follow three pointers. On the other hand, in the right tree, you might follow as many as five pointers before that fifth pointer is null. For example, if you search for the key zero, you're going to traverse five left pointers in a row, and then you're finally going to encounter the null at the end. 
So it is not constant time, certainly. You have to get to the bottom of the tree. It's going to be proportional to logarithm, the logarithm in the number of keys. If you have a nicely balanced binary search tree like this one on the left, it's going to be proportional to the number of keys n, as in the fourth answer, if you have a really lousy search tree like this one on the right. And in general, the search time or the insertion time is going to be proportional to the height, the largest number of hops you need to take to get from the root to a leaf of the tree. Let's move on to some more operations that search trees support, but that, for example, the dynamic data structures of heaps and hash tables do not. So let's start with the minimum and the maximum. So by contrast, in a heap, remember, you can choose one of the or the two. You can either find the minimum easily or find the maximum easily, but not both. In a search tree, it's really easy to find either the min or the max. So let's start with the minimum. One way to think of it is that you do a, a search for negative infinity in the search tree. So you start at the root and you just keep following left child pointers until you run out, until you hit a null. And whatever the last key that you visit has to be the smallest key of the tree. Right? Because think about it. Suppose you start at the root. Right? Suppose that the root is not the minimum then the min where's the minimum got to be? It's got to be in the left subtree. So you follow the left child pointer, and then you just repeat the argument. If you haven't already found the minimum, where's it got to be with respect to the current place? It's got to be in the left subtree. And you just iterate until you can't go to the left any further. So for example, in our running search tree, you'll notice that if we just keep following left child pointers, we'll start at the three, we'll go to the one, we'll try to go left from the one, we'll hit a null pointer, and we return one. And one is indeed the minimum key in this tree. Now, given that we've gone over how to compute the minimum, no prizes to guess how we compute the maximum. Of course, if we want to compute the maximum, instead of following left child pointers, we follow right child pointers by symmetric reasoning that's guaranteed to find the largest key in the tree. It's like searching for the key plus infinity. All right, so what about computing the predecessor? So remember, this means you're given a key in the tree, an element of the tree, and you want to find the next smallest element. So for example, the predecessor of the 3 is 2, the predecessor of the 2 in this tree is the 1, the predecessor of the 5 is the 4, the predecessor of the 4 is the 3. So here I'll be a little hand wavy just in the interests of getting through all of the operations in a reasonable amount of time. But let me just point out that there's one really easy case, and then there's one slightly trickier case. So the easy case is when the node with the key k has a non-empty left subtree. If that's the case, then what you want is simply the biggest element in this node's left subtree. So I'll leave it for you to prove formally that this is indeed the correct way to compute predecessors for keys that do have a non-empty left subtree. Let's just verify it in our example by going through the trees that have a left subtree and checking that this is in fact what we want. Now if you look at it, there's actually only two nodes that have a non-empty left subtree. The three has a non-empty left subtree, and indeed the largest key in the left subtree of three is the 2, and that is the predecessor of the 3, so that worked out fine. And then the other node with a non-empty left subtree is the 5, and its left subtree is simply the element 4. Of course, the maximum in that tree is also 4, and you'll notice that is indeed the predecessor of 5 in this entire search tree. So the trickier case is what happens if you have a key with no left subtree at all. Okay, so what are you going to do if you're not in the easy case? Well, given at this node with key k, you only have three pointers, and by assumption, the left one is null. So that's not going to get you anywhere. Now, the right child pointer, if you think about it, is totally pointless for computing the predecessor. Remember, the predecessor is going to be a key less than the given key k. The right subtree, by definition of a search tree, only has keys that are bigger than k. So it stands to reason to find the predecessor, we've got to follow the parent pointer. Maybe, in fact, more than one parent pointer. So to motivate exactly how we're going to follow parent pointers, let's look at a couple of examples in our favorite search tree here on the right. So let's start with the node 2. So we know we've got to follow a parent pointer. When we follow 2's parent pointer, we get to 1. And boom, 1, in fact, is 2's predecessor in this tree. So that was really easy. To compute 2's predecessor, it seems that all we have to do is follow the parent pointer. So for another example, though, let's think about the node 4. Now 4, when we follow its parent pointer, we get to 5. And 5 is not 4's predecessor, it's 4's successor. Right? We want a key that is less than where we started. We followed the parent pointer and it was bigger. 
But if we follow one more parent pointer, then we get to the three. So from the two, we needed to follow one parent pointer. From the four, we needed to follow two parent pointers. But the point is, you just need to follow parent pointers until you get to a node with key smaller than your own. And at that point, you can stop, and that's guaranteed to be the predecessor. So hopefully you found this intuitive. I should say I have definitely not formally proved that this works. And that is a good exercise for those of you that want to have a deeper understanding of search trees and this magical search tree property and all of the structure that it grants you. The other thing I should mention is another way to interpret the, the terminating criterion. So what I've said is you stop your search of parent pointers as soon as you get to a key smaller than yours. If you think about it a little bit, you'll realize you'll get to a key smaller than yours the very first time you take a left turn. So the very first time that you go from a right child to its parent. Look at the example. When we started from two, we took a left turn, right? We went up a link going leftward. Two is a right child of one, and that's when we got to the predecessor in just one step. By contrast, when we started from the four, our first step was to the right. So we got to a node that was bigger than where we started. Four is five's left child, so it's gotta be smaller than five. But the first time we took a left turn on the next step, we got to a node that was not only smaller than five, but actually smaller from four, smaller from our starting point. So in fact, you're gonna see a key smaller than your starting point the very first time you take a left turn, the very first time you go from a node to a parent. And in fact, that node is that parent's right child. So this is another statement which I think is intuitive, but which formally is not totally obvious. And again, I encourage you to think carefully about why these two descriptions of the terminating criteria are exactly the same. So it doesn't matter if you stop when you first find a key smaller than your starting point. It doesn't matter if you first stop when you follow a parent pointer uh, that goes from a node that's the right child of a node. Either way, you're gonna stop at exactly the same time. So I encourage you to think about why those are the exact same stopping condition. A couple of other details, if you start from the unique node that has no predecessor at all, you're never going to trigger this terminating condition. So for example, if you start from the node 1 in the search tree, not only is the left subtree empty, which says you're supposed to start traversing parent pointers, but then when you traverse a parent pointer, you only go to the right, you never turn left, and that's because there's no predecessor. So that's how you detect that you're at the minimum of a search tree. And then of course, if you wanted to compute the successor of a key instead of the predecessor, obviously you just flip left and right throughout this entire description. So that's the high level explanation of all of these different ordering operations, minimum, maximum, predecessor, and successor, work in a search tree. Let me ask you the same question I asked you when we talked about search and insertion. How long do these operations take in the worst case? Well, the answer is the same as it was before. It's proportional to the height of the tree, and the explanation is exactly the same as it was before. So to understand the dependence on the height, let's just focus on the maximum operation as is stated in the question. The other three operations, the running time is proportional to the height in the worst case for exactly the same reasons. So what does the max operation do? Well, you start at the root and you just follow right child pointers until you run out of them, until you hit null. So you know that the running time is going to be no worse than the longest such path. It's a particular path from the root to essentially a leaf. So it's never gonna have running time more than the height of the tree. On the other hand, for all you know, the path from the root to the maximum key might well be the longest one in the tree. It might be the path that actually determines the height of the search tree. So for example, in our running unbalanced example, that would be a bad tree for the minimum operation. If you look for the minimum in this tree, then you'd have to traverse every single pointer uh, from five all the way down to one. Of course, there's an analogous bad search tree for the maximum operation where the one is the root and the five is all the way down as a leaf. Another thing you can do with search trees, which mimics what you can do with sorted arrays, is you can print out all of the keys in sorted order in linear time with constant time per element. Obviously in a sorted array, this is trivial. You just use a for loop starting at the beginning, going to the end of the array, printing out the keys one at a time. And there's a very elegant recursive implementation for doing the exact same thing in a search tree. And this is known as an in-order traversal of a binary search tree. So as always, you begin at the beginning, uh, namely at the root of the search tree. And a little bit of notation, let's call all of the search tree that starts at R's left child, T sub L, and the search tree rooted at R's right child, T sub R. In our running example, of course, the root is three. T sub L would correspond to the search tree comprising only the elements one and two. T sub R would correspond to the subtree comprising only the elements five and four. 
Now remember we want to print out the keys in increasing order. So in particular, the first key we want to print out is the smallest of them all. So something we definitely don't want to do is we don't want to first print out the key at the root. For example, in our search tree example, the roots key is three. We don't want to print that out first. We want to print out the one first. So where's the minimum lie? Well, by the search tree property, it's got to lie in the left subtree T sub L. So we're just going to recurse on T sub L. So by the magic of recursion, or if you prefer induction, what recursing on T sub L is going to accomplish is we're going to print out all of the keys in T sub L in increasing order from smallest to largest. Now that's pretty cool because T sub L contains exactly the keys that are smaller than the key at the root. Remember that's the search tree property. Everything bigger than the roots key has to be in the left subtree. Everything bigger than the roots key has to be in its right subtree. So in our concrete example, this first recursive call is just going to print out the keys one and then two. And now, if you think about it, it's the perfect time to print out the key at the root. Right? We want to print out all the keys in increasing order. We've already done everything less than the roots key. We're a, you know, recursing on the right-hand side. We'll take care of everything bigger than it. So in between the two recursive calls, and this is why it's called an in-order traversal, that's when we want to print out R's key. And clearly this works in our concrete example. The first recursive call prints out one and two. It's the perfect time to print out three. And then the recursive call will print out four and five. And more generally, the recursive call on the right subtree will print out all of the keys bigger than the roots key in increasing order, again, by the magic of recursion or induction. So the fact that this pseudocode is correct, the fact that this so-called in-order traversal indeed prints out the keys in increasing order, is a fairly straightforward proof by induction. It's very much in the spirit of the proofs by induction of correctness of the divide and conquer algorithms that we discussed earlier in the course. So what about the running time of an in-order traversal? The claim is that the running time of this procedure is linear. It's O of n, where n is the number of keys in the search tree. And the reason is there's exactly one recursive call for each node of the tree, and constant work is done in each of those recursive calls. In a little more detail, so what does the in-order traversal do? Well, it prints out the keys in increasing order. In particular, it prints out each key exactly once. Each recursive call prints out exactly one key's value. So there's exactly n recursive calls, and all a recursive call does is print one thing. So n recursive calls, constant time for each, that gives us a running time of O of n overall. In most data structures, deletion is the most difficult operation, and in search trees, there are no exception. So let's get into it and talk about how deletion works. There are three different cases. So the first order of business is to locate the node that has the key k, to locate the node that we want to get rid of. All right, so for starters, maybe we're trying to delete the key 2 from our running example search tree. So the first thing we need to do is figure out where it is. So there are three possibilities for the number of children that a node in a search tree might have. It might have zero children, it might have one child, it might have two children. Corresponding to those three cases, the deletion pseudocode will also have three cases. So let's start with the happy case where there's only zero children, like in this case where we're deleting the key 2 from the search tree. Then, of course, we can, without any reservations, just delete the node directly from the search tree. Nothing can go wrong. There's no children depending on that node. Then there's the medium difficult case. This is where the node containing k has one child. An example here would be if we wanted to delete 5 from the search tree. So the medium case is also not too bad. All you got to do is splice out the node that you want to delete. That creates a hole in the tree, but then the, that node, deleted node's unique child assumes the previous position of the deleted node. I could make a nerdy joke about Shakespeare right here, but I'll refrain. For example, in our five node search tree, if we wanted to, let's say we haven't actually deleted two out of this one, if we wanted to delete the five, the five, we take it out of the tree, that would leave a hole, but then we just replace the position previously held by five by its unique child, four. And if you think about it, that works just fine in the sense that that preserves the search tree property. Remember, the search tree property says that everything in, say, a right subtree has to be bigger than everything in the node's key. So we've made four the new right child of three, but four and any children that it might have were always part of three's right subtree. So all that stuff has got to be bigger than three. So there's no problem putting four and possibly all of its descendants uh, as the right child of three. The search tree property is, in fact, retained. 
So the final difficult case then is when the node being deleted has both of its children, has two children. So in our running example with five nodes, this would only transpire if we wanted to delete the root, if we wanted to delete the key three from the tree. The problem, of course, is that you, know, you can try ripping out this node from the tree, but then there's this hole, and it's not clear that it's going to work to promote either child into that spot. You might stare at our example search tree and try to understand what would happen if you tried to bring one up to be the root or if you tried to bring five up to be the root. Problems would happen. That's what would happen. This is an interesting contrast to when we face the same issue with heaps because the heap properties in some sense is perhaps less stringent. There we didn't have an issue. When we wanted to delete something with two children, we just promoted the smaller of the two children, assuming we wanted to export and uh, extract min operation. Here we're going to have to work a little harder. In fact, this is going to be a really neat trick. We're going to do something that reduces the case of two children to the previously solved cases of zero or one children. So here's the very sneaky way we identify a node to which we can apply either the case 0 or the case 1 operation. What we're going to do is we're going to start from k and we're going to compute k's predecessor. Remember, this is the next smallest key in the tree. So for example, the predecessor of the key 3 is 2. That's the next smallest key in the tree. In general, let's call k's predecessor L. Now, this might seem complicated, right? We're trying to implement one tree operation, namely deletion, and all of a sudden we're invoking a different tree operation predecessor, which we covered a couple slides ago. And to some extent, you're right, you know, delete, this is a non-trivial operation, but it's not quite as bad as you think for the following reason. When we compute this predecessor, we're actually in the easy case of the predecessor operation, conceptually. Remember, how do you compute a predecessor? Well, it depends. What does it depend on? It depends on whether you've got a non-empty left subtree or not. If you don't have a non-empty left subtree, that's when you've got to do this thing where you follow parent pointers upward until you find a key which is smaller than where you started. But if you've got a left subtree, then it's easy. You just find the maximum of the left subtree, and that's got to be the predecessor. And remember, finding maximum are easy. All you do is follow right child pointers until you can't anymore. Now what's cool is, because we only bother with this predecessor computation in the case where K's node has both children, we only have to do it in the case where it has a non-empty left subtree. So really when we say compute K's predecessor L, all you got to do is follow K's left child, that's not null because it has both children, and then follow right child pointers until you can't anymore, and that's the predecessor. Now here's the fairly brilliant part of the way you do implement deletion in a search tree, which is you swap these two keys, K and L. So for example, in our running search tree, instead of this 3 at the root, we would put a 2 there. And instead of this 2 at the leaf, we would put a 3 there. Now the first time you see this, it just strikes you as a little crazy, maybe even cheating, like we're just completely disregarding the rules of, rules of search trees. And actually it is, like check out what happened to our example search tree. We swapped the three and the two, and this is not a search tree anymore, right? So we have this three, which is in two's left subtree, and the three is bigger than the two. And that is not allowed. That is a violation of the search tree property. Oops. So how can we get away with this? We can get away with this because we're going to delete three anyways. So we're going to wind up with a search tree at the end of the day. So we may have messed up the search tree property a little bit, but we've swapped K into a position where it's really easy to get rid of. Well, how did we compute K's predecessor L? Ultimately, that was the result of a maximum computation, which involves following right child pointers until you get stuck. And L was the place we got stuck. What does it mean to get stuck? It means L's right child pointer is null. It does not have two children. In particular, it does not have a right child. Once we swap K's into L's old position, K now does not have a right child. It may or may not have a left child. In the example on the right, it does not have a left child either in its new position. But in general, it might have a left child. But it definitely doesn't have a right child because that was a position at which a maximum computation got stuck. And if we want to delete a node that has only zero or one child, well, that we know how to do. That we covered on the last slide. Either you just delete it, that's what we do in the running example here, or in the case where K's new node does have a left child, you would do the splice out operation. So you would rip out the node that contains K, and the unique child of that node would assume uh, the previous position of that node. Now, an exercise which I'm not going to do here, but I strongly encourage you to think through in the privacy of your own home, is that 
fact, this deletion operation retains the search tree property. So roughly speaking, when you do this swap, you can violate the search tree property, as we see in this example, but all of the violations involve the node you're about to delete. So once you delete that node, there's no other violations of the search tree property. So bingo, you're left with the search tree. The running time, this time no, get, no prizes for guessing what it is, uh, because it's basically just one of these predecessor computations plus some pointer rewiring, uh, just like predecessor and search, it's going to be governed by the height of the tree. So let me just say a little bit about the final two operations mentioned earlier, select and rank. So remember, select is just the selection problem. I give you an order statistic like 17, and I want you to return the 17th smallest key in the tree. Rank is I give you a key value, and I want to know how many keys in the tree are less than or equal to that value. So to implement these operations efficiently, we actually need one small new idea, which is to augment binary search trees with additional information at each node. So now a search tree will contain not just a key, but also information about the tree itself. So this idea is often called augmenting your data structure, and perhaps the most canonical augmentation of a search tree like these is to keep track of each node, not just of a key value, but also of the population of tree nodes in the subtree that's rooted there. So let's call this size of x, which is the number of tree nodes in the subtree rooted at x. So to make sure you know what I mean, let me just tell you what the size field should be for each of the five nodes in our running search tree example. So again, remember, we're thinking about how many nodes are in the subtree rooted at a given node, or equivalently, following child pointers from that node, how many different tree nodes can you reach? So from the root, of course, you can reach everybody. Everybody's in the tree rooted at the root. So the size there is five. By contrast, if you start at the node one, well, you can get to the one, or you can follow the right child pointer to get to the two. So at the one, the size would be two. At the node with the key value five, for the same reason, the size would be two. At the two leaves, the subtree rooted at a leaf is just the leaf itself, so there the size would be one. There's an easy way to compute the size of a given node once you know the size of its two subtrees. So if a given node in a search tree has children Y and Z, then how many nodes are there in the subtree rooted at X? Well, there's those that are rooted at Y. There are those in the left subtree. There are those that are reachable from Z. That is, there are the children that are also uh, children of Z. And then there's X itself. Now, in general, whenever you augment a data structure, and this is something we'll talk about again when we discuss red-black trees, you got to pay the piper. So the extra data that you maintain, it might be useful for speeding up certain operations, but whenever you have operations that modify the tree, specifically insertion and deletion, you have to take care to keep that extra data valid, to keep it maintained. Now, in the case of these subtree sizes, they're quite straightforward to maintain under insertion and deletion without affecting the running time of insertion and deletion very much. But that's something you should really think about offline. For example, when you perform an insertion, remember how that works. You do a, essentially a search. You follow left and right child pointers down to the bottom of the tree until you hit a null pointer. Then that's where you stick the new node. Now what you have to do is you have to trace back up that path all of the ancestors of the new node you just inserted and increment their subtree sizes by one. So let's wrap up this video by showing you how to implement the selection procedure given an order statistic in a search tree that's been augmented so that at every node you know the size of the subtree rooted at that node. Well, of course, as always, you start at the beginning, which in a search tree is the root. And let's say the root has subchildren Y and Z. Y or Z could be null, that's no problem. We just think of the size of a null node as being zero. Now, what's the search tree property? It says every the keys that are less than the key stored at x are precisely the ones that are in the left subtree at x. The keys in the tree that are bigger than the key at x are precisely the ones you're going to find in the x's right subtree. So suppose we're asked to find the 17th order statistic in a search tree, the 17th smallest key that's stored in the tree. Where is it going to be? Which sub where should we look? Well, it's going to depend on the structure of the tree, and in fact, it's going to depend on the subtree sizes. This is exactly why we're keeping track of them, so we can quickly make decisions about how to navigate through the tree. So, for a simple example, suppose that 
X's left subtree contains, say, 25 keys. So remember, Y knows locally exactly what the population of its subtree is. So in constant time from X, we can figure out how many keys are in Y subtree, and let's say it's 25. Now, by the defining property of search trees, these are the 25 smallest keys anywhere in the tree, right? X is bigger than all of them. Everything in X's right subtree is bigger than all of them. So the 25 smallest order statistics are all in the subtree rooted at Y. Clearly, that's where we should recurse. Clearly, that's where the answer lies. So we can recurse on the subtree rooted at Y, and then we are again looking for the 17th order statistic in this new smaller search tree. On the other hand, suppose when we start at X and we look, we ask Y, how, how many nodes are there in your subtree? And maybe Y locally has stored the number 12. So there's only 12 things in X's left subtree. Well, okay, X itself is bigger than all of them, so that's going to X is going to be the 13th biggest uh, order statistic. It's going to be the 13th biggest element in the tree. Everything else is in the right subtree. So in particular, the 17th order statistic is going to be in the right subtree. So we're going to recurse in the right subtree. Now, what are we looking for? We're not looking for the 17th order statistic anymore. The 12 smallest things are all in X's subtree. X itself is the 13th smallest, so we're looking for the fourth smallest of what remains. So the recursion is very much along the lines of what we did in the divide and conquer selection algorithms earlier in the course. So to fill in some more details, let's let A denote the subtree size at Y. And if it happens that X has no left child, we'll, we'll define A to be zero. So the super lucky case is when there's exactly I minus one nodes in the left subtree. That means the root here, x, is itself the ith order statistic. Remember, it's bigger than everything in its left subtree, it's smaller than everything in its right subtree. But in the general case, we're going to be recursing either on the left subtree or on the right subtree. We recurse on the left subtree when its population is large enough that we're guaranteed it encompasses the ith order statistic. And that happens exactly when its size is at least i. That's because the left subtree has the smallest keys that are anywhere in the search tree. And in the final case, when the left subtree is so small that not only does it not contain the ith order statistic, but also x is too small to be the ith order statistic, then we recurse on the right subtree, knowing that we've thrown away a plus 1, the a plus 1 smallest key values anywhere in the original tree. So correctness of this procedure is pretty much exactly the same as the inductive correctness for the selection algorithms we discussed earlier. In effect, the root of the search tree is acting as a pivot element, with everything in the left subtree being less than the root, everything in the right subtree being greater than the element in the root. So that's why the recursion is correct. As far as the running time, I hope it's evident from the pseudocode that we do constant time each time we recurse. How many times can we recurse Well, we keep moving down the tree? The maximum number of times we can move down the tree is proportional to the height of the tree. So this, again, is proportional to the height. So that's the select operation. There is an analogous way to write the rank operation. Remember, this is where you're given a key value and you want to count up the number of stored keys that are less than or equal to that target value. Again, you use these augmented search trees. And again, you can get running time proportional to the height. And I encourage you to think through the details of how you'd implement rank offline. So in this video, we'll graduate beyond the domain of just vanilla binary search trees, like we've been talking about before. And we'll start talking about balanced binary search trees. These are the search trees you really want to use when you want to have real-time guarantees on your operation time because they're search trees which are guaranteed to stay balanced, which means the height is guaranteed to stay logarithmic, which means all of the operations search trees support that we know and love will also be logarithmic in the number of keys that they're storing. So let's just quickly recap what is the basic search tree property. It should be the case that at every single node of your search tree, if you go to the left, you only see keys that are smaller than where you started, and if you go to the right, you only see keys that are bigger than where you started. And a really important observation, which is that given a set of keys, there are going to be lots and lots of different legitimate, valid binary search trees with those keys. So we've been having these running examples with the keys 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. On the one hand, you can have a nice and balanced uh, search tree that has height only 2 with the keys 1 through 5. On the other hand, you can also have these crazy chains, basically devolved to linked lists, 
where the heights for n elements could be as high as n minus 1. So in general, you could have an exponential difference in the height. It could be as small in the best case as logarithmic, as big in the worst case as linear. So this obviously motivates search trees that have the additional property that you never have to worry about their height. You know they're going to be well balanced. You know they're going to have height logarithmic. You're never worried about them having this really lousy linear height. Remember why it's so important to have a small height? It's because the running time of all of the operations of search trees depends on the height. You want to do search, you want to do insertion, you want to find predecessors, whatever. The height is going to be what governs the running time of all of those properties. So the high-level idea behind balanced search trees is, is really exactly what you'd think. Which is that, you know, because the height can't be any better than logarithmic in the number of things you're storing, that's because the trees are binary, so the number of nodes can only double each level, so you need a logarithmic number of levels to accommodate everything that you're storing. But it's got to be logarithmic. Let's make sure it stays logarithmic all the time, even as we do insertions and deletions. If we can do that, then we get a very rich collection of supported operations all running in logarithmic time. As usual, n denotes the number of keys being stored in the tree. There are many, many, many different balanced search trees. Uh, they're not super, most of them are not super different from each other. I'm going to talk about one of the more popular ones, which are called red-black trees. So these were invented back in the 70s. These were not the first balanced binary search tree data structure. That honor belongs to AVL trees, which again are not very different from red-black trees though the invariants are slightly different. Another thing you might want to look up uh, and read about is a very cool data structure called splay trees due to Slater and Tarjan. Uh, these, unlike red black trees and AVL trees, which only are modified on insertions and deletions, which if you think about it is sort of what you'd expect, splay trees modify themselves even when you're doing lookups, even when you're doing searches. So they're sometimes called self-adjusting trees for that reason. And they're super simple, but they still have kind of amazing guarantees. And then finally, going beyond the, just the binary tree paradigm, uh, many of you might want to look up examples of B trees or also B plus trees. These are very relevant for implementing databases. Here, what the idea is in a given node, you're going to have not just one key, but many keys. And from a node, you have multiple branches that you can take, depending on where you're searching for falls with respect to the multiple keys that are at that node. The motivation in a database context uh, for going beyond the binary paradigm is to have a better matchup with the memory hierarchy. So that's also very important, although a little bit outside of the scope here. That said, uh, what we discuss about red-black trees, much of the intuition will translate to all of these other balanced tree data structures if you ever find yourself in a position where you need to learn more about them. So red-black trees are just the same as binary search trees, except they also always maintain a number of additional invariants. And so what I'm going to focus on in this video is, first of all, what the invariants are, and then how the invariants guarantee that the height will be logarithmic. Time permitting, at some point there will be optional videos more about the guts, more about the implementations of red-black trees, namely how do you maintain these invariants under insertions and deletions. That's quite a bit more complicated, so that's appropriate for, for optional material. But understanding what the invariants are and what role they play in controlling the height is very accessible, and it's something I think uh, every programmer should know. So there, I'm going to write down four invariants, and really the byte comes from the second two, okay, from the third and the fourth invariants. The first two invariants uh, you know, are just really cosmetic. So the first one, uh, we're going to store one bit of information additionally at each node beyond just the key, uh, and we're going to call this bit as indicating whether it's a red or a black node. You might be wondering, you know, why red-black? Well, I asked my colleague Leo Gibis about that a few years ago, and he told me that when he and Professor Sedgwick were writing up this article, uh, the journals were just had access to a certain kind of new printing technology that allowed very limited color uh, in the printed copies of the journals. And so they were eager to use it, and so they named their data structure red-black so they could have these nice red and black pictures in the journal article. Unfortunately, there was then some snafu, and at the end of the day, that technology wasn't actually available, so it wasn't actually printed the way they were envisioning it, but the name has stuck. So that's the rather idiosyncratic reason why these data structures got the name uh, that they did, red-black trees. So secondly, we're going to maintain the invariant that the root of the search tree is always black, can never be red. Okay, so with the superficial pair of invariants out of the way, let's go to the two main ones. 
So first of all, we're never going to allow two reds in a row. By which I mean, if you have a red node in the search tree, then its children must be black. If you think about it for a second, you realize this also implies that if a node is red and it has a parent, then that parent has to be a black node. So in that sense, there are no two red nodes in a row anywhere in the tree. And the final invariant, which is also rather severe, is that every path you might take from root to a null pointer passes through exactly the same number of black nodes. So to be clear on what I mean by a root null path, what you should think about is an unsuccessful search. Right, so what happens in an unsuccessful search? You start at the root, depending on whether you need to get smaller or bigger. You go left or right respectively. You keep going left, right as appropriate until eventually you hit a null pointer. So I want you to think about that process by which you start at the root and then eventually fall off into the tree. In doing so, you traverse some number of nodes. Some of those nodes will be black. Some of those nodes will be red. And I want you to keep track of the number of black nodes. And the constraints that a red-black tree, by definition, must satisfy is that no matter what path you take through the tree, starting from the root, terminating in a null pointer, the number of black nodes traversed has to be exactly the same. It cannot depend on the path. It has to be exactly the same on every single root null path. Let's move on to some examples. So here's a claim. And this is meant to kind of whet your appetite for the idea that red-black trees must be pretty balanced. They have to have height, basically logarithmic. So remember, what's the most unbalanced search tree? Well, that's these chains. So the claim is even a chain with three nodes cannot be a red-black tree. So what's the proof? Well, consider such a search tree. Right, so maybe with the key values 1, 2, and 3. So the question that we're asking is, is there a way to color the no these three nodes, red and black, so that all four of the invariants are satisfied? So we need to color each red or black. Remember, invariant 2 says the root, the 1, has to be black. So we have four possibilities for how to color 2 and 3. But really, because of the third invariant, we only have three possibilities. We can't color 2 and 3 both red, because then we'd have two reds in a row. So we can either make two red, three black, two black, three red, or both two and three black. And all of the cases are the same. Uh, just to give one example, suppose that we color the node two red and one and three are black. The claim is invariant four is then broken. And invariant four is gonna be broken no matter how we try and color two and three uh, red and black. What does invariant four says? It says really on any unsuccessful search, you pass through the same number of black nodes. And so one unsuccessful search would be you search for zero. And if you search for zero, you go to the root, you immediately go left and hit a null pointer, so you see exactly one black node, namely one. On the other hand, suppose you searched for four. Then you'd start at the root, you'd go right, you'd go to two, you'd go right, you'd go to three, you'd go right again, and only then would you hit a null pointer. And on that unsuccessful search, you'd encounter two black nodes, both the one and the three. So that's a violation of the fourth invariant. Therefore, this would not be a red-black tree. I'll leave it for you to check that no matter how you try to color two and three, uh, red or black, you're going to break one of the invariants. If they're both red, you break the third invariant. If at most one is red, you break the fourth invariant. So that's a non-example of a red-black tree. So let's look at an example of a red-black tree. One, uh, a search tree where you actually can color the nodes red or black so that all four invariants are maintained. So one search tree which is very easy to make red-black is a perfectly balanced one. So for example, let's consider this three-node search tree. It has the keys three, five, and seven. And let's suppose the five is the root. So it has one child on each side, the three and the seven. So can this be made a red-black red tree? So remember what that question really means. It's asking, can we color these three nodes, some combination of red and black, so that all four of the invariants are satisfied? If you think about it a little bit, you realize, yeah, you can definitely color these nodes red or black to make and satisfy all four of the invariants. In particular, suppose we color all three of the nodes black. We've satisfied invariant number one, we've colored all the nodes. We've satisfied invariant number two, in particular the root is black. We've satisfied invariant number three, there's no reds at all, so there's certainly no two reds in a row. And if you think about it, we satisfy invariant four because this tree is perfectly balanced. No matter what you unsuccessfully search for, you're going to encounter two black nodes. If you search for, say, one, you're going to encounter three and five. If you search for, say, six, you're going to encounter five and seven. 
So all root null paths have exactly two black nodes. Invariant number four is also satisfied. So that's great. But of course, the whole point of having a binary search tree data structure is you want to be dynamic. You want to accommodate insertions and deletions. Every time you have an insertion or a deletion into a red-black tree, you get a new node. Let's say an insertion, you get a new node, you have to color it something, and now all of a sudden you've got to worry about breaking one of these four invariants. So let me just show you some easy cases where you can accommodate insertions without too much work. Time permitting, we'll include some optional videos with the notion of rotations, which do more fundamental restructuring of search trees so that they can maintain the four invariants and stay uh, nearly perfectly balanced. So if we have this red-black tree where everything's black and we insert, say, six, that's going to get inserted down here. Now, if we try to color it black, it's no longer going to be a red-black tree. And that's because if we do an unsuccessful search now for, say, 5.5, we're going to encounter three black nodes, where if we do an unsuccessful search for one, we only encounter two black nodes. So that's not going to work. But the way we can fix it is instead of coloring the six black, we color it red. And now this 6 is basically invisible to invariant number 4. It doesn't show up in any root null paths. So because you had two black nodes on all root null paths before, before the 6 was there, that's still true now that you have this red 6. So all four invariants are satisfied once you insert the 6 and color it red. If we then insert, say, an 8, we can pull exactly the same trick. We can color the 8 red. Again, it doesn't participate in invariant 4 at all, so we haven't broken it. Moreover, we still don't have two reds in a row, so we haven't broken invariant number three either. So this is yet another red-black tree. In fact, this is not the unique way to color the nodes of the search tree so that it satisfies all four of the invariants. If we instead recolor six and eight black, but at the same time recolor the node seven red, we're also golden. Clearly, the first three invariants are all satisfied, but also in pushing the red upward, consolidating the red at 6 and 8, and putting it at 7 instead, we haven't changed the number of black nodes on any given path. Any, black, any path that previously went through 6 went through 7. Anything that went through 8 went through 7. So there's exactly the same number of red and black nodes on each such path as there was before. So all paths still have equal number of black nodes, and invariant 4 remains satisfied. As I said, I've shown you here only very simple examples where you don't have to do much work on an insertion to retain the red-black properties. In general, if you keep inserting more and more stuff, and certainly if you do deletions, you have to work much harder to maintain those four invariants. Time permitting, we'll cover just a taste of it in some optional videos. So what's the point of these seemingly arbitrary four invariants of a red-black tree? Well, the whole point is that if you satisfy these four invariants in your search tree, then your height is going to be small. And because your height is going to be small, all your operations are going to be fast. So let me give you a proof that if a search tree satisfies the four invariants, then it has super small height. In fact, no more than double the absolute minimum it could conceivably have, at most two times log base two of n. So the formal claim is that every red-black tree with n nodes has height O of log n. More precisely, at most two times log base two of n plus one. So here's the proof. And what's cool about this proof is it's very obvious the role played by these invariants three and four. Essentially, what the invariants guarantee is that a red-black tree has to look like a perfectly balanced tree with, at most, a sort of factor two inflation. So let's see exactly what I mean. So let's begin with an observation. And this, this has nothing to do with red-black trees. Forget about the colors for a moment. And just think about the structure of binary trees. And let's suppose we have a lower bound on how long root null paths are in a tree. So for some parameter k, and go ahead and think of k as like 10 if you want, suppose we have a tree where if you start from the root, and no matter how it is you navigate left and right child pointers until you terminate at a null pointer, no matter how you do it, you have no choice but to see at least k nodes along the way. If that hypothesis is satisfied, then if you think about it, the top of this tree has to be totally filled in. So the top of this tree has to include a perfectly balanced search tree, binary tree, of depth k minus 1. So let me draw a picture here of the case of k equals 3. 
So if no matter how you go from the root to a null pointer, you have to see at least three nodes along the way, then it means the top three levels of this tree have to be full. So you have to have the root, it has to have both of its children, and it has to have all four of its grandchildren. The proof of this observation is by contradiction. If in fact you were missing some nodes in any of these top k levels, well that would give you a way of hitting a null pointer seeing less than k nodes. So what's the point is, the point is this gives us a lower bound on the population of a search tree as a function of the length of its root null paths. So the size n of the tree must include at least the number of nodes in a perfectly balanced tree of depth k minus 1, which is 2 raised to the k minus 1. So for example, when k equals 3, it's 2 raised to the 3, 2 cubed, minus 1, or 7. So that's just a basic fact about trees, nothing about red-black trees. So let's now combine that with the red-black tree invariance to see why red-black trees have to have small height. So again, to recap where we got to on the previous slide, the size n, the number of nodes in a tree, is at least 2 to the k minus 1, where k is the fewest number of nodes you will ever see on a root null path. So let's rewrite this a little bit and let's actually say, let's instead of having a lower bound on n in terms of k, let's have an upper bound on k in terms of n. So the length of every root null path, the minimum length of every root null path, is bounded above by log base 2 of quantity n plus 1. This is just adding 1 to both sides and taking the logarithm base 2. So what? What does this buy us? Well now let's start thinking about red-black trees. So in a red-black tree with n nodes, what does this say? This says that the number of nodes, forget about red or black, just the number of nodes on some root null path has to be at most log base 2 of n plus 1. In the best case, all of those are black. Maybe some of them are red, but in the, in the maximum case, all of them are black. So we can write in a red-black tree with n nodes, there is a root null path with at most log base 2 of n plus 1 black nodes. This is an even weaker statement than what we just proved. We proved that some path must have at most log base 2 of n plus 1 total nodes, so certainly that path has at most log base 2 of n plus 1 black nodes. Now let's, now let's apply the two knockout punches of our two invariants. All right, so fundamentally, what is the fourth invariant telling us? It's telling us that if we look at a path in our red-black tree, we go from the root, we think about, say, an unsuccessful search, we go down to a null pointer, it says, if we think of the red nodes as invisible, if we don't count them in our tally, then we're only going to see log, uh, basically a logarithmic number of nodes. But when we care about the height of the red-black tree, of course, we care about all of the nodes, the red nodes and the black nodes. So, so far we know if we only count black nodes, then we're good. We only have log base 2 of n plus 1 nodes that we need to count. So here's where the third invariant comes in. It says, well, actually, Black nodes are a majority of the nodes in the tree. In a strong sense, there are no two reds in a row on any path. So if we know the number of black nodes is small, then, because you can't have two reds in a row, the number of total nodes on the path is at most twice as large. In the worst case, you have a black root, then red, then black, then red, then black, then red, then black, etc. In the worst case, the number of red nodes is equal to the number of black nodes, which doubles uh, the length of a path once you start counting the red nodes as well. And this is exactly what it means for a tree to have a logarithmic depth. So this in fact proves the claim if a search tree satisfies the invariants 1 through 4, in particular if there's no two reds in a row and all